Now, to tell the truth, the comet had been a bit late with its prophecy, because the war with Nilfgaard was well underway, and one could already have prophesied conflagrations and massacres correctly, without hesitation, for not a day went by without them. Eugenius Krantz, who was familiar with the movements of heavenly bodies, was, however, hoping to calculate when, in how many years or centuries, the comet would appear again, announcing another war, which, who knows, it would perhaps be possible to prepare for better than the present one. The astronomer stood up, massaged his backside, and went to relieve his bladder from the terrace through the small balustrade. He always pissed straight from the terrace onto a bed of peonies, not caring at all about the housekeeper's reprimands. It was quite simply too far to the privy. Wasting time walking a long way to relieve himself bore the risk of the loss of valuable reflections, which no scholar could afford to do. He stood by the balustrade and undid his trues, looking at the lights of Vichima reflected in the lake. He sighed with relief and raised his eyes heavenwards. Stars, he thought, and constellations. The winter maiden, the seven goats, the pitra. According to some theories, they aren't just little twinkling lights, but worlds. Other worlds. Worlds from which time and space separate us. I believe deeply, he thought, that one day journeys to those other places, to those other times and universes, will be possible. Yes, it will certainly be possible one day. A way will be found. But it will demand utterly new thinking, a new original idea that will tear apart the rigid corset called rational cognition that restricts it today. Ah, he thought, hopping, if only it could be achieved. If only one could experience inspiration. If there could be one unique opportunity. Something flashed below the terrace. The darkness of the night ruptured like a starburst, and a horse emerged from the flare with a rider on its back. The rider was a girl. Good evening, she greeted him politely. I'm sorry if it's a bad time. May one know what place this is, and what time? Arrhenius Krantz swallowed, opened his mouth, and mumbled. The police, the girl repeated patiently and clearly. The time? Uh, I... <laughs> the horse snorted. The girl sighed. Well, it must be the wrong place again. The wrong place, the wrong time. But answer me, fellow, with at least one comprehensible word. For I can't be in a world where people have forgotten articulate speech. Uh, one little word? Hmm... <laughs> Then bugger you, you stupid old goat, said the girl, and vanished, along with the horse. Arrhenius Krantz closed his mouth. He stood for a while by the balustrade, staring into the night, at the lake and the distant lights of Vichima reflected in it. Then he buttoned up his trousers and returned to his telescope. The comet swiftly flashed across the sky. One ought to observe it, not let the eyepiece and eye lose sight of it. Track it until it disappeared into the chasms of the universe. It was an opportunity, and a scholar cannot waste such an opportunity. Perhaps I could try from another direction, she thought, staring at the two moons above the moor, now visible as two crescents, one small, the other large and less crescent. Perhaps not imagine places or faces, she thought, but strongly desire, strongly wish for something, very strongly, right from my belly. What harm is there in trying? Geralt. I want to go to Geralt. I very much want to go to Geralt. Oh, no, she cried. What have I bloody ended up now? Kelpie confirmed that she thought the same by whinnying, belching steam from her nostrils and scraping her snowbound hooves. The blizzard whistled and moaned, blinding them. Sharp snowflakes stung her cheeks and hands. The cold chilled her to the marrow, nipped her joints like a wolf. Siri trembled, hunching her shoulders and hiding her neck in the meagre, non-existent protection of her turned-up collar. To the left and right, 
rose majestic, menacing peaks, grey, glazed monuments whose summits vanished somewhere high up in the fog and blizzard. A swift, very swollen river, dense with frazil and lumps of ice, sped along the bottom of the valley. It was white all around, and cold. So much for my abilities, thought Siri, feeling the inside of her nose freezing. So much for my power. A fine master of the worlds. Well, well. I wanted to go to Geralt, and I ended up in the middle of some bloody wilderness, winter and blizzard. Come on, Kelpie, move or you'll go numb. She grabbed the reins with fingers paralysed by the frost. Gee up, gee up, girl. I know it's not the place it's meant to be. I'll soon get us out of here. We'll soon return to our warm moor. But I have to concentrate, and that may take some time. So move yourself. Come on, right. Kelpie belched steam from her nostrils. The strong wind blew. Snow stuck to her face, melting on her eyelashes. The freezing snowstorm howled and whistled. Look! called Angoulême, out shouting the blizzard. Look there! There are tracks! Someone rode that way! What are you saying? Geralt unwrapped the shawl he had wrapped around his head to protect his ears from frostbite. What are you saying, Angoulême? Tracks! Hoof prints! A horse! Here! Kair also had to shout. The blizzard intensified, and the river sans retour, it seemed, whooshed and roared even louder. How could a horse get here? Look for yourselves! Indeed, commented the vampire, the only member of the company who wasn't displaying symptoms of being utterly frozen, since he was, for obvious reasons, just as insensitive to low as to high temperatures. Hoof prints. But are they a horse's? It's impossible for it to be a horse. Kair massaged his cheeks and nose hard. Not in the middle of nowhere. The tracks must have been left by some wild animal. Most probably a mouflon. Mouflon yourself? yelled Angoulême. When I say a horse, I mean a horse. Milva, as usual, preferred practice to theory. She dismounted and bent over, pushing her fox fur calpac back on her head. The pup's right, she decided after a moment. It's a horse. I think it's even shod, but it's hard to say. The blizzard has covered the tracks. It rode over there into that ravine. Ha! Angoulême banged her arms together briskly. I knew it. Somebody lives here, in the vicinity. Let's follow the trail. Perhaps we'll find some warm cottage or other. Perhaps he'll let us get warm. Perhaps he'll treat us to something. For certain, said Kaya with a sneer. Most probably a crossbow bolt. It would be most sensible to keep to our plan and the river, Rages decided in his most omniscient tone. Then we won't be at risk of getting lost. And further down the son's retour, there was meant to be a trapper's manufactory. There's a greater likelihood they'll put us up there. Get out. What do you see? The witcher said nothing and fixed his eyes on the snowflakes swirling in the blizzard. We'll follow the tracks, he finally decided. Actually, began the vampire, but Geralt immediately interrupted him. Follow the hoof prints. Ride. They spurred their steeds, but didn't get very far. They ventured not more than a quarter of a furlong into a gorge. That's it. Angoulême stated a fact, looking at the quite smooth and virginal snow. Now you see it, now you don't. Like an elven circus. What now, witcher? Kair turned around in the saddle. The tracks have ceased. They've been covered up by the blizzard. No, they haven't, Milva said. The blizzard doesn't reach here, in the canyon. What happened to the horse then? The archer shrugged huddled up in the saddle, pulling her head into her shoulders. Where's that horse? Kair wasn't giving up. Did it vanish? Evaporate? Or perhaps we imagined it. Geralt? What do you say? The gale howled above the ravine, whipping up and swirling the snow. Why? asked the vampire, scrutinizing the witcher intently. Did you order us to follow those tracks, Geralt? I don't know, he confessed a moment later. 
I... I felt something. Something touched me. Never mind what. You were right, Regis. Let's go back to the Sons Retour and keep by the river without any excursions or diversions that might end badly. According to what Reinhardt said, the real winter and bad weather only begin in the Malheur Pass. When we get there, we'll have to be sound in body. Don't just stand there, we're turning around. Without having cleared up what happened to that strange horse. What's there to explain? The Witcher said bitterly. The tracks were swept away and that's that. Anyway, maybe it really was a mouflon. Milver looked at him strangely, but refrained from comment. When they returned to the river, the mysterious tracks were no longer there either, for they had been covered up by wet snow. Frazil was floating densely. Pieces of pack ice were swirling and turning around in the tin grey current of the sun's retour. I'll tell you something, Angolin piped up, but promise you won't laugh. They turned around. In her woolen pom-pom hat, pulled down over her eyes, with cheeks and nose red from the cold, wearing a shapeless sheepskin coat, the girl looked funny, a dead ringer for a small, plump kobold. I'll tell you something about those tracks. When I was with Nightingale in the Hansa, they said that during the winter, the Mountain King, leader of the Ice Demons, rides on an enchanted horse in the passes. To meet him face to face is certain death. What do you say to that, Geralt? Is it possible that anything, he interrupted her, anything's possible. On we go, company. Before us is the Malheur Pass. The snow lashed and whipped, the wind blew, and ice demons whistled and wailed amidst the blizzard. Except the moor she'd landed on wasn't the one she knew, Siri realized at once. She didn't even have to wait until evening. She was sure she wouldn't see the two moons. The forest along whose edge she rode was as wild and inaccessible as the other one. But differences could be seen. Here, for example, there were more birches and fewer beeches. She hadn't heard or seen any birds there, while there were great numbers of them here. There had only been sand and moss between the clumps of heather. Here, whole carpets of green club moss sprawled. Even the grasshoppers running from under Kelpie's hooves were somehow different here somehow familiar. And then, her heart began beating harder. She saw a track, overgrown and neglected, leading into the forest. Siri looked around carefully and made sure the strange track didn't go any further that it ended here, that it didn't lead to the forest, but from it or through it. Without deliberating for long, she prodded the mare's sides with her heels and rode between the trees. I'll ride south, she thought. If I don't come across anything to the south, I'll turn around and ride in the opposite direction, beyond the moor. She trotted beneath a canopy of boughs, looking around attentively, trying hard not to overlook anything important. Because of that, she didn't overlook an old man peeping out from behind an oak tree. The old man, who was very short but not at all stooped, was dressed in a linen shirt and trues made from the same material. On his feet he had huge and very funny-looking bast slippers. In one hand he held a gnarled stick, and in the other a wicker basket. Siri couldn't see his face precisely, for it was hidden by the frayed and drooping brim of a straw hat, from under which protruded a sunburnt nose and a tangled grey beard. Fear not, she said. I won't do you any harm. The grey-bearded man shifted his weight from one foot to the other and removed his hat. He had a round face flecked with liver spots, ruddy and not very wrinkled, thin eyebrows and a small and very receding chin. His long grey hair was tied up on his nape in a queue, but the top of his head, meanwhile, was completely bald, as yellow and shiny as a pumpkin. She saw him looking at her sword, at the hilt extending above her shoulder. Don't be afraid, she repeated. No, oh, he said, mumbling a little. Oh, oh, my young maiden, Forrest Graham sitting afraid. He ain't one of those fearful types, oh no. He smiled. He had large, very protruding teeth because of a bad occlusion and receding jaw. It was because of that that he mumbled so much. Forrest Graham ain't afraid of wanders, he repeated, or even brigands. Forrest Graham's is poor. He's a poor thing. 
Forrest Gramps is peaceful. He don't disturb no one, eh? He smiled again. When he smiled, he seemed to be all front teeth. And you, young lass, aren't you afraid of Forrest Gramps? Siri snorted. I'm not. Just imagine. I'm not the fearful kind either. He <laughs> he well, I never. He took a pace towards her, resting on his stick. Kelpie snorted. Siri tugged on the reins. She doesn't like strangers, she warned. And she bites. He <laughs> he, first Gramps knows. Bad and ruly mare. Where are you riding from, miss? Where are you heading, may I ask? It's a long story. Where does this road lead? Don't you know that, miss? Don't answer questions with questions, if you don't mind. Where will that road take me? What place is this in any case? And what time is it? The old man stuck his teeth out again, moving them like a koipu. Hey, hey, he mumbled. Well, I never. What time, you ask, miss? Oh, I see you've travelled from far away. From far away to Forest Gramps, miss. From quite far away indeed. She nodded indifferently. From other places and times? He completed a sentence. Gramps knows. Gramps guessed. What? She asked excited. What did you guess? What do you know? Forrest Gramps knows much. Speak. Mess must be hungry. He stuck out his teeth. Thirsty? Fatigued? If you want, miss, Forrest Gramps will take you to his cottage. Feed you, give you a drink, take you in. For a long time, Siri hadn't had the time or the peace of mind to think about rest or food. Now the words of the strange old man tightened up her stomach, knotted up her guts and tied up her tongue. The old man observed her from under the brim of his hat. Forrest Gramps, he mumbled, has meat in his cottage, has spring water and has hay for the mare, the bad mare that wanted to buy good old Gramps, hey? Everything is in Forrest Gramps' cottage. Uh, we'll be able to talk about other places and times. It's not far at all, oh no. Will the young traveller avail herself? Bump to stay in a visit to poor old Grams. Siri swallowed. Lead on. Forrest Gramps turned around and shambled down a barely visible path among the thicket, measuring off the road with energetic swings of his stick. Siri rode behind him, dipping her head under branches and reining Kelpie back. The mare was indeed determined to bite the old man, or at least eat his hat. In spite of his assurances, it wasn't near at all. When they got there, to a clearing, the sun was almost at its zenith. Gramp's cottage turned out to be a picturesque shack on stilts, with a roof that had clearly often been patched up using whatever happened to be to hand. The shack's walls were covered with hides resembling pigskin, in front of the cottage, there was a wooden construction shaped like a gallows, a low table and a chopping stump with an axe stuck in it. Behind the cottage was a hearth made of stones and clay with a large blackened cauldron on it. This is far as Graham's home. The old man indicated with his stick, not without pride. Far as Graham's lives here. He sleeps here. He cooks vettles here. Should he have something to cook? It's a hardship. A severe hardship to get vittles in the forest. Does Miss Wanderer like pearl barley? She does. Siri swallowed again. She likes everything. With a bit of meat, with some grease, with scratchings. Mm-hmm. And it don't look. Gramps shot her an appraising glance. That Miss has lately tasted meat and scratchings often. Oh, no. You're skinny, Miss. Skinny. Skin and bones. <laughs> And what's that behind your back, miss? Siri looked around, taken in by the oldest and most primitive trick in the book. A terrible blow of the gnarled stick caught her right in the temple. Her reflexes helped only in that she raised her arm and her hand partly cushioned a blow capable of smashing her skull like an egg. But in any case, Siri ended up on the ground, stunned, bewildered, and completely disorientated. Gramps, grinning, leapt at her, and struck her again with the stick. Siri once again managed to shield her head with her hands, with the result that both flopped down inertly. The left one was definitely injured, the metacarpals probably shattered. Gramps, leaping forward, attacked from the other side and whacked her in the stomach with his stick. 
She screamed, curling up into a ball. Then he stooped on her like a hawk, turned her over face downwards, and pinned her down with his knees. Siri tensed up, kicked back hard, missing, then delivered a vicious blow with her elbow, this time hitting the target. Gramps roared furiously and smashed her in the back of the head with his fist so powerfully she lurched face first into the sand. He seized her by the hair on her nape and pressed her mouth and nose against the ground. She felt herself suffocating. The old man kneeled on her, still pressing her head against the ground, tore the sword from her back and cast it aside. Then he began to fiddle with his trousers. He found the buckle and unfastened it. Siri howled, choking and spitting sand. He pushed her down harder, immobilizing her, entangling her hair in his fist. He tore her trousers off her with a powerful tug. <laughs> hey, he mumbled, wheezing. And hasn't Gramps got a nice bit of stuff? Oh, Gramps hasn't had one like this for a long, long time. Siri, feeling the repulsive touch of his dry, claw-like hand, yelled with her mouth full of sand and pine needles. I still miss. She heard him slavering, kneading her buttocks. Gramps isn't as young as he was. Not right away, slowly. But never fear. Gramps will do what's to be done. <laughs> and then Gramps will eat his fill. Hey, his fill. Lavishly. He broke off, roared and squealed. Feeling that his grip had eased off, Siri kicked, jerked and leapt up like a spring and saw what had happened. Kelpie, creeping up noiselessly, had seized Forrest Gramps in her teeth by his cue and almost lifted him into the air. The old man howled and squealed, struggled, kicked and wriggled his legs, finally managing to tear himself free, leaving the long grey lock of hair in the mare's teeth. He tried to grab his stick, but Siri kicked it out of range of his hands. She was about to treat him to another kick where he deserved it, but her movements were hindered by her trousers being halfway down her thighs. Gramps made good use of the time it took her to pull them up one-handed. He was by the stump in a few bounds and jerked the axe from it, driving the determined Kelpie away with a swing. He roared, stuck out his awful teeth and attacked Siri, raising the axe to strike. Gramps is gonna fuck you, miss, he howled wildly. Even if Gramps has to chop you up into pieces first, it's all the same to Gramps if you're in one piece or in portions. She thought she'd cope with him easily. After all, he was a decrepit old geezer. She was very much mistaken. In spite of his enormous slippers, he jumped like a spinning top, hopped like a rabbit, and swung the axe with the bent handle like a butcher. After the dark and sharpened blade had literally grazed her several times, Siri realized that the only thing that could save her was to run away. But she was rescued by a coincidence. Stepping back, she knocked her foot against her sword. She picked it up in a flash. Drop the axe, she panted, drawing Swallow from the scabbard with a hiss. Drop the axe onto the ground, you lecherous old man. Then, who knows, perhaps I'll spare your life and not cut you into pieces. He stopped. He was panting and wheezing, and his beard was disgustingly covered in saliva. He didn't drop his weapon, though. She saw savage fury in his eyes. Very well. She swung her sword in a hissing moulinet. Meek my day. For a moment, he looked at her as though not understanding. Then he stuck out his teeth, goggled, roared, and lunged at her. Siri had had enough of fooling around. She dodged him with a swift half turn and cut from below across both his raised arms above the elbows. Gramps released the axe from his bloodied hands, but immediately jumped at her again. She leapt aside and slashed him in the nape of the neck. More out of mercy than need, he would soon have bled to death from his two severed brachial arteries. He lay, fighting unbelievably hard not to give up his life, still writhing like a worm in spite of his cloven vertebrae. Siri stood over him. The last grains of sand were still grating in her teeth. She spat them out, straight onto his back. He was dead before she finished spitting. The strange construction in front of the cottage resembling a gallows was equipped with iron hooks and a block and tackle. The table and chopping block were worn smooth, sticky with grease and reeked horribly, like a shambles. 
In the kitchen, Siri found a cauldron of the pearl barley he had offered her, swimming in grease, full of pieces of meat and mushrooms. She was very hungry, but something told her not to eat it. She only drank some water from a wooden pail and nibbled a small wrinkled apple. Behind the shack, she found a cellar with steps, deep and cool. In the cellar stood pots of lard. Something was hanging from the ceiling. The remains of a side of meat. She ran out of the cellar, stumbling on the steps as though devils were pursuing her, then fell over in some nettles, jumped up and ran tottering over to the cottage, grabbing with both hands one of the stilts supporting it. Although she had almost nothing in her stomach, she vomited very spasmodically for a very long time. The side of meat hanging in the cellar belonged to a child. Led by the strong smell, she found a water-filled hollow in the forest into which the prudent forest gramps would throw scraps of what it wasn't possible to eat. Looking at the skulls, ribs and pelvises sticking out of the ooze, Siri realized with horror that she was only alive thanks to the ghastly old man's lecherousness, only owing to the fact that he had felt like frolicking. Had his hunger been more powerful than his despicable sexual urges, he would have hit her treacherously with the axe, not the stick. Suspended by the legs from the wooden gallows, he would have disemboweled and skinned her, dressed and divided her on the table, chopped her up on the chopping block. Although she was unsteady on her feet from giddiness and her left hand was swollen and pain was shooting through it, she dragged the corpse to the hollow in the forest and pushed it into the stinking slime among the bones of his victims. She returned, covered up the entrance to the cellar with branches and twigs and the yard and entire small holding with brushwood. Then she meticulously set fire to it all from four sides. She only rode away once it had thoroughly caught fire, when the fire was raging and roaring satisfactorily, when she was certain that no rain showers would interfere with all traces of that place being obliterated. Her hand wasn't in such bad shape. It was swollen. Indeed, it hurt awfully, but probably no bones were broken. As evening approached, only one moon indeed rose. But somehow, strangely, Siri didn't feel like considering this world hers, nor staying in it longer than need be. It'll be a good night tonight, murmured Nimu. I can sense it. Conwiramur sighed. The horizon blazed gold and red. There was a stripe of the same color on the lake from the horizon to the island. They sat in armchairs on the terrace, with the looking glass in the ebony frame and the tapestry depicting the old castle, hugging a rock wall behind them, looking at themselves in the mountain lake. How many evenings, thought Condwiramures, how many evenings have we sat like this until dusk has fallen, and later, in the dark, without any results, just talking? It was getting cool. The sorceress and the novice covered themselves with furs. From the lake they heard the creaking of the rollocks of Fisher King's boat, but they couldn't see it. It was obscured by the brilliance of the sunset. I quite often dream, Condwiramures returned to their interrupted conversation, that I'm in an icy wasteland, where there's nothing but the white of the snow and mounds of ice glistening in the sun. And there's a silence. A silence ringing in the ears, an unnatural silence. The silence of death. Nimu nodded, as though to indicate she knew what was meant, but she didn't comment. Suddenly, continued the novice, suddenly I feel I can hear something, that I feel the ice tremble beneath my feet. I kneel down, rake aside the snow. The ice is as transparent as glass, as in some clear mountain lakes, when the pebbles at the bottom and the fish swimming can be seen through a layer two yards thick. In my dream, I can also see, although the layer of ice is dozens or perhaps hundreds of yards thick. It doesn't stop me seeing and hearing people calling for help. At the bottom, deep beneath the ice, is a frozen world. 
Nemu didn't comment this time either. Of course, I know what the source of that dream is, continued the novice. Aislinna's prophecy, the infamous white frost, the time of frost and the wolfish blizzard. The world dying among the snows and ice, in order, as the prophecy says, to be born again centuries later, cleansed and better. I believe deeply, said Nemo softly, that the world will be born again. Whether into something better, not particularly. I beg your pardon? You heard me. Didn't I miss here? Nemo, the white frost has already been prophesied thousands of times. Every time the winter is severe, it's been said that it has come. Right now, even children don't believe that any winter is capable of endangering the world. Well, well, children don't believe. But I, just imagine, do. Based on any rational premises, asked Conwirimus with a slight sneer, or only on a mystical faith in the infallibility of elven predictions. Nemu said nothing for a long while, picking at the fur she was draped in. The earth, she finally began in a slightly sermonizing tone, has a spherical shape and orbits the sun. Do you agree with that? Or perhaps you belong to one of those fashionable sects that try to prove something utterly different. No, I don't. I accept heliocentrism, and I agree with the theory of the spherical shape of the Earth. Excellent. You are sure then to agree with the fact that the vertical axis of the globe is tilted at an angle, and the path of the Earth around the Sun doesn't have the shape of a regular circle, but is elliptical? I learned about it, but I'm not an astronomer, so you don't have to be an astronomer. It's enough to think logically. The Earth circles the Sun in an elliptical-shaped orbit, and so, during its revolution, sometimes it's closer and sometimes further away. The further the Earth is from the Sun, the colder it is on it. That must be logical. And the less the world's axis deviates from the perpendicular, the less light reaches the northern hemisphere. That's also logical. Both those factors... I mean, the ellipticalness of the orbit and the degree of tilt of the world's axis are subject to changes, as can be observed, cyclical ones. The ellipse may be more or less elliptical, that is, stretched out and elongated, and the Earth's axis may be less or more tilted. Extreme conditions, as far as climate is concerned, are caused by a simultaneous occurrence of the two phenomena. The maximum elongation of the ellipse and only an insignificant deviation of the axis from the vertical. The Earth, orbiting the Sun, receives very little light and heat at the aphelium, and the polar regions are additionally harmed by the disadvantageous angle of tilt of the axis. Naturally, less light in the northern hemisphere means the snow lies longer. White and shining snow reflects sunlight. The temperature falls even more. The snow lies even longer because of that. It doesn't melt at all in greater and greater stretches or only melts for a short time. The more snow and the longer it lies, the greater the white and shining reflective surface. I understand. The snow's falling. It's falling and falling. And there's more and more of it. So observe that masses of warm air drift with the sea currents from the south, which condense over the frozen northland. The warm air condenses and falls as snow. The greater the temperature differences, the heavier the falls. The heavier the falls, the more white snow that doesn't melt for a long time, and the colder it is. The greater the temperature difference, and the more abundant the condensation of the masses of air, I understand. The snow cover becomes heavy enough to become compacted ice, a glacier, on which, as we now know, snow continues to fall, pressing it down even more. The glacier grows. It's not only thicker and thicker, but it spreads outwards, covering greater and greater expanses, white expanses, reflecting the sun's rays. Kunwira Muir's nodded, becoming colder, colder and even colder. The white frost prophesied by Aislina. But is a cataclysm possible? Is there really a danger that the ice that has lain in the north forever will all of a sudden flow south? crushing, compressing and covering everything. How fast does the ice cap spread at the pole? 
a few inches annually? As you surely know, said Nemu, eyes fixed on the lake. The only port in the Gulf of Praxeda that doesn't freeze is Pont Vanis. Yes, I'm aware. Enriching your knowledge, a hundred years ago, none of the Gulf's ports used to freeze. A hundred years ago, there are numerous accounts of it. Cucumbers and pumpkins used to grow in Talgar, and sunflowers and lupins were cultivated in Cairngorm. They aren't cultivated now, since their growth is impossible. It's simply too cold there. And did you know that there were once vineyards in Kaidwin? The wines from those vines probably weren't the best, because it appears from the surviving documents that they were very cheap. But local poets sung their praises anyway. Today, vines don't grow in Kaidwin at all, because today's winters, unlike the former ones, bring hard frosts, and a hard frost kills vines. It doesn't just retard growth, it simply kills, destroys. I understand. Yes, Nemo reflected. What more is there to add? Perhaps that it snows in Talgar in the middle of November and drifts south at a speed of more than fifty miles a day. That at the end of December and the beginning of January, snowstorms occur by the Alba, where still, a hundred years ago, snow was a sensation. And that every child knows that the snows melt and the lakes thaw in April in our region, don't they? And every child wonders why that month is called April. The opening. Didn't it surprise you? Not especially, admitted Condwir Muse. Anyway, at home in Vicovaro, we didn't say April, but false bloom, or in the elven, Virka. But I understand what you're implying. The name of the month comes from ancient times when everything really did bloom in April. Those distant times are all a hundred, a hundred and twenty years ago. That's virtually yesterday, girl. Eithlina was absolutely right. Her prophecy will be fulfilled. The world will perish beneath a layer of ice. Civilization will perish through the fault of the destroyer, who could have, who had the opportunity to open a path to hope. It is known from legend that she didn't. For reasons that the legend doesn't explain, or explains with the help of a vague and naive moral. That's true, but the fact remains a fact. The white frost is a fact. The civilization of the northern hemisphere is doomed to extinction. It will vanish beneath the ice of a spreading glacier, beneath permanent pack ice and snow. There's no need to panic, though, because it'll take some time before it happens. The sun had completely set, and the blinding glare had disappeared from the surface of the lake. Now a streak of softer, paler light lay down on the water. The moon rose over Innisvitra, as bright as a gold sovereign chopped in half. How long? Conwiramuas asked. How long, uh, according to you, will it take? I mean, how much time do we have? A good deal. How much, Nimu? Some three thousand years. On the lake, the fisher king banged his oar down in the boat and swore. Conwiramuas sighed loudly. You've reassured me a little, she said after a while. But only a little. The next place was one of the foulest Siri had visited. It certainly appeared in the top ranking and at the top of that ranking. It was a port, a port channel. She saw boats and galleys by jetties and posts, saw a forest of masts, saw sails sagging heavily in the still air. Smoke, clouds of stinking smoke, were creeping and hanging all around. Smoke also rose from behind crooked shacks by the channel. The loud, broken crying of a child could be heard from there. Kelpie snorted, jerking her head sharply, and stepped back, banging her hooves on the cobbles. Siri glanced down and noticed some dead rats. They were lying everywhere. Dead rodents contorted in agony with pale pink paws. Something's not right here, she thought, feeling horror gripping her. Something's wrong here. Get out of here. Run from here as quickly as possible. A man in a gaping shirt was sitting under hanging nets and lines, 
his head resting on his shoulder. A few paces away lay another. They didn't look as if they were asleep. They didn't even twitch when Kelpie's horseshoes clattered on the stones right next to them. Siri bowed her head, riding under the rags hanging from washing lines and giving off an acrid odor of filth. There was a cross on the door of one of the shacks, painted in whitewash. Black smoke left a trail in the air behind the roof. The child was still crying. Somebody shouted in the distance. Somebody closer coughed and wheezed. A dog howled. Siri felt her hand itching. She looked down. Her hand was flecked with the black dots of fleas like caraway seeds. She screamed at the top of her voice, shaking all over in horror and revulsion. She began to brush herself off, waving her arms wildly. Kelpie, alarmed, burst into a gallop, and Siri almost fell off. Squeezing the mare's sides with her thighs, she combed and ran her fingers through her hair. She shook her jacket and blouse. Kelpie galloped into a smoke-enveloped alleyway. Siri screamed with terror. She rode through hell, through an inferno, through the most nightmarish of nightmares, among houses marked with white crosses, among smouldering piles of rags, among the dead lying singly, and those who lay in heaps one upon the other, and among living, ragged, half-naked spectres with cheeks sunken from pain, groveling through dung, screaming in a language she didn't understand, stretching out towards her bony arms covered in horrible, bloody pustules. Run! Run from here! Even in the black nothingness, in the oblivion of the archipelago of places, Siri could still smell that smoke and stench in her nostrils. The next place was also a port. There was also a quay here, with a piled canal, busy with cogs, launches and other craft, and above them a forest of masts. But here, in this place, above the masts, seagulls were cheerfully screeching, and it stank in a normal, familiar way, of wet wood, pitch, seawater, and also fish in all its three basic varieties, fresh, rotten and fried. Two men were arguing on the deck of a cog, shouting over each other in raised voices. She understood what they were saying. It was about the price of herrings. Not far away was a tavern. The odour of mustiness and beer and the sound of voices, clanking and laughter, belched from the open door. Someone roared out a filthy song, the same verse the whole time. Lined vartele in a hearse, in a me in spurs. She knew where she was, before she'd even read on the stern of one of the galleys, Eval Mure, and its home port, Bachala. She knew where she was, in Nilfgaard. She fled before anyone could pay more close attention to her. But before she managed to dive into nothingness, a flea, the last of the ones that had crawled all over her in the previous place, that had survived the journey in time and space, nestled in a fold of her jacket, leapt a great flea leap onto the wharf. That same evening, the flea settled into the mangy coat of a rat, an old male, the veteran of many rat fights, testified to by one ear chewed off right by its skull. That same evening, the flea and the rat embarked on a ship, and the next morning set sail on a voyage, on a barge, old, neglected, and very dirty. The barge was called Katrina. That name was to pass into history, but no one knew that then. The next place, difficult though it was to believe, was a truly astonishingly idyllic scene. A thatched tavern grown over with wild vines, ivy and sweet peas stood among hollyhocks by a peaceful lazy river flowing among willows, alders and oaks bent over the water, right beside a bridge connecting the banks with its elegant stone arch. A sign with gilded letters on it swung over the porch. The letters were completely foreign to Siri, but there was quite a well-executed picture of a cat, so she assumed it was the Black Cat Tavern. The scent of food drifting from the tavern was simply captivating. Siri did not ponder for long. She straightened her sword on her back and entered. It was empty inside. Only one of the tables was occupied by three men with the appearance of peasants. They didn't even look at her. 
Siri sat down in the corner with her back to the wall. The innkeeper, a corpulent woman in a perfectly clean apron and horned cap, approached and asked about something. Her voice sounded jangling but melodic. Siri pointed a finger at her open mouth, patted herself on the stomach, after which she cut off one of the silver buttons on her jacket and laid it on the table. Seeing a strange glance, she set to cutting off another button, but the woman stopped her with a gesture and a hissing, though nicely ringing word. The value of a button turned out to be a bowl of thick vegetable soup, an earthenware pot of beans and smoked bacon, bread and a jug of watered-down wine. Siri thought she'd probably burst into tears at the first spoonful, but she controlled herself. She ate slowly, delighting in the food. The innkeeper came over, jingling questioningly, and laid her cheek on her pressed-together hands. Would she stay the night? I don't know, said Siri. Perhaps. In any case, thank you for the offer. The woman smiled and went out into the kitchen. Siri unfastened her belt and rested her back against the wall. She wondered what to do next. The place, particularly compared to the last few, was pleasant and encouraged her to stay longer. She knew, though, that excessive trust could be dangerous and lack of vigilance fatal. A black cat, exactly like the one on the inn sign, appeared from nowhere and rubbed against her calf, arching its back. She stroked it, and the cat gently butted her palm, sat down, and began licking the fur on its breast. Siri gazed into space, her sight drifting elsewhere. She saw Yara sitting by the fireplace in a circle of some unattractive-looking scruffs. They were all knocking over small vessels containing a red liquid. Yara? That's what you should do, said the boy, looking into the flames of the fire. I read about it in The History of Wars, a work written by Marshal Pellegrim. You should do that when the motherland is in need. What should you do? Spill blood? Yes, precisely. The motherland is calling, and partly for personal reasons. Siri, don't sleep in the saddle, says Yennefer. We're almost there. There are large crosses painted in whitewash on the houses of the town they are arriving in, on all the doors and gates. Thick, reeking smoke. Smoke is billowing from pyres with corpses burning on them. Yennefer seems not to notice it. I have to make myself beautiful. A small mirror is floating in front of her face, over the horse's ears. A comb is dancing in the air, tugging through her black curls. Yennefer is using witchcraft. She doesn't use her hands at all, because... Because her hands are a mass of clotted blood. Mummy, what have they done to you? Stand up, girl, says Cohen. Master your pain. Get up and onto the comb. Otherwise fear will seize you. Do you want to be dying of fear all your life? His yellow eyes shine unpleasantly. He yawns. His pointed teeth flash white. It's not Cohen at all. It's the cat. The black cat. A column of soldiers many miles long are marching. A forest of spears and standards sways and undulates over them. Yara also marches. He has a round helmet on his head and a pike on his shoulder so long he has to clutch it tightly in both hands, otherwise it would overbalance him. The drums growl and the soldiers' song booms and rumbles. Crows cawr above the column. A mass of crows. A lakeshore. On the beach, white caps of whipped up foam, rotten reeds washed up. An island on the lake. A tower. Toothed battlements, a keep thickened by the protrusions of machulations. Over the tower, in the darkening blue of the sky, the moon shines, as bright as a gold sovereign chopped in half. Two women wrapped in furs sit on the terrace. A man in a boat. A looking glass and a tapestry. Siri jerks her head up. Eredin Brech Lass is sitting opposite on the other side of the table. You can't not know, he says, showing his even teeth in a smile, that you're only delaying the inevitable. You belong to us and we'll catch you. Like hell! You will return to us. You will roam a little around places and times, 
Then you'll reach the spiral and we'll catch you in it. You will never return to your world or time. It's too late in any case. There's nothing for you to return to. The people you knew died long ago. Their graves are overgrown and have caved in. Their names have been forgotten. Your name also. You're lying. I don't believe you. Your beliefs are your private matter. I repeat, you will soon reach the spiral and I'll be waiting there for you. You desire that secretly, don't you? Mia Lina Lunet. You've got to be talking rubbish. We A and L sense things like that. You were fascinated by me. You desired me and feared that desire. You desired me and you still desire me, Zirel. Me, my hands, my touch. Feeling a touch, she leapt up, knocking over a cup which was fortunately empty. She reached for her sword, but calmed down almost at once. She was in the black cat inn. She must have dropped off, dozing on the table. The hand that had touched her hair belonged to the portly innkeeper. Siri wasn't fond of that kind of familiarity, but kindness and goodness simply radiated from the woman, which she couldn't pay back with brusqueness. She let herself be stroked on the head and listened to the melodic, jingling speech with a smile. She was weary. I must write, she said at last. The woman smiled, jingling melodiously. How does it happen? thought Siri. What can it be ascribed to? That in all worlds, places and times, in all languages and dialects, that one word always sounds comprehensible and always similar? Yes, I must ride to my mama. My mama is waiting for me. The innkeeper led her out into the courtyard. Before she found herself in the saddle, the innkeeper suddenly hugged Siri hard, pressing her against her plump breast. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Forward, Kelpie. She rode straight for the arched bridge over the tranquil river. When the mayor's horseshoes rang on the stones, she looked around. The woman was still standing outside the inn. Concentration. Fists at her temples. A buzzing in her ears as though from the inside of a conch. A flash. And abruptly, soft and black nothingness. Bonne chance, ma fille. Thérèse Lapin, the innkeeper of the tavern, au chat noir in Pensorion, cried after her by the highway running from Melon to Auxerre. Have a pleasant journey. Concentration. Fists at her temples. A buzzing in her ears as though from the inside of a conch. A flash. And abruptly. Soft and black nothingness. A place. A lake. An island. The moon like a sovereign hacked in half. Its light lies down on the water in a luminous streak. In the streak, a boat. On it, a man with a fishing rod. On the terrace of the tower. Two women? Condwyrimuers couldn't bear it and screamed in amazement immediately covering her mouth with her hand. The fisher king dropped the anchor with a splash, swore gruffly, and then opened his mouth and froze like that. Nemu didn't even twitch. The surface of the lake, bisected by a streak of moonlight, vibrated and rippled as though having been struck by a gale. The night air above the lake ruptured like a smashed stained glass window cracks. A black horse emerged from the crack with a rider on its back. Nimu calmly held out her hands, chanting a spell. The tapestry hanging on the stand suddenly burst into flames, lighting up in an extravaganza of tiny multicolored lights. The tiny lights reflected in the oval of the looking glass, danced, teemed in the glass like colored beads, and suddenly flowed out like a rainbow-colored apparition, a widening streak making everything as bright as day. The black mare reared up and neighed wildly. Nimu spread wide her arms violently and screamed a formula. Condwyrimures, seeing the image forming and growing in the air, focused intently. 
The image gained in clarity at once. It became a portal, a gate beyond which was visible a plateau full of shipwrecks, a castle embedded in the sharp rocks of a cliff towering over the black-looking glass of a mountain lake. This way, Nemo screamed piercingly. This is the way you must take, Siri, daughter of Pavetta. Enter the portal. Take the road leading to your encounter with destiny. May the wheel of time close. May the serpent Aroboros sink its teeth into its own tail. Roam no more. Hurry. Hurry to help your friends. This is the right way, O oh Witcher girl. The mare whinnied again, flailed the air with its hooves once more. The girl in the saddle turned her head, looking now at them, now at the image called up by the tapestry and the looking glass. She brushed her hair aside, and Conwirimures saw the ugly scar on her cheek. Trust me, Siri, cried Nemo, for you know me. You saw me once. I remember, they heard. I trust you. Thank you. They saw the mare spurred on and running with a light and dancing step into the brightness of the portal. Before the image became blurred and dispersed, they saw the ashen-haired girl wave a hand turned towards them in the saddle. And then everything vanished. The surface of the lake slowly calmed. The streak of moonlight became smooth again. It was so quiet, they felt they could hear the Fisher King's wheezing breath. Holding back the tears welling up in her eyes, Kondwiramuers hugged Nimu tightly. She felt the little sorceress tremble. They remained in an embrace for some time, without a word. Then they both turned around towards the place where the gate of the worlds had vanished. Good luck, witcher girl, they cried in unison. Good luck. Close by that field where the fierce battle took place, where almost the whole force of the North clashed with almost the entire might of the Nilfgaardian invader, were two fishing villages, Old Bottoms and Brenner. Because, however, Brenner was burned down to the ground at that time, it caught on at first to call it the Battle of Old Bottoms. Today, nonetheless, no one says anything other than the Battle of Brenner, and there are two reasons for that. Primo, after being rebuilt, Brenner is today a large and prosperous settlement, while Old Bottoms did not resist the ravages of time, and all trace of it was covered over by nettles, cooch grass, and burdock. Secundo, somehow that name did not befit that famous, memorable, and, at the same time, tragic battle. For just ask yourself, here was a battle in which more than 30,000 men laid down their lives, and if bottoms was not enough, they had to be old as well. Thus, in all the historical and military literature, it became customary only to write the Battle of Brenner, both in the North and in Nilfgaardian sources, of which, nota bene, there are many more than ours. The venerable Yara of Elander, the Elder. Annales Sucronicae Incliti Regni Temeriae. Chapter 8 Cadet Fitz Osterlen Fail. Please sit down. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that lack of knowledge about famous and important battles from the history of our fatherland is embarrassing for every patriot and good citizen, but in the case of a future officer is simply a scandal. I shall take the liberty of making one more small observation, Cadet Fitz Osterlin. For twenty years, that is, since I've been a lecturer at this institution, I don't recall a diploma exam in which a question about the Battle of Brenner hasn't come up. Thus, ignorance in this regard virtually rules out any chances of a career in the army. Well, but if one is a baron, one doesn't have to be an officer. One can try one's luck in politics or in diplomacy. 
which I sincerely wish for you, Cadet Fitz Austerlin. And let's return to Brenner, gentlemen. Cadet Putkama. Present. Please come to the map and continue, from the point where eloquence gave up on the Lord Baron. Yes, sir. The reason Field Marshal Menno Cohorn decided to execute a maneuver and a rapid march westwards were the reports from reconnaissance informing that the army of the Nordlings was coming to the relief of the besieged fortress of Mayenna. The marshal decided to cut off the Nordlings' progress and force them into a decisive battle. To this end, he divided the forces of the center army group. He left some of his men at Mayenna and set off at a rapid march with the rest of his troops. Cadet Putkama, you aren't a novelist. You are to be an officer. What kind of expression is the rest of his troops? Please give me the exact ordre de bataille of Marshal Cohorn's strike force, using military terminology. Yes, Captain. Field Marshal Cohorn had two armies under his command. The 4th Horse Army, commanded by Major General Marcus Brabant, our school's patron. Very good, Cadet Putkama. Dem toady, hissed Cadet Fitz Austerlin from his desk. And the 3rd Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Retz de Melistoc. The 4th Horse Army consisted of, numbering over 20,000 soldiers, the Venendal Division, the Marnia Division, the Frunsberg Division, the 2nd Vicovarian Brigade, the 3rd Derlenian Brigade, and the Nausicaa and Vrihez Divisions. The 3rd Army consisted of the Albert Division, the Dithwin Division, and, um, and the... The Ardfen Division, stated Julia Pretty Kitty about a Marco. If you haven't balls down anything up, of course. They definitely had a large silver sun on their gonfalon. Yes, Colonel, stated the reconnaissance commander firmly. Without doubt they did. Hard fen, murmured Pretty Kitty. Hmm, interesting. That would mean that not only the horse army, but also part of the third are coming for us in those columns you supposedly saw. No, sir, nothing on faith alone. I have to see it with my own eyes. Captain, during my absence, you command the company. I order you to send a liaison officer to Colonel Pangrat. But, Colonel, is that wise, to go yourself? That's an order. Yes, sir. It's sheer lunacy, Colonel. The commander of the reconnaissance outshouted the rush of the gallop. We might run into some elven patrol. Don't talk. Lead on. The small troop galloped hard down the gorge, flashed like the wind down the stream's valley and rushed into a forest. Here they had to slow down. The undergrowth impeded riding, and furthermore, they were indeed in danger of suddenly happening upon reconnaissance troops or pickets, which the Nilf Guardians had undoubtedly sent. The party of mercenaries had admittedly stolen up on the enemy from the flank, not head-on, but the flanks were certainly also guarded. The game was thus as risky as hell. But Pretty Kitty liked games like that and there wasn't a soldier in the entire free company who wouldn't have followed her all the way to hell. It's here, said the commander of the reconnaissance. The tower. Julia Abatamarco shook her head. The tower was crooked, ruined, bristling with broken beams, forming a latticework through which the wind, blowing from the west, played as though on a tin whistle. It wasn't known who had built the tower here, in a wilderness, or why but it was apparent it had been built a long time before. It won't collapse? Certainly not, Colonel. Sir wasn't used among the mercenaries of the Free Company, or Madam, only rank. Julia climbed to the top of the tower, almost running up. The reconnaissance commander only joined a minute later, panting like a bull covering a heifer. Leaning on the crooked railing, Pretty Kitty surveyed the valley using a telescope sticking her tongue between her lips and sticking out her shapely rear. The reconnaissance commander felt a quiver of excitement at the sight. He quickly controlled himself. Hard fin, there's no doubt. Julia Abatamarco licked her lips. I can also see Elan Trahe's Dialanians. There are also elves from the Vrieth Brigade, our old friends from Maribor and Maena. Ha ha! There are also the Death Heads, the famous Nazakea Brigade. I can also see the flames on the pennants of the Dithwin Armoured Division and a white standard with a black Alerion, the sign of the Alba Division. You recognize them? 
murmured the reconnaissance commander, as though they were friends. Are you so well informed? I'm a graduate of the military academy. Pretty Kitty cut him off. I'm a qualified officer. Good. I've seen what I wanted to see. Let's return to the company. The fourth and third horse are making for us, said Julia Abatamarco. I repeat, the whole of the fourth horse and probably the whole of the cavalry of the third army. A cloud of dust was rising into the sky behind the standards that I saw. By my reckoning, 40,000 horse are heading this way in those three columns, and maybe more, perhaps. Perhaps Kuhorn has divided up the center army group, finished Adam Adieu Pangrat, leader of the free company. He only took the fourth horse and the cavalry from the third, without infantry, in order to move quicker. Ha! Julia, were I in the place of Constable Natalis or King Faltis, I know. Pretty Kitty's eyes flashed. I know what you'd do. Have you sent runners to them? Naturally. Natalis is nobody's fool. Perhaps tomorrow, perhaps. Adieu didn't let her finish. And I even think that will happen. Spur your horse, Julia. I want to show you something. They rode a few furlongs quickly, pulling a long way ahead of the rest of the soldiers. The sun was almost touching the hills in the west. The wetland forests cloaked the valley in a long shadow. But enough could be seen for Pretty Kitty to guess at once what Adieu Pangrat had meant to show her. Here. Adieu confirmed her speculation standing up in the stirrups. I would engage the enemy here tomorrow if the command of the army were mine. Nice terrain, agreed Julia of Atamarco. Level, hard, smooth. There's room to form up. Hmm, from those hills to those fish ponds there, it'll be some three miles. That hill there is a perfect command position. You're right. And there, look in the center. There's one more small lake or fish pond. It's sparkling over there. It can be taken advantage of. That little river is suitable for a border because although it's small, it's marshy. What's that river called, Julia? We rode that way yesterday, didn't we? Do you remember? I've forgotten. I think it's the halter or something like that. Whoever knows those parts can easily imagine the whole thing. While to those who are less well-travelled, I shall reveal that the left wing of the royal army reached the place where today the settlement of Brenner is located. At the time of the battle, there was no settlement, for the year before it had been sent up in smoke by the squirrel elves and had burned down to the ground. For there, on the left wing, stood the Redanian Royal Corps, which the Count of Reuter was commanding, and there were eight thousand foot and front-line horse in that corps. The centre of the royal formation stood beside a hill later to be named Gallows Hill. There, on the hill, stood with their detachment King Faltist and Constable Jan Natalis, having a prospect of the whole battlefield from high up. Here the main forces of our army were gathered, twelve thousand brave Temerian and Redanian infantrymen, formed in four great squares, protected by ten cavalry companies, standing right at the northern end of the fish pond called Golden Pond by local folk. The central formation, meanwhile, had a reserve regiment in the second line, three thousand Vichimian and Mariborian foot, over which Voyevode Bronibor held command. From the southern edge of Golden Pond, however, up to the row of fish ponds and a bend in the river Chotla, to the marches a mile wide, stood the right wing of our army. The volunteer regiment formed of Mahakam dwarves, eight companies of light horse, and companies of the eminent free mercenary company. The condottiero, Adam Pangrat, and dwarf, Barclay Els, commanded the right wing. Field Marshal Menno Kuhorn deployed the Nilfgaardian army opposite them, about a mile or two away, on a bare field beyond the forest. Iron, hard men stood there like a black wall, regiment by regiment, company by company, squadron by squadron. Endless, it seemed, as far as the eye could see. 
and from the forest of standards and spears, one could deduce that it was not just a broad, but a deep array, for it was an army of six and forty thousand which few knew about at that time, and just as well, because at the sight of that Nilfgaardian might, many hearts sank somewhat, and hearts started to beat beneath the breastplates of even the bravest, started to beat like hammers, for it became patent that a heavy and bloody battle would soon begin, and many of those who stood in that array would not see the sunset. Yara, holding his spectacles which were sliding off his nose, read the entire passage of text once again, sighed, rubbed his pate, and then picked up a sponge, squeezing it a little and rubbing out the last sentence. The wind soughed in the leaves of a linden tree and bees buzzed. The children, as children will, tried hard to outshout one another. A ball which had rolled across the grass came to rest against the foot of the old man. Before he managed to bend over, clumsy and ungainly, one of his grandchildren flashed past like a little wolf cub, grabbing the ball in full flight. He knocked the table, which began to rock, and Yara saved the inkwell from falling over with his right hand, holding down the sheets of paper with the stump of his left. The bees buzzed, heavy with tiny yellow balls of acacia pollen. Yara took up his writing again. The morning was cloudy, but the sun broke through the clouds, and its height clearly signalled the passing of the hours. A wind got up. Pennants fluttered and flapped like flocks of birds taking flight, and Nilfgaard stood on. Stood on until everyone began to wonder why Marshal Menokuhorn did not give his order to march forward. When? Manokuhorn raised his head from the maps and turned his gaze on his commanders. When, you ask, will I give the order to begin? No one said anything. Menno quickly looked his commanders up and down. The most anxious and nervous seemed to be those who were going to remain in reserve. Ilentrahe, commander of the 7th Delanian, and Geis van Loo of the Nausicaa Brigade. Uda de Wingalt, the marshal's aide-de-camp, who had the least chance of active involvement in the fighting, was also nervous. Those who were to strike first looked composed. Why, even bored. Marcus Brybant was yawning. Lieutenant General Retz de Melistoke kept sticking his little finger in his ear, pulling it out and looking at it, as though really expecting to find something worthy of his attention. Oberst Raymond Tirkenel, the young commander of the Ardfein Division, whistled softly fixing his gaze on a point on the horizon known only to him. Oberst Liam at Moss of the Dithwin Division turned the pages of his ever-present slim volume of poetry. Tibor Egebracht of the Alba Heavy Lances scratched the back of his neck with the end of a riding crop. We shall begin the attack, said Kuhorn, as soon as the patrols return. Those hills to the north trouble me, gentlemen. Before we strike, I must know what is behind them. Lamar Flout was afraid. He was terribly afraid, and the fear was creeping over his innards. It seemed to him he had at least twelve slimy eels covered in stinking mucus in his intestines, doggedly searching for an opening they would be able to escape through. An hour earlier, when the patrol had received its orders and set off, Flout had hoped deep down that the cool of the morning would drive away the terror, hoped that routine practiced ritual, the hard and severe ceremony of service would quell the fear. He was disappointed. Only now, after an hour had passed and after travelling some five miles, far, dangerously far from his comrades, deep, hazardously deep in enemy territory, close, mortally close to unknown danger, had the fear showed what it was capable of. They stopped at the edge of a fir forest, prudently not emerging from behind the large juniper bushes growing at the edge. A wide basin stretched out before them, beyond a belt of low spruces. Fog trailed over the tops of the grass. No one, judged Flood. Not a soul. Let's go back. We're a little too far already. 
The sergeant looked at him askance. Far? We've barely ridden a mile, and crawling along like lame tortoises at that. It would be worth, he said, having a look beyond that hill, Lieutenant. I reckon the prospect will be better from there. A long way over both valleys. If someone's heading that way, we can't not see them. Well then, do we ride over, sir? It's no more than a few furlongs. A few furlongs, thought Flout. Over open ground, totally exposed. The eels squirmed, violently searching for a way out of his guts. At least one, Flout felt clearly, was well on its way. I heard the clank of a stirrup, the snorting of a horse. Over there among the vivid green of young pines on a sandy slope. Did something move there? A figure? Are they surrounding us? A rumour was going around the camp that a few days earlier, the mercenaries of the Free Company, having wiped out a patrol of the Vrieth Brigade in an ambush, had taken an elf alive. It was said they'd castrated him, torn his tongue out and cut off all his fingers, and finally gouged out his eyes. Now, they had jeered, you won't frolic with your elven whore in any fashion, and you won't even be able to watch her when she frolics with others. Well, sir, the sergeant cleared his throat. Shall we nip up that hill? Lamar Flout swallowed. No, he said. We cannot dally. We've ascertained it. There's no enemy here. We must give a dispatch on it to headquarters. Back we go. Menno Kuhorn listened to the dispatch and raised his head from the maps. To your companies, he ordered briefly. Mr. Brybant, Mr. Melis Stoke, attack. Long live the Emperor! yelled Tirkenel and Egebracht. Menno looked at them strangely. To your companies, he repeated. May the great sun enlighten your glory. Milo Vanderbeck, halfling, field surgeon, known as Rusty, greedily breathed into his nostrils the heady blend of the smells of iodine, ammonia, alcohol, ether, and magical elixirs hanging beneath the tent roof. He wanted to enjoy that aroma to the full now, while it was still healthy, pure, virginally uncontaminated and clinically sterile. He knew it wouldn't stay like that for long. He glanced at the operating table, also virginally white, and at the surgical instruments, at the dozens of tools which inspired respect and confidence by the cool and menacing dignity of their cold steel, the pristine cleanliness of the metal sheen the order and aesthetics of their arrangement. His staff, three women, busied themselves around the instruments. Rusty spat and made a correction in his thoughts. One woman and two girls. He spat again. One old, though beautiful and young-looking grandmother, and two children. A sorceress and healer called Marty Sodegren, and the volunteers, Shani, a student from Oxenfurt, Yola, a priestess from the Temple of Melitola in Elenda. I know Marty Sodegren, thought Rusty. I've already worked with that beauty more than once. A bit of a nymphomaniac, she's also prone to hysteria. But that's nothing, as long as her magic works. Anesthetic, disinfectant, and blood-staunching spells. Yola, a priestess, or rather a novice, a girl with looks as plain and dull as linen, with long, strong peasant hands. The temple had prevented those hands from becoming tainted by the ugly mark of heavy and dirty slogging on the soil. But it hadn't managed to disguise their descent. No, thought Rusty. I'm not afraid for her, by and large. Those peasant woman's hands are sure hands, trustworthy hands. Besides, girls from temples seldom disappoint, and they don't cave in at moments of despair, but seek comfort in religion, in their mystical faith. Interestingly, it helps. He glanced at red-haired Shani, nimbly threading curved needles with catgut. Shani, a child from reeking city backstreets who made it to the Academy of Oxenfurt thanks to her own thirst for knowledge and the unimaginable sacrifices of her parents in paying her fees. A schoolgirl, a jester, a cheerful scamp. What does she know? How to thread needles? Put on tourniquets? Hold retractors? Ha! 
The question is, when will the little redhead student faint, drop the retractors, and tumble nose first into the open belly of a patient being operated on? People aren't very hardy, he thought. I asked to be given an elf woman, or somebody from my own race, but no, there's no trust. Not towards me, either, as a matter of fact. I'm a halfling, an unhuman, a stranger. Shani. Yes, Mr. Van der Beek? Rusty. I mean, to you, it's Mr. Rusty. What's this, Shani? And what's it for? Are you testing me, Mr. Rusty? Answer, girl. It's a respiratory, for stripping the periosteum during amputations, so that the periosteum doesn't crack under the teeth of the saw, to make the sawing clean and smooth. Satisfied? Did I pass? Quiet, girl, quiet. He raked his fingers through his hair. Interesting, he thought. There are four of us doctors here, and each one's ginger. <laughs> Is it fate or what? Please step outside the tent, girls, he beckoned. They obeyed, though all of them snorted to themselves, each in her own way. Outside the tent sat a cluster of orderlies enjoying the last minutes of sweet idleness. Rusty cast a severe glance at them and sniffed to check if they were already plastered. A blacksmith, a huge fellow, was bustling around by his table, which resembled a torture chamber, and organizing his tools, which served to pull the wounded out of suits of armor, male shirts, and bent visors. In a moment, over there, began Rusty without introductions, indicating the field. People will start slaughtering each other, and a moment after that moment, the first casualties will appear. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do. Each one of us knows their duties and their place. If everyone obeys what they ought to obey, nothing can go wrong. Clear? None of the girls commented. Over there, continued Rusty, pointing again, almost a hundred thousand soldiers will begin to wound each other in very elaborate ways. There are, including the other two hospitals, twelve of us doctors. Not for all the world will we manage to help all those that are in need. Not even a scanty percentage of those in need. No one expects that. But we are going to treat them. Because it is, excuse the banality, our raison d'etre to help those in need. So we shall, banally, help as many as we manage to help. Once again, no one commented. Rusty turned around. We won't manage to do much more than we're capable of, he said more quietly and more warmly. But we shall all do our best to make sure it won't be much less. They've set off, stated Constable Jan Natalis, and wiped his sweaty hand on his hip. Your Majesty, Nilfgaard has set off. They're heading for us. King Foltest brought his dancing horse, a grey in a trapping decorated with lilies, under control. He turned his beautiful profile, worthy of featuring on coins, towards the constable. Then we must receive them with dignity. Constable, sir. Gentlemen. Death to the black cloaks, yelled the mercenary Adam Adio Pangrat and Graf de Reuter in unison. The constable looked at them, then straightened up and breathed in deeply. To your companies. From a distance, the Nilfgaardian war drums thundered dully. Crumhorns, olifants, and battle horns wailed. The ground, struck by thousands of hooves, shuddered. Here they come, said Andy Bibivelt, a halfling and the leader of the convoy, brushing the hair from his small pointed ear. Any moment! Tara Hildebrandt, Dee Dee Brewer Hofmeyer, and the other carters who were gathered around him nodded. They could also hear the dull, monotonous thud of hooves coming from behind the hill and forest. They could feel the trembling of the ground. The roar suddenly increased, jumping a tone higher. The archer's first salvo! Andy Bibervelt was experienced and had seen, or rather heard, many a battle. There'll be another. He was right. Now they'll clash. With... 
the g g and the guards, suggested William Hardbottom, known as Mumatek, fidgeting anxiously. I'm t t t t telling you. Bieberwelt and the other halflings looked at him with pity. Under the carts? What for? Nearly a quarter of a mile separated them from the site of the battle, and even if a patrol turned up here, at the rear, by the convoys, would hiding under a cart save anyone? The roaring and rumbling increased. Now, Andy Bieberwelt judged, and he was right again. A distinct macabre noise, which made the hair on their heads stand up, reached the ears of the Vittlers from a distance of a quarter of a mile, from beyond the hill and the forest, through the roaring and the sudden thud of iron smashing against iron. Squealing, the gruesome, desperate, wild squealing and shrieking of mutilated animals. The cavalry! Bibivelt licked his lips. The cavalry have impaled themselves on the pikes! I j j j j j just stammered out the pale Mumatek. Don't know how the horses are to blame. The, the horses. Yara rubbed out another sentence with a sponge. God only knew how many that made. He squinted his eyes, recalling that day, the moment the two armies clashed. When the two armies, like determined mastiffs, went for each other's throats, clenched in a mortal grip. He searched for words he could use to describe it. In vain. The wedge of cavalry rammed into the square. Like the thrust of a gigantic dagger, the Alba division crushed everything that was defending access to the living body of the Temerian infantry. The pikes, javelins, halberds, spears, pavises and shields. Like a dagger, the Alba division thrust into the living body and drew blood. Blood in which horses now splashed and slid. But the dagger's blade, though thrust in deep, hadn't reached the heart or any of the vital organs. The wedge of the Alba division, instead of smashing and dismembering the Temerian square, thrust in and became stuck. Became lodged in the elastic horde of foot soldiers as thick as pitch. At first, it didn't look dangerous. The head and sides of the wedge were made up of elite, heavily armoured companies, and the lanzknechts, edges and blades rebounded from the shields and armour plate like hammers from anvils, and neither was there any way to get through the barding of the steeds. And although every now and then one of the armoured men would tumble from his horse or with his horse, the swords, battle axes, hatchets and morning stars of the cavalrymen cut down the pressing infantrymen. Trapped in the throng, the wedge shuddered and began to drive in deeper. Alba! Second Lieutenant Devin Ab Mira heard the cry of Oberst Egebracht, soaring above the clanging, roaring, groaning and neighing. Forward, Alba! Long live the Emperor! They set off, hacking, clubbing and slashing. Beneath the hooves of the squealing and kicking horses was the sound of splashing, crunching, grinding and snapping. Alba! The wedge became caught again. The lanzknechts, although thinned out and bloodied, didn't yield, but pressed forward and gripped the cavalry like pliers. Until they cracked. Under the blows of halberds, battle axes and flails, the armoured troops of the front line caved in and broke. Jabbed by partisans and pikes, hauled from the saddle by the hooks of gizarm and bear spears, mercilessly pounded by iron balls and chains and clubs, the cavalrymen of the Alba division began to die. The wedge thrust into the square of infantry, which not long before had been menacing iron, cutting into a living body, was now like an icicle in a huge peasant fist. To Marier! For the king, boys! Kill the black cloaks! But neither was it coming easily to the lanzknechts. Alba didn't let itself be broken up. Swords and battle axes rose and fell, hacked and slashed, and the infantry paid a grim price in blood for every horseman knocked from the saddle. Oberst Egebracht, stabbed through a slit in his armour by a pike blade as thin as a bodkin, yelled and rocked in the saddle. Before anyone could help him, an awful blow of a flail swept him to the ground. The infantry teemed over him. The standard, with a black alerion bearing a gold perisonium on its chest, 
wobbled and fell. The armored soldiers, including also Second Lieutenant Devin Epmera, rushed over to it, hacking, hewing, trampling and yelling. I'd like to know, thought Devlin Epmera, tugging his sword out of the cloven kettle hat and skull of a Temerian lanzknecht. I'd like to know, he thought, deflecting with a sweeping blow the toothed blade of a geese arm which was stabbing at him. I'd like to know what all this is for. What's the point of it? And who's the cause of it? Ah, uh, and then the convent of the great master sorceresses gathered, our esteemed mothers, uh, whose memory will always live among us, for, um, the great master sorceresses of the first lodge decided to, uh, decided to... Novice abond, you are unprepared. Fail. Sit down. But I revised really... Sit down. Why the hell do we have to learn about this ancient history? muttered Abond, sitting down. Who's bothered about it today? And what use is it? Silence. Novice Nimu? Present, mistress, I can see that. Do you know the answer to the question? If you don't, sit down and don't waste my time. Yes, I do. Go on. So... The chronicles teach us that the convent of master sorceresses gathered at Bald Mountain Castle to decide on how to end the damaging war that the Emperor of the South was waging with the kings of the North. Esteemed Mother Azira, the Holy Martyr, said that the rulers would not stop fighting until they had lost a lot of men. And esteemed Mother Philippa, the Holy Martyr, answered, Let us then give them a great and bloody, awful and cruel battle. Let us bring about such a battle. Let the Emperor's armies and the King's forces run in blood in that battle, and then we, the Great Lodge, shall force them to make peace. And this is precisely what happened. The esteemed mothers caused the Battle of Brenner to happen, and the rulers were forced to sign the Peace of Sintra. Very good, novice Nimu. I'd have given you a star and acreage, had it not been for that so at the beginning of your contribution. We don't begin sentences with so. Sit down. And now, who'll tell us about the Peace of Sintra? The bell for the break rang, but the novices didn't react with immediate uproar and the banging of desktops. They maintained a peaceful and dignified silence. They weren't chits from the kindergarten now. They were third formers. They were fourteen. And that carried certain expectations. Ah, there's not much to add here. Rusty assessed the condition of the first wounded man who was right then sullying the immaculate white of the table. Crushed thigh bone. The artery is intact, otherwise they would have brought us a corpse. It looks like an axe blow, and at the same time the saddle's hard pommel acted like a woodcutter's chopping block. Please look. Shani and Yola bent over. Rusty rubbed his hands. As I said, nothing to add. All we can do is take away. To work. Yola, tonike, tightly. Shani, knife. Not that one. The double-bladed one for amputations. The wounded man couldn't tear his restless gaze from their hands, tracked their movements with the eyes of a terrified animal, caught in a snare. A little magic, Marty, if you please, nodded the halfling, leaning over the patient so as to fill his entire field of vision. I'm going to amputate, son. No, yelled the injured man thrashing his head around and trying hard to escape from Marty Sudegren's hands. I don't want to. If I don't amputate, you'll die. I'd rather die. The wounded man was speaking slower and slower under the effect of the healer's magic. I'd rather die than be a cripple. Let me die. I beg you, let me die. I can't. Rusty raised the knife, looked at the blade, at the still shining, immaculate steel. I can't let you die, for it so happens that I'm a doctor. He struck the blade in decisively and cut deeply. The wounded man howled, for a human, inhumanly. 
the messenger reined in his horse so hard that turf sprayed from its hooves. Two adjutants clutched the bridle and calmed down the foaming steed. The messenger dismounted. From whom? shouted Jan Natalis. From whom do you come? From Graf de Reuter, the messenger panted. We've held the black cloaks, but there are severe casualties. Graf de Reuter requests reinforcements. There are no reinforcements, the constable replied after a moment's silence. You must hold out. You must. And here, Rusty indicated with the expression of a collector showing off his collection. Please look at the beautiful result of a cut to the belly. Someone has helped us somewhat by previously conducting an amateur laparotomy on the poor wretch. It's good he was carried carefully. None of his more important organs have been lost. I mean, I assume they haven't been. What's up with him, Shani, in your opinion? Why such a face, girl? Have you only known men from the outside before today? The intestines are damaged, Mr. Rusty. A diagnosis as accurate as it is obvious. One doesn't even have to look, it's enough to sniff. A cloth, Yola. Marty, there's still too much blood. Be so kind as to give us a little more of your priceless magic. Shani, clamp. Put on some arterial forceps. You can see it's pouring, can't you? Yola, knife. Who's winning? Suddenly asked the man being operated on, quite lucidly, although he mumbled a little, rolling his goggling eyes. Tell me, who is winning? Son. Rusty stooped over the open, bloody and throbbing abdominal cavity. That really is the last thing I'd be worrying about in your shoes. Cruel and bloody fighting then began on the left wing and the center of the line. But here, though great was Nilfgaard's fierceness and impetus, their charge broke on the royal army like an ocean wave breaks on a rock. For here stood the select soldiers, the valiant Mariborian, Vichimian, and Retorian armored companies, and also the dogged lands necks, the professional soldiers of fortune, whom cavalry could not frighten. And thus they fought, truly like the sea against a rocky cliff. Thus continued the battle, in which you could not guess who had the upper hand, for although the waves endlessly beat against the rock, not weakening, and they only fell back to strike anew, the rock stood on, as it had always stood, still visible among the turbulent waves. The battle unfolded in a different way on the right wing of the royal army. Like an old sparrow-hawk that knows where to stoop and peck its prey to death, so Field Marshal Menno Kuhorn knew where to aim his blows. Clenching in his iron fist his select divisions, the Dythwin lancers and the armoured Ardfin, he struck at the junction of the line above Golden Pond, where the companies from Brugge stood. Although the Brugeans resisted heroically, they turned out to be more weakly accoutred, both in armour and in spirit, than their foes. They did not weather the Nilfgaardian advance. Two companies of the Free Company, under the old Conditerio Adam Pankrat, went to their aid and held back Nilfgaard, paying a severe price in blood. But the awful threat of being surrounded stared the dwarves of the volunteer regiment standing on the right flank in the face, and the severing of the array imperiled the whole royal army. Yara dipped his quill pen in the inkwell. His grandchildren, further away in the orchard, were shouting, their laughter ringing like little glass bells. Jan Natalis, nonetheless attentive as a crane, had noticed the menacing danger and understood in an instant which way the wind was blowing. And... Without delay, sent a messenger to the dwarves with an order for Colonel Elves. In all of his seventeen-year-old naivety, Cornet Aubrey believed that to reach the right wing, deliver the order, and return to the hill would take him ten minutes at most, absolutely no more. Not on Chiquita, a mare as nimble and fleet as a hind. 
Even before he had arrived at Golden Pond, the Cornet had become aware of two things. There was no telling when he'd reached the right wing, and there was no way of telling when he'd managed to return, and that Chiquita's fleetness would come in very handy. Fighting was raging on the battlefield to the east of Golden Pond. The Black Cloaks and the Bregean Horse protecting the infantry array were smiting each other. In front of the Cornet's eyes, figures in green, yellow and red cloaks suddenly shot out like sparks, like the glass of a stained glass window, from the whirl of the battle, chaotically bolting towards the River Chotler. Nilf Guardians flooded like a black river behind them. Aubrey pulled his mare back hard, jerked the reins, ready to turn tail and flee, get out of the way of the fugitives and the pursuers. A sense of duty took the upper hand. The cornet pressed himself to his horse's neck and galloped at breakneck speed. All around was yelling and hoofbeats, a kaleidoscopic twinkling of figures, the flashes of swords, clanging and thudding. Some of the Brugaeans, who were pressed against the fish pond, were putting up desperate resistance, herding together around a standard bearing an anchored cross. The black cloaks were slaughtering the scattered and exposed infantry. The view was obscured by a black cloak with the symbol of a silver sun. Evgir! Nordling! Aubrey yelled, and Chiquita, excited by the cry, gave a truly deer-like bound, saving Aubrey's life by carrying him out of range of the Nilfgaardian sword. Arrows and bolts suddenly howled over his head. Figures flickered before his eyes again. Where am I? Where are my comrades? Where is the enemy? Evgir Morv! Nordling! Thudding, clanking, neighing of horses, shouts. Stand, you little shit! Not that way! A woman's voice. A woman on a black stallion, in armour, with hair blown around, her face covered in spots of blood. Beside her, armoured horsemen. Who are you? The woman smeared the blood on her sword with a fist. Call it Aubrey, Constable Natalis's flugel adjutant, with orders for Colonels Pangrat and Els. You have no chance of getting to where Adieu is fighting. We'll ride to the dwarfs. I'm Julia Abatamarco. To horse, damn it! They're surrounding us, at the gallop! He didn't have time to protest. There was no point anyway. After some furious galloping, a mass of infantry emerged from the dust. A square, encased like a tortoise in a wall of pavises, like a pincushion bristling with spear blades. A great gold standard with crossed hammers fluttered over the square, and beside it rose up a pole with horsetails and human skulls. The square was being attacked by Nilf guardians, who were darting forwards and jumping back like dogs, worrying a beggar swinging a cane. The Ardfen division, owing to the great suns on their cloaks, could not be mistaken for any other. Fight, free company, yelled the woman, whirling her sword around in a moulinette. Let's earn our pay. The horsemen, and with them Cornet Aubrey, charged the Nilf guardians. The clash only lasted a few moments. But it was terrible. Then the wall of pavises opened before them. They found themselves inside the square, in a crush amongst dwarves in male shirts, bassinets, and pointed chick-chack helmets, amongst the Redanian infantry, light Brugaean horse, and armoured condottieri. Julia Abatamarco, pretty kitty, condottiero, Aubrey only now recognised her, dragged him in front of a pot-bellied dwarf in a chick-chack helmet decorated with a splendid plume, sitting awkwardly on an armoured Nilfgaardian horse in a lancer's saddle with large pommels, which he had clambered into to be able to see over the heads of the infantrymen. Colonel Barkley Els? The dwarf nodded his plume-helmeted head, noticing with evident appreciation the blood with which the cornet and his mare were sprayed. Aubrey blushed involuntarily. It was the blood of the Nilf guardians whom the condottieri had hacked down just beside him. He himself hadn't even managed to draw his sword. Cornet Aubrey, the son of Anselm Aubrey? His youngest. Ha! Huh? I know your father. What have you brought me from Natalis and Foltest, Cornet, my boy? You're threatened by a breach in the centre of the line. The constable orders the volunteer regiment to pull back the wing as soon as possible and retreat to Golden Pond and the River Chotler in order to reinforce... His words were drowned out by roaring, clanging, and the squealing of horses. Aubrey suddenly realised how absurd the orders he had brought were. 
what little significance those orders had for Barclay Elves, for Julia Abatamarco, for that dwarven square under a gold standard with hammers, fluttering over the surrounding Black Sea of Nilfgaard, attacking them from all sides. I'm late, he whimpered. I arrived too late. Pretty Kitty snorted. Barclay Elves grinned. No, little Cornet's son, he said. It was Nilfgaard that came too soon. Congratulations to you ladies, and to me, on a successful segmentectomy of the small and large bowel, splenectomy, and a liver suture. I draw your attention to the time it took to remove the consequences of what was done to our patient in a split second during the battle. I recommend that as material for philosophical reflections. Miss Shani will sew up the patient. But I've never done it before, Mr. Rusty. You have to start sometime. Red to red, yellow to yellow, white to white. So like that, and it's sure to be fine. What the hell? Barclay Ells twisted his beard. What are you seeing, little Cornet, Anselm Aubrey's youngest son? That we're just loafing around here? We didn't even fucking budge in the face of the enemy. We didn't budge an inch. I mean, our fault the men from Brugger didn't hold out. But the order, I don't give a shit about the order. If we don't fill the breaches, Pretty Kitty shouted over the commotion, the black cloaks will break the front. They'll break the front. Open the array, Barclay. I'm going to strike. I'll get through. We'll slaughter you before you get to the fish pond. You'll perish senselessly. So what do you suggest? The dwarf swore, tore his helmet from his head and hurled it to the ground. His eyes were savage, bloodshot, dreadful. Chiquita, frightened by the yells, danced beneath the cornet as far as the crush permitted. Summon Yap and Zigrin and Dennis Granma, pronto. It was apparent at first glance that the two dwarves had come from the heaviest fighting. They were both bespattered with blood. The steel spalder of one of them bore the mark of a cut so powerful it had bent the edges of the metal plating outwards. The head of the other dwarf was wrapped in a rag oozing blood. Everything in order, Zigrin? I wonder, panted the dwarf, why everyone's asking that. Barclay Ells turned around, found the cornet's gaze and stared hard at him. So, Anselm's youngest son, he rasped. The king and the constable have ordered us to go to them and support them. Well, keep your eyes wide open, little cornet. This'll be worth seeing. Sot it, roared Rusty, springing back from the table and brandishing his scalpel. Why, blast it, why does it have to be like this? No one answered him. Marty Sodegren just spread her arms. Sharni bowed her head, and Yola sniffed. The patient who had just died was looking upwards, and his eyes were unmoving and glazed. Strike! Kill! Confusion to the horsans! Keep in line! Barclay Ells roared. Keep an even step! Hold the line and keep close! Close! They won't believe, thought Cornet Aubrey. They'll never believe me when I tell them about it. This square is fighting in a total encirclement, surrounded on all sides by cavalry, being torn, hacked, pounded and stabbed. And the square is marching. It's marching in line, serried, pavis by pavis. It's marching, trampling and stepping over corpses, pushing the elite Ard Fein division in front of it. And it's marching. Fight! Even step, even step! bellowed Barclay Ells. Hold the line! The song, for fuck's sake! The song! Our song! Food Mahakam! Several thousand dwarven throats yelled the famous Mahakam battle song. Ho, ho, ho! Just wait, don't be hasty, things will very soon get tasty, this shambles will fall apart, shaken to its very heart. Ho, ho, ho! Fight, free company! Julia Abatamarco's high-pitched soprano cut into the throaty roar of the dwarves, like the thin, keen edge of a misericord. The condottieri, breaking free of the line, counterstruck the cavalry, attacking the square. It was a truly suicidal stroke, 
as the entire momentum of the Nilfgaardian offensive turned onto the mercenaries, now deprived of the protection of the dwarven halberds, pikes and pavises. The thudding, yelling and squealing of horses made Cornet Aubrey cringe involuntarily in the saddle. Someone struck him in the back, and he felt himself drift with his mare, stuck in the crush, towards the greatest confusion and the most terrible slaughter. He tightly gripped his sword hilt, which suddenly seemed slippery and strangely unwieldy. A moment later, carried in front of the line of pavises, he was already hacking around himself like a madman and yelling like a madman. One more time! He heard the wild cry of Pretty Kitty. One more shove! You'll do it, boys! Fight! Kill! For the ducat, as gold as the sun! To me, free company! A helmetless Nilfgaardian rider with a silver sun on his cloak penetrated the line, stood up in his stirrups, and with a terrible blow of his battle-axe, felled a dwarf along with his pavis and cleaved open the head of another. Aubrey turned in the saddle and hacked backhanded. A sizable fragment bearing hair flew from the head of the Nilfgaardian, who tumbled to the ground. At the same time, the cornet was also struck in the head and fell from the saddle. The crush meant he didn't end up on the ground immediately, but hung for several seconds, screaming shrilly, between the sky, the earth, and the sides of two horses. But although he had had the fright of his life, he didn't have time to experience pain. When he fell, his skull was almost immediately crushed by iron-shod hooves. Sixty-five years later, when asked about that day, about Brenner Field, about the square marching towards Golden Pond over the bodies of friends and enemies. The old woman would smile, wrinkling up even more a face already as shriveled and dark as a prune. Impatient, or perhaps pretending to be impatient, she waved a trembling, bony hand, grotesquely contorted by arthritis. There was no way, she mumbled, that either of the sides could gain the advantage. We were in the middle, in the encirclement, and they were on the outside, and we were simply killing one another. They, us, and we, them. <coughs> they, us, we, them. The old woman struggled to overcome a coughing fit. Those listeners who were closest saw on her cheek a tear, making its way with difficulty among the wrinkles and old scars. They were just as brave as us, mumbled the old dear, who had once been Julia Abatamarco, pretty kitty of the Free Mercenary Company. <laughs> we were all just as brave, us and them. The old woman fell silent for a long time. Her audience didn't urge her on, seeing her smile at her recollections, at her glory, at the faces of those who gloriously survived, looming in the fog of oblivion, of forgetting, in order later to be shabbily killed by vodka, drugs, and consumption. We were all just as brave, finished Julia Abadamarco. Neither of the sides had the strength to be braver. But we, we managed to be brave for a minute longer. Marty, I'd be very grateful if you could give us a little more of your wonderful magic. Just a little bit more. Just a few ounces. The inside of this poor wretch's belly is one great goulash, seasoned additionally by loads of metal rings from a male shirt. I can't do anything while he thrashes about like a fish being gutted. Sharni, damn it, hold those retractors. Yola, are you asleep, damn it? Clamp, clamp! Yola breathed out heavily, fighting to swallow the saliva filling her mouth. I'm going to faint soon, she thought. I can't bear it. I can't bear this any longer. This stench, this ghastly mixture of blood, puke, excrement, urine... The content of intestines, sweat, fear and death. I can't bear these endless screams any longer, this moaning, these bloodied, slimy hands cling to me as though I really was their hope, their escape, their life. 
I can't bear the pointlessness of what we're doing. Because it is pointless. It's one great, enormous, pointless pit of pointlessness. I can't bear the effort and the fatigue. They keep bringing new ones and new ones. I, I can't stand it. I'm going to vomit. I'm going to faint. I'll shame myself. Dressing, compress, bowel clamp, not that one, soft clamp. Mind what you're doing. Make another mistake and I'll smack you in that ginger head. Do you hear? I'll smack you in that ginger head. Great Melitola, help me. Help me, oh goddess. There. Better already. One more clamp, priestess. Clamp on the artery. Good. Good, Yola. Keep it up. Marty, mop his eyes and face. And mine, too. Where does that pain come from? thought Constable Jan Natalis. What hurts so much? Aha! My clenched fists. Let's finish them off! yelled Gaze van Loo, rubbing his hands. Let's finish them off, sir! The line's breaking along the formation. Let's strike! Let's strike without delay! And by the great sun, they'll fall apart! They'll scatter! Menno Kuhorn was nervously chewing a fingernail, realized they were watching, and quickly took his finger out of his mouth. Let's strike! repeated Gaze von Loo calmly, not without emphasis. Now the care's ready! Now the care is to stand by, said Menno sharply. The Derlanians too, Mr. Foltiana. The commander of the Vrieheth Brigade, Isengrim Foltiana, called the Iron Wolf, turned his awful face, disfigured by a scar running across his forehead, brow, bridge of the nose and cheek, towards the marshal. Strike! Menno pointed with his baton, at the junction of Demeria and Dridania over there. The elf saluted. His disfigured face didn't even twitch. His large eyes didn't change their expression. Allies, thought Menno. Confederates. We are fighting together against a common foe. But I don't understand them at all, those elves. They're somehow alien. Different. Interesting. Rusty tried to rub his face with his elbow, but his elbow was also covered in blood. Yola hurried to help him. Curious, repeated the surgeon, pointing at the patient. Stabbed by a pitchfork or some sort of two-pronged type of gizam. One of the prongs punctured the heart. There, please look. The chamber undoubtedly perforated. The aorta almost severed. And he was still breathing for a while. Here, on the table. God, right in the heart, he survived all the way to the table. Do you wish to state? A cavalryman from the light volunteer horse asked gloomily. That he's expired. We bore him from the battle in vain. Nothing is in vain. Rusty didn't lower his eyes. And for the sake of the truth, then yes, he's dead, sadly. Exitus. Take him away. Oh, bloody hell. Take a look, girls. Marty Sodergren, Shani and Yola bent over the body. Rusty pulled back the corpse's eyelid. Have I seen anything like that? All three of them shuddered. Yes, they all said at the same time. They glanced at each other as though slightly surprised. I have too, said Rusty. It's a vitra, a mutant. That would explain why he lived so long. Was he your comrade at arms, men? Or did you bring him here by chance? He was our comrade, Mr. Medic, confirmed another volunteer gloomily, a beanpole with a bandaged head. From our squadron, a volunteer like us. Ah, oh, he was a master with a sword. They called him Cohen. And he was a vetra. Aye, but he was a decent bloke otherwise. Ah, sighed Rusty, seeing four soldiers carrying another casualty on a blood-soaked cloak dripping with blood. He was very young, judging by how shrilly he was wailing. Ah, pity. I would have gladly taken that otherwise decent vetra for a post-mortem. I'm consumed with curiosity, and a paper could be written if one could just take a look inside him. But there's no time. Get the corpse off the table. Shani, water, Marty, disinfection. Uh, Yola, pass me. Hello, girl. Are you shedding tears again? What is it this time? Nothing, Mr. Rusty. 
Nothing. Everything's all right now. I feel, repeated Triss Merigold, as though I've been robbed. Nenica didn't answer for a long time and looked from the terrace towards the temple garden where the priestesses and novices were busily engaged in their springtime work. You made a choice, she finally said. You chose your way, Triss, your own destiny, of your own free will. Now isn't the time for regrets. Nenica, the sorceress lowered her eyes. I really can't say anything more than what I've said. Believe me and forgive me. Who am I to forgive you? And what would you get from my forgiving you? But I can see how you're glaring at me, Triss exploded. You and your priestesses. I can see you asking me questions with your eyes like, What are you doing here, witch? Why aren't you where Iola, Yurinid, Katya and Mira are? And Yara? You are exaggerating, Triss. The sorceress looked into the distance at the forest, bluish beyond the temple wall, at the smoke of distant campfires. Nenica said nothing. She was also far away in her thoughts, away where the fighting was raging and the blood was flowing. She thought about the girls she'd sent there. They talked me out of it all, Triss said. Nenica said nothing. They talked me out of it all, Triss repeated. So wise, so sensible, so logical. How not to believe them when they explained that there are more and less important matters. That one ought to give up the less important ones without a second thought. Sacrifice them for the important ones without a trace of regret. That there's no point saving people you know and love because they're individuals. And the fate of individuals is meaningless against the fate of the world. That there's no point fighting in the defense of virtue, honor and ideals because they are empty notions. That the real battlefield for the fate of the world is somewhere else completely. That the fight will take place somewhere else. And I feel robbed. Robbed of the chance to commit acts of insanity. I can't insanely rush to help Siri. I can't run and save Geralt and Yennefer like a madwoman. But that's not all. In the war being waged, in the war to which you sent your girls, in the war to which Yara fled, I'm even refused the chance to stand on the hill. To stand on the hill once more. This time with the awareness of a truly conscious and correct decision. Everybody has their own decision and their own hill, Triss, said the High Priestess softly. Everybody. You can't run away from yours, either. There was a commotion in the entrance to the tent. Another casualty was being carried in, accompanied by several knights. One in full-plate armour was shouting, giving orders and urging the carriers on. Move, stretch of errors, quicker, put him here, here! Hey, you, medic, I'm busy. Rusty didn't even look up. Please put the wounded man on a stretcher, I'll see to him when I finish. You'll see to him immediately, stupid leech, for it is none other than the most honourable Count of Garamond. This hospital... Rusty raised his voice, angry, because the broken arrowhead stuck in the casualty's guts had once again slipped out of his forceps. This hospital has very little in common with democracy. They mainly bring in knights and upward. Barons, counts, marquises and various others of that ilk. Somehow, few care about wounded men of humbler birth. But there is some kind of equality here, nonetheless. That is on my table. Eh? Hey, you what? It doesn't matter. Rusty once again stuck a cannula and a pair of forceps into the wound. If this one here, from whose guts I'm removing bits of iron, is a peasant, a member of the minor gentry, old nobility or aristocracy, he's lying on my table. And to me, as I hum to myself, a duke's worth a jester. Before God, we are all equally wise and equally foolish. You what? Your count will have to wait his turn. You confounded halfling. Help Mishani take the other forceps. Look out for that artery. Uh, Marty, just a little more magic if you would. We have serious hemorrhaging here. The knight took a step forward, teeth and armor grating. I'll have you hanged, he roared. I'll order you hanged, you unhuman. Silence, Batbrock, the wounded Count said with difficulty, biting his lips. Silence! Leave me and get back to the fighting. 
No, my lord, never. That was an order. A thudding and clanging of iron, the snorting of horses and wild cries reached their ears from behind the tent flap. The wounded in the field hospital moaned in various keys. Please look. Rusty raised his forceps, showing the splintered arrowhead he had finally extracted. A craftsman made this trinket, supporting a large family thanks to its manufacture. Furthermore, contributing to the growth of small craftwork, and thus also to general prosperity and universal happiness. And the way this ornament clings to human guts is surely protected by a patent. Long live progress. He casually threw the bloody blade into the bin and glanced at the casualty, who had fainted during the operation. Saw him up and take him away, he nodded. If he's lucky, he'll survive. Bring me the next in the queue, the one with the gashed head. That one, Marty Sodegren said calmly, just gave up his place a moment ago. Rusty sucked in and exhaled, moved away from the table without unnecessary comments, and stood over the wounded count. Rusty's hands were bloody, and his apron splashed with blood like a butcher. Daniel Echeverry, the Count of Garamond, paled even more. Well, panted Rusty, it's your turn, your grace. Put him on the table. What do we have here? Ah, nothing remains of that joint that could be saved. It's porridge. It's pulp. What do you whack each other with, Count, that you smash each other's bones like that? Well, it'll hurt a bit, your grace. It'll hurt a bit. But please, don't worry. It'll be just like it is in a battle. Don't okay? Knife? We're going to amputate, your grace. Daniel Echeverry, the Count of Garamond, who had put a brave face on it until then, howled like a wolf. Before he clenched his jaws from the pain, Shani quickly slipped a peg of linden wood between his teeth. Your Royal Highness, Lord Constable, talk, lad. The Volunteer Regiment and the Free Company are holding the defile near Golden Pond. The Dwarves and Condottieri are holding fast, although they're awfully bloodied. They say a Dieu Pangrat's dead, Frontino's dead, Julia Abatamarco's dead. All of them, all dead. The Dorian Company, which came to relieve them, is slaughtered. Reserves, my Lord Constable, Fortis said quietly, but clearly. If you want to know my opinion, it's time to send in the reserves. Have Bronibor throw his infantry at the Black Cloaks. Now, forthwith. Otherwise they'll dismember our lines, and that means the end. Jan Natalis didn't answer, now observing the next liaison officer rushing towards them from a distance on a horse, spraying flecks of foam. Get your breath back, lad. Get your breath back and speak concisely. They've breached... the front... The elves of the Vreeheth Brigade. Graf de Reuter informs your graces that... What does he inform us? Talk. That it's time to save your lives. Jan Natalis raised his eyes heavenwards. Blenkert, he said hollowly. May Blenkert come now, or may the night come. The ground around the tent trembled beneath hooves and the tent walls, it seemed, billowed from the intensity of the cries and the neighing of horses. A soldier rushed into the tent, followed close behind by two orderlies. People flee, the soldier bellowed. Save yourselves! Nilfgaard is vanquishing our army! Destruction! Destruction! Defeat! Clamp! Rusty withdrew his face before the stream of blood, a potent and vivid fountain squirting from an artery. Clamp and a compress. Clamp, Shani. Marty, do something if you would about that bleeding. Someone howled like an animal right beside the tent, briefly, stopping abruptly. A horse squealed. Something hit the ground with a clank and a thud. A crossbow bolt punctured the canvas with a crack, hissed and flew out the other side, fortunately too high to threaten the wounded men lying on stretchers. Nilfgaard! The soldier shouted again, in a high, trembling voice. Gentlemen medics, can't you hear what I'm saying? Nilfgaard has breached the royal line. They're coming and murdering. Flee! Rusty took a needle from Marty Sodegren and put in the first suture. 
The man being operated on hadn't moved for a long time, but his heart was beating, visibly. I don't want to die, yelled one of the conscious wounded. The soldier cursed, dashed for the exit, suddenly yelled, crashed backwards, splashing blood, and tumbled onto the dirt floor. Yola, kneeling by the stretchers, leapt to her feet and stepped back. It suddenly went quiet. Not good, thought Rusty, seeing who was entering the tent. Elves, silver lightning bolts, the Vrihed Brigade, the notorious Vrihed Brigade. A field hospital, the first of the elves stated. He was tall, with a pretty, oval, expressive face with large cornflower blue eyes. Treating the wounded? No one said anything. Rusty felt his hands begin to tremble. He quickly handed the needle to Marty. He saw Shani's forehead and the bridge of her nose pale. So, what's this about? said the elf, drawling his words menacingly. Why do we wound our foes over there on the battlefield? Over there, in the fighting, we inflict wounds so men will die from them, and you treat them. I observe an absolute lack of logic here, and a conflict of interests. He stooped over and thrust his sword almost without a swing into the chest of the casualty on the stretcher nearest the entrance. Another elf pinned another wounded man with a half-pike. A third casualty, conscious, tried hard to stop a thrust with his left arm and the heavily bandaged stump of his right. Shani screamed, shrilly, piercingly, drowning out the heavy, inhuman groaning of the mutilated man being murdered. Yola, throwing herself onto a stretcher, covered the next casualty with her body. Her face blanched like the linen of a bandage, and her mouth began to twitch involuntarily. The elf squinted his eyes. Va fort, Biana, he barked, or I'll run you through along with this doina. Get out of here! Rusty was beside Yola in three bounds, shielding her. Get out of my tent, you murderer! Get back there to the battlefield. Your place is there, among the other murderers. Murder each other there, if that is your will. But get out of here! The elf looked down at the pot-bellied halfling, shaking with fear, the top of whose curly mop reached a little above his waist. Blood, Therian, he hissed. Toady to humans, get out of my way. Not a chance. The halfling's teeth were chattering, but his words were distinct. The second elf leapt forward and pushed the surgeon with the shaft of his half-pike. Rusty fell to his knees. The tall elf wrenched Yola away from the wounded man with a brutal tug and raised his sword and froze. Seeing on the rolled-up cloak under the injured man's head the silver flames of the Dithwind division and the insignia of a colonel. Yavin! screamed an elf woman with dark hair woven into a plait, rushing into the tent. Came velo! Et ave giri the doina! Eyan va! Es teith! The tall elf looked at the wounded colonel for a moment, then at the eyes of the surgeon which were watering in terror. Then he turned on his heel and left. Once again the tramping of hooves, yelling and the clanging of iron could be heard from beyond the wall of the tent. How about the black cloaks? Murder! A thousand voices yelled. Someone howled like an animal, and the howling transformed into macabre wheezing. Rusty tried to stand up, but his legs failed him. His arms weren't much use either. Yola, trembling with powerful spasms of suppressed tears, curled up by the stretcher of the wounded Nilfgaardian in a fetal position. Shani was crying, not trying to hide her tears, but still holding the retractors. Marty was calmly putting in sutures, only her mouth moving in a kind of mute, silent monologue. Rusty, still unable to stand up, sat back down, he met the gaze of the orderly, huddled and squeezed into a corner of the tent. Give me a swig of hooch, said Rusty with effort. Just don't say you don't have any. I know you rascals. You always do. General Blenheim Blenkert stood up in his stirrups, stuck his neck out like a crane, 
and listened to the sounds of the battle. Draw out the array, he ordered his commanders, and we'll go at a trot at once behind that hill. From what the scouts say, it appears that we'll come out straight on the black coat's right wing. And we'll give them what for? One of the lieutenants, a whippersnapper with a silky and very spare little moustache, shouted shrilly. Blenkert looked askance at him. A detachment with a standard at the head, he ordered, drawing his sword. And in the charge, cry, Redania. Cry it at the top of your lungs. May Faultist and Natalis's boys know that the relief is coming. Graf Kobus de Reuter had fought in various battles for forty years since he was sixteen. Furthermore, he was an eighth-generation soldier. Without doubt, he had something in his genes. Something that meant that the roar and hubbub of battle, for everyone else simply a horrifying hullabaloo that drowned out everything else, was like a symphony, like a concert for a full orchestra to Kobus de Reuter. De Reuter had once heard other notes, chords and tones. Hurrah, boys, he roared, brandishing his baton. Redania! Redania is coming! The eagles! The eagles! From the north, from behind the hills rolling towards the battle, came a mass of cavalry, over which an amaranth pennant and a great gonfalon with a silver Redanian eagle fluttered. Relief! yelled de Reuter. The relief's coming! Hurrah! Death to the black cloaks! The eighth-generation soldier immediately noticed that the Nilfgaardian wing was wheeling around, trying to turn towards the charging relief with a disciplined tight front. He knew he could not allow them to do that. Follow me, he roared, resting the standard from the standard bearer's hands. Follow me, Tredagorians, follow me! They struck. They struck suicidally, dreadfully, but effectively. The Nilfgaardians of the Venendal division fell into confusion and then the Redanian companies drove into them. A great shout rose into the sky. Gobus de Reuter didn't see or hear it. A stray bolt from a crossbow had struck him straight in the temple. The nobleman sagged in the saddle and fell from his horse, the standard covering him like a shroud. Eight generations of de Reuters who had fallen fighting and were following the battle from the beyond nodded in acknowledgement. It could be said, Captain, that the noodlings were saved by a miracle that day, or a coincidence that no one could have predicted. Admittedly, Restif de Montelon writes in his book that Marshal Cujon made a mistake in his assessment of the enemy's strength and plans, that he took too great a risk splitting up the center army group and setting off with a cavalry troop, that he took on a risky battle not having at least a threefold advantage, and that he neglected reconnaissance. He didn't uncover the Redanian army arriving with reinforcements. Cadet Putkama, Mr. de Montelon's work, which was of doubtful quality, is not included in this school's curriculum, and his imperial highness deigned to express himself extremely critically about the book. Thus, you will not quote it here, cadet. Indeed, it astonishes me. Until now, your answers have been very good, positively excellent, and suddenly you begin to discourse about miracles and coincidences, while finally you take the liberty of criticizing the leadership abilities of Menno Kuhorn, one of the greatest leaders the Empire has produced. Cadet Putkama, and all the rest of you cadets, if you're seriously thinking about passing the final exam, you'll listen and remember. At the Battle of Brenna, no miracles or accidents were at work, but a conspiracy. Hostile saboteur forces, subversive elements, foul rubber rousers, Cosmopolites, political bankrupts, traitors and turncoats. A canker that was later burned out with white-hot iron. But before it came to that, those base traitors tangled up their own nation in spiderwebs and wove a snare of scheming. It was they who inveigled and betrayed Marshal Kuhorn, then deceived him and misled him. It was they, scoundrels without faith or honor. Horsons! repeated Menno Kuhorn, without taking the telescope from his eye. Common horsons. But I'll find you. Just wait. I'll teach you what reconnaissance means. The Vingelt. You will personally find the officer who was on the patrol beyond the hills to the north. Have all of them, the entire patrol, hanged. Yes, sir. Ute de Vingelt, the marshal's aide-de-camp, clicked his heels together. He could not know that right then, Lamar Flout, 
the officer from the patrol was dying, trampled by horses of the secret reserves of the Nordlings who were attacking the flanks, the reserves he hadn't uncovered. Neither could de Vingalt know that he only had two hours of life left. How many of them are there, Mr. Trahe? Kuhorn didn't take the telescope from his eye, in your opinion. At least ten thousand, replied the commander of the 7th Derlanian dryly. Mainly Radania, but I also see the chevron of Adirn. The unicorn is also there, so we also have Kaidwen, with a detachment of at least a company. The company was galloping. Sand and grit flew from beneath hooves. Forward, you duns, roared Centurion Halfpot, drunk as usual. Attack! Kill! Kaidwen! Kaidwen! Damn it, but I'm dying for a piss, thought Zivik. I should have gone before the battle. Now there might not be a chance. Forward, you duns! Always the duns. Wherever things are going wrong, the duns. Who did they send as an expeditionary force to Temeria? The duns. Always the dun banner. I need a piss. They arrived. Zivik yelled, turned around in the saddle and slashed backhand, destroying the spolder and shoulder of a horseman in a black cloak with an eight-pointed silver star. The duns! Kaidwen! Fight! Kill! The Dun Banner Standard struck Nilfgaard with a thud, a clatter and a clank, amidst the roars of soldiers and the squeals of horses. The Melis Stoke and Brabant will cope with that relief, said Elan Trahe, the commander of the 7th Delanian Brigade, calmly. The forces are balanced. Nothing has gone wrong yet. Tirconel's division is counterbalancing the left wing. Manya and Venendal are managing on the right. And we... We can tip the scales uh, by striking the line going in after the elves. Mano Kuhorn understood at once. By striking at the rear lines, sowing panic. That's it. That's what we shall do by the great sun. To your companies, gentlemen. Now the care and the seventh, your time has come. Long live the emperor, yelled Gaze von Lu. Lord de Wingalt. The marshal turned around. Please muster the adjutants and the guard troop. Enough inactivity. We are going to charge with the 7th Derlanian. Uda de Vingalt paled slightly, but immediately regained control. Long live the Emperor, he cried, and there was almost no tremor in his voice. Rusty cut, and the wounded man wailed and scratched the table. Yola, bravely fighting giddiness, was taking care of the tourniquets and clamps. Shani's raised voice could be heard from the entrance to the tent. Where? Are you insane? The living are waiting to be saved here, and you're marching in with corpses. But this is Baron Anselm Aubrey himself, Madam Merrick, the company commander. It was the company commander, now it's our corpse. You only managed to bring him in one piece because his armour is watertight. Take him away. This is a field hospital, not a mortuary. But Madam Merrick, don't block the entrance. Look there, the carrying one that's still breathing. Or at least he looks like he's still breathing, because it might just be wind. Rusty snorted but immediately afterwards raised an eyebrow. Shani, come here at once. Remember your chit, he said through clenched teeth, bending over the mutilated leg, that a surgeon can only take the liberty of cynicism after ten years of experience. Will you remember that? Yes, Mr. Rusty. Take the raspberry and strip off the periosteum. Blast. It will be worth anaesthetizing him a little more. Where's Marty? She's puking outside the tent, said Shani without a trace of cynicism, puking her guts out. Sorcerers. Rusty took hold of a saw. Instead of thinking up numerous awful and powerful spells, they would be better thinking up one. One that would enable them to cast minor spells, for example, anaesthetizing ones, without difficulty and without puking. The saw grated and crunched on bone. The wounded man moaned. Tighten the tourniquet, Yule. The bone finally gave way. Rusty tidied it up with a small chisel and wiped his forehead. Blood vessels and nerves, he said mechanically and needlessly, because before he had finished the sentence, the girls were already putting in the sutures. He removed the severed leg from the table and threw it down onto a pile of other severed limbs. The wounded man hadn't roared or moaned for some time. Fainted or dead? Fainted, Mr. Rusty, 
Good. Sew up the stump, Shani. Bring on the next one. Yola, go and find out if Marty has puked everything up. I wonder, said Yola very quietly, without raising her head. How many years of experience you have, Mr. Rusty? A hundred? After a quarter of an hour of strenuous marching and choking on dust, the yells of the centurions and the curians ceased, and the Vachemian regiments spread out in a line. Yara, gasping and gulping in air through his mouth like a fish, saw Voivode Bronibor strutting before the front on his beautiful armoured steed. The Voivode himself was also in full plate armour. His armour was enamelled in blue stripes, making Bronibor look like a great steel-plated mackerel. How are you, you dolts? The rows of pikemen answered with a rumbling growl like distant thunder. You're issuing farting sounds, the voivode noted, reining his armoured horse around and directing him to walk before the front. That means you're feeling good. When you're feeling bad, you don't fart in hushed tones, but you wail and howl like the damned. It's clear from your expressions that you're spoiling for a fight that you're dreaming of battle that you can't wait to get your hands on the North Guardians. Right, you Vichimian brigands? Then I have good news for you. Your dream will come true in a short while. In a very short while. The pikeman muttered again. Bronibor, after riding to the end of the line, turned around and spoke on, wrapping his mace against the ornamental pommel of his saddle. You stuffed yourselves with dust, infantry, marching behind the armoured troops, up until now, instead of glory and spoils, you've been sniffing horses' farts. And even today, when a great battle is upon us, you almost didn't make it to the field. But you managed it, so I congratulate you with all my heart. Here, outside this village, whose name I've forgotten, you will finally show how much worth you have as an army. That cloud you see on the battlefield is the Nilfgaardian horse, which means to crush our army with a flanking strike. Shove us and drown us in the bogs of this little river, whose name I have also forgotten. The honour of defending the breach that has arisen in our ranks has fallen to you, celebrated Vichemian pikeman, by the grace of King Foltest and Constable Natalis. You will close that breach, so to speak, with your breasts. You will stop the Nilfgaardian charge. You're rejoicing, comrades, what? You're bursting with pride, eh? Yara, squeezing his pike staff, looked around. There was nothing to indicate that the soldiers were rejoicing at the prospect of the imminent battle, and if they were bursting with pride by virtue of the honour of closing the breach, they were skilfully disguising it. Melfi, standing on the boy's right, was mumbling a prayer under his breath. On his left, Doislax, a hardened professional soldier, sniffed, swore and coughed nervously. Bronibor reined his horse around and sat up straight in the saddle. I can't hear you, he roared. I asked if you're bursting with fucking pride. This time the pikemen, seeing no alternative, roared with one great voice that they were. Yara also roared. If everyone was, he might as well too. Good. The voivode reined back his horse before the front. And now stand in an orderly array. Centurions, what are you waiting for, for fuck's sake? Form a square. The first rank kneels, the second stands. Ground your pikes. Not that end, ass. Yes, yes, I'm talking to you, you horrible little man. Higher. Hold your pikes up higher, you wretches. Close ranks. Close up. Close ranks. Shoulder to shoulder. Well, now you look impressive. Almost like an army. Yara found himself in the second rank. He pushed the butt of his pike into the ground and gripped the pike staff in his hands, sweaty from fear. Melfi was muttering indistinctly repeating various words over and over, mainly concerning the private lives of the Nilfgaardians, dogs, bitches, kings, constables, voivodes and all their mothers. The cloud in the battlefield grew. Don't fart there! Don't shut at your teeth! roared Bronibor. Thoughts of frightening the Nilfgaardian horses with those noises are misguided. Let no man deceive himself. What is headed for you are the Nazakaya and the 7th Delanian Brigades. Splendid, valiant, superbly trained soldiers. They can't be scared. They can't be defeated. They have to be killed. Hold those pikes higher. 
From a distance, the still soft but growing thud of hooves could now be heard. The ground began to shudder. Blades began to glint like sparks in the cloud of dust. It's your good fucking fortune, Vichimians, the voivode roared once more, that the standard infantry pike of the new modernized model is 21 feet long, and an Nilfgaardian sword is three and a half feet long. Can you reckon? Know that they can too. But they are counting on your not holding out, that your true nature will emerge, that it will be confirmed and revealed that you are shitheads, cowards and mangy sheepshaggers. The black cloaks are counting on you to throw down your poles and start running, and they will pursue you across the battlefield and hack you on the backs, heads and necks. Hack you comfortably and with no difficulty. Well, remember, you little shits, that although fear lends the heels extraordinary speed, you won't outrun cavalrymen. Whoever wants to live, whoever wants glory and spoils, must stand. Stand firm. Stand like a wall and close ranks. Yara looked back. The crossbowmen standing behind the line of pikemen were already winding their cranks, and the interior of the square was bristling with the points of Gizam, ronceurs, halberds, glaives, partisans, scythes, and pitchforks. The ground trembled more and more distinctly and powerfully, and it was already possible to discern the shapes of horsemen in the black wall of cavalry hurtling towards them. Mama, dear mother, repeated Melfi through trembling lips. Mama, dear mother, fucker, mumbled Doislax. The hoofbeats intensified. Yara wanted to lick his lips, but he couldn't. His tongue had gone stiff. His tongue stopped behaving normally. It had stiffened strangely and was as dry as a bone. The hoofbeats intensified. Close ranks, roared Bronibor, drawing his sword. Feel your comrade's shoulder. Remember, none of you is fighting alone. And the only remedy for the fear you're feeling is the pike in your fist. Prepare to fight. Pikes aimed at the horses' chests. What are we going to do, Virginia brigands? I'm asking. Stand firm roared the pikeman with one voice. Stand like a wall! Close ranks! Yara also roared. If everyone was, he might as well too. Sand, grit and turf sprayed from beneath the hooves of the advancing wedge of cavalry. The charging horsemen yelled like demons, brandishing their weapons. Yara leaned onto his pike, buried his head in his shoulders and shut his eyes. Yara shooed away a wasp circling above his inkwell with a violent movement of his stump without interrupting his writing. Marshal Kuhorn came to nothing. His flanking troop was stopped by the heroic Vichimian infantry under Voyevode Bronibor, paying in blood for his heroism. And at the moment the Vichimians resisted, Nilfgaard fell into confusion on the left wing. Some of them began to take flight, others to pull together and defend themselves in groups surrounded on all sides. Soon after, the same thing happened on the right wing, where the doggedness of the dwarves and condottieri finally overcame Nilfgaard's assault. A single great cry of triumph went up along the entire front, and a new spirit entered the royal knights, and the spirit fell in the Nilfgaardians. Their hands weakened, and our men began to shell them like peas, so loudly it echoed. And Field Marshal Menno Kuhorn understood that the battle was lost, saw the brigades perishing and falling into confusion around him, and then his officers and knights ran to him, giving him a fresh horse, calling for him to flee and save his own life. But a fearless heart beat in the breast of the Nilfgaardian Field Marshal. That will not do, he called, pushing away the reins held out towards him. It will not do for me to flee like a coward from the field on which so many good men under my command have fallen for the emperor. And the doughty Menokuhorn added, Besides, now there's nowhere to fuck off to, Menokuhorn added calmly and soberly, looking around the battlefield. They're surrounding us on all sides. Give me your cloak and helmet, sir, 
Captain Sievers wiped blood and sweat from his face. Take mine, sir. Dismount your steed and take mine. Don't protest. You must live, sir. You're indispensable to the Empire, irreplaceable. We Derlinians will strike the Nordlings. We'll draw them to us. You, meanwhile, try to break through down there, below the fish pond. You won't get out of that alive, muttered Kuhorn, taking the reins being offered to him. It's an honor. Sievers straightened up in the saddle. I'm a soldier of the Seventh Derlinians. To me, have faith. To me. Good luck, mumbled Kuhorn throwing over his back a Delanian cloak with a black scorpion on the shoulder. Sievers. Yes, sir, Marshal, sir. Nothing. Good luck, lad. And may luck be on your side, sir. To horse. Have faith. Kuhorn watched them ride off. For a long while. Until the moment Sievers small group rode with a bang, a yell and a thud into the condottieri into a troop considerably outnumbering them, to whose aid, indeed, other troops hurried at once. The Dalanians' black cloaks vanished among the greyness of the condottieri. All was lost in the dust. The nervous coughing of de Vingalt and the adjutants brought Kuhorn to his senses. The marshal adjusted the stirrup leathers and flaps. He brought the restless steed under control. To horse, he commanded. At first, things went well for them. In the mouth of the valley leading to the rivulet, a dwindling troop of survivors of the Nazikea Brigade was doggedly defending itself, forced into a circle bristling with blades, onto which the Nordlings had concentrated all their momentum and force, making a breach in the ring. Naturally, they didn't get away totally unscathed. They had to hack their way through a row of light volunteer horse, probably Brigean, judging by their insignia. The skirmish was very short, but furiously fierce. Kuhorn had already lost and discarded all remains and appearances of lofty heroism, and now just wanted to survive. Not even looking back at his escort, trading vicious blows with the Brigaeans, he rushed towards the stream with his adjutants, pressing himself to and hugging the horse's neck. The way was clear. Beyond the little river, beyond the crooked willows, a barren plain spread out, on which no enemy troops could be seen. Uda de Vingalt, Galloping beside Kuhorn, also saw it and yelled triumphantly, prematurely. A meadow covered in bright green knotgrass separated them from the sluggish, murky little river. When they charged into it at full gallop, the horses suddenly plunged up to their bellies in the bog. The marshal flew over his steed's head and fell headfirst into the bog. All around, horses were neighing and kicking, and men covered in mud and green duckweed were yelling. Menno suddenly heard another sound amidst this pandemonium, a sound that meant death, the hiss of fletchings. He dashed for the current of the small river, wading up to his hips in the thick marsh. An adjutant, forcing his way through beside him, suddenly tumbled face first into the mud, and the marshal saw a bolt stuck into his back up to the fletchings. At that same moment, he felt a terrible blow to the head. He staggered, but didn't fall, stuck in the mud and swamp. He wanted to scream, but only managed to splutter. I'm alive, he thought, trying to wriggle out of the clutch of the sticky slime. A horse struggling out of the marsh had kicked him in the helmet, and the deeply dented metal had shattered his cheek, knocked out some teeth and cut his tongue. I'm bleeding, I'm swallowing blood, but I'm alive. Once again, the slap of bowstrings, the hiss of fletchings, the thud and crack of arrowheads penetrating armor. Yells, the neighing of horses, squelching and blood splashing. The marshal looked back and saw bowmen on the bank. Small, stocky, pot-bellied shapes in male shirts, bassinets and pointed chick-chacks. Dwarves, he thought. The slap of bowstrings, the whistle of bolts, the squeal of horses threshing around, the yelling of men choking on water and mud. Uda de Vingalt, turning towards the marksman, cried in a high, squeaky voice that he was surrendering, asking for mercy and compassion, promised a ransom and begged for his life. Aware that no one understood his words, he raised his sword, held by the blade above his head. He held the weapon out towards the dwarves in the international, outright cosmopolitan gesture of surrender. He wasn't understood, or was misunderstood. 
for two bolts slammed into his chest with such force that the impact hurled him up out of the bog. Kuhorn tore the dented helmet from his head. He knew the common speech of the Nordlings quite well. I'll battle Kuhorn, he mumbled, spitting blood. Muffle Kuhorn, I surrender. Mercy, mercy. What's he saying, Zoltan? One of the crossbowmen asked in surprise. Bugger him and his chattering. Do you see the embroidery on his cloak, Munro? A silver scorpion. Ah! Wall up the horse, son, boys, for Caleb Stratton. For Caleb Stratton! Bowstrings clanged. One bolt hit Kuorn straight in the chest, the second in the hip, and the third in the collarbone. The Nilfgaardian field marshal fell over backwards in the watery marsh, the knotgrass and swamp yielding under his weight. Who the bloody hell could Caleb Stratton be? He managed to think. I've never heard of any Caleb. The murky, viscous, muddied and bloodied water of the river Chotla closed over his head and gushed into his lungs. She went outside the tent to get some fresh air, and then she saw him sitting beside the blacksmith's bench. Yara! He raised his eyes towards her. There was emptiness in those eyes. Yola? he asked moving his swollen lips with difficulty. How come you... What a question! She interrupted him at once. You'd better tell me how you've ended up here. We've brought our commander. Voivod Bronibor. He's wounded. You're also wounded. Show me that hand. Oh, goddess. But you'll bleed to death, lad. Yara looked at her and Yola suddenly began to doubt whether he could see her. It's a battle, said the boy, teeth chattering slightly. Y you must stand like a wall, S steady in the line. The, the lightly wounded are to carry the heavily wounded to the field hospital. I it's an order. Show me your hand. Yara howled briefly, his clenching teeth snapping in a wild staccato. Yola frowned. Oh my, it looks dreadful. Oh dear, Yara, Yara, you'll see, Mother Nenica will be angry. Come with me. She watched him blanch when he saw it, when he smelled the stench hanging beneath the roof of the tent. He staggered. She held him up. She saw him looking at the bloodied table, at the man lying there, at the surgeon, a small halfling who suddenly leapt up, stamped his feet, cursed foully, and threw a scalpel on the ground. Damn it! Fuck it! Why? Why is it like this? Why does it have to be like this? No one replied to the question. Who was it? Voivod Pronibor, explained Yara in a feeble voice, looking straight ahead with his empty gaze. Our commander, we stood firm in the line, it was an order, like a wall, and they killed Melfi. Mr. Rusty, Yola asked, this boy's a friend of mine. He's wounded. He's on his feet, the surgeon assessed coldly. And here there's a dying man waiting for a trepanation. There's no room here for any sentimental connections. At that moment, Yara, with excellent timing, fainted dramatically and fell down on the dirt floor. The halfling snorted. Oh, very well, on the table with him, he commanded. Oh, ho, a nicely smashed arm. I wonder what's holding it on. His sleeve, I think. Tonike, Yola, tightly, and don't you dare cry. Shani, give me a saw. The saw dug into the bone above the crushed elbow joint with a hideous crunching. Yara came to and bellowed, horribly but briefly. For when the bone gave way, he immediately fainted again. And thus, the might of Nilfgaard was reduced to dust on the Brenner battlefields, and an end was put to the march of the Empire northwards. Either by being killed or taken captive, the Empire lost four and forty thousand men at the Battle of Brenner.
the flower of the knighthood, and the elite cavalry fell. Leaders of the stature of Menno Kuhorn, Briabant, Demelis Stoke, Van Lo, Tierkanon, Egebracht, and others whose names have not survived in our archives, fell, were taken prisoner, or disappeared without trace. Thus did Brenner become the beginning of the end. But it behoves me to write that that battle was but a small stone in the building, and superficial would have been its importance had the fruits of the victory not been wisely taken advantage of. It behoves us to recall that instead of resting on his laurels and bursting with pride and awaiting honours and homage, Jan Natalis headed south almost without stopping. The cavalry troop under Adam Pangrat and Julia Abatemarco destroyed two divisions of the Third Army that had brought belated relief to Menokuhorn, routing them such that Nec Nuncius Cladis. At news of this, the rest of the center army group took miserable flight and fled in haste to the far side of the Uruga. And since Fortist and Natalis were on their heels, the imperial forces lost entire convoys and all their siege engines, with which, in their hubris, they had meant to capture Vichima, Gorsvelen, and Novigrad. And like an avalanche rolling down from the mountains, becoming covered in more and more snow and becoming greater, so also Brenner caused more and more severe results for Nilfgaard. Hard times came for the Veden army under Duke de Vette, whom the corsairs from Skellige and King Ithain of Sidaris sorely vexed in a guerrilla war. When, meanwhile, de Vette learned about Brenner, when news reached him that King Faltist and Jan Natalis were marching briskly to him, he immediately ordered the trumpeting of the retreat and fled to Sintra, strewing the escape route with corpses, because at the news of the Nilfgaardian defeats, an insurrection in Verden flared up anew. Only in the undefeated strongholds of Nastrog, Rosrog, and Bothrog did powerful garrisons remain, for which reason only after the peace of Sintra did they leave honorably and with their standards intact. Whereas in Adian, the tidings about Brenner led to the feuding kings Demavend and Henselt shaking each other's right hands and taking arms against Nilfgaard together. The East Army Group, which under the command of Duke Ardal Epdai marched towards the Pontar Valley, did not manage to challenge the two allied kings. Strengthened by reinforcements from Redania and Queen Maeve's guerrillas, who had cruelly plundered Nilfgaard, Demavend and Henselt drove Ardal Abdai all the way to Aldersburg. Duke Ardal wanted to give battle, but by a strange twist of fate, he suddenly fell ill, having eaten something. He came down with the colic and diarrhea miserere, and thus, in two days, he died in great pain. And Demavend and Henselt, without delay, attacked the Nilfgaardians, also there at Aldersburg, evidently for the sake of historical justice, and they routed them in a decisive battle, though Nilfgaard still had a significant numerical advantage. Thus do spirit and artistry usually triumph over dull and brutal force. It behooves me to write about one more thing. What exactly happened to Menno Kuhorn himself at the Battle of Brenner, no one knows. Some say he fell and his body, unrecognized, was buried in a common grave. Others say he escaped with his life, but fearing imperial wrath did not return to Nilfgaard, but hid in Brookelon among the dryads, and there became a hermit, letting his beard grow down to the ground and there, shortly after, expired amidst his worries. A story circulates among simple folk that the marshal returned at night to the Brenner battlefield and walked among the burial mounds, wailing, Give me back my legions, until finally he hanged himself on an aspen spike on the hill called Gibbet Hill because of that. And at night, one can happen upon the ghost of the celebrated marshal among other apparitions that commonly haunt the battlefield. Grandfather Yara, 
Grandfather Yara. Yara raised his head from his papers and adjusted his spectacles, which were slipping down his sweaty nose. Grandfather Yara, his youngest granddaughter shouted in the upper register. She was a determined and bright six-year-old who, thank the gods, had taken more after her mother, Yara's daughter, than his lethargic son-in-law. Grandfather Yara, Grandmother Lucienne told me to tell you that that's enough for today of that layabout scribbling and that tea's on the table. Yara meticulously assembled the written sheets and corked the inkwell. Pain throbbed in the stump of his arm. The weather's changing, he thought. There'll be rain. Grandfather Yara, I'm coming, Siri, I'm coming. It was already well after midnight before they had dealt with the last casualties. They carried out the final operations by artificial light, first from an ordinary lamp and later using magic. Marty Sodergren recovered after the crisis she had undergone, and although as pale as death, stiff and as unnatural in her movements as a golem, used her magic competently and effectively. The night was black when they exited the tent and all four of them sat down, leaning against the canvas. The plain was full of fires, various fires, the stationary fires of camps and the moving flames of torches. The night resounded with distant song, chanting, shouts and cheers. The night around them was also alive with the intermittent cries and groans of the wounded, the pleading and sighs of the dying. They didn't hear it. They had become accustomed to the sounds of suffering and dying, and those sounds were ordinary, natural to them, as integrated into the night as the croaking of frogs in the marshes by the river Chotla, or the singing of cicadas in the acacia trees by Golden Pond. Marty Sodergren sat in lyrical silence, resting on the halfling's shoulder. Yola and Shani, indifferent, cuddling one another, snorted from time to time with completely nonsensical laughter. Before they sat down against the tent, they had each drunk a cup of vodka, and Marty had treated all of them with her last spell, a cheering charm, typically used when extracting teeth. Rusty felt cheated by this treatment. The drink, combined with the magic, instead of relaxing him, had stupefied him. Instead of reducing his exhaustion, had increased it instead of giving oblivion, brought back memories. It looks, he thought, as though the alcohol and magic have only acted as they were meant to on Yola and Shani. He turned around, and in the moonlight saw sparkling silvery tracks of tears on the girls' faces. I wonder, he said, licking his numb, insensitive lips, who won this battle? Does anybody know? Marty turned her face towards him, but remained silent. The cicadas were singing among the acacias, willows and alders by Golden Pond, and the frogs croaked. The wounded moaned, begged and sighed, and died. Shani and Yola giggled through their tears. Marty Sodergren died two weeks after the battle. She began meeting an officer of the free company of Condottieri. She treated the affair light-heartedly, unlike the officer. When Marty, who liked change, began fraternizing with a Temerian cavalry captain, the Condottiero, mad with jealousy, stabbed her with a knife. He was hanged for it, but it was impossible to save the healer. Rusty and Yola died a year after the battle, in Maribor, during the largest outbreak yet of an epidemic of viral hemorrhagic fever, a disease also called the Red Death, or, from the name of the ship it was brought on, Katrina's Plague. All the physicians and most of the priests fled from Maribor then. Rusty and Yola remained, naturally. They treated the sick because they were doctors, the fact that there was no cure for the Red Death was unimportant to them. They both became infected. He died in her arms in the powerful, confidence-inspiring embrace of her large, ugly, 
peasant hands. She died four days later, alone. Shani died 72 years after the battle, as the celebrated and universally respected retired dean of the Department of Medicine at the University of Oxenfurt. Generations of future surgeons used to repeat her famous joke. So red to red, yellow to yellow, white to white. It's sure to be fine. Almost no one noticed how, after delivering that witty anecdote, the dean always wiped away a furtive tear. Almost no one. The frogs croaked and the cicadas sang among the willows by Golden Pond. Shani and Yola giggled through their tears. I wonder, repeated Milo Vanderbeck, halfling, field surgeon, known as Rusty. I wonder who won. Rusty, Marty Sodergren said lyrically. Believe me, in your shoes, it's the last thing I'd be worrying about. Some of the flames were tall and strong, burning brightly and vividly, while others were tiny, flickering and quavering, and their light diminished and died. At the very end was but one tiny flame, so weak it barely flickered and glimmered, now struggling to flare up, now almost going out entirely. Whose is the dying flame? asked the witcher. Yours, Death replied. Florence Delanois, Fairy Tales and Stories Chapter 9 The plateau, extending almost all the way to the distant mountain peaks, greyish-blue in the fog, was like an actual stone sea, here undulating in a hump or a ridge, there bristling with the sharp fangs of reefs. The impression was enhanced by shipwrecks. Dozens of wrecks, of galleys, galeasses, cogs, caravels, brigs, hulks, and longships. Some of them looked as though they had ended up there not long before. Others were piles of barely recognizable planks and ribs, clearly having lain there for decades, if not centuries. Some of the ships were lying keel up. Others, turned over on their sides, looked as though they had been tossed up by devilish squalls and storms. Still others gave the impression they were sailing, making a way amidst that stone ocean. They stood even and straight, the chests of their figureheads proudly stuck out, their masts pointing to the zenith, the remains of sails, shrouds and stays fluttering. They even had their own ghostly crews, skeletons jammed between rotten planks and entangled in ropes, dead sailors, busy forever with endless navigation. Flocks of black birds flew up, cawing from the masts, yards, ropes and skeletons, alarmed by the appearance of the rider, frightened by the clack of hooves. For a moment they flecked the sky, circled in a flock over the edge of the cliff, at the bottom of which lay a lake as grey and smooth as quicksilver. On the edge could be seen a dark and gloomy stronghold, whose towers partly overlooked the graveyard of ships and were partly suspended over the lake, with its bastions embedded in the vertical rock. Kelpie danced, snorted and pricked up her ears, alarmed by the wrecks, the skeletons, at the whole landscape of death, at the cawing black birds which had already returned, alighting again on the broken masts and cross trees, on the shrouds and skulls. But if anyone ought to have been afraid there, it was the rider. Easy, Kelpie, said Siri in a changed voice. It's the end of the road. This is the right place and the right time. She found herself outside a gate, God knows how, and emerged like an apparition from between the wrecks. The guards at the foot of the gate noticed her first, alarmed by the cawing of rooks and now shouted, gesticulating and pointing at her, calling others. When she rode to the gatehouse, there was already a crush there, an excited hubbub. They were all staring at her. The few who knew her and had seen her before, like Boreas Mun and Deca Siliphant, and the considerably more numerous of them who had only heard about her, newly recruited soldiers from Skelen, 
mercenaries and ordinary marauders from Ebbing and the surroundings, who were now looking in amazement at the ashen-haired girl with the scar on her face and the sword on her back, at the splendid black mare holding her head high and snorting, her horseshoes ringing on the flagstones of the courtyard. The hubbub died down. It became very quiet. The mare trotted, lifting her legs like a ballerina, her horseshoes ringing like a hammer on an anvil. This went on for a long time before her way was finally barred by crossed Gizarm and Ronceurs. Someone reached out a hesitant and frightened hand towards the bridle. The mare snorted. Take me to the lord of this castle, the girl said confidently. Boreas Munn, not knowing himself why he was doing it, held her stirrup steady and offered his hand. Others held the stamping and snorting mare. Do you recognize me, my lady? Boreas asked softly. For we've already met. Where? On the ice. She looked him straight in the eye. I didn't look at your face then, sir, she said unemotionally. You were the lady of the lake. He nodded seriously. Why have you come here, girl? What for? For Yennefer, and to claim my destiny. Claim your death more like, he whispered. This is Stigger Castle. In your place, I'd flee as far from here as you can. She looked again, and Boreas at once understood what she meant to say with that look. Stefan Skellen appeared. He watched the girl for a long time, his arms crossed on his chest. Finally, he indicated with an energetic gesture that she was to follow him. She went without a word, escorted on all sides by armed men. A strange winch, muttered Boreas, and shuddered. Fortunately, she is now concerned now, said Dacus Elephant. I'm surprised at you for talking to her like that. It was she, the witch, who killed Vargas and Fripp, and later Ola Harsheim. Tawny Owl killed Harsheim. Boreas cut him off. Not she. She spared our lives there on the pack ice, though she could have slaughtered and drowned us like pups. All of us. Tawny Owl too. Very well. Dacre spat on the flags of the courtyard. He'll reward her for that mercy, together with the sorcerer and Bonart. You'll see, man. Now they'll gut her ceremonially. They'll flay her in thin strips. I'm inclined to believe they'll flay her, snapped Boreas, because they're butchers. And we ain't no better since we serve under them. And do we have a choice? We don't. One of Skellen's mercenaries suddenly cried softly, and another followed suit. One man swore, another gasped. Someone pointed silently. As far as the eye could see, black birds were sitting on the battlements on the corbels, on the roofs of the towers, on the cornices, on the window sills and gables, on the gutters and on the gargoyles and mascarons. They had flown from the ship's graveyard noiselessly, without cawing, and now they were sitting in silence, waiting. They sent death, mumbled one of the mercenaries. And Carrion, added a second. We don't have a choice, Silifan repeated mechanically, looking at Boreas. Boreas Munn looked at the birds. Perhaps it's time we did, he replied softly. They climbed a great staircase with three landings, walked along a long corridor between an avenue of statues set in niches, and passed through a cloister surrounding a vestibule. Ciri walked boldly, feeling no anxiety. Neither the weapons nor her escort's murderous visages caused her fear. She had lied, saying she couldn't remember the faces of the men from the frozen lake. She did remember. She remembered seeing Stefan Skellen, the same man now leading her with a gloomy expression, deeper into that huge, awful castle, as he shook, teeth chattering on the ice. Now as he looked around and glared at her from time to time, she sensed he was still a little afraid of her. She breathed more deeply. They entered a hall beneath a high star vault supported on columns beneath great spidery chandeliers. Ceres saw who was waiting there for her. 
Fear dug its claw-like fingers into her guts, clenched its fist, tugged and twisted. Bonnard was by her in three strides. He grabbed her by the front of her jerkin, lifted her up and pulled her towards him at the same time, bringing her face closer to his pale, fishy eyes. Hell must indeed be dreadful, he roared, if you've chosen me. She didn't reply. She could smell alcohol on his breath. And maybe hell didn't want you, you little beast. Perhaps that devilish tower spat you out in disgust after tasting your venom. He drew her closer. She turned aside and drew back her face. You're right, he said softly. You're right to be afraid. It's the end of your road. You won't escape from here. Here, in this castle, I'll bleed you dry. Have you finished, Mr. Bonnard? She knew at once who had spoken. The sorcerer Vilgefortz, who first of all had been a prisoner in Manacles and afterwards pursued her in the Tower of the Gull. He had been very handsome then, on the island. Now something in his face had changed, something that made it ugly and fearful. Mr. Bonnard! The sorcerer didn't even move on his throne-like armchair. Let me assume the pleasant duty of welcoming to Stigger Castle, our guest, Miss Cyrilla of Sintra, the daughter of Pavetta, the granddaughter of Calanthe, the descendant of the famous Lara Dorinapshada. Greetings. Please come closer. The derision, hidden beneath the mask of civility, slipped out from the sorcerer's last words. There was nothing but a threat and order in them. Siri felt at once that she would be unable to resist that order. She felt fear. Ghastly fear. Closer, hissed Vilgefortz. Now she noticed what was wrong with his face. His left eye, considerably smaller than his right, blinked, flickered, and spun around like a mad thing in the wrinkled grey-blue eye socket. The sight was gruesome. A brave pose, a trace of fear in the face, said the sorcerer, tilting his head. My acknowledgments. Assuming your courage doesn't result from stupidity, I shall dispel any possible fantasies at once. You will not escape from here, as Mr. Bonnard correctly observed, neither by teleportation nor with the help of your own special abilities. She knew he was right. Previously, she had persuaded herself that if it came to it, she would always, even at the last moment, be able to flee and hide amidst times and places. Now she knew that was an illusory hope, a fantasy. The castle positively vibrated with strange, evil, hostile magic, and that magic was pervading, penetrating her. It crawled like a parasite over her innards, repulsively slithering over her brain. She could do nothing about it. She was in her enemy's power. Helpless. Too bad, she thought. I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was coming here for. The rest was really just fantasy. May what has to happen, happen. Well done, said Vilgefortz. An accurate assessment of the situation. What must happen will happen. Or, more precisely, what I decide will happen, will happen. I wonder if you're also guessing, my splendid one, what I shall decide. She was about to answer, but before she could overcome the resistance of her tight, dry throat, he anticipated her by reading her thoughts. Of course, you know. Master of worlds. Master of times and places. Yes, yes, my splendid one. Your visit didn't surprise me. Quite simply, I know where you escaped to from the lake and how you did it. I know how you got here. The one thing I don't know is, was it a long way? And did it provide you with many thrills? Oh, 
He smiled nastily, anticipating her once again. You don't have to reply. I know it was interesting and exciting. You see, I can't wait to try it myself. I'm very envious of your talent. You'll have to share it with me, my splendid one. Yes, have to are the right words. Until you share your talent with me, I simply won't let you out of my hands. I won't let you out of my hands, neither by day nor by night. Siri finally understood it wasn't only fear squeezing her throat. The sorcerer was gagging and choking her magically. He was mocking her, humiliating her, in front of everyone. Let Yennefer go! She coughed so hard, she arched her back with the effort. Let her go, and you can do what you want with me! Barnhart roared with laughter, and Stefan Skellen also laughed dryly. Vilgefortz poked the corner of his gruesome eye with his little finger. You can't be so slow-witted not to know that I can do what I want with you in any case. Your offer is pompous, and that's pathetic and ridiculous. You need me. She raised her head although it cost her an enormous amount of strength. To have a child with me. Everybody wants that. You too. Yes, I'm in your power. I came here by myself. You didn't catch me, although you pursued me through half the world. I came here by myself, and I'm giving myself up to you for Yennefer, for her life. Is it so ridiculous to you? So try using violence and force with me. You'll see. You'll be over your desire to laugh in no time. Monart leapt at her and swung his scourge. Vilgefortz made an apparently careless gesture, just a slight movement of the hand. But even that was enough for the whip to fly from the hunter's hand, and he staggered as though hit by a coal wagon. I see Mr. Bonhart still has difficulty understanding the responsibilities of a guest said Vilgefortz, massaging his fingers. Try to remember, when one is a guest, one doesn't destroy the furniture or works of art, nor steal small objects, nor does one soil the carpets or inaccessible places. One doesn't rape or beat other guests, the latter two not, at least, until the host has finished raping and beating. Not until he gives the sign that one may now rape and beat. You too, Siri, ought to be able to draw the appropriate conclusions from what I've said. You can't. I'll help you. You surrender yourself to me and humbly agree to everything. Allow me to do anything I want with you. You think your offer highly generous. You're mistaken. For the matter is that I shall do with you what I have to do, not what I'd like to do. An example. I'd like to gouge out at least one of your eyes as revenge for Thanev, but I can't, because I'm afraid you wouldn't survive it. Siri knew it was now or never. She spun around in a half turn and jerked Swallow from the scabbard. The entire castle suddenly whirled and she felt herself falling, painfully banging her knees. She bent over her forehead almost touching the floor, fighting the urge to vomit. The sword slipped from her numb fingers. Someone lifted her up. Yes, Vilgefort drawled, resting his chin on hands held together as if in prayer. Where was I? Ah, yes, that's right, your offer. Yennefer's life and freedom in exchange... For what? For your voluntary surrender? Willingly, without violence or compulsion? I'm sorry, Siri. Violence and compulsion are simply essential to what I shall do to you. Yes, yes, he repeated, watching with interest as the girl wheezed, spat, and tried to vomit. 
It simply won't happen without violence or compulsion. You would never agree voluntarily to what I shall do to you, I assure you. So, as you must see, your offer, still pathetic and ridiculous, is, furthermore, worthless. So I reject it. Go on, take her to the laboratory at once. The laboratory didn't differ much from the one Siri knew from the temple of Melitola in Ellender. It was also brightly lit, clean with long metal topped tables laden with glass, large jars, retorts, flasks, test tubes, pipes, lenses, hissing and bubbling alembics and other strange apparatus. Here also, as in Ellender, it smelled strongly of ether, alcohol, formalin and something else, something that triggered fear. Even in the friendly temple, beside the friendly priestesses and a friendly Yennefer, Ciri had felt fear in the laboratory. And after all, in Ellender, no one had dragged her to the laboratory by force. No one had brutally shoved her onto a bench, and no one had held her shoulders and arms in an iron grip. In Ellender, there hadn't been a dreadful steel chair whose purpose was quite sadistically obvious. There had been no shaven-headed characters dressed in white in the middle of the laboratory, no Bonnard and no Skelen, excited, flushed and licking his lips. And neither was there Vilgefortz, with one normal eye and the other tiny and twitching hideously. Vilgefortz turned around from the table where he had spent a long time arranging some sinister-looking instruments. Do you see, my splendid maiden, he began, walking towards her that you are the key to mastery and power? Not only over this world, a vanity of vanities, doomed in any case to early extinction, but over all worlds, over the whole compass of places and times which have arisen since the conjunction. You certainly understand me. You have already visited some of those places and times. I'm ashamed to admit it, he continued a moment later, rolling up his sleeves, but I'm terribly attracted by power. It's crude, I know. But I want to be a ruler. A ruler before whom people will bow down, whom people will bless simply because I let them be, and whom they will worship as a god, if, let's say, I decide to save their world from a cataclysm, even if I only save it on a whim. Oh, Siri. My heart is gladdened by the thought of how magnanimously I shall reward the faithful and how cruelly I shall punish the disobedient and arrogant. The prayers that shall be offered up by whole generations to me and for me, for my love and my mercy, will be balm and honey to my soul. Whole generations, Siri, whole worlds, listen out. Do you hear? Deliver us from the plague, hunger, war and wrath of Vilgefortz. He moved his fingers just in front of her face, then violently seized her by the cheeks. Ciri screamed and struggled, but she was held firmly. Her lips began to tremble. Vilgefort saw it and sniggered. The child of destiny! <laughs> he laughed nervously, and white flecks of foam appeared at the corners of his mouth. In any year, the sacred elven Elderblatt. Now... All mine. He straightened up abruptly and wiped his mouth. Various fools and mystics, he now announced in his usually cold tone, have tried to adapt you to fairy tales, legends and prophecies, have tracked the genes you carry, your inheritance from your ancestors. Mistaking the sky for stars reflected in the surface of a pond, they mystically supposed that a gene determining great potential would continue to evolve, that it would achieve the height of power in your child or the child of your child, and a charming aura grew around you. Incense smoke trailed behind you. But the truth is much more banal, much more mundane. Organically mundane, I'd say. Your blood, my splendid one, is important. But in the absolutely literal, quite unpoetic sense of the word. 
he picked up from the table a glass syringe measuring about six inches. The syringe ended in a thin, slightly curved capillary. Siri felt her mouth go dry. The sorcerer examined the syringe under the light. In a moment, he declared coldly, you will be undressed and placed on this chair, precisely this one which you're contemplating with such curiosity. You'll spend some time in the chair, albeit in an uncomfortable position. With the help of this device, which also, as I see, is fascinating you, you will be impregnated. It won't be so awful, for almost the whole time you'll be befuddled by elixirs, which I shall give you intravenously, with the aim of implanting the fetal ovum properly and ruling out an ectopic pregnancy. You needn't be afraid. I'm skilled. I've done this hundreds of times. Never, admittedly, to a chosen one of fate and destiny, but I don't think the uteruses and ovaries of chosen ones differ so much from those of ordinary mates. And now, the most important thing. Vilgefortz savoured what he was saying. It may worry you, or it may gratify you, but know that you won't give birth to the infant. Who knows? Perhaps it would also have been a great chosen one with extraordinary abilities, the saviour of the world and the king of nations. No one, however, is able to guarantee that, and I, furthermore, have no intention of waiting that long. I need blood. More precisely, placental blood. As soon as the placenta develops, I shall remove it from you. The rest of my plans and intentions, my splendid one, will not, as you now comprehend, concern you. So there's no point informing you about them. It will only be an unnecessary frustration. He fell silent, leaving a masterly pause. Siri couldn't control her trembling mouth. And now, the sorcerer nodded theatrically, I invite you to the chair, Miss Cyrilla. It'll be worth having that bitch Yennefer watching this. Bonnard's teeth flashed beneath his grey moustaches. She deserves it. Indeed she does. Small white balls of froth appeared again in the corners of Ilgefort's smiling mouth. Impregnation is, after all, a sacred thing, solemn and ceremonial, a mystery at which one's entire close family should assist. And Yennefer is, after all, your quasi-mother. And in primitive cultures, the mother virtually takes an active part in her daughter's consummation ceremony. Go on, bring her here. But regarding that impregnation, Bonnard bent over Siri, whom the sorcerer's shaven-headed acolytes had begun to undress. Couldn't one... Lord Vilgefortz, do it more normally, as nature intended. Skellen snorted, nodding his head. Vilgefortz frowned slightly. No, he responded coolly. No, Mr. Bonnard, one couldn't. Siri, as though only now realising the gravity of the situation, uttered an ear-splitting scream. Once, and then a second time. Well, well, the sorcerer grimaced. We enter the lion's den bravely, with head and sword held high, and now we're afraid of a small glass tube. For shame, young lady. Siri, not caring about shame, screamed so loudly the laboratory vessels jingled, and the whole of Stigger Castle suddenly responded with yelling and commotion. There'll be trouble, boys, repeated Zadalik, scraping dried dung from between the stones of the courtyard with the metal-tipped butt of his ronceur. Oh, you'll see, there'll be trouble for us poor wretches. He looked at his comrades, but none of the guards commented. Neither did Boreas Munn speak. He had remained with the guards at the gate from choice, not because of orders. He could have, like Siliphant, followed Tawny Owl, could have seen with his own eyes what would happen to the Lady of the Lake, what fate she would suffer. But Boreas didn't want to watch it. 
He preferred to stay here in the courtyard, beneath the open sky, far from the chambers and halls of the upper castle, where they had taken the girl. He was certain that not even her screams would reach here. Those blackbirds are a bad sign. Zadalik nodded at the rooks, still sitting on the walls and cornices. That young wench who came here on the black mare is an evil omen. We're serving Tony Owl in an evil matter, I tell you. They're saying, in truth, that Tony Owl himself isn't a coroner or important gentleman now, but an outlaw like us, that the emperor has it in cruelly for him. If he seizes us all, boys, there'll be trouble for us poor wretches. Aye, aye added another guard with long moustaches, wearing a hat decorated with black stork feathers. The noose is at hand. It's no good when the emperor's angry. Below that, interjected a third, a new arrival to Stigger Castle, with the last party of mercenaries recruited by Scalene. The emperor might not have enough time for us. They say he has other concerns. They say there was a decisive battle somewhere in the north. The Nordlings beat the imperial forces, thrashed them soundly. In that case, said a fourth, Perhaps it isn't so bad that we're here with Tawny Owl. Always better to be with the victors. No, certainly it's better, said the new one. Tawny Owl, it seems to me, will go far, and we'll go far with him too. Oh, boys, Zadalik leaned on his ranseur. You're as thick as pig shit. The black birds took flight with a deafening flapping and cawing. They darkened the sky, wheeling in a flock around the bastion. What the fuck? growled one of the guards. Open the gate, please. Boreas Munn suddenly detected a powerful smell of herbs, sage, mint, and thyme. He swallowed and shook his head. He closed and opened his eyes. It didn't help. The thin, grey-haired elderly man resembling a tax collector who had suddenly appeared beside them had no intention of vanishing. He stood and smiled through pursed lips. Boreas's hair almost lifted his hat up. Open the gate, please, repeated the smiling elderly gentleman. Without delay, it really will be better if you do. Zadalik dropped his ranceur with a clank, stood stiffly and moved his mouth noiselessly. His eyes were empty. The remaining men went closer to the gate, striding stiffly and unnaturally like automatons. They took down the bar and opened the hasp and staple. Four riders burst into the courtyard with a thudding of horseshoes. One had hair as white as snow, and the sword in his hand flashed like lightning. Another was a fair-haired woman, bending a bow as she rode. The third rider, quite a young woman, carved open Zadalik's temple with a sweeping blow of a curved sabre. Boreas Munn picked up the ranseur and shielded himself with a shaft. The fourth rider suddenly towered over him. There were wings of a bird of prey attached to both sides of his helmet. His upraised sword shone. Leave him, Kaya, said the white-haired man sharply. Let's save time and blood. Milver? Rages that way. No, mumbled Boreas, not knowing himself why he was doing it. Not that way. That's only a dead end. Your way is there, up that staircase, to the upper castle. If you wish to rescue the Lady of the Lake, then you must hurry. My thanks, said the white-haired man. Thank you, stranger. Rages, did you hear? Lead on. A moment later, only corpses remained in the courtyard, and Boreas Munn still leaning on the pikestaff, which he couldn't release because his legs were shaking so much. The rooks circled, cawing over Stigger Castle, covering the towers and bastions in a shroud-like cloud. Vilgefortz listened with stoical calm and an inscrutable expression to the breathless report of the mercenary who had come running but his restless and blinking eye betrayed him. Last ditch reinforcements, he ground his teeth. Unbelievable. Things like that don't happen. Or they do, but only in crummy, vulgar pageants, and it comes to the same thing. Do me the pleasure, good fellow, of telling me you've made it all up for, shall we say, a lark? I'm not making it up, the hireling said in indignation. I'm speaking the truth. Some horsemen have burst in. A whole hasser of them. Very well, very well, the saucer interrupted. I was joking. Skellen, deal with this matter personally. It will be a chance to demonstrate how much your army, hired with my gold, is worth. Tawny Owl leapt up 
nervously waving his arms. Aren't you treating this too lightly, Vilgefortz? He yelled. You, it seems, don't realize the gravity of the situation. If the castle is being attacked, it's by Emir's army, and that means it doesn't mean anything. The sorcerer cut him off. But I know what you have in mind. Very well. If the fact that you have me behind you will improve your morale, have it as you will. Let's go, you too, Mr. Bonnard. As far as you're concerned, he fixed his terrible eye on Siri. Don't have any false hopes. I know who's turned up here with these pathetic reinforcements worthy of a cheap farce. And I assure you, I shall turn this cheap farce into a nightmare. Hey, you! He nodded at the servants and acolytes. Shackle the girl in the meritium. Lock and bolt her in a cell and don't move an inch from the door. You'll answer with your lives for her. Understood? Yes, sir. They rushed into the corridor, and from the corridor into a large hall full of sculptures, a veritable glyptotech. No one barred their way. They only saw a few lackeys who immediately fled on seeing them. They ran up some stairs. Kair kicked a door open. Angoulême rushed inside with a battle cry, and with a blow of her saber, knocked off the helmet of a suit of armor she took for a guard standing by the door. She realized her mistake and roared with laughter. <laughs> Look at that! Angoulême! Geralt took her to task. Don't just stand there, go on. A door opened in front of them. Shapes loomed in the doorway. Milva bent her bow and sent off an arrow without a second thought. Somebody screamed. The door was closed. Geralt heard a bolt thudding. Go on, go on, he shouted. Don't just stand there. Witcher, said Regis. This running is senseless. I'll go off. I'll fly off and do some reconnaissance. Fly! The vampire took off as though blown by the wind. Geralt had no time to be surprised. Again, they chanced upon some men, this time armed. Kair and Angoulême jumped towards them with a yell, and the men bolted, mainly, it seemed, because of Kair and his impressive winged helmet. They dashed into the cloister and the gallery surrounding the inner vestibule. Around twenty paces separated them from the portico leading into the castle when shapes appeared on the other side of the cloister. Loud shouts echoed out, and arrows whistled. Take cover, the witcher yelled. Arrows rained down on them. Fletchings fluttered and arrowheads sent up sparks from the floor, chipping the mouldings from the walls and showering them in fine dust. Get down, behind the balustrade. They dropped down, hiding pell-mell behind spiral columns carved with leaves. But they didn't get away with it entirely. The witcher heard Angoulême cry out and saw as she grabbed her arm, her sleeve, which immediately became blood-soaked. Angoulême! It's nothing! It passed through muscle! The girl shouted back in only a slightly trembling voice, confirming what he had seen. Had the arrowhead shattered the bone, Angoulême would have fainted from the shock. The archers were shooting from the gallery without let-up and were shouting out, calling for reinforcements. Several of them ran off to the side to fire at the pinned-down party from an acute angle. Geralt swore, assessing the distance separating them from the arcade. Things looked bad, but to stay where they were meant death. Let's make a run for it, he yelled. Ready? Kair, help Angoulême. They'll slaughter us. Run for it, we have to. No, screamed Milva, standing up with bow in hand. She straightened up, assumed a shooting position, a veritable statue, a marble Amazon with a bow. The marksman on the gallery yelled. Milva lowered her head. One of the archers flew backwards, slamming against the wall, and a bloody splash resembling a huge octopus bloomed on the stone. A cry resounded from the gallery, a roar of anger, fury, and horror. By the great sun, groaned Kair. Geralt squeezed his shoulder. Let's make a run for it. Help Angoulême. The marksmen on the gallery directed all their fire at Milva. The archer didn't even twitch, although all around her it was dusty with plaster, chips of marble and splinters of shattering shafts. She calmly released the bowstring. Another yell, and another archer tumbled over like a ragdoll, splashing his companions with blood and brains. Now, yelled Geralt, seeing the guards fleeing from the gallery, dropping to the floor, hiding from the deadly arrowheads. Only the three bravest were still shooting. An arrowhead thudded against a pillar, showering Milva in a cloud of plaster dust. 
The archer blew on her hair, which was falling over her face, and bent her bow. Milva! Geralt, Angulem, and Kair had reached the arcade. Leave it! Run! One more little shot, said the archer, with the fletching of an arrow in the corner of her mouth. The bowstring slapped. One of the three brave men howled, leaned over the balustrade, and plummeted downwards onto the flags of the courtyard. At the sight, courage immediately deserted the others. They fell to the floor and pressed themselves against it. Those who had arrived were in no hurry to come out onto the gallery and expose themselves to Milva's shooting. With one exception. Milva measured him up at once. Short, slim, swarthy, with a bracer on his left forearm rubbed to a shine and an archer's glove on his right hand. She saw him lift a shapely composite bow with a profiled carved riser, saw him tauten it smoothly. She saw the bowstring, tightened to its full draw, cross his swarthy face, saw the red feathered fletching touch his cheek. She saw him aim carefully. She tossed her bow up, tightened it smoothly, already aiming as she did so. The bowstring touched her face, the feather of the fletching, the corner of her mouth. Harder, harder, Mariska. All the way to your cheek. Twist the bowstring with your fingers so the arrow doesn't fall from the rest. Hand tight against your cheek. Aim. Both eyes open. Now hold your breath. Shoot. The bowstring, in spite of the woolen bracer, stung her left forearm painfully. Her father was about to speak when he was seized by a coughing fit. A heavy, dry, painful coughing fit. He's coughing worse and worse, thought Marishka Baring, lowering her bow. More and more horribly, and more and more often. He started coughing yesterday as he was aiming at a book, and for dinner there was only boiled pigweed. I can't stand boiled pigweed. I hate hunger and poverty. Old Baring sucked in air, wheezing gratingly. Your arrow passed a span from the bullseye, lass. A whole span. And I've told you, ain't I, not to twitch when you're letting the bowstring go. And you're hopping about like a slug's crawled into your arse crack. <laughs> and you take too long aiming. You're shooting with a weary arm. That's how you waste arrows. But I hit the target, and not a span at all, but half a span from the bullseye. Don't talk back. How the gods punish me by sending me a clod of a lass instead of a son. I ain't a clod, we'll soon find out. Shoot one more time, and mark what I told you. You had to stand like you were sunk into the ground. Aim, and shoot swiftly. Why are you making faces? Because you're bad-mouthing me. It's my fatherly right. Shoot. She drew back the bow, sullen and close to tears. He noticed. I love you, Marishka, he said softly. Always mind that. She released the bowstring when the fletching had barely touched the corner of her mouth. Well done, said her father. Well done, lass. And coughed horribly, wheezingly. The swarthy archer from the gallery died outright. Milva's arrow struck him below his left armpit and penetrated deep, more than halfway up the shaft, shattering his ribs, pulverizing his lungs and heart. The swarthy archer's red-feathered arrow, released a split second earlier, struck Milva low in the belly and exited at the back, having shattered her pelvis and pulverized her intestines and arteries. The archer fell to the floor as though rammed. Geralt and Kaia shouted with one voice, Heedless that at the sight of Milva's collapse the marksmen from the gallery had once again picked up their bows, they jumped out from the portico protecting them, grabbed the archer and dragged her back, scornful of the hail of arrows. One of the arrowheads rang against Kaia's helmet. Another, Geralt would have sworn, parted his hair. Milva left behind her a broad and glistening trail of blood. In the blink of an eye, a huge pool had appeared in the place they laid her down. Kaia cursed, his hands shaking. Geralt felt despair overcoming him, and fury. Auntie, howled Angoulême. Auntie, don't die. Maria Baring opened her mouth, coughed horrifyingly, spitting blood under her chin. I love you too, Papa, she said quite distinctly, and died.
The shaven-headed acolytes couldn't cope with the struggling and yelling Siri, and lackeys rushed to help them. One, kicked between the legs, leapt back, bent over double, and felt his knees grabbing his crotch and gasping spasmodically for air. But that only infuriated the others. Siri was punched in the neck and slapped in the face. They knocked her over. Someone kicked her hard in the hip, and someone else sat down on her shins. One of the bald acolytes, a young character with evil green and gold eyes, kneeled on her chest, dug his fingers into her hair, and tugged it hard. Siri howled. The acolyte also howled and goggled. Siri saw streams of blood gushing from his shaven head, staining his white laboratory coat with a macabre design. The next second, hell broke loose in the laboratory. Overturned furniture banged. The high-pitched cracking and crunching of breaking glass merged with the hellish moaning of people. The decocts, filters, elixirs, extracts, and other magical substances spilling over the tables and floor mixed up and combined, some of them hissing on contact and belching clouds of yellow smoke. The room was instantly filled with a pungent stench. Amidst the smoke, through tears brought on by the smell of burning, Siri saw to her horror a black shape resembling an enormous bat dashing around the laboratory at an incredible speed. She saw the bat in flight, slashing the men and saw them falling over, screaming. In front of her eyes, a lackey trying hard to flee was picked up from the floor and flung onto a table, where he thrashed around, splashed blood, and finally croaked among smashed retorts, alembics, test tubes and flasks. The mixture of spilled liquids splashed onto a lamp. It hissed, stinking, and flames suddenly exploded in the laboratory. A wave of heat dispersed the smoke. She clenched her teeth so as not to scream. A slender, grey-haired man dressed elegantly in black was sitting on the steel chair meant for her. The man was calmly biting and sucking on the neck of the shaven-headed acolyte slumped over his knee. The acolyte squealed shrilly and twitched convulsively, his extended legs and arms jerking rhythmically. Corpse blue flames were dancing on the metal tabletop. Retorts and flasks exploded with a thud one after another. The vampire tore his pointed fangs from the victim's neck and fixed his agate black eyes on Siri. There are occasions, he said in an explanatory tone, licking blood from his lips, when it's simply impossible not to have a drink. Don't fear, he smiled, seeing her expression. Don't fear, Siri. I'm glad I found you. My name's Emil Rages. I am, although it may seem strange to you, a comrade of the Witcher Geralt. I came here with him to rescue you. An armed mercenary rushed into the blazing laboratory. Geralt's comrade turned his head towards him, hissed and bared his fangs. The mercenary howled horrifyingly. The howling went on for a long time before it faded into the distance. Emil Regis threw the acolyte's body, motionless and soft as a rag from his knee, stood up and stretched just like a cat. Who would have thought it, he said. Just some rent, and what good blood inside him. What hidden talents. Come with me, Cyrilla, I'll take you to Geralt. No, mumbled Siri. You don't have to be afraid of me. I'm not, she protested, bravely fighting with her teeth, which insisted on chattering. That's not what it's about. B but Yennefer is imprisoned here somewhere. I have to free her as quickly as possible. I I'm afraid that Vilgefort's Mr... Emil Regis. Warn Geralt, good sir, that Vilgefortz is here. He's a sorcerer, a powerful sorcerer. Geralt has to be on his guard. You're to be on your guard, repeated Regis, looking at Milva's body, because Vilgefortz is a powerful mage. Meanwhile, she's setting Yennefer free. Geralt swore. Come on, he yelled trying to revive the low spirits of his companions with a shout. Let's go! Let's go! Angoulême stood up and wiped away her tears. Let's go! It's time to kick a few fucking arses! I feel such strength inside me, I could probably lay waste to this entire castle, hissed the vampire, smiling gruesomely. The witcher glanced at him suspiciously. Don't go that far, he said but force your way through to the upper floor and make a bit of a racket to draw their attention away from me. I'll try to find Siri. It wasn't good. It wasn't good, vampire, that you left her alone. 
She demanded it, Rages explained calmly, using a tone and attitude that ruled out any discussion. She astonished me, I admit. I know. Go to the upper floor. Look after yourselves. I'll try to find her. Her or Yennefer. He found her, and quite quickly. He ran into them all of a sudden, completely unexpectedly, coming around a bend in a corridor. He saw and the sight made the adrenaline prick the veins on the back of his hands. Several lackeys were dragging Yennefer along the corridor. The sorceress was dishevelled and shackled in chains, which didn't stop her kicking and struggling and swearing like a trooper. Geralt didn't let the lackeys get over their astonishment. He only struck once, with one short thrust from the elbow. The man howled like a dog, staggered, smashed his head with a clank and a thud against a suit of plate armour standing in an alcove, and slid down it, smearing blood over the steel plates. The remaining ones, there were three of them, released Yennefer and left aside, apart from the fourth, who seized the sorceress by the hair and held a knife to her throat just above her demeritium collar. Don't come any closer, he howled. I'll slit her throat. I'm not joking. Neither am I. Geralt swung his sword around and looked the thug in the eyes. That was enough for him. He released Yennefer and joined his companions. All of them were now holding weapons. One of them wrenched an antique but menacing-looking halberd from a panoply on the wall. All of them, crouching, were vacillating between attack and defence. I knew you'd come, said Yennefer, straightening up proudly. Geralt, show these scoundrels what a witch's sword can do. She raised her cuffed hands high, tautening the links of the chain. Geralt grasped his sile in both hands, tilted his head slightly and aimed and smote, so swiftly no one saw the movement of the blade. The links fell onto the floor with a clank. One of the servants gasped. Geralt grasped the hilt more tightly and moved his index finger under the cross guard. Stand still, Yen. Head slightly to one side, please. The sorceress didn't even flinch. The sound of metal being struck by the sword was very faint. The dimeritium collar fell down beside the manacles. Only a single tiny drop appeared on Yennefer's neck. She laughed, massaging her wrists, and turned towards the lackeys. None of them could endure her gaze. The one with the halberd placed the antique weapon gingerly on the floor, as though afraid it would clank. Let Tawny Owl, he mumbled, fight someone like that himself. My life is dear to me. They ordered us, muttered another withdrawing. They ordered us. We were captive. After all... We won't root to you, madam, in your prison. A third licked his lips. Testify to that. Be gone, said Yennefer. Freed from the Dimeritium manacles, erect, with her head proudly raised, she looked like a titaness. Her unruly black mane seemed to reach up to the vault. The lackeys fled, furtively and without looking back. Having shrunk to her normal dimensions... Yennefer fell on Geralt's neck. I knew you'd come for me, she murmured, searching for his mouth with hers. That you'd come, whatever might happen. Let's go, he said after a moment, gasping for air. Now for Siri. Siri, she said, and a second later, a menacing violet glow lit up in her eyes. And Vilgefortz. A man with a crossbow came around the corner, yelled and shot, aiming at the sorceress. Geralt leapt as though propelled by a spring, brandished his sword, and the deflected bolt flew right over the crossbowman's head, so close he had to crouch. He didn't manage to straighten up, though, for the witcher leapt forward and filleted him like a carp. Two more were still standing in the corridor, also holding crossbows. They also fired, but their hands were shaking too much to find the target. The next moment, the witcher was upon them and they were both dead. Which way, Yen? The sorceress focused, closing her eyes. That way, up those stairs. Are you sure it's the right way? Yes. They were attacked by thugs just around the bend in the corridor, not far from a portal decorated with an archivolt. There were more than ten of them, and they were armed with spears, partisans and corsets. They were even determined and fierce. In spite of that, it didn't take long. Yennefer stabbed one of them in the centre of the chest at once with a fiery arrowhead shot from her hand. Geralt whirled in a pirouette and fell among the others, 
the dwarven sile flashing and hissing like a snake. Once four had fallen, the rest fled, the corridors echoing with their clanking and stamping. Everything in order yet? Couldn't be better. Vilgefortz stood beneath the archivolt. I'm impressed, he said calmly and resonantly. I really am impressed, Witcher. You're naive and hopelessly stupid, but your technique is impressive. Your brigands, Yennefer replied just as calmly, have just beaten a retreat, leaving you at our mercy. Hand Siri over, and we'll spare your life. Do you know, Yennefer, that that's the second such generous offer I've had today? The sorcerer grinned. Thank you, thank you. And here's my answer. Look out, yelled Yennefer, jumping aside. Geralt also leapt aside, just in time. The column of fire shooting from the sorcerer's outstretched hands transformed the place they had been standing a moment earlier into black and fizzing mud. The witcher wiped soot and the remains of his eyebrows off his face. He saw Vilgefortz extend a hand. He dived aside and flattened himself against the floor behind the base of a column. There was a boom so loud it hurt their ears, and the whole castle was shaken to its foundations. Booming echoed through the castle. The walls trembled and the chandeliers jingled. A large oil portrait in a gilded frame fell with a great clatter. The mercenaries who ran up from the vestibule had abject fear in their eyes. Stefan Skelen calmed them with a menacing look and took them to task with his grim expression and voice. What's going on there? Talk. My lord coroner, wheezed one of them. There's horror there. There's demons and devils there. They're shooting unerringly. It's a massacre. Death is there. It's red with gore everywhere. Some ten men have fallen. Perhaps more. Over yonder. Do you hear, sir? There was another boom, and the castle shook. Magic, muttered Skellen. Vilgevort. Well, we shall see. We'll find out who is beating whom. Another hireling came running. He was pale and covered in plaster. For a long time he couldn't utter a word, and when he finally spoke, his hands trembled and his voice shook. There's... There's... A monster, Lord Coroner, like a great black flitter mouse. It was tearing people's heads off before my very eyes. Blood was gushing everywhere, and it was darting around and laughing. It had teeth like this. We won't escape with our lives, whispered a voice behind Tawny Owl's back. Lord Corinna. Boreas Munn decided to speak. They are spectres. I saw the young Graf Kaya Kyalak, but he's dead. Skelen looked at him, but didn't say anything. Lord Stefan, mumbled Dacre Siliphant. Who are we to fight here? They aren't men, groaned one of the mercenaries. They're sorcerers and hellish devils. Human strength cannot cope against such as them. Tawny Owl crossed his arms on his chest and swept a bold and imperious gaze over the mercenaries. So we shall not get involved in this conflict of hellish forces, he announced thunderously and emphatically. Let demons fight with demons, witches with witches, and ghosts with corpses risen from the grave. We won't interfere with them. We shall wait here calmly for the outcome of the battle. The mercenaries' faces brightened up. The morale rose perceptibly. That staircase is the only way out, Skelen continued in a powerful voice. We'll wait here. We shall see who tries coming down it. A terrible boom resounded from above, and mouldings fell from the vault with an audible rustle. There was a stench of sulphur and burning. It's too dark here, called Tawny Owl, thunderously and boldly to raise his troop spirits. Briskly, light whatever you can, torches, brands. We have to see well whoever appears on those stairs. Fill those iron cressets with some fuel or other. What kind of fuel, sir? Skelen indicated wordlessly what kind. Pictures. A mercenary asked in disbelief. Paintings? Yes, indeed, snorted Tawny Owl. Why are you looking like that? Art is dead. 
Frames were splinted and paintings shredded. The well-dried wood and canvas, saturated with linseed oil, caught fire immediately and flared up with a bright flame. Boreas Mun watched, his mind completely made up. There was a boom and a flash, and the column they had managed to jump away from at almost the last moment disintegrated. The shaft broke, the capital, decorated with acanthus leaves, crashed to the floor, destroying a terracotta mosaic. A ball of lightning hurtled towards them with a hiss. Yennefer deflected it, screaming out a spell and gesticulating. Vilgefortz walked towards them, his cloak fluttering like a dragon's wings. I am not surprised at Yennefer, he said as he walked. She is a woman, and thus an evolutionary inferior creature governed by hormonal chaos. But you, Geralt, are not only a man who is sensible by nature, but also a mutant, invulnerable to emotions. He waved a hand. There was a boom and a flash. A lightning bolt bounced off the shield Yennefer had conjured up. In spite of your good sense, Vilgefortz continued to talk, pouring fire from hand to hand. In one matter, you demonstrate astounding and foolish perseverance. You invariably desire to row upstream and piss into the wind. It had to end badly. Know that today, here in Stigger Castle, you have pissed into a hurricane. A battle was raging somewhere on the lower stories. Someone screamed horribly, moaned and wailed in pain. Something was burning. Siri could smell smoke and burning and felt a waft of hot air. Something boomed with such force that the columns holding up the vault trembled and stuccos fell off the walls. Siri cautiously looked around the corner. The corridor was empty. She walked along it quickly and silently, with rows of statues standing in alcoves on her right and left. She had seen those statues once. In her dreams. She exited the corridor and ran straight into a man with a spear. She sprang aside, ready to dodge and somersault. And then she realized it wasn't a man, but a thin, grey-haired, stooped woman, and that it wasn't a spear, but a broom. A sorceress with black hair is imprisoned somewhere around here. Siri cleared her throat. Where? The woman with the broom was silent for a long time, moving her mouth as though chewing something. And how should I know, treasure? She finally mumbled. For I only clean here. Nothing else. Just clean up after them, she repeated, not looking at Siri at all. And all they do is keep dirt in the place. Look for yourself, treasure. Siri looked. There was a smudged zigzag streak of blood on the floor. The streak extended for a few paces and ended beside a corpse huddled up by the wall. Two more corpses lay further on, one curled up in a ball, the other positively indecently spread-eagled. Beside them lay crossbows. They keep making a mess. The woman took a pail and rag, kneeled down and set about cleaning. Dirt. Nothing but dirt. All the time, dirt, and I must clean and clean. Will there ever be an end to it? No, Siri said softly. Never. That's what this world's come to. The woman stopped cleaning, but didn't raise her head. I clean, she said. Nothing more. But I'll tell you, treasure, that you must go straight and then left. Thank you. The woman bowed her head even lower and resumed her cleaning. She was alone, alone and lost in the maze of corridors. Madame Yennefer! Up until then, she had kept quiet, afraid of saddling herself with Vilgefortz's men. But now, Yennefer! She thought she'd heard something. Yes, for sure. She ran into a gallery, and from there into a large hall between slender pillars. The stench of burning reached her nostrils again. Bonnard, 
emerged like a ghost from a niche and punched her in the face. She staggered, and he leapt on her like a hawk, seized her by the throat, pinning her to the wall with his forearm. Siri looked into his fish-like eyes and felt her heart drop downwards to her belly. I wouldn't have found you if you hadn't called, he wheezed out. But you called, and longingly, to cap it all off. Have you missed me so, my little darling? Still pinning her to the wall, he slipped his hand into the hair on her nape. Siri jerked her head. The bounty hunter grinned. He ran his hand over her arm, squeezed her breast, and grabbed her roughly by the crotch. Then he released her and pushed her so that she slid down the wall and tossed a sword at her feet. Her swallow. And she knew at once what he wanted. I'd have preferred it in the ring, he drawled, as the crowning achievement, as the grand finale of many beautiful performances. The Witcher Girl against Leo Bonnard. Eh? People would pay to see something like that. Go on. Pick up the weapon and draw it from the scabbard. She did as he said, but she didn't draw the blade, just slung it across her back so the hilt would be within reach. Bonnard took a step back. I thought it would suffice me to gladden my eyes with the sight of that surgery Vilgefortz is preparing for you, he said. I was mistaken. I must feel your life flowing down my blade. I defy witchcraft and sorcerers, destiny, prophecies, the fate of the world. I defy the elder and younger blood. What do all these predictions and spells mean to me? What do I gain from them? Nothing. Nothing can compare with the pleasure. He broke off. She saw him purse his lips, saw his eyes flash ominously. I'll bleed you to death, witcher girl he hissed. And afterwards, before you cool off, we'll celebrate our nuptials. You are mine, and you'll die mine. Throw your weapon. A distant thud resounded, and the castle shuddered. Vilgefortz, Bonnet explained with an inscrutable expression, is reducing your witcher rescuers to pulp. Go on, girl, draw your sword. Shall I run away? She thought, frozen in terror. Flee to other places, to other times. If only I could get far from him, if only... She felt shame. How can I run away? Leave Yennefer and Geralt at their mercy. But good sense told her. I'm not much used to them dead. She focused, pressing her fists to her temples. Barnard knew immediately what she was planning and lunged for her. But it was too late. There was a buzzing in Ciri's ears. Something flashed. I've done it, she thought triumphantly. And at once realized her triumph was premature. She realized it on hearing furious yelling and curses. The evil, hostile and paralyzing aura of the place was probably to blame for the fiasco. She hadn't traveled far. Not even out of eyeshot. Only to the opposite end of the gallery. Not far from Bonnard, but beyond the range of his hands and his sword, temporarily at least. Pursued by his roar, Ciri turned and ran. She ran down a long, wide corridor, followed by the dead glances of the alabaster caryatids holding up the arcades. She turned once and then again. She wanted to lose and confuse Bonnard, and furthermore, she was heading towards the noises of the battle. Her friends would be where the fighting was raging, she was sure. She rushed into a large round room, in the centre of which a sculpture portraying a woman with her face covered, most probably a goddess, stood on a marble plinth. Two corridors led away from the room, both quite narrow. She chose at random. Naturally, she chose wrongly. The wench! roared one of the thugs. We have her! There were too many of them to be able to risk fighting, even in a narrow corridor and Barnard was surely nearby. Ciri turned back and bolted. She burst into the room with the marble goddess and froze. Before her, 
stood a knight with a great sword in a black cloak and helmet decorated with the wings of a bird of prey. The town was burning. She heard the roar of fire, saw flames flickering and felt the heat of the conflagration. The neighing of horses and the screaming of the murdered were in her ears. The black bird's wings suddenly flapped, covering everything. Help! Sintra, she thought, coming to her senses. The Isle of Thaneth. He's followed me all the way here. He's a demon. I'm surrounded by demons, by nightmares from my dreams. Barnhart behind me, him in front of me. The shouting and stamping of enemies coming running could be heard behind her. The knight in the plumed helmet suddenly took a step forward. Ciri overcame her fear. She yanked Swallow from its scabbard. You will not touch me! The knight moved forward, and Ciri noticed in amazement that a fair-haired girl armed with a curved saber was hiding behind his cloak. The girl flashed past Ciri like a lynx, sending one of the approaching lackeys sprawling with a slash of her saber. And the black knight, astonishingly, rather than attacking Ciri, slit open another thug with a powerful blow. The remaining ones retreated into the corridor. The fair-haired girl rushed for the door, but didn't manage to close it, although she was whirling her saber menacingly and yelling. The lackeys shoved her back from the portal. Ciri saw one of them stab her with a pylum, saw the girl fall to her knees. Ciri leapt and slashed backhand with Swallow, while the black knight ran up on the other side, hacking terribly with his longsword. The fair-haired girl, still on her knees, drew an axe from her belt and hurled it, hitting one of the bruisers right in the face. Then she lunged for the door, slammed it, and the knight bolted it. Phew, said the girl. Oh, can I It'll take us some time to chop the way through that. They won't waste time. They'll search for another way, commented the black knight soberly, after which his face suddenly darkened on seeing the girl's blood-soaked trouser leg. The girl waved a hand dismissively. Let's be away. The knight removed his helmet and looked at Ciri. I'm Kaya Maur Daifren, son of Kjallach. I came here with Geralt to rescue you, Ciri. I know it's unbelievable. I've seen more unbelievable things, Ciri growled. You've come a long way, Kaya. Where's Geralt? He looked at her. She remembered his eyes from Thaneth, dark blue and as soft as silk. Pretty. He is rescuing the sorceress, he answered. That Yennefer, let's go. Yes, said the fair-haired girl, putting a makeshift dressing on her thigh. We still have to kick a few asses for Auntie. Let's go, repeated the knight. But it was too late. Run away, whispered Ciri, seeing who was approaching along the corridor. He's the devil incarnate, but he only wants me. He won't come after you. Run. Help Geralt. Kaia shook his head. Siri, he said kindly. I'm surprised by what you're saying. I came here from the end of the world to find you, rescue you and defend you. And now you want me to run away? You don't know what you're up against. Kaia pulled up his sleeve, tore off his cloak and wrapped it around his left arm. He brandished his sword and whirled it so fast it hummed. I'll soon find out. Bonnart, seeing the three of them, stopped, but only for a moment. Aha, he said. Have the reinforcements arrived? Your companions, which a girl? Very well. Two less, two more, makes no difference. Siri had a sudden flash of inspiration. Say farewell to your life, Bonnart, she yelled. It's the end of you. You've met your match. She must have overdone it, and he caught the lie in her voice. He stopped and looked suspiciously. The Witcher? Really? Kaia whirled his sword, standing in position. Bonard didn't budge. This witch has more of a liking for younger men than I expected, he hissed. Just look here, my young blade. He pulled his shirt open. Silver medallions flashed in his fist. A cat a griffin and a wolf. If you are truly a witcher, he ground his teeth, know that your own quack amulet will soon embellish my collection. If you're not a witcher, you'll be a corpse before you manage to blink. 
It would be wise, therefore, to get out of my way and take to your heels. I want this wench. I don't bear a grudge against you. You talk, big, Kaya said calmly, twirling the blade. Let's see if your bite's worse than your bark. Angulem, Siri, flee. Kair, run, he corrected himself, and help Geralt. They ran. Siri was holding up the limping Angulem. You asked for it. Barnard squinted his pale eyes and moved forward, whirling his sword. I asked for it? Kair, Maud, Daifren, of Kjallach repeated dully. No. It's what destiny wants. They leapt at each other, quickly engaged, surrounding each other with a frantic kaleidoscope of blades. The corridor filled with a clang of iron, seemingly making the marble sculpture tremble and rock. You aren't bad, rasped Bonnard when they came apart. You aren't bad, my young blade. But you're no witcher. The little viper deceived me. You're done for. Prepare for death. You talk, big. Kair took a deep breath. The clash had convinced him he had faint chance with the fishy-eyed man. This man was too fast and too strong for him. The only chance was that Bonnard was in a hurry to get off to Siri, and he was clearly irritated. Bonnard attacked again. Kair parried a cut, stooped, jumped, seized his opponent by the belt, shoved him against the wall, and kneed him hard in the crotch. Bonnard caught him by the face, battered him powerfully on the side of the head with his sword pommel. Once. Twice. Thrice. The third blow shoved Kaya back. He saw the flash of the blade. He parried instinctively. Too slowly. It was a strictly observed tradition in the Diverin family that all male members would hold a silent vigil lasting a whole day and night over the body of a fallen kinsman once he was inhumed in the castle armory. The women gathered in a remote wing of the castle so as not to disturb the men, not to distract them or disrupt their reflections, would sob, keen and faint. When brought round, they sobbed and keened again, and da capo. Sobbing and weeping, even among women, Vicovarian noble women, was an unwelcome faux pas and a great dishonour. But among the Dovrins, that and no other was the tradition, and no one ever changed it, or meant to change it. The ten-year-old Kair, the youngest brother of Ailil, who had fallen in Nazaire and was then lying in the castle armory, was not yet a man in terms of customs and traditions. He was not allowed to join the group of men gathered around the open coffin, and he was not permitted to sit in silence with his grandfather Grevith, with his father Kjallach, his brother Deran, or the whole collection of uncles and cousins. Neither was he permitted, naturally, to sob and faint along with his grandmother, mother, three sisters, and the whole collection of aunts and cousins. Kair clowned about and made mischief on the castle walls along with the rest of his young relatives who had come to Don Dovre for the obsequies, funeral and wake. And he pummeled any boys who considered that the bravest of the brave in the fighting for Nazaire were their own fathers and older brothers, but not Ailil Ipkialach. Kair, come here, my son. In the cloister stood Maur, Kair's mother, and her sister, his aunt Hineid, Varanahid. His mother's face was red and so swollen from weeping that Kair was terrified. It shocked him that weeping could make such a monster out of such a comely woman as his mother. He made a firm resolution never ever to cry. Remember, son, Maur sobbed, pressing the boy so hard to her breast he couldn't catch his breath. Remember this day. Remember who took the life from your dear brother Eilil. The damned Nordlings did it. Your foes, my son. You are ever to hate them. You are to hate that damned, murderous nation. I shall hate them, mother of mine, Kaya promised, somewhat surprised. Firstly, his brother Ailo had died the praiseworthy and enviable death of a warrior, in battle with honour. What was one to shed tears over? Secondly, it was no secret that his grandmother, Eviva, Maur's mother, was descended from Nordlings. Papa had more than once called his grandmother in anger, She-Wolf from the North. Behind her back, naturally. Well, but if mother is now ordering me... I shall hate them, he pledged eagerly. I already hate them. And when I'm big and have a real sword, I'll go to war and chop off their heads. You'll see, ma'am. His mother took a breath and began sobbing. Aunt Hineid held her up. 
Kaia clenched his little fists and trembled with hatred. With hatred for those who had wronged his mamma, making her so ugly. Von Hart's blow clove his temple, cheek and mouth. Kaia dropped his sword and staggered, and the bounty hunter cut him between his neck and collarbone using the force of a half turn. Kaia tumbled at the feet of the marble goddess, and his blood splashed the statue's plinth like a pagan sacrifice. There was a boom. The floor trembled beneath feet, and a shield fell with a thud from a wall panoply. Acrid smoke trailed and crept along the corridor. Siri wiped her face. The fair-haired girl she was supporting weighed her down like a millstone. Quick, we must run quicker. I can't run any quicker, said the girl, and suddenly sat down heavily on the floor. Siri saw with horror a red puddle begin to spill out and collect beneath the seated girl, beneath her blood-soaked trouser leg. The girl was white as a sheet. Siri threw herself on her knees beside her, pulled off her scarf and then her belt, trying to apply tourniquets. But the wound was too severe and too near her groin. The blood kept dripping. The girl grasped her by the hand, her fingers as cold as ice. Siri? Yes? I'm Uncle M. I didn't believe... I didn't believe we'd find you. But I followed Geralt. Because it's impossible not to follow him, isn't it? It is. That's how he is. We found you. And rescued you. And Fringilla mocked us. Tell me. Don't say anything, please. Tell me. Angoulême was moving her lips, slower and slower, and with greater difficulty. Tell me, you're a, a queen, aren't you? In Sintra? We'll be in your good graces, won't we? Will you make me a... a countess? Tell me. Don't lie. Can you? Tell me. Don't say anything. Save your strength. Angoulême sighed, suddenly leaned over forward, and rested her brow against Ciri's shoulder. I knew, she said quite clearly. I knew that a brothel in Toussaint would be a better fucking way of making a living. A long, long time passed before Siri realized she was holding a dead girl in her arms. She saw him as he approached, being led by the lifeless looks of the alabaster caryatids holding up the arcades, and suddenly understood that flight was impossible, that it was impossible to escape from him, that she would have to face him. She knew it, but was still too afraid of him. He drew his weapon. Swallow's blade sang softly. She knew that song. She retreated down the wide corridor, and he followed her, holding his sword in both hands. Blood trickled down the blade, heavy drops dripping from the crossguard. Dead, he judged, stepping over Angoulême's body. Well and good. Your young blade has also fallen. Siri felt desperation seizing her, felt her fingers gripping the hilt so tightly it hurt. She retreated. You deceived me, drawled Bonnart, following her. The young blade didn't have a medallion, but something tells me somebody will be found in this castle who wears one. Someone like that will be found. Old Leo Bonnart stakes his life on it, somewhere near the witch Yennefer. But first things first, viper. First of all, alas, you and me, and our nuptials. Siri got her bearings. Describing a short arc with Swallow, she took up her position. She began to circle him, quicker and quicker, forcing the bounty hunter to move around on the spot. Last time, he muttered, 
That trick wasn't much use to you. Well, can't you learn from your mistakes? Siri speeded up. She deceived and beguiled, tantalized and hypnotized with flowing soft movements of her blade. Bonnard whirled his sword in a hissing moulinet. That doesn't work on me, he snarled, and it bores me. He shortened the distance with two rapid strides. Play music. He leapt, cut hard. Siri spun around in a pirouette, jumped, landed confidently on her left foot, and struck at once without assuming a position. Before the blade had clanged on Bonnart's parry, she had spun past, smoothly moving in under the whistling blow. She struck again, without a backswing, using an unnatural, unorthodox bend of the elbow. Bonnart blocked, using the momentum of the parry to immediately slash from the left. She was expecting that, and all she needed was a slight bend of the knees and a sway of her trunk to move her whole body aside from under the blade. She countered and thrust at once. But this time he was waiting for her and deceived her with a feint. Not meeting a parry, she almost lost her balance, saving herself with a lightning-fast leap, but his sword caught her arm anyway. At first, she thought the blade had only cut through her padded sleeve, but a moment later, she felt the warm liquid in her armpit and on her arm. The alabaster caryatids observed them with indifferent eyes. She drew back and he followed her, hunched, making wide, sweeping movements with his sword, like the bony death Siri had seen on paintings in the temple. The dance of the skeletons, she thought. The grim reaper is coming. She drew back. The warm liquid was now dripping down her forearm and hand. First blood to me, he said, at the sight of the drops splattering starlike on the floor. Who'll draw the second blood, my betrothed? She retreated. Look around. It's the end. He was right. The corridor ended in nothingness, in an abyss, at the bottom of which could be seen the dust-covered, dirty and smashed-up floorboards of the lower story. This part of the castle was destroyed. There was no floor at all. There was only a framework of load-bearing timbers, posts, ridges and a lattice of beams. She didn't hesitate for long. She stepped onto a beam and moved backwards along it without taking her eyes off Bonnard, watching his every move. That saved her. For he suddenly charged her, running along the beam, slashing with rapid diagonal blows, whirling his sword in lightning-fast feints. She knew what he was counting on. A wrong parry or mistake with a feint would have upset her balance, and then she would have fallen off the beam onto the smashed-up woodblocks of the lower floor. This time, Siri didn't let the feints deceive her. Quite the opposite. She spun around nimbly and feinted a blow from the right, and when for a split second he hesitated, cut with the right second so quickly and powerfully that Bonnard rocked after parrying, and would have fallen if not for his height. He managed to hold onto a ridge by reaching up with his left hand, keeping his balance, but he lost concentration for a split second, and that was enough for Siri. She lunged hard, fully extending her arm and blade. He didn't even flinch as Swallow's blade passed with a hiss across his chest and left arm. He immediately countered so viciously that had Siri not turned a back somersault, the blow would probably have cut her in half. She hopped onto the adjacent beam, dropping onto one knee with her sword held horizontally over her head. Bonnard glanced at his shoulder and raised his left arm, already marked by a pattern of wavy crimson lines. He looked at the thick drops dripping downwards into the abyss. Well, well, he said. You do know how to learn from your mistakes. His voice trembled with fury. But Siri knew him too well. He was calm, composed and ready to kill. He leapt onto her beam, whirling his sword, went for her like a hurricane, treading surely without wobbling or even looking at his feet. The beam creaked, raining down dust and rotten wood. He pushed on, slashing diagonally. He forced her backwards. He attacked so quickly she couldn't risk a leap or a somersault, so she had to keep parrying and dodging. She saw a flash in his fishy eyes. She knew what was afoot. He was driving her against a post to the truss beneath the ridge. He was pushing her back to a place from where there was no escape. She had to do something. And she suddenly knew what. Kaer Moren. The pendulum. You push off from the pendulum. You take its momentum, its energy. You take its momentum by pushing off. Do you understand? Yes, Geralt. 
All of a sudden, with the speed of a striking viper, she went from a parry to a cut. Swallow's blade groaned, striking against Barnard's edge. Simultaneously, Siri pushed off and jumped onto the adjacent beam. She landed, miraculously keeping her balance. She took a few quick, light steps and leapt again, back onto Bonnard's beam, landing behind his back. He spun around in time, made a sweeping cut, almost blindly, to where her leap should have carried her. He missed her by a hair's breadth, and the force of the blow made him stagger. Siri attacked like a lightning strike. She lunged, dropping onto one knee. She struck powerfully and surely. And she froze, with her sword held out to the side. Watching calmly, as the long, slanting, perfectly straight slit in his jacket began to well up and brim a dense red. You! Bonnard staggered. You! He came for her. He was already slow and sluggish. She eluded him by leaping backwards, and he lost his balance. He fell onto one knee, but did not plant his other on the beam, and the wood was now wet and slippery. He looked at Siri for a second. Then he fell. She saw him tumble onto the parquet floor in a geyser of dust, plaster and blood, saw his sword fly several yards to one side. He lay motionless, spread out, huge and gaunt, wounded and utterly defenceless, but still terrible. It took some time, but he finally twitched, groaned, tried to raise his head. He moved his arms, he moved his legs, he crept to a post and propped his back up against it. He groaned again, feeling his bloodied chest and belly with both hands. Siri leapt down and fell beside him onto one knee, as softly as a cat. She saw his fishy eyes widen in fear. You won, he wheezed, looking at Swallow's blade. You won, Witcher Girl. Pity it wasn't in the arena. It would have been some spectacle. She didn't reply. It was I who gave you that sword. Do you remember? I remember everything. Surely you won't, he grunted. Surely you won't finish me off, will you? You won't do it. You won't finish off a beaten and defenseless man. I know you, after all, Siri. You're too... noble for that. He looked long at her. Very long. Then she bent over. Bonnard's eyes widened even more. But she just tore from his neck the medallions. The wolf, the cat and the griffin. Then she turned around and walked towards the exit. He lunged at her with a knife, sprang at her dishonorably and treacherously, and as silent as a bat. Only at the last moment, when the dagger was about to plunge up to the guard in her back, did he roar, putting all his hatred into the bellow. She dodged the treacherous thrust with a swift half-turn and leap, swung her arm and struck quickly and widely, powerfully, with a full swing, increasing the power with a twist of the hips. Swallow, swished and cut, cut with the very tip of the blade. There was a hiss and a squelch, and Bonnard grabbed his throat. His fishy eyes were popping out of his head. Didn't I tell you, Siri said coldly, that I remember everything? Bonnard goggled even more, and then fell. He overbalanced and tumbled over backwards, raising dust. And he lay like that, huge, as bony as the Grim Reaper on the dirty floor among broken woodblocks. He was still clutching his throat tightly with all his might. But although he squeezed hard, his life was draining away fast between his fingers, spreading out around his head in a great black halo. Ciri stood over him, without a word, but allowing him to see her clearly, so as to take her image, her image alone, with him where he was going. Bonnard glanced at her, his gaze growing dull and blurred. He was shivering convulsively, scraping his heels over the floorboards. Then he uttered a gurgle of the kind a funnel gives just before it empties. 
and it was the last sound he made. There was a bang, and the stained glass windows exploded with a thud and a clink. Look out, Geralt! They jumped aside just in time. A blinding flash of lightning ploughed up the floor. Chips of terracotta and sharp shards of mosaic wailed in the air. Another flash of lightning hit the column the Witcher was hiding behind. The column broke into three parts. Half the arcade broke off the vault and crashed onto the floor with a deafening boom. Geralt, lying flat on the floor, shielded his head with his hands, aware of what poor protection they were against more than ten tons of rubble. He had prepared himself for the worst, but things were not too bad. He got up quickly, managed to see the glow of a magical shield above him, and realized that Yennefer's magic had saved him. Vilgefortz turned towards the sorceress and pulverized the pillar she was sheltering behind. He roared furiously, sewing together a cloud of smoke and dust with threads of fire. Yennefer managed to jump clear and retaliated, firing at the sorcerer her own flash of lightning, which, nonetheless, Vilgefortz deflected effortlessly and with sheer contempt. He replied with a blow that hurled Yennefer to the floor. Geralt rushed at him, wiping plaster from his face. Vilgefortz turned his eyes towards him and a hand from which flames exploded with a roar. The Witcher instinctively shielded himself with his sword. The rune-covered dwarven blade protected him astonishingly, cutting the stream of fire in half. Ha! roared Vilgefortz. Impressive, Witcher, and what say you to this? The Witcher said nothing. He flew as if he'd been rammed, fell onto the floor and shot across it, only stopping at the base of the column. The column broke up and fell to pieces, again taking a considerable part of the vault with it. This time, Yennefer wasn't quick enough to give him magical protection. A huge lump broken off from the arcade hit him in the shoulder. The pain paralyzed him for a moment. Yennefer, chanting spells, sent flash after flash of lightning towards Vilgefortz. None of them hit the target all harmlessly bouncing off the magical sphere protecting the sorcerer. Vilgefortz stretched out his arms and suddenly spread them. Yennefer cried out in pain and soared up into the air, levitating. Vilgefortz twisted his hands exactly as though he were wringing out a wet rag. The sorceress howled piercingly and began to spin. Geralt sprang up, overcoming the pain. But Rages was quieter. The vampire appeared out of nowhere in the form of an enormous bat and fell on Vilgefortz with a noiseless glide. Before the sorcerer could protect himself with a spell, Rages had slashed him across the face with his claws, only missing his eye because of its tiny size. Vilgefortz bellowed and waved his arms. Yennefer, now released, tumbled down onto a heap of rubble with an ear-splitting groan, blood bursting from her nose onto her face and chest. Geralt was now close, was already raising the sile to strike. But Vilgefortz was not yet defeated and did not mean to surrender. He threw off the Witcher with a great surge of power and shot a blinding white flame at the attacking vampire, which sliced through a column like a hot knife through butter. Rages nimbly avoided the flame and materialized in his normal shape alongside Geralt. Beware, grunted the Witcher, trying to see how Yennefer was. Beware, Rages. Beware? yelled the vampire. Me? I didn't come here to beware. With an incredible, lightning-fast, tiger-like bound, he fell on the sorcerer and grabbed him by the throat. His fangs flashed. Vilgefortz howled in horror and rage. For a moment it seemed as though it would be the end of him. But that was an illusion. The sorcerer had a weapon in his arsenal for every occasion, and for every opponent. Even a vampire. The hands that seized Rages glowed like red-hot iron. The vampire screamed. Geralt also screamed, seeing the sorcerer literally tearing Rages apart. He leapt to his aid, but wasn't fast enough. Vilgefortz pushed the mutilated vampire against a column and shot white fire at him from close up out of both hands. Rages screamed, screamed so horribly that the Witcher covered his ears with his hands. The rest of the stained glass windows exploded with a roar and a smash, and the columns simply melted. The vampire melted along with it, fusing into an amorphous lump. Geralt swore, putting all his rage and despair into the curse. He leapt at Vilgefortz, raising his sile to strike, but failed. Vilgefortz turned around and struck him with magical energy. 
The Witcher flew the whole length of the hall and slammed into the wall, sliding down it. He lay like a fish, gasping for air, not wondering what was broken, but what was intact. Vilgefortz walked towards him. A six-foot iron bar materialized in his hand. I could have reduced you to ashes with a spell, he said. I could have melted you into clinker like I did to that monster a moment ago. But you, Witcher, ought to die differently. In a fight. Not a very honest one, perhaps. But still. Geralt didn't believe he'd be able to stand. But he did. He spat blood from his cut lip. He gripped his sword more tightly. On Thaneth, Vilgefortz came closer, whirled the bar in a moulinet. I only broke you a little bit, sparingly, for it was meant to be a lesson. Since it wasn't learned, this time I'll break you thoroughly, into tiny little bones, so that no one will ever be able to stick you back together again. He attacked. Geralt didn't run away. He took on the fight. The bar flickered and whistled. The sorcerer circled around the dancing witcher. Geralt avoided the blows and delivered his own, but Vilgevort's deftly parried, and then steel groaned mournfully as it struck steel. The sorcerer was as quick and agile as a demon. He tricked Geralt with a twist of his trunk and a feigned blow from the left and slammed him in the ribs from below. Before the witcher could get his balance and his breath back, he was hit in the shoulder so hard he fell to his knees. He dodged aside, saving his skull from a blow from above, but could not avoid a reverse thrust from below, above the hip. He staggered and struck his back against the wall. He still had enough wits about him to fall to the floor, just in time, because the iron bar grazed his hair and slammed into the wall, sending sparks flying. Geralt rolled over and the bar struck sparks on the floor right beside his head. The second blow hit him in the shoulder blade. There was shock and paralyzing pain. Weakness flowed down to his legs. The sorcerer raised the bar. Triumph burned in his eyes. Geralt clenched Fringilla's medallion in his fist. The bar fell with a clang, striking the floor a foot from the witch's head. Geralt rolled away and quickly got up on one knee. Vilgefortz leapt forward and struck. The bar missed the target again by a few inches. The sorcerer shook his head in disbelief and hesitated for a second. He sighed, suddenly understanding. His eyes lit up. He leapt, taking a swing. Too late. Geralt slashed him hard across the belly. Vilgefort screamed, dropped the bar and staggered back, bent over. The witcher was already upon him. He pushed him with his boot onto the stump of the broken column and cut vigorously, diagonally from collarbone to hip. Blood gushed on the floor, painting an undulating pattern. The sorcerer screamed and fell to his knees. He lowered his head and looked down at his belly and chest. For a long time, he could not tear his eyes away from what he saw. Geralt waited calmly in position, with the sile ready to strike. Vilgefortz groaned piercingly and raised his head. Geralt! The witcher didn't let him finish. It was very quiet for a long time. I didn't know. Yennefer said at last, scrambling out of a pile of rubble. She looked terrible. The blood trickling from her nose had poured all over her chin and cleavage. I didn't know you could cast illusory spells, she repeated, seeing Geralt's uncomprehending gaze, capable even of deceiving Vilgefortz. It's my medallion. Aha. Uh -huh. She looked suspicious. A curious thing. But anyway... We're only alive thanks to Siri. I beg your pardon? His eye. He never regained full coordination. He didn't always land his blow. But I mainly owe my life to... She fell silent, glanced at the remains of the melted column in which the outline of a shape could be discerned. Who was that, Geralt? A friend. I'm going to miss him. Was he a human? The epitome of humanity. How are you, Yen? A few broken ribs, concussion, twisted hip joint, bruised spine. 
Besides that, excellent. And yourself? More or less the same. She looked impassively at Vilgefortz's head, lying exactly in the centre of the floor mosaic. The sorcerer's small eye, already glazed, looked at them with mute reproach. That's a nice sight, she said. It is, he admitted a moment later. But I've already seen enough. Will you be able to walk? With your help, yes. And they met, all three of them, in a place where the corridors came together under the arcades. They met beneath the dead gazes of the alabaster caryatids. Siri, said the witcher, and rubbed his eyes. Siri, said Yennefer, being held up by the witcher. Geralt, said Siri. Siri, he replied, overcoming a sudden tightening of the throat. Good to see you again. Madam Yennefer. The sorceress freed herself from the witcher's arm and straightened up with the greatest of effort. What do you look like, girl? She said severely. Just look at you. Tidy up your hair. Don't stoop. Come here, please. Siri approached as stiff as an automaton. Yennefer straightened and smoothed her collar and tried to wipe the now dried blood from Siri's sleeve. She touched her hair and uncovered the scar on her cheek. She hugged her tightly, very tightly. Geralt saw her hands on Siri's back, saw the deformed fingers. He didn't feel anger, resentment or hatred. He felt only weariness and a huge desire to be done with all of it. Mama. Daughter. Let's go. He decided to interrupt them, but only after a long while. Siri sniffed noisily and wiped her nose with the back of her hand. Yennefer shot an angry look at her and wiped her eye, which something had probably got into. The witcher looked down the corridor from where Siri had exited, as though expecting somebody else to come out of it. Siri shook her head. He understood. Let's get out of here, he repeated. Yes, said Yennefer. I want to see the sky. I'll never leave you both, Siri said softly. Never. Let's get out of here, he repeated. Siri, hold Yen up. I don't need holding up. Let me, Mama. In front of them was a stairway. A great stairway drowning in smoke, in the twinkling glow of torches and fire in iron cressets. Siri shuddered. She had seen that stairway before, in dreams and visions. Down below, far away, armed men were waiting. I'm tired, she whispered. Me too, admitted Geralt, drawing the sigh. I've had enough of killing. Me too. Is there no other way out? No, there isn't. Only this stairway. We must, girl. Yen wants to see the sky. And I want to see the sky. Yen and you. Siri looked back and glanced at Yennefer, who was resting on the balustrade in order not to fall down. She took out the medallions taken from Bonnard. She put the cat around her neck and gave Geralt the wolf. I hope you know it's just a symbol, he said. Everything's just a symbol. She removed Swallow from its scabbard. Let's go, Geralt. Let's go. Keep close beside me. Skelen's mercenaries were waiting at the bottom of the stairway, gripping their weapons in sweaty fists. Tawny Owl sent the first wave up the stairs. The mercenaries' iron-shod boots thudded on the steps. Slowly, Siri. Don't rush. Close to me. Yes, Geralt. And calmly, girl. Calmly. Remember, without anger, without hatred, we have to get out and see the sky, and the men that are standing in our way must die. 
Don't hesitate. I won't hesitate. I want to see the sky. They got to the first landing without mishap. The mercenaries retreated before them, astonished and surprised by their calm. But after a moment, three of them leapt towards them, yelling and whirling their swords. They died at once. Swarm them! Tawny Owl bellowed from below. Kill them! The next three leapt forward. Geralt quickly sprang out to meet them, deceived them with a feint, and cut one of them from below in the throat. He turned around, made way for Ciri under his right arm, and Ciri smoothly slashed the next soldier in the armpit. The third one tried to save his life by leaping over the balustrade. He was too slow. Geralt wiped splashes of blood from his face. Calmly, Ciri. I am calm. The next three. A flash of blades, screams, death. Thick blood crawled downwards, dribbling down the steps. A soldier in a brass-studded brigantine leapt towards them with a long pike. His eyes were wild from narcotics. Ciri shoved the shaft aside with a diagonal parry, and Geralt slashed. He wiped his face. They walked on, not looking back. The second landing was now close. Kill them, yelled Skelen. Have at them! Kill them! Stamping and yelling on the stairs. The flash of blades, screams, death. Good, Siri, but more calmly, without euphoria, and close to me. I'll always be close to you. Don't cut from the shoulder if you can from the elbow. Take heed. I am. The flash of a blade, screams, blood, death. Good, Siri. I want to see the sky. I love you very much. I love you too. Take heed, it's getting slippery. The flash of blades, moaning. They walked on, catching up with the blood pouring down the steps. They walked down, always down, down the steps of Stigger Castle. A soldier attacking them slipped on a bloody step, fell flat on the ground right at their feet and howled for mercy, covering his head with both hands. They passed him without looking. No one dared to bar their way until the third landing. Bowls! Stefan Skelen bellowed from below. Fire the crossbows! Boreas Mun was meant to bring the crossbows. Where is he? Boreas Mun, which Tawny Owl couldn't have known, was already quite far away. He was riding eastwards with his forehead against his horse's mane, squeezing as much gallop out of his steed as he could. Only one of the men sent for the bows had returned. The man who had decided to shoot had slightly shaking hands and eyes watering from fish tech. The first bolt barely grazed the balustrade. The second didn't even hit the stairs. Higher! yelled Tawny Owl. Go higher, you fool! Shoot from up close! The crossbowman pretended he hadn't heard. Skillen cursed at great length, snatched the crossbow from him, leapt onto the stairway, kneeled down and took aim. Geralt quickly covered Ciri with his body. But the girl slipped out from behind him like lightning, so when the bowstring clanged, she was already in position. She twisted her sword to the upper quarter and hit the bolt back so hard it somersaulted many times before it fell. Very good, muttered Geralt. Very good, Siri. But if you ever do that again, I'll tan your hide. Skillen dropped the crossbow and suddenly realized he was alone. All of his men were at the very bottom in a tight little group. None of them were too keen to go up the stairs. There seemed to be fewer than there were before. Once more, several ran off somewhere, probably to fetch crossbows. And the witcher and the witcher girl, not hurrying, but not slowing either, walked down, down the blood-covered stairway of Stigger Castle. Close to each other, shoulder to shoulder, tantalizing and bamboozling their foes with fast movements of their blades. Skelen walked backwards and didn't stop, right down to the very bottom. When he found himself in the group of his own men, he noticed that the retreat was continuing. He swore impotently. Lads, he yelled, and his voice broke discordantly. On you go, have at them, en masse, go on, have at them, follow me. Go yourself, sir, mumbled one of them, raising a hand with fish deck to his nose. Tawny Owl punched him, 
covering the man's face, sleeve and the front of his jacket in white powder. The Witcher and the Witcher Girl passed another landing. When they get to the very bottom, we'll be able to surround them, roared Skelen. Go on, lads, have at them, to arms! Geralt glanced at Ciri and almost howled with fury, seeing streaks shining white as silver in her ashen hair. He controlled himself. It wasn't the time for anger. Be careful, he said softly. Stay close to me. I'm always going to be close to you. It'll be hot down there. I know, but we're together. We're together. I'm with you, said Yennefer, following them down the stairs, red and slippery with blood. Form up! Form up! roared Tawny Owl. Several of the men who had run to get crossbows returned, without them, very terrified. The rumble of doors being forced by battle axes, thudding, the clanking of iron and the sound of heavy steps resounded from all three corridors leading to the stairway. And suddenly, soldiers in black helmets, armor and cloaks, with the sign of a silver salamander, marched out of all three corridors. On being shouted at thunderously and menacingly, Skelen's mercenaries threw their weapons on the floor, one after the other. Crossbows and the blades of glaives and bear spears were aimed at the more hesitant, and they were urged on by even more menacing shouts. Now all of them obeyed, for it was evident that the black-cloaked soldiers were extremely keen to kill somebody and were only waiting for a pretext. Tawny Owl stood at the foot of a column, arms crossed on his chest. Miraculous relief, muttered Ciri. Geralt shook his head. Crossbows and spear blades were also being aimed at them. Glieder van Wort. There was no sense in resisting. Black-cloaked soldiers were swarming like ants at the bottom of the stairs, and the witches were very, very weary. But they didn't drop their swords. They placed them carefully on the steps and then sat down. Geralt felt Ciri's warm shoulder and heard her breath. Yennefer descended, walking past corpses and pools of blood, showing the black-cloaked soldiers her unarmed hands. She sat down heavily beside them on a step. Geralt also felt the warmth against his other shoulder. It's a pity it can't always be like this, he thought. And he knew it couldn't. Tawny Owl's men were tied up and escorted away one after the other. There were more and more soldiers in black cloaks bearing the salamander. Suddenly, high-ranking officers appeared among them, recognizable by the white plumes and silver edging on their suits of armor, and by the respect which the others showed in parting to let them pass. The soldiers stood back with even greater respect before one of the officers, whose helmet was particularly sumptuously decorated with silver, bowing before him. The man stopped in front of Skelen, who was standing at the foot of the column. Tawny Owl, it was very obvious, even in the flickering light of the torches and the paintings burning out in the cressets, paled, becoming as white as a sheet. Stefan Skelen, said the officer in a resonant voice a voice which sounded right up to the vault of the hall. You will be tried in court and punished for treason. Tawny Owl was led away, but his hands weren't tied like the ordinary soldiers had been. The officer turned around. A burning rag broke off from a tapestry up above. It fell, swirling like a huge fiery bird. The brightness shone on the silver-edged armor, on the visor extending halfway down the cheeks which was like all the black-cloaked soldiers, shaped like horrendous toothed jaws. Now our turn, thought Geralt. He wasn't mistaken. The officer looked at Ciri, and his eyes burned in the slits of the helmet, noticing and registering everything. The paleness, the scar on her cheek, the blood on her sleeve and hand, the white streaks in her hair. Then the Nilfgaardian turned his gaze onto the Witcher, Vilgefortz? he asked in his resonant voice. Geralt shook his head. Kair Epkyala? Another shake of the head. A slaughter, said the officer looking at the stairs. A bloodbath. Well, he who lives by the sword. Furthermore, you've saved the hangman work. You've travelled a long way, Witcher. Geralt didn't comment. Ciri sniffed loudly and wiped her nose with her wrist. 
Yennefer gave her a scolding look. The Nilfgaardian also noticed that and smiled. You've travelled a long way, he repeated. You've come here from the end of the world, following her and for her sake, even if only for that reason you deserve something. Lord Dorido? Yes, your Imperial Highness. The Witcher wasn't surprised. Please find a discreet chamber in which I shall be able to converse completely undisturbed with Sir Geralt of Rivia. During that time, please offer all possible comforts and services to the two ladies, under vigilant and unremitting guard. Yes, sir, your imperial majesty. Sir Geralt, please follow me. The witcher stood up. He glanced at Yennefer and Ciri, wanting to calm them and warn them not to do anything foolish. But it wasn't necessary. They were both terribly tired and resigned. You've travelled a long way, repeated Emieva Emeris Daiwen Athan Incarnep Morvuth, the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies, removing his helmet. I'm not sure, Geralt calmly replied, if you haven't travelled further, Dooney. You've recognised me. Well, well. The Emperor smiled. And they say the lack of a beard and my way of holding myself have changed me utterly. Many of the people who used to see me earlier in Sintra came to Nilfgaard later and saw me during audiences, and no one recognized me. But you only saw me once, and that was sixteen years ago. Did I become so embedded in your memory? I wouldn't have recognized you. You have indeed changed greatly. I simply worked out who you were. Some time ago. I guessed, not without help and a hint from someone else, what role incest played in Ciri's family in her blood. I even dreamed about the most awful, the most hideous incest imaginable in a gruesome nightmare. And well, here you are in person. You can barely stand, said Emir coldly, and deliberate impertinence is making you even more unsteady. You may sit in the presence of the Emperor. I grant you that privilege until the end of your days. Geralt sat down with relief. Emir continued to stand, leaning against a carved wardrobe. You saved my daughter's life, he said, several times. I thank you for that, on behalf of myself and posterity. You disarm me. Cyrilla will go to Nilfgaard. Emir was not bothered by the mockery. She will become empress at a suitable moment in precisely the same way that dozens of girls have become and do become queens, meaning almost not knowing their spouses, often not having a good opinion of them on the basis of their first encounter, often disappointed by the first days and first nights of marriage. Cyrilla would be the first. Geralt refrained from comment. Cyrilla, continued the emperor, will be happy like most of the queens I was talking about. It will come with time. Cyrilla will transfer the love that I do not demand at all onto the son I will beget with her. An archduke, and later an emperor. An emperor who will beget a son. A son who will be ruler of the world and will save the world from destruction. Thus speaks the prophecy whose exact contents only I know. Naturally, the white flame continued, Cyrilla will never find out who I am. The secret will die, along with those who know it. That's clear, Geralt nodded. It can't be clearer. You cannot fail to detect the hand of destiny in all of this, Emir said after a long time. All of this, including your activities from the very beginning. I see rather the hand of Vilgefortz, for it was he who directed you to Sintra, wasn't it? When you were the enchanted Urkion, he made Pavetta. You're stumbling in the dark. Emir interrupted brutally, tossing his salamander-decorated cloak over his shoulder. You don't know anything, and you don't have to know. I didn't ask you here to tell you my life story or to excuse myself before you. The only thing you have earned is the assurance that the girl will not be harmed. 
I have no debts towards you, Witcher. None. Yes, you do, Geralt interrupted brutally. You broke the contract. You went back on your word. They are debts, Dooney. You broke a promise as a princeling, and you have a debt as an emperor, with imperial interest, ten years' worth. Is that all? That is all. For only that is owed to me, nothing more. But nothing less, either. I was to collect the child when it turned six. You didn't wait for the promised date. You planned to steal it from me before it passed. The destiny you keep talking about sneered at you, however. You tried to fight that destiny for the following ten years. Now you have her. You have Siri, your own daughter, whom you once basely deprived of parents, and with whom you now mean to vilely beget incestuous children, without demanding love, rightly as a matter of fact. You do not deserve her love. Just between us, Dooney, I don't know how you will manage to look her in the eyes. The end justifies the means, Emir said dully. What I'm doing, I'm doing for posterity, to save the world. If the world is to be saved like that... The Witcher lifted his head. It will be better for it to perish. Believe me, Dooney, it would be better if it perished. You're pale, Emiva Emery said almost gently. Don't get so excited, for you are liable to faint. He moved away from the wardrobe, selected a chair and sat down. The Witcher's head was indeed spinning. The Iron Urchion the Emperor began calmly and quietly, was to be a way of forcing my father to collaborate with the usurper. It was after the coup. My father, the overthrown Emperor, was in prison and being tortured. He couldn't be broken, so another way was tried. A sorcerer, hired by the usurper, changed me into a monster in front of my father's eyes. The sorcerer added a little something on his own initiative, namely humour. Emir in our language, means an Urkion, an old name for a hedgehog. My father didn't allow himself to be broken, and so they murdered him. I, meanwhile, was released into a forest amidst mockery and scorn, and dogs were set on me. I survived. I wasn't hunted too seriously, for it wasn't known that the sorcerer had botched his work and that my human form returned at night. Fortunately, I knew several people of whose loyalty I could be certain, and at that time I was, for your information, thirteen. I had to flee the country, and the fact that I ought to search for a cure to the spell in the north, beyond the Manadal stairs, was read in the stars by a slightly crazy astrologer by the name of Zathisius. Later, when I was emperor, I gave him a tower and apparatus for that. At that time, he had to work on borrowed equipment. You know... It's a waste of time getting bogged down in what happened in Sintra. I deny, however, that it supposedly had anything to do with Vilgefortz. Firstly, I didn't know him then, and secondly, I had a strong aversion to mages. Even today, I don't like them, actually. Ah, while I remember, when I regained the throne, I caught up with the sorcerer who had served the usurper and tortured me in front of my father's eyes. I also displayed a sense of humour. The mage's name was Briathins, and in our language that sounds almost the same as fried. Enough digressions, though. Let's get back to the matter at hand. Vilgefortz visited me secretly in Sintra, shortly after Ciri's birth. He passed himself off as a trusted friend of people in Nilfgaard who were still loyal to me and had conspired against the usurper. He offered help and soon proved to be capable of helping. When, still mistrustful, I asked about his motives, he bluntly declared he was counting on gratitude for the favours, privileges and power he would be given by the great emperor of Nilfgaard, meaning me, a powerful ruler who would govern half the world, who would beget an heir who would govern half the world. He intended to rise high himself, or so he declared, without inhibition at the side of those great rulers. Here, he took out some scrolls bound with snakeskin and commended the contents to my attention. Thus, I learned of the prophecy. I learned about the fate of the world and the universe. I found out what I had to do and came to the conclusion that the end justifies the means. Of course. 
My affairs were prospering in Nilfgaard, meanwhile. Emir ignored the sarcasm. My partisans were gaining more and more influence. Finally, having a group of frontline officers and a corps of cadets, they decided to launch a coup d'etat. I was needed for that, nonetheless. Me, myself, the rightful heir to the throne and crown of the empire, a rightful emiris with the blood of the emirises. It was to be something akin to the standard of the revolution. Just between us, plenty of the revolutionaries cherished the hope that I would be nothing more than that. Those among them who are still alive cannot get over it to this day. But, as has been said before, let us leave the digressions. I had to return home. The time came for Duni, the false prince of Mecht and the phony duke of Sintra, to demand his inheritance. I hadn't forgotten about the prophecy, however. I had to return with Siri, and Calanthe was keeping a weather eye on me. She never trusted you. I know. I think she knew something about that prediction, and would have done anything to hamper me, and in Sintra I was in her power. It was clear I had to return to Nilfgaard, but in a way that no one could guess that I was Duni and Siri was my daughter. Vilgefort suggested a way. Duni, Pavetta and their child had to die, vanish without trace. In a staged shipwreck. That's right. During the voyage from Skellige to Sintra, Vilgefortz was to pull the ship into a magical whirlpool over the Sedna Abyss. Pavetta, Siri and I were supposed to have previously locked ourselves in a specially secured lifeboat and survive, and the crew were meant not to survive, finished the Witcher. And that's how your ruthless path began. Amir Var Emrys said nothing for some time. It began earlier, he finally said and his voice was soft. Regrettably. At the moment, it turned out, Siri wasn't on board. Geralt raised his eyebrows. Unfortunately, I hadn't appreciated Pavetta in my planning. The Emperor's face didn't express anything. That melancholy wench with her permanently lowered eyes had seen through me and my plans. She had sent the child ashore in secret before the anchor was weighed. I fell into a fury, as she did. She had an attack of hysteria. During the struggle, she fell overboard. Before I could dive after her, Vilgefortz had drawn the ship into his maelstrom. I hit my head against something and lost consciousness. I survived by a miracle entangled in the ropes. I came to, covered in bandages. I had a broken arm. I wonder how a man feels after murdering his wife the witcher said coldly. Lousy, replied Emir without delay. I felt, and I feel lousy and bloody shabby. Even the fact that I never loved her doesn't change that. The end justifies the means, yet I sincerely do regret her death. I didn't want it or plan it. Pavetta died by accident. You're lying, Geralt said dryly. And that doesn't befit an emperor. Pavetta could not live. She had unmasked you and would never have let you do what you wanted to do to Siri. She would have lived, Emir retorted. Somewhere, far away, there are enough castles. Don Rowan, for instance. I couldn't have killed her. Even for an end that was justified by the means. One can always find a less drastic means. The Emperor wiped his face. There are always plenty of them. Not always, said the Witcher, looking him in the eyes. Amir avoided his gaze. That's exactly what I thought, Geralt said nodding. Finish your story. Time's passing. Calanthe guarded little Siri like the apple of her eye. I couldn't even have dreamed of kidnapping her. My relations with Vilgefortz had cooled considerably, and I still had the dislike of other mages. But my military men and aristocracy were urging me hard towards war, towards an attack on Sintra. They vouched that the people were demanding it, that the people wanted living space, that listening to the Vox Populi would be a kind of imperial test. I decided to kill two birds with one stone, by capturing both Sintra and Siri in one go. You know the rest. I do, Geralt nodded. Thank you for the conversation, Dooney. I'm grateful that you are willing to devote your time to me. 
but I cannot delay any longer. I am very tired. I watched the death of my friends who followed me here to the end of the world. They came to rescue your daughter, not even knowing her. Apart from Kair, none of them even knew Siri. But they came here to rescue her. For there was something in her that was decent and noble. And what happened? They found death. I consider that unjust, and if anyone wants to know, I don't agree with it. Because a story where the decent ones die, and the scoundrels live and carry on doing what they want is full of shit. I don't have any more strength, Emperor. Summon your men. Witcher, the secret has to die with those who know it. You said it yourself. You don't have a choice. It's not true that you have plenty of them. I'll escape from any prison. I'll take Siri from you. There's no price I wouldn't pay to take her away, as you well know. I do. You can let Yennefer live. She doesn't know the secret. She would pay any price to rescue Siri, Emir said gravely, and avenge your death. True. The Witcher nodded. Indeed. I'd forgotten how much she loves Siri. You're right, Dooney. Well... You can't run from destiny. I have a request. Yes? Let me say goodbye to them both. Then I'll be at your disposal. Emir stood by the window, staring at the mountain peaks. I cannot decline you, but don't worry. I won't tell Siri anything. I'd be harming her by telling her who you are, and I couldn't harm her. Emir said nothing for a long time, still turned towards the window. Perhaps I do have a debt to you. He turned on his heel. So hear what I will offer you in payment. Long, long ago in former times, when people still had honour, pride and dignity, when they valued their word and were only afraid of shame, it happened that persons of honour, when sentenced to death and to escape the shameful hand of the executioner, would enter a bath of hot water and open their veins. Is it possible? Order the bath filled. Is it possible, the emperor calmly continued, that Yennefer might wish to accompany you in that bath? I'm almost certain of it. But you must ask. She has quite a rebellious nature. I know. Yennefer agreed at once. The circle is closed, she added, looking down at her wrists. The serpent Aroboros has sunk its teeth into its own tail. I don't understand, Siri hissed like an infuriated cat. I don't understand why I have to go with him. We're two. What for? Daughter, Yennefer said softly. This and no other is your destiny. Understand that it simply can't be otherwise. And you? Our destiny awaits us. Yennefer looked at Geralt. This is the way it has to be. Come here, my daughter. Hug me tightly. They want to murder you, don't they? I don't agree. I've only just got you back. It's not fair. He who lives by the sword, Emmy of our Emrys said softly, dies by the sword. They fought against me and lost, but they lost with dignity. Ciri was standing before him in three strides, and Geralt silently sucked in air. He heard Yennefer's gasp. Damn it he thought. Everybody can see it. All his black-uniformed army can see what can't be hidden. The same posture, the same sparkling eyes, the same grimace. Arms crossed on the chest identically. Fortunately, extremely fortunately, she inherited her ashen hair from her mother. But anyhow, when you scrutinise them, it's clear whose blood... But you won! said Ciri, glaring at him passionately. You won! And do you think it was with dignity? Emir Var Emrys didn't reply. He just smiled, eyeing the girl with a clearly contented gaze. Siri clenched her teeth. 
So many have died. So many people have died because of all this. Did they lose with dignity? Is death dignified? Only a beast could think like that. Though I looked on death from close up, it wasn't possible to turn me into a beast, and it won't be possible. He didn't answer. He looked at her, and it seemed he was drinking her in with his gaze. I know what you're plotting, she hissed. Know what you want to do with me. And I'll tell you right now, I won't let you touch me. And if you... if you... I'll kill you, even tied up. When you fall asleep, I'll tear your throat out with my teeth. With a rapid gesture, the Imperator quietened the rumble gathering among the officers surrounding them. What is destined shall be, he drawled, not taking his eyes off Siri. Say goodbye to your friends, Cyrilla, Fiona, Ellen, Rhiannon. Siri looked at the Witcher. Geralt shook his head. The girl sighed. She and Yennefer hugged and whispered for a long time. Then Siri went closer to Geralt. Pity, she said quietly. Things were looking more promising. Much more. They hugged each other. Be brave. He won't have me, she whispered. Don't worry, I'll escape from him. I have a way. You may not kill him. Remember, Siri, you may not. Don't worry, I wasn't thinking about killing at all. You know, Geralt, I've had enough of killing. There's been too much of it. Too much. Farewell, Witcher girl. Farewell, Witcher. Just don't cry. Easier said than done. Emir Var Empress, Imperator of Nilfgaard, accompanied Yennefer and Geralt all the way to the bathroom, almost to the edge of a large marble pool full of steaming, fragrant water. Farewell, he said. You don't have to hurry. I'm going, but I'm leaving people here who I shall instruct and to whom I shall issue orders. When you're ready, just call, and the lieutenant will give you a knife. But I repeat, you don't have to hurry. We appreciate your favor. Yennefer nodded gravely. Your Imperial Majesty. Yes. Please. As far as possible, don't harm my daughter. I wouldn't want to die with the thought that she's crying. Emir was silent for a long time. A very long time, leaning against a window with his head turned away. Madame Yennefer, he finally answered, and his face was very strange. You may be certain... I shall not harm your and Witcher Geralt's daughter. I've trampled human bodies and danced on the barrows of my foes. And I thought I was capable of anything. But what you suspect me of, I simply wouldn't be capable of doing. I know it now. So I thank you both. Farewell. He went out, quietly closing the door behind him. Geralt sighed. Shall we undress? He glanced at the steaming pool. The thought that they'll haul me out of here as a naked corpse doesn't especially delight me. And, can you believe it? To me, it's all the same. Yennefer threw off her slippers and unfastened her dress with swift movements. Even if it's my last bath, I'm not going to bathe in my clothes. She pulled her blouse over her head and entered the pool, energetically splashing water around. Well, Geralt, why are you standing there like a statue? I'd forgotten how beautiful you are. You forget easily. Come on, into the water.
When he sat down beside her, she immediately threw her arms around his neck. He kissed her, stroking her waist above and below the water. Is it, he asked for form's sake, an appropriate time? Any time, she muttered, putting a hand under the water and touching him, is the right time for this. Emmy repeated twice that we don't have to hurry. What would you prefer to spend doing during the last minutes given to you? Weeping and wailing? That's undignified, isn't it? Examining your conscience? That's banal and stupid, isn't it? That's not what I meant. So what did you mean? The cuts will be painful if the water cools down, he murmured, caressing her breasts. It's worth paying in pain. Yennefer put her other hand in the water. For pleasure. Are you afraid of pain? No. Neither am I. Sit on the edge of the pool. I love you, but I'm not bloody going to do it underwater. Oh my, oh my, said Yennefer, tilting her head back so that her hair, damp from the steam, spread over the edge like little black vipers. Oh my, oh. I love you, Yen. I love you, Geralt. It's time. We'll call them. We'll call them. They called. First the Witcher called, and then Yennefer called. Then not having heard any reaction, they yelled in unison. Now! We're ready! Give us that knife! Hey! Damn it! The water's cooling down! Get out of there, said Siri, peeping into the bathroom. They've all gone. What? I'm telling you, they've all gone. Apart from us three, there isn't a living soul here. Get dressed. You look awfully funny in the nude. As they were dressing, their hands began to tremble. Both Geralt's and Yennefer's. They had great difficulty coping with the hooks and eyes, clasps and buttons. Siri was jabbering away. They rode away, just like that. All of them, as many as there were of them. They took everyone from here, mounted the horses and rode away as fast as they could. Didn't they leave anybody? Nobody at all? That's staggering, whispered Geralt. It's staggering. Has anything happened? Yennefer cleared her throat. To explain it? No, Siri quickly replied. Nothing. She was lying. At first, she put on a brave front. Erect, with head haughtily raised and stony-faced, she pushed away the gloved hands of the black-cloaked knights, looking boldly and defiantly at the menacing nose guards and visors of their helmets. They didn't touch her any longer, particularly since they were stopped from doing so by the growl of an officer a broad-shouldered soldier with silver braid and a white heron feather plume. She walked towards the exit, escorted on both sides, with her head proudly raised. Heavy boots studded, male shirts clanked and weapons jingled. After a dozen paces, she looked back for the first time. After the next few, the second time. Why, I'll never ever see them again. The thought flashed, with terrifying and cool clarity beneath her crown. Neither Geralt nor Yennefer. Never. That awareness immediately, all at once, wiped away the mask of feigned courage. Ciri's face contorted and grimaced, her eyes filled with tears and her nose ran. The girl fought with all her strength, but in vain. A wave of tears breached the dam of pretense. The Nilfgaardians with salamanders on their cloaks looked at her in silence and amazement. Some of them had seen her on the bloody staircase. All of them had seen her in conversation with the Emperor. The Witcher Girl with a sword, the unvanquished Witcher Girl arrogantly challenging the Imperator to his face. And now they were surprised to see a sniveling, sobbing child. She was aware of it. Their eyes burned her like fire, pricked her like pins. She fought but ineffectively. 
The more powerfully she held back her tears, the more powerfully they exploded. She slowed down and then stopped. The escort also stopped, but only for a moment. On the growling command of an officer, iron hands grasped her by the upper arms and wrists. Siri, sobbing and swallowing back tears, looked back for the last time. Then they dragged her. She didn't resist, but sobbed louder and louder and more and more despairingly. They were stopped by Emperor Emir Emris, that dark-haired man with a face which awoke strange, vague memories in her. They released her when he gave a curt order. Siri sniffed and wiped her eyes with her sleeve. Seeing him approaching, she stopped sobbing and raised her head haughtily. But now she was aware of it. It just looked ridiculous. Emir looked at her for a long while, without a word. Then he approached her and held out a hand. Siri, who always reacted to gestures like that by pulling away involuntarily, now, to her great amazement, didn't react. To her even greater amazement, she found his touch wasn't unpleasant at all. He touched her hair as though counting the snow-white streaks. He touched her cheek, disfigured by the scar. Then he hugged her and stroked her head and back. And she, overwhelmed by weeping, let him, although she held her arms as stiffly as a scarecrow. It's a strange thing, destiny, she heard him whisper. Farewell, my daughter. What did he say? Siri's face grimaced slightly. He said, Varfail, Luned. In the elder speech, farewell, girl. I know. Yennefer nodded. What then? Then. Then he let me go. Turned around and walked away. He shouted some orders and everybody went. They passed me, utterly indifferently, with stamping, thudding and the clanking of armour echoing down the corridor. They mounted their horses and rode away. I heard the neighing and tramping of hooves. I'll never understand that. For if I were to wonder, Siri, what? Don't wonder about it. Stiga Castle repeated Philippa Eilhart, looking at Fringilla Vigo from under her eyelashes. Fringilla didn't blush. During the past three months, she had managed to manufacture a magical cream which made the blood vessels contract. Thanks to the cream, she didn't blush, no matter how embarrassed she was. Vilgefortz's hideout was in Stigger Castle, confirmed Azirava Anahid, in Ebbing, above a mountain lake, whose name my informer, a simple soldier, was unable to recall. You said, was, Francesca Finderbear observed. Was, Philippa interrupted in mid-sentence, because Vilgefortz is dead, my dear ladies. He and his accomplices, the entire gang, are no more. That favour was done for us by no other than our good friend the Witcher, Geralt of Rivia, whom we didn't appreciate. None of us, about whom we were mistaken. All of us. Some of us, less seriously... Others more. All the sorceresses looked at Fringilla in unison, but the cream really did act effectively. Azira of Anahid sighed. Philippa tapped her hand on the table. Although the multitude of activities connected to the war and the preparations for the peace negotiations excuse us, she said dryly, we ought to admit that the fact of being thoroughly outmaneuvered in the case of Vilgefortz is a defeat for the Lodge. That must never happen to us again, my dear ladies. The Lodge, with the exception of the ashen-pale Fringilla Vigo, nodded. Right now, continued Philippa, the Witcher Geralt is somewhere in Ebbing, along with Yennefer and Ciri, whom he freed. We ought to ponder over how to find them. And that castle? Sabrina Glevisig interrupted. Haven't you forgotten something, Philippa? No, no, I haven't. The legend, if it should arise, 
ought to have a single faithful version. Thus, I'd like to ask you to do it, Sabrina. Take Kira and Triss with you. Sort out the matter, so that no trace remains. The roar of the explosion was heard as far away as Mecht, and the flash, since it took place at night, was visible even in Matina and Jesu. The series of further tectonic shocks were perceptible even further away, at the remotest ends of the world. Congreve, Estella Ostella, the daughter of Baron Otto de Congreve, espoused to the Count of Lidertal, managed his estates extremely judiciously following his early death, owing to which she amassed a considerable fortune. Enjoying the great estimation of Emperor Emir Var Emris, QV, she was a greatly important personage at his court. Although she held no position, it was known that the emperor was always in the habit of gracing her voice and opinion with his attention and consideration. Owing to her great affection for the young empress Cyrilla Fiona, see also, whom she loved like her own daughter, she was jokingly called the Empress Mother. Having survived both the Emperor and the Empress, she died in 1331, and her immense estate was left in her will to distant relatives, a side branch of the Lidertals, called the White Lidertals. They, however, being careless and giddy-headed people, utterly squandered it. Effenberg and Talbot, Encyclopedia Maxima Mundi, Volume 3 Chapter 10 the man stealing up to the camp, to give him his due, was as spry and cunning as a fox. He changed his position so swiftly and moved so agilely and quietly that he could have sneaked up on anyone. Anyone. But not Boreas Munn. Boreas Munn had too much experience in the matter of stalking. Come out, fellow, he called, trying hard to colour his voice with self-assured and confident arrogance. Those tricks of yours are in vain. I see you. You're over there. One of the megaliths, a ridge of which bristled on the hillside, twitched against the deep blue starry sky. It moved and assumed human form. Boreas turned some meat roasting on a spit, for he could smell burning. He laid his hand on his bow's riser, pretending to be leaning carelessly. My belongings are meagre. He wove a gruff, metallic thread of warning into his apparently calm tone. There are a few of them, but I'm attached to them. I shall defend them to the death. I'm no bandit, said the man who had pretended to be a menia in a deep voice. I'm a pilgrim. The pilgrim was tall and powerfully built, easily measuring seven feet, and in order to balance him on a weighing scales, Boreas would have bet anything that a weight of at least five and twenty stone would have been required. His pilgrim's staff, a pole as thick as a cart shaft, looked like a walking cane in his hand. Boreas Munn was indeed amazed how such a huge clodhopper was able to steal up so agilely. He was also somewhat alarmed. His bow, a composite seventy-pounder with which he could down an elk at four dozen paces, suddenly seemed a small, fragile child's toy. I'm a pilgrim, repeated the powerful man. I mean, any other man, Boreas interrupted sharply. Let him come out too. What are the... stammered the pilgrim, and broke off, seeing a slender silhouette, noiseless as a shadow, emerging from the gloom on the other side. This time, Boreas Munn wasn't at all amazed. The other man, his way of moving immediately betrayed it to the tracker's trained eye, was an elf, and it is no disgrace to be sneaked up on by an elf. I ask for forgiveness, said the elf, in a strangely unelven, slightly husky voice. I hid from both of you gentlemen, not from evil intentions, but from fear. I turned that spit over. Indeed, said the pilgrim, leaning on his staff and sniffing audibly. The meat cooked more than enough on that side. Boreas turned the spit, sighed and cleared his throat, and sighed again. Sit ye down, gentlemen, he decided, and wait. The animal will be done any minute. <laughs> Verily, he's a fool who denies meat to travellers on the road. The fat dribbled onto the fire with a hiss. The fire flared up. It became brighter. The pilgrim was wearing a felt hat with a broad brim, whose shadow quite effectively covered his face. 
A turban made from colourful cloth, not covering his face, served as headgear for the elf. When they saw his face in the glare of the campfire, both men, Boreas and the pilgrim, shuddered, but didn't utter so much as a gasp, not even a soft one, at the sight of the face, once, no doubt, elfinly beautiful, now disfigured by a hideous scar running diagonally across his forehead, brow, nose and cheek to his chin. Boreas Munn cleared his throat and turned the spit again. This sweet fragrance lured you to my campfire, he stated rather than asked. Didn't it, gentlemen? Indeed. The pilgrim tipped the brim of his hat, and his voice changed a little. I smelled out the roast from far away with all due modesty, but I remained cautious. Uh, they were roasting a woman on a campfire I approached two days ago. That's true, confirmed the elf. I was there the next morning. I saw human bones in the ashes. The next morning, the pilgrim repeated in a slow, drawling voice, and Boreas would have bet anything that a nasty smile had appeared on the face concealed by the shadow of the hat. Have you been tracking me in secret for so long, Master Elf? Aye. And what stopped you revealing yourself? Good sense. The Euskadurk Pass. Boreas Munn turned the spit and interrupted the awkward silence. Is a place that doesn't enjoy the best of reputations. I've also seen bones on campfires, skeletons on stakes, men hanged from trees. This place is full of the savage followers of cruel cults and creatures just waiting to eat you, according to hearsay. It's not hearsay, the elf corrected him. It's the truth, and the further into the mountains towards the east, the worse it'll be. Are you gentlemen also travelling eastwards, beyond Elskadeg, to Zerikania, or perhaps even further to Hackland? Neither the pilgrim nor the elf replied. Boreas hadn't really expected an answer. Firstly, the question had been indiscreet. Secondly, it had been stupid. From where they were, it was only possible to go back or eastwards, through Elskadeg, where he too was headed. Roast's ready. Boreas opened a butterfly knife with a deft flourish meant to impress. Go oh, ahead, hey, gentlemen, help yourselves. The pilgrim had a cutlass and the elf a dagger, which also didn't resemble a kitchen knife at all. But all three blades sharpened for more menacing purposes, served to carve meat that day. For some time, all that could be heard was crunching and munching, and the sizzling of chewed bones thrown into the embers. The pilgrim belched in a dignified manner. Strange little creature, he said, examining the shoulder blade which he had gnawed clean and licked until it looked as though it had been kept for three days in an anthill. It tasted a bit like goat, and it was as tender as Cody. I don't recall eating anything like that. It was a screck, said the elf, crunching the gristle with a crack. Neither do I recall eating it at any time. Boreas cleared his throat quietly. The barely audible note of sarcastic merriment in the elf's voice proved he knew that the roast came from an enormous rat with bloodshot eyes and huge teeth, only the tail of which measured three L's. The tracker had by no means hunted the gigantic rodent. He had shot it in self-defense, but had decided to roast it. He was a sensible and clear-headed man. He wouldn't have eaten a rat scavenging on rubbish heaps and eating scraps, but it was a good three hundred miles from the narrow passage of the Elskadurk Pass to the nearest community capable of generating waste. The rat, or as the elf had said, Shkrek, must have been clean and healthy. It hadn't had any contact with civilization, so there was nothing it could have been soiled by or infected with. Soon, the last, smallest bone, chewed and sucked clean, landed in the embers. The moon rose over the jagged range of the fiery mountains. The wind fed the fire and sparks shot up, dying out and fading amidst the countless twinkling stars. Long on a road, gentlemen? Boreas Munn risked another non-too-discreet question. Here, in the wildernesses? Left the Solviga gate behind you long since, if you'll pardon my asking. Long since? Long since, said the pilgrim, is a relative thing. I passed through Solviga Gate the second day after the September full moon. Me on the sixth day, said the elf. Ah, continued Boreas Mun, 
encouraged by the reaction. It's a wonder we've only met up now, because I also walked that way, or actually rode, for I still had a horse then. He fell silent, driving away the unpleasant thoughts and recollections linked to the horse and its loss. He was sure his accidental companions must also have had similar adventures. If they'd been walking the whole time, they never would have caught up with him here, near Elskadeg. I venture thus, he continued, that you set off right after the war, after the peace of Sintra was concluded, gentlemen. It's none of my business, naturally, but I dare suppose that you were not pleased by the order and vision of the world created and established in Sintra. The lengthy silence that fell by the campfire was interrupted by distant howling. A wolf, probably, although in the vicinity of the Elkadeg Pass you could never be certain. If I'm to be frank, the elf spoke up unexpectedly, I didn't have the grounds to be pleased with the world and its image following the peace of Sintra, not to mention the new order. In my case, it was similar, said the pilgrim, crossing his powerful forearms on his chest, though I came to realize it, as a friend said, post factum. Silence reigned for a long time. Even whatever had been howling on the pass was silent. At first, continued the pilgrim, although Boreas and the elf had been ready to bet he would not. At first, everything indicated that the peace of Sintra would bring favorable changes, would create quite a tolerable world order, if not for everyone, then at least for me. If more memory serves me, Boreas cleared his throat. The kings arrived in Sintra in April? The second of April, to be precise. The pilgrim corrected him. It was, I recall, a full moon. Along the walls, positioned below the dark beams supporting a small gallery, hung rows of shields with colourful representations of the heraldic emblems and coats of arms of the Sintran nobility. A first glance revealed the differences between the now somewhat faded arms of the ancient families and those of families ennobled more recently during the reigns of Dagorad and Calanthe. The new ones had vivid and not yet cracked paint, and no peppering of woodworm holes was visible on them, whereas the escutcheons of the more recently ennobled Nilfgaardian families, rewarded during the capture of the castle and the five-year imperial administration, had the most vivid colours. When we regain Sintra, thought King Foltest, it will be necessary to make sure the Sintrans don't destroy those shields in a fervour of revival. Politics is one thing, the hall's decor another. Changes in regimes cannot be a justification for vandalism. So, everything began here, thought Dykstra, looking around the great hall. The celebrated betrothal banquet, during which the steel Urchian appeared and demanded the hand of Princess Favetta, and Queen Calanthe engaged the witcher. How bizarre are the twists of human fate, thought the spy, surprising himself at the banality of his own musings. Five years ago, thought Queen Maeve, five years ago, the brain of Calanthe, the lioness of the blood of the Serbians, splashed onto the floor of the courtyard. This very courtyard I can see from the windows. Calanthe, whose proud portrait we saw in the corridor, was the penultimate living carrier of the royal blood. After her daughter, Pavetta, drowned, the only one left was her granddaughter, Cyrilla unless the news that Cyrilla is also dead is true. Please! Cyrus Engelkind Hemelfart, the hierarch of Novigrad, accepted on grounds of age, position and universal respect per acclamationem as the chairman of the meeting, beckoned with a trembling hand. Please, take your seats. They found their chairs, which were marked by mahogany plaques, and sat down at the round table. Maeve, Queen of Rivia and Lyria, Foltest, King of Temeria, and his vassal, King Venslav of Brugge, Demavend, King of Adian, Henselt, King of Caedwin, King Ethen of Sidaris, young King Kistrin of Verden, Duke Knighthood, head of the Redanian Regency Council, and Count Dykstra. We must rid ourselves of that spy, remove him from the conference table, thought the hierarch. 
King Henselt and King Foltest. Why, even young Kistrin have taken the liberty of making sour remarks, so at any moment there'll be a démarche from the Nilfgaardian representatives. Sigismund Dykstra is a man of unseemly breeding, and furthermore a person with a dirty past and bad reputation. A persona turpis. One cannot let the presence of a persona turpis infect the atmosphere of the negotiations. The head of the Nilfgaardian delegation, Baron Schillard Fitzostelen, who had been allotted a place at the round table immediately opposite Dykstra, greeted the spy with a polite diplomatic bow. Seeing that everybody was now seated, the hierarch of Novigrad also sat down, not without the help of pages supporting him by his trembling arms. The hierarch sat down on a chair made for Queen Calanthe many years before. The chair had an impressively high and richly decorated backrest, making it stand out among the other ones. So it was here, thought Triss Merigold, looking around the chamber staring at the tapestries, paintings and numerous hunting trophies, and the antlers of a horned animal totally unfamiliar to her. It was here, after the infamous shambles in the throne room, where the famous private conversation between Calanthe, the witcher, Pavetta and the enchanted Urkion occurred, when Calanthe gave her agreement to that bizarre marriage, and Pavetta was already pregnant. Ciri was born almost eight months later. Ciri! the heir to the throne, the lion cub from the lioness's blood. Siri, my little sister, who's still somewhere far away in the south. Fortunately, she's no longer alone. She's with Geralt and Yennefer. She's safe, unless they've lied to me again. Sit down, dear ladies, urged Philippa Eilhart, who had been scrutinizing Triss closely for some time. In a short while, the rulers of the world will begin making their inaugural speeches, one after another. I wouldn't want to miss a word. The sorceresses, interrupting their furtive gossiping, quickly took their seats. Shayla de Tankerville, in a boa of silver fox, which gave a feminine accent to her severe male outfit. Azirivar Anahid, in a dress of mauve silk, which extremely gracefully combined modest simplicity with chic elegance. Francesca Finderbear, Regal as usual, Ida Emane Epsivni, mysterious as usual, Margarita Lozantile, distinguished and serious, Sabrina Glevesig in turquoise, Kira Metz in green and daffodil yellow, and Fringilla Vigo, dejected, sad, and pale with a truly deathly, morbid, utterly ghastly paleness. Triss Merigold was sitting beside Kira opposite Fringilla. A painting depicting a horseman galloping headlong down a road between an avenue of alders hung above the head of the Nilfgaardian sorceress. The alders were holding out their monstrous arm-like bows towards the rider, sneeringly smiling with the ghastly moors of their hollows. Triss shuddered involuntarily. The three-dimensional telecommunicator standing in the middle of the table was active. Philippa Eilhart used a spell to focus the image and sound. Ladies, as you can see and hear, she said, not without a sneer, the rulers of the world are, at this very moment, getting down to deciding the fate of it in the throne room of Sintra, plumb beneath us, one floor lower, and we, here, one floor above them, will be watching over, so that the boys don't go too wild. Other howlers joined the howler howling in Elskadeg. Boreas had no doubt. They weren't wolves. I hadn't expected much from those Sintran talks either, he said, in order to revive the dead conversation. Why, no one I know expected any good to come of them. The simple fact that the negotiations began was important, calmly protested the pilgrim. A simple fellow, and I indeed am just such a fellow, if I may say so, thinks simply. A simple fellow knows that the warring kings and emperors aren't that furious with each other. If they could have, if they'd had the strength, they'd have killed each other. That they've stopped trying to kill each other, and instead have sat down to a round table, that means they have no more power. They are, to put it simply, powerless. 
And the result of that powerlessness is that no armed men are attacking a simple fellow's homestead. They aren't killing, aren't mutilating, aren't burning down buildings. They aren't cutting children's throats, aren't raping wives or driving people into captivity. No. Instead of that, they've gathered in Sintra and are negotiating. Let's rejoice. The elf finished poking with his stick a log in the fire that was shooting sparks and looked askance at the pilgrim. Even a simple fellow, he said, not concealing the sarcasm. Even if he's joyful, why, even euphoric, ought to understand that politics is also a war, just conducted a little differently. He ought to understand that negotiations are like trade. They have the same self-propelling mechanism. Negotiated successes are bought with concessions. You win some, you lose some. In other words, in order for some people to be bought, others have to be sold. Indeed, the pilgrim said after a while. It's so simple and obvious that every man understands it, even a simple one. No, no, and once more, no, yelled King Henselt, banging both fists on the table so hard, he knocked over a goblet and made the inkwells jump. No discussions on that subject, no horse trading in this matter. That's the end of it. That's the Dirayeth. Henselt. Foltest spoke calmly, soberly, and very placatingly. Don't make things difficult, and don't embarrass us in front of His Excellency with your yelling. Shilard Fitzosterlin, negotiator for the Empire of Nilfgaard, bowed with a false smile, which was meant to imply that the King of Kaidwin's antics were neither shocking nor bothering him. We are negotiating with the Empire, continued Foltest, and amongst ourselves we've suddenly begun to bite each other like dogs. It's a disgrace, Henselt. We've reached agreement with Nilfgaard in matters as difficult as Dol Angra and Riverdale, said Dykstra, apparently casually. It would be stupid. I won't have such remarks, roared Henselt, this time so loudly that not even a buffalo would have matched him. I won't put up with such remarks, particularly from spies of all people. I'm the king, for fuck's sake. That's quite plain, snorted Maeve. Demavend, his back to them, was looking at the escutcheons on the wall, smiling contemptuously, quite as if the game was not about his kingdom. Enough! panted Henselt, eyes roving around. Enough! Enough by the gods, or my blood will boil. I said not a span of land. No, but no repossession. I won't agree to my kingdom being reduced by so much as a span, even half a span of land. The gods entrusted me with the honor of Kaidwen, and only to the gods will I give it up. The lower marches is our land. Our eth ethnic land. The lower marches have belonged to Kaidwen for centuries. Upper Edion, Dykstra spoke again, has belonged to Kaidwen since last year. To be precise, since the 24th of July last year, from the moment a Kaidwenian occupying force invaded it. I request, Shilod Fitzosterlin said without being asked, for it to be minuted, ad futurum re memoriam, that the Empire of Nilfgaard had nothing to do with that annexation. Apart from the fact that it was pillaging Wengerberg at the time. Nihil adrem. Indeed. A gentleman, Foltest admonished. The Kaidwenian army, rasped Henselt, entered the lower marches as liberators. My soldiers were welcomed there with flowers. My soldiers, your bandits. King Demaven's voice was calm, but it was apparent from his face how much effort it was costing him. Your brigands who invaded my kingdom with a murderous hussar, murdered, raped, and looted. Gentlemen, we have gathered here and have been debating for a week. We're debating about what the future face of the world should be. By the gods, is it to be a face of crime and pillage? Is the murderous status quo to be maintained? Are plundered goods to remain in the hands of the thug and the marauder? Henselt seized a map from the table, tore it up with a violent movement, and hurled it towards Demavend. The king of Adian didn't even move. My army, wheezed Henselt, 
and his face took on the color of good old wine. Captured the marchers from the Nilfgaardians. Your wolf or kingdom didn't even exist in Denethend. I shall say more. Had it not been for my army, you wouldn't even have a kingdom today. I'd like to see you driving the black cloaks over the Yoruga and beyond Dolangra without my help. That's the statement that your king, by my grace, wouldn't be much of an exaggeration. But here my generosity ends. I said I won't give up even a span of my land. I won't let my kingdom be diminished, nor I. Demavend stood up. We shall not reach agreement then. Gentlemen! Cyrus Hemelfart, the hierarch of Novigrad, who had been slumbering until then, suddenly spoke in a placatory manner. Some kind of compromise is surely possible. The Empire of Nilfgaard, began again Schillard Fitzosterlin, who liked to butt in out of the blue, will not accept any deal that would be damaging to the land of elves in Dolblatana. If necessary, I shall read you once again the contents of the memorandum. Henselt, Foltest and Dijkstra snorted, but Demavend looked at the imperial ambassador calmly and almost benignly. For the general good and for peace, he declared, I recognize the autonomy of Dolblatana, not as a kingdom, but as a duchy. The condition is that Duchess Enid Angleana pays liege homage to me and obligates herself to grant equal rights and privileges to humans and elves. I'm prepared to do that, as I have said, pro publico bono. Spoken like a true king, said Maeve. Salus publica lex suprema est, said Hierarch Hemelfart, who had also been searching for some time for the chance to show off his knowledge of diplomatic jargon. I shall add, nonetheless, continued Demavend, looking at the pompous Henselt, that the concession regarding Dolblatana is not a precedent. It is the only encroachment on the integrity of my lands to which I shall agree. I shall not recognize any other partition. The Kaidwanian army that invaded my borders as an aggressor and invader has one week to abandon the illegally occupied fortalices and castles of Upper Adian. That is the condition of my further participation in this conference, and because verba volant, my secretary shall submit to the minutes an official démarche in the case. Henselt? Foltest looked hesitantly at the bearded king. Never! roared the king of Kaidwan knocking over a chair and hopping like a chimpanzee stung by a hornet. I'll never give up the marches, over my dead body, never. Nothing will make me, no force, no fucking force. And in order to prove he was also well-born and educated, he howled, non possumus. I'll give him non possumus, the old fool, snorted Sabrina Glevisig in the upstairs chamber. You need not worry, ladies. I'll force that blockhead to recognize the repossession demands in the case of Upper Adian. The Kaidwanian army will leave before ten days are up. The matter is clear. No two ways about it. If any of you doubted it, I have the right to feel piqued indeed. Philippa Eilhart and Sherla de Tankerville expressed their acknowledgement by bowing. Izirava Anahid gave her thanks with a smile. All that remains today, said Sabrina, is to settle the matter of Dolblatana. We know the contents of Emperor Emir's memorandum. The kings down below still haven't had the chance to discuss that matter, but have signalled their preferences, and the most, I would say, interested party has taken a stance. That's King Demavend. Demavend's stance, said Sherla de Tankerville, wrapping the silver foxbur around her neck, bears the features of a far-reaching compromise. It's a positive, considered and balanced stance. Gillard Fitzostelin will have considerable difficulty trying to argue in the direction of greater concessions. I don't know if he'll want to. He will, Azireva Anahid stated calmly, because those are the instructions he has from Nilfgaard. He will invoke ad referendum and submit notes. He'll argue for at least a day. After that time has passed, he'll begin to make concessions. That's normal. Sabrina Glevisig cut her off. It's normal that they'll finally find some common ground and agree on something. We won't wait for that. We'll decide right away what they'll ultimately be permitted to do. Francesca, say something. It's about your country, after all. Just for that reason, the daisy of the valley smiled very beautifully. Just for that reason, I'm keeping quiet, Sabrina. 
Get over your pride, Margarita Lozantila said gravely. We have to know what we can allow the kings. Francesca Finderbear smiled even more beautifully. For the sake of peace and pro bono publico, she said, I agree to King Demaven's offer. From this moment, you may stop addressing me as your royal highness, my dear girls. An ordinary, your enlightenment will suffice. Elven jokes, Sabrina grimaced. Don't amuse me at all, probably because I don't understand them. What about Demaven's other conditions? Francesca fluttered her eyelashes. I agree to the re-immigration of human settlers and the return of their estates, she said gravely. I guarantee equality to all races. For the love of the gods, Enid, laughed Philippa Eilhart. Don't agree to everything. Set some conditions. I shall. The elf suddenly grew more serious. I don't agree to lead homage. I want Dolblatana as a freehold. No vassal duties, apart from an oath of loyalty, and no actions to the detriment of the suzerain. Demavhen won't agree, Philippa commented curtly. He won't waive the income and rent that the Valley of Flowers gave him. In that matter, Francesca raised her eyebrows, I'm prepared to negotiate bilaterally. I'm sure we can achieve consensus. The freehold doesn't demand payment, but it doesn't forbid nor exclude it either. And what about familial inheritance? Philippa Eilhart kept digging. What about primogeniture? By agreeing to a freehold, Foltest will want a guarantee of the duchy's indivisibility. My complexion and figure may indeed beguile Foltest, Francesca smiled again. But I'm surprised at you, Philippa. The age when falling pregnant was a possibility is far, far behind me. Regarding primogeniture and fidei commissum, Themavend ought not to be afraid, for I shall be the ultimus familiae of the dynasty of Dolbratana's monarchs. But in spite of the age difference Themavend sees as advantageous, we will be resolving the issue of inheritance, not with him, but rather his grandchildren. I assure you, ladies, there will be no moot points in this matter. Not in this one agreed Aziravā Anahid, looking into the sorceress's elven eyes. And what about the matter of the squirrel commando units? What about the elves who fought for the empire? If I'm not mistaken, this mainly concerns your subjects, Madame Francesca. The daisy of the valleys stopped smiling. She glanced at Ida Emeyan, but the silent elf from the Blue Mountains avoided her gaze. Pro publico bono. She began and broke off. Asira, also very serious, nodded her understanding. What to do? She said slowly. Everything has its price. War demands casualties. Peace, it turns out, does too. Aye, true in every respect. The pilgrim repeated pensively, looking at the elf sitting with head lowered. Peace talks are a market, a country fair, so that some people can be bought, others must be sold. Thus the world runs its course. The point is not to pay too high a price. And not to sell oneself too cheaply, finished the elf, without raising his head. Traitors, despicable good for nothings. Horsans, and Badriach and Kuach, Nilfgaardian dogs. Silence, roared Hamilcar Dancer, slamming an armoured fist onto the balustrade of the cloister. The archers on the gallery pointed their crossbows at the elves crowded into the cul-de-sac. Calm down, Danza roared even more loudly. Enough, quieten down, gentlemen officers, a little more dignity. Do you have the audacity to talk of dignity, blackguard? yelled Koinach de Reo. We spilled blood for you, accursed Doina, for you and your emperor, who received an oath of fealty from us. And this is how you repay it? You hand us over to those murderers from the north as felons, as criminals? Enough, I said. Danza slammed his fist hard onto the balustrade again. Acknowledge this fait complete, gentle elves. 
The agreements reached in Sintra as conditions of the peace treaty being concluded impose on the Empire the duty to turn over war criminals to the Nordlings. Criminals, shouted Riordan. Criminals, you wretched diner. War criminals, repeated Dancer, paying no attention whatsoever to the unrest below him. In the officers who stand accused of proven charges of terrorism, murdering civilians, killing and torturing captives, massacring the wounded in field hospitals, you whore sons, yelled Angus Brickery. We killed because we were at war. We killed on your orders. Cock the ep ers, blood doine. It has been ruled, repeated Danza. Your insults and shouts won't change anything. Please. Go to the guardhouse one at a time and put up no resistance while being manacled. We should have stayed when they were fleeing across the Yaruga. Riordan ground his teeth. We should have stayed and fought on in the commando units. But we, idiots, fools, dolts, kept our soldierly oath. Serves us right. Isn't Grim Foiltiana, the Iron Wolf, the most celebrated, now almost legendary commander of the Squirrels, Presently an imperial colonel, tore the silver lightning bolts of the Vrieth brigade from his sleeve and spalder, stony-faced, and threw them down in the courtyard. The other officers followed his example. Hamilcar Danza frowned from the gallery as he watched this. An irresponsible demonstration, he said. Furthermore, in your place, I wouldn't rid myself so lightly of imperial insignia. I feel the duty to inform you that as imperial officers... During the negotiations of the conditions of the peace treaty, you were guaranteed fair trials, lenient sentences, and a swift amnesty. The elves, crowded into the cul-de-sac, roared in unison with laughter that thundered and boomed amidst the walls. I also draw your attention to the fact, Hamilcar Danza added calmly, that it's only you we are handing over to the Nordlings, thirty-two officers, and not one of the soldiers you commanded. Not one. The laughter in the cul-de-sac ceased in an instant. The wind blew on the campfire, stirring up a shower of sparks and blowing smoke into their eyes. Again, howling could be heard from the pass. They prostituted everything. The elf broke the silence. Everything was for sale. Honor. Loyalty, our bonds, vows, everyday decency. They were simply chattels, having a value as long as there was a trade in them and a demand. And once there wasn't, they weren't worth a straw and were discarded onto the dust heap. Onto the dust heap of history, the pilgrim nodded. You are right, Master Elf. That's how it was back then in Sintra. Everything had its price and was worth as much as it could be traded for. The market opened every morning, and, like a real market, now and again there'd be unexpected booms and crashes. And, just like a real market, one couldn't help but get the impression somebody was pulling the strings. Am I hearing right? Shilad Fitz Austin asked in a slow, drawling voice, expressing disbelief in his tone and facial expression. Do my ears deceive me? Berengar Leuvarden, special imperial envoy, didn't deign to reply. Sprawled in an armchair, he continued to contemplate the ripples of wine as he rocked his goblet. Shilad puffed himself up, then assumed a mask of contempt and superiority, which said, either you're lying, blackguard, or you wish to trick me, test me out. In both cases, I've seen through you. So am I to understand, he said, sticking his chest out, that after far-reaching concessions in the matter of borders, in the matter of prisoners of war and the repayment of spoils, in the matter of the officers of the Vrihed Brigade and the Skortayel Commando units, the Emperor orders me to compromise and accept the Nordling's impossible claims regarding the repatriation of settlers? You understood perfectly, Baron, replied Baron Garloivaden, drawing out his syllables characteristically. Indeed, I am full of admiration for your perspicacity. By the great son, Lloyd Loivaden, do you in the capital ever consider the consequences of your decisions? 
The Nordlings are already whispering that our empire is a giant with feet of clay. Now they're crying that they've defeated us, beaten us, driven us away. Does the Emperor understand that to make further concessions means to accept their arrogant and excessive ultimatums? Does the Emperor understand that if they treat this as a sign of weakness, it may have lamentable results in the future? Does the Emperor understand, finally, what fate awaits those several thousand settlers of ours in Brugge and Lyria? Berenger Leuwarden stopped rocking his goblet and fixed his coal-black eyes on Schillard. I have given you an imperial order, Baron, he muttered through his teeth. When you have carried it out and returned to Nilfgaard, you may ask the Emperor yourself why he's so unwise. Perhaps you mean to reprimand the Emperor, scold him, chide him? Why not? But alone, without my mediation. Aha, thought Chilard. Now I know. The new Stefan Skellen is sitting before me, and I must behave with him as with Skellen. But it's obvious he didn't come here without a goal. An ordinary courier could have brought the order. Well, he began, apparently freely, in a positively familiar tone. Woe to the vanquished, but the imperial order is clear and precise, and it shall be carried out thus. I shall also try hard to make it look like the result of negotiations, and not abject submissiveness. I know something about that. I've been a diplomat for thirty years, with four generations before me. My family is one of the wealthiest, most prominent, and the influential. I know. I know, to be sure. Leuwarden interrupted him with a slight smirk. That's why I'm here. Schillard bowed slightly and waited patiently. The difficulties in understanding, began the envoy, rocking his goblet, occurred because you, dear Baron, chose to think that victory and conquest are based on senseless genocide, on thrusting a standard somewhere in the blood-soaked ground and crying, All this is mine! I have captured it. A similar opinion is, regrettably, quite widespread. For me, though, sir, as also for the people who gave me my powers, victory and conquest depend on diametrically different things. Victory should look thus. The defeated are compelled to buy goods manufactured by the victors. Why, they do it willingly, because the victors' goods are better and cheaper. The victor's currency is stronger than the currency of the defeated, and the vanquished trust it much more than their own. Do you understand me, Baron Fitzosterlin? Are you beginning slowly to differentiate the victors from the vanquished? Do you comprehend whom woe actually betides? The ambassador nodded to confirm he did. But, in order to consolidate the victory and render it binding, Leuwarden continued a moment later, drawing out his syllables, peace must be concluded, quickly and at any cost, not some truce or armistice, but peace, a creative compromise, a constructive accord, and without the imposition of trade embargoes, retortions of customs duty and protectionism. Schillard nodded again to confirm he knew what it was about. Not without reason have we destroyed their agriculture and ruined their industry. Leuwarden continued in a calm, drawling, unemotional voice. We did it in order for them to have to buy our goods owing to a scarcity of theirs. But our merchants and goods won't get through hostile and closed borders. And what will happen then? I shall tell you what will happen then, my dear Baron. A crisis of overproduction will occur, because our manufactories are working at full tilt. The maritime trading companies who entered into collaboration with Novigrad and Kovia would also suffer great losses. Your influential family, my dear Baron, has considerable shares in those companies, and the family 
as you are no doubt aware, is the basic unit of society. Are you aware of that? I am. Shillard Fitzosterlin lowered his voice, although the chamber was tightly sealed against eavesdropping. I understand. I comprehend. Though I'd like to be certain I'm carrying out the Emperor's order, not that of some corporation. Emperors pass, drawled Leuven, and the corporations survive and will survive. But that's a truism. I understand your anxieties, Baron. You can be certain, sir, that I'm carrying out an order issued by the Emperor, aimed at the Empire's good and its interest. Issued? I don't deny it. As a result of advice given to the Emperor by a certain corporation. The envoy opened his collar and shirt, demonstrating a golden medallion, on which was depicted a star set in a triangle surrounded by flames. A pretty ornament, Shillard confirmed with a smile and a slight bow that he understood. I'm aware it is very expensive and exclusive. Can they be had anywhere? No, stated Baron Galoivaden with emphasis. You have to earn them. If you permit, my lady and gentlemen. The voice of Shillard Fitzosterlin assumed a special tone, already familiar to the debaters, that signified that what the ambassador was about to say was considered by him to be of the utmost importance. If you permit, my lady and gentlemen, I shall read the aide memoir sent to me by His Imperial Highness, Emir Va Emris, by grace of the great son, the Emperor of Nilfgaard. Oh, no, not again. Demavend ground his teeth, and Dykstra just groaned. This did not escape Shillard's attention, because it couldn't have. The note is long, he admitted, so I shall pray see it rather than read it. His Imperial Highness expresses his great gladness concerning the course of the negotiations, and as a peace-loving man, joyfully receives the compromises and reconciliations achieved. His Imperial Highness wishes further progress in the negotiations and the resolution to them to the mutual benefit of Let us get down to business, then. Foltest interrupted in mid-sentence, and briskly, Let's finish it to our mutual benefit and return home. That's right, said Henselt, who had the furthest to go. Let's finish, for we dally were liable to be caught by the winter. One more compromise awaits us, reminded Maeve a matter which we have barely touched on several times, probably for fear that we're liable to fall out over it. It's time to overcome that fear. The problem won't vanish just because we're afraid of it. Indeed, confirmed Foltest. So, let's get to work. Let's settle the status of Sintra, the problem of succession to the throne of Calanthe's heir. It's a difficult problem, but I don't doubt we'll cope with it. Shall we not, Your Excellency? Oh, Fitzostalin smiled diplomatically and mysteriously. I'm certain that the matter of the succession to the throne of Sintra will go like clockwork. It's an easier matter than you all suppose, my lady and gentlemen. I submit for consideration, announced Philippa Eilhart in quite an indisputable tone, the following project. We shall turn Sintra into a trust territory. We'll grant Foltest of Temeria a mandate. That Foltest is getting too big for his boots, Sabrina Glevesig grimaced. He has too large an appetite. Brugger, Sodden, Angren, we need... Philippa cut her off. A strong state at the mouth of the Yuruga and on the Marnadal stairs. I don't deny it, Sherla de Tankerville nodded. It's of necessity to us but not to any of our emrys, and compromise, not conflict, is our aim. A few days ago, reminded Francesca Finderbear, Schillard suggested building a demarcation line, dividing Sintra into spheres of influence, into northern and southern zones. Nonsense and childishness, snorted Margarita Losantilla. 
such divisions are senseless, and only the seeds of conflicts. I think Sintra ought to be turned into a jointly governed principality, said Shela, with power exercised by appointed representatives of the northern kingdoms and the empire of Nilfgaard. The city and port of Sintra will receive the status of a free city. Would you like to say something, my dear Madame Aziri? Please do. I admit, I usually prefer discourses consisting of full, complete utterances. But please proceed. We're listening. All of the sorceresses, including Fringilla Vigo, who was as white as a sheet, fixed their eyes on Aziravar Anahid. Anahid. The Nilfgaardian sorceress wasn't disconcerted. I suggest we concentrate on other problems, she declared in her soft, pleasant voice. Let's leave Sintra in peace. I have so far been unable to inform you all of certain matters about which I've received reports. The matter of Sintra, distinguished sisters, has already been solved and taken care of. I beg your pardon? Philippa's eyes narrowed. What do you mean by that, if one may ask? Triss Merigold gasped loudly. She had already guessed, already knew what was meant by it. Vatier de Rido was downhearted and morose. His charming and wonderful lover, the golden-haired Cantarella, had dropped him, suddenly and unexpectedly, without giving any arguments or explanations. For Vatier, it was a blow, an awful blow, following which he moped about dejectedly and was agitated, distracted and stupefied. He had to be very attentive, be very guarded so as not to blot his copybook, nor make a faux pas in conversation with the emperor. Times of great changes did not favour the agitated and incompetent. We have already repaid the Guild of Merchants for their invaluable help, said Emiva Emrys, frowning. We've given them enough privileges, more than they received from the previous three emperors combined. As regards Berengar Leuwarden, we are also indebted to him for his help in uncovering the conspiracy. He has received a senior and remunerative position, but if it turns out he is incompetent, he'll be kicked out, in spite of his services. It would be well if he knew that. I'll do my utmost, your highness. And what about Dijkstra and that mysterious informer of his? Dijkstra would rather die than reveal who his informer is. It would indeed be worth repaying him for that invaluable news. But how? Dijkstra won't accept anything from me. If I may... Your Imperial Majesty, speak. Dijkstra will accept the information, something he doesn't know and would like to. Your Highness can repay him with information. Well done, Vatier. Vatier de Rido sighed with relief. He turned his head away and took a deep breath, for which reason he was first to notice the ladies approaching. Stella Congreve, the Countess of Lidatal, and the fair-haired girl entrusted into her care. They are coming, he gestured with a movement of his eyebrows. Uh, Your Imperial Majesty, may I take the liberty of reminding reasons of state, the Empire's interests? Stop! Emir of Emrys cut him off truculently. I said I'd ponder it. I'll think the matter over and make a decision, and after taking it, I'll inform you what the decision is. Yes, your imperial majesty. What else? The white flame of Nilfgaard impatiently slapped a glove against the hip of a marble nereid adorning the fountain's pedestal. Why are you still here, Vatier? The matter of Stefan Skellen? I shall not show mercy, death to the traitor, but after an honest and thorough trial. Yes, your imperial majesty. Emir didn't even glance at him as he bowed and walked away. He was looking at Stella Congreve and the fair-haired girl. Here comes the interest of the Empire, he thought. The bogus princess, the bogus queen of Sintra, the bogus ruler of the mouth of the river Yara, which means so much to the Empire. Here she approaches, eyes lowered, terrified, in the white silk dress and the green gloves, with a peridot necklace on her slight décolletage. Back then in Dan Rauen, 
I complimented her on that dress, praised the choice of jewellery. Stella knows my taste. But what am I to do with the young thing? Put her on a pedestal? Noble ladies. He bowed first. In Nilfgaard, apart from in the throne room, courtly respect and courtesy regarding women even applied to the emperor. They responded with deep curtsies and lowered heads. They were standing before a courteous emperor, but still an emperor. Emir had had enough of etiquette. Stay here, Stella, he ordered dryly, and you girl will accompany me on a stroll. Take my arm, head up. Enough. I've had enough of those curtsies. It's just a walk. They walked down an avenue, amidst shrubs and hedges barely in leaf. The imperial bodyguard, Soldiers from the elite Impera Brigade, the famous Salamanders, stayed on the sidelines, but always on the alert. They knew when not to disturb the Emperor. They passed a pond, empty and melancholy. The ancient carp, released by Emperor Torres, had died two days earlier. I'll release a new, young, strong, beautiful specimen, thought Emir by Emrys. I'll order a medal with my likeness and the date to be attached to it. Vaisa de Reyad ep Egea. Something has ended. Something is beginning. It's a new era, new times, a new life. So let there be a new carp too, damn it. Deep in thought, he almost forgot about the girl on his arm, about her warmth, her lily-of-the-valley fragrance, and the interest of the empire, in that order and no other. They stood by the pond, in the middle of which an artificial island rose out of the water, and on it a rock garden, a fountain, and a marble sculpture. Do you know what that figure depicts? She didn't reply right away. Yes, your imperial majesty. It's a pelican, which pecks its own breast open to feed its young on its blood. It is an allegory of noble sacrifice, and also... I'm listening to you attentively. And also of great love. Do you think? He turned her to face him and pursed his lips. That the torn open breast hurts less because of that? Uh, I don't know, she stammered. Your Imperial Majesty, I... He took hold of her hand. He felt her shudder. The shudder ran along his hand, arm and shoulder. My father, he said, was a great ruler, but never had a head for legends or myths, never had time for them, and always mixed them up. Whenever he brought me here to the park, I remember it like yesterday, he always said that the sculpture shows a pelican rising from its ashes. Well, girl, at least smile when the emperor tells a funny story. Thank you. That's much better. The thought that you aren't glad to be walking here with me would be unpleasant to me. Look me in the eyes. I'm glad to be able to be here with your Imperial Majesty. It's an honor for me, I know. But also a great joy. I'm enjoying, really. Or is it perhaps just courtly flattery? Etiquette? The good school of Stella Congreve? A line that Stella has ordered you to learn by heart, admit it, girl. She was silent and lowered her eyes. Your emperor has asked you a question, repeated Emirvar Emris. And when the emperor asks, no one can dare be silent. No one can dare to lie either, of course. Truly, she said melodiously. I'm truly glad, your imperial majesty. I believe you, Emir said a moment later. I believe you, although I'm surprised. I also, she whispered back. I'm also surprised. I beg your pardon. Don't be shy, please. I'd like to be able to go for walks more often and talk. But I understand. I understand that it's not possible. You understand well. He bit his lip. 
Emperors rule their empires. But two things they cannot rule, their hearts and their time. Those two things belong to the empire. I know that only too well, she whispered. I shall not be staying here long, he said, after a moment of oppressive silence. I must ride to Sintra and grace with my person the ceremony of the peace treaty being signed. You will return to Don Rowan. Raise your head, girl. Oh, no, that's the second time you sniffed in my presence. And what's that in your eyes? Tears? Oh, those are serious breaches of etiquette. I will have to express my most serious discontent to the Countess of Lidertal. Raise your head, I said. Please, forgive Madame Stella. Your Imperial Majesty, it's my fault. Only mine. Madame Stella has taught me and prepared me well. I've noticed and appreciate that. Don't worry. Stella Congreve isn't in danger of my disfavor and never has been. I was making fun of you, reprehensibly. I noticed, whispered the girl, paling, horrified by her own audacity. But Emir just laughed somewhat stiffly. I prefer you like that, he stated. Believe me, bold, just like... He broke off. Like my daughter, he thought. A sense of guilt tormented him like a dog worrying at him. The girl didn't take her eyes off him. It's not just Stella's work, thought Emir. It really is her nature. In spite of appearances, she's a diamond that's hard to scratch. No, I won't let Vatier murder this child. Sintra is Sintra, and the interest of the Empire is the interest of the Empire. But this matter seems only to have one sensible and honorable solution. Give me your hand. It was an order delivered in a stern voice and tone. But in spite of that, he couldn't help but get the impression it was carried out willingly, without compulsion. Her hand was small and cool, but wasn't trembling now. What's your name? Just please don't say it's Cyrilla Fiona. Cyrilla Fiona? I feel like punishing you, girl, severely. I know. Your Imperial Majesty, I deserve it, but I... I have to be, Cyrilla Fiona. One might suppose you regret you are not she, he said, not letting go of her hand. I do, she whispered. I do regret I am not she. Indeed. If I were... The real Cyrilla the emperor would look more favorably on me. But I'm only a counterfeit, a poor imitation, a double, not worthy of anything, nothing. He turned around suddenly and grabbed her by the arms and released her at once. He took a step back. Yearning for a crown? Power? He was speaking softly but quickly pretending not to see as she denied it with abrupt movements of her head, honors, accolades, luxuries. He broke off, breathing heavily, pretending he couldn't see the girl still shaking her lowered head, still denying further hurtful accusations, perhaps all the more hurtful because of being unexpressed. He breathed out deeply and loudly. Do you know, little moth, that what you see before you is a flame? I do, your imperial majesty. They were silent for a long time. The scent of spring suddenly made them feel lightheaded, both of them. In spite of appearances, Emir finally said dully, being empress is not an easy job. I don't know if I'll be able to love you. She nodded to show she also knew. He saw a tear on her cheek. Just like in Stigger Castle, he felt the tiny shard of cold glass lodged in his heart shift. He hugged her, 
pressed her hard to his chest, stroked her hair, which smelled of lilies of the valley. My poor little one, he said in an unfamiliar voice. My little one. My poor raison d'etat. Bells rang throughout Sintra, in a stately manner, deeply, solemnly, but somehow strangely mournfully. Unusual looks, thought Hierarch Hemelfart, looking like everybody else at the hanging portrait, which measured, like all the others, at least one yard by two. Strange looks. I'm absolutely certain she's some kind of half-breed. I'd swear she has the blood of the accursed elves in her veins. Pretty, thought Faltist. Prettier than the miniature the people from the intelligence service showed me. Oh, well, portraits usually of latter. Utterly unlike Calanthe, thought Maeve. Utterly unlike Rogna. Utterly unlike Pavetta. Hmm. There have been rumours. But no, that's impossible. She must have royal blood. Must be the rightful ruler of Sintra. She must. It is demanded by raison d'etat and history. She's not the one I saw in my dreams, thought Esther Tyson, king of Covia, who had recently arrived in Sintra. She's certainly not that one, but I shan't tell that to anyone. I'll keep it to myself and my Zuleika. Zuleika and I shall decide how we shall use the knowledge those dreams gave us. She was almost my wife, that Siri, thought Kistrin of Verden. I'd have been Duke of Sintra then, according to custom, the heir to the throne, and I'd probably have perished like Calanthe. It was fortunate. Oh, it was fortunate that she ran away from me then. Not even for a moment did I believe in the tale of great love at first sight, thought Chilard Fitzosterlin. Not even for a moment. And yet, Emir is marrying that girl. He's rejecting the chance for reconciliation with the dukes. Instead of the daughter of one of the Nilfgaardian dukes, he's taking Cyrilla of Sintra for his wife. Why? In order to seize that miserable little country, half of which, if not more, I would anyway have gained for the empire in negotiations. To seize the mouth of the Yaruga, which is in any case under the dominion of a Nilfgaardian Novigradian Coviran Maritime Trading Company. I don't understand anything of this raison d'etat. I suspect they aren't telling me everything. Sorceresses, thought Dykstra. It's the sorceresses' handiwork. But let it be. It was clearly written that Ciri would become the Queen of Sintra, the wife of Emir and the Empress of Nilfgaard. Destiny clearly wanted that. Fate? Let it be, thought Triss Merigold. May it remain like that. Well and good. Ciri will be safe now. They'll forget about her. They'll let her live. The portrait finally ended up in its place, and the servants who had hung it stood back and removed the ladders. In the long row of darkened and somewhat dusty paintings of the rulers of Sintra, beyond the collection of Serbins and Corums, beyond Corbett, Dagorad and Rögne, beyond the proud Calanthe and the melancholy Pavetta, hung the last portrait, depicting the currently reigning gracious monarch, the successor to the throne and to the royal blood the portrait of a slim girl with fair hair and a sad gaze, wearing a white dress with green gloves. Cyrilla, Fiona, Ellen, Rhiannon, the Queen of Sintra and the Empress of Nilfgaard. Destiny, thought Philippa Eilhart, feeling Dykstra's eyes on her. Poor child, thought Dykstra, looking at the portrait. She probably thinks it's the end of her worries and misfortunes. Poor child. The bells of Sintra rang, frightening the seagulls. Shortly after the end of the negotiations and the signing of the peace of Sintra, the pilgrim picked up the story. A grand holiday, a celebration lasting several days, was held in Novigrad, the crowning moment of which was a great and ceremonial military parade. The day, as befitted the first day of a new era, was truly beautiful. Are we to understand, the elf asked sarcastically, that you were present there, sir, at that parade? In truth, I was a little late. 
The pilgrim clearly wasn't the type to be disconcerted by sarcasm. The day, as I said, was beautiful. It promised thus from the very dawn. Vascoigne, the commandant of Drakenborg, until recently deputy to the chief of political affairs, impatiently struck his whip against the side of his boot. Faster over there, faster, he urged. The next ones are waiting. After that peace treaty signed in Sintra, we're snowed under here. The hangman, having put the nooses around the condemned men's necks, stepped back. Vascoigne whacked his whip against his boot. If any of you has anything to say, he said dryly, now is your last chance. Long live freedom, said Kaibra F. Dyerith. The trial was fixed, said the Rusty's cops, marauder, robber and killer. Kiss my horse, said Robert Pilch, deserter. Tell Lord Dykstra I, I'm sorry, said Jan Lenep, secret agent, condemned for bribery and thievery. I didn't mean to. I really didn't mean to, sobbed Istvan Igalfi, the fort's former commandant, removed from his position and arraigned before the tribunal for acts committed against female prisoners, as he tottered on a birch stump. The sun, as blinding as liquid gold, exploded above the fort's palisade. The gallows poles cast long shadows. A beautiful new sunny day rose over Drakenborg. The first day of a new era. Baskoyne hit his whip against his boot. He raised and lowered his hand. Stumps were kicked out from under feet. All the bells of Novigrad tolled, their deep and plaintive sounds echoing against the roofs and mansards of merchants' residences, the echoes fading amongst the narrow streets. Rockets and fireworks shot up high. The crowd roared, cheered, threw flowers, tossed up their hats, waved handkerchiefs, favours, flags, why, even trousers. Long live the free company! Hurrah! Long live the condottieri! Lorenzo Mola saluted the crowd, blowing kisses to beautiful townswomen. If they're going to pay bonuses as effusively as they cheer, he shouted over the tumult, then we'll be rich! Pity! said Julia Abatamarco, with a lump in her throat. Pity Frontino didn't let us see this. They walked their horses through the town's main street. Julia, Adam, Adieu Pangrat, and Lorenzo Mola, at the head of the company, dressed in their best regalia, formed up into fours, so even that none of the groomed and gleaming horses stuck their muzzles even an inch out of line. The condottieri's horses were, like their riders, calm and proud. They weren't frightened by the crowd's cheers and shouts, reacting with slight, faint, almost imperceptible jerks of their heads at the wreaths and flowers flying at them. Long live the condottieri! Long live a Pangrat! Long live pretty kitty! Julia furtively wiped away a tear, catching a carnation thrown from the crowd. I never dreamed, she said. Such a triumph. Pity, Frontino. You're a romantic, smiled Lorenzo Moller. You're getting emotional, Julia. I am. Attention by my troth. Eyes left. Look. They sat up straight in the saddle, turning their heads towards the review stand and the thrones and seats arranged there. I'd see full test, thought Julia. That bearded one is probably Henselt of Kaidwen, and that handsome one Dem of Endavadian. That matron must be Queen Hedvig, and that pup beside her is Prince Radovid, son of the murdered king. Poor boy. Long live the condottieri! Long live Julia Batamarco! Hurrah for Adieu Pangrat! Hurrah for Lorenzo Mola! Long live Constable Natalis! Long live the kings! Long live Faltist, Demovend and Henselt! Long live Tykstra! roared some toady. Long live his holiness! yelled several voices paid to do so. Cyrus Engelkind Hemelfat, the hierarch of Novigrad, stood up and greeted the crowd and the marching army with arms raised, rather inelegantly turning his rear towards Queen Hedvig and the minor Radovid, obscuring them with the tails of his voluminous robes. No one's going to shout long live Radovid, thought the prince, blocked by the hierarch's fat backside. No one's even going to look at me. No one will raise a cry in honour of my mother, nor mention my father, they won't shout his glory. Today, 
on the day of triumph, on the day of reconciliation, of the alliance to which my father, after all, contributed, which was why he was murdered. He felt someone's eyes on the nape of his neck, as delicate as something he didn't know, or did, but only from his dreams. Something like the soft, hot caress of a woman's lips. He turned his head. He saw the dark, bottomless eyes of Philippa Eilhart fixed on him. Just you wait, thought the prince, looking away. Just you wait. No one could have predicted then, or guessed, that this thirteen-year-old boy, now a person without any significance in a country ruled by the Regency Council and Dykstra, would grow into a king. A king who, after paying back all the insults borne by himself and his mother, would pass into history as Radovid V, the Stern. The crowd cheered. Flowers rained down under the hooves of the parading horses of the condottieri. Julia? Yes, adieu. Marry me. Be my wife. Pretty Kitty delayed her answer a long time as she recovered from her astonishment. The crowd cheered. The hierarch of Novigrad, sweaty, gasping for air like a large, fat catfish, blessed the townspeople and the procession, town and world from the viewing stand. But you are married, Adam Pangrat. I'm separated. I'll get a divorce. Julia Abatimarco didn't answer. She turned her head away, astonished, disconcerted, and very happy. God knows why. The crowd cheered and threw flowers. Rockets and fireworks exploded with a crack over the rooftops. The bells of Novigrad moaned plaintively. A woman, thought Nenica. When I sent her away to war, she was a girl. She's returned a woman. She's confident, self-aware, serene, composed, feminine. She won that war by not allowing the war to destroy her. Deborah, Yuneid continued her litany in a soft but sure voice, died of typhus in a camp at Maena. Trina drowned in the Hiruga when a boat full of casualties capsized. Mira was killed by squirrel elves during an attack on a field hospital at Armeria. Katya. Go on, my child, Nanika urged her on gently. Katya. Yuneid cleared her throat. Met a wounded Nilfgaardian in hospital. She went back to Nilfgaard with him after the peace was concluded, when prisoners of war were exchanged. I always say, sighed the stout priestess, that love knows no borders or cordons. What about Yola the second? She's alive, Yuneid hurried to assure her. She's in Maribor. Why doesn't she come back? The novice bowed her head. She won't return to the temple, mother, she said softly. She's in the hospital of Mr. Milo Vanderpeck, the surgeon, the halfling. She said she wants to tend the sick, that she'll only devote herself to that. Forgive her, Mother Nineke. Forgive her? The priestess snorted. I'm proud of her. You're late, Philippa Eilhart hissed. You're late for a ceremony graced by kings, by a thousand devil Sigismund. Your arrogance regarding etiquette is well known enough for you not to have to flaunt it so blatantly. Particularly today, on a day like this, I had my reasons. Dykstra responded to the look of Queen Hedvig and the raised eyebrows of the hierarch of Novigrad with a bow. He noticed the grimace on the face of priest Vilema and the expression of contempt on the impossibly handsome countenance of King Faltist. I have to talk to you, Phil. Philippa frowned. In private, most probably. That would be best. Dykstra smiled faintly. If, however, you consider it appropriate, I'll agree to a few additional pairs of eyes. Let's say those of the beautiful ladies of Monte Calvo. Hush! hissed the sorceress from behind her smiling lips. When can I expect an audience? I'll think about it and let you know. Now leave me in peace. This is a stately ceremony. It's a great celebration. Let me remind you of that, if you hadn't noticed yourself. A great celebration? We're on the threshold of a new era, Dykstra. 
The spy shrugged. The crowd cheered. Fireworks shot into the sky. The bells of Novigrad tolled, tolled for the triumph, for the glory. But somehow they sounded strangely mournful. Hold the reins, Yara, said Lucian. I've grown hungry. I'd like a bite of something. Here, I'll wrap the strap over your arm. I know one's not much use. Yara felt a blush of shame and humiliation burning on his face. He still hadn't got used to it. He still had the impression that the whole world didn't have anything better to do than stare at his stump, at the sleeve sewn up over it. That the whole world didn't think of anything else but to look at his disability, to falsely sympathise with the cripple and falsely pity him and secretly disdain him and treat him as something that unpleasantly disturbs the nice order by repulsively and blatantly existing, by daring to exist. Lucienne, he had to hand it to her, differed a little from the whole world in this respect. She neither pretended she couldn't see it, nor adopted an affected style of humiliating help and even more humiliating pity. Yara was close to thinking that the fair-haired young wagoner treated him naturally and normally. But he drove that thought away. He didn't accept it, for he still hadn't managed to treat himself normally. The wagon carrying military invalids creaked and rattled. Hot weather had come after a short period of rain, and the ruts created by military convoys had dried out and hardened into ridges and humps of fantastic shapes, over which the vehicle being pulled by four horses had to trundle. The wagon positively jumped over the bigger ruts, creaking, the coach body rocking like a ship in a storm. The swearing of the crippled soldiers, mainly lacking legs, was as exquisite as it was filthy, and in order not to fall, Lucienne hung on to Yara and hugged him, generously giving the boy her magical warmth, extraordinary softness, and the exciting mixture of the smell of horses, leather straps, hay, oats, and young, intense, girlish sweat. The wagon lurched out of another pothole, and Yara took in the slack from the reins wound around his wrist. Lucienne, taking bites in turn from a hunk of bread and a sausage, cuddled up to his side. Well, well. She noticed his brass medallion and disgracefully exploited the fact that his hand was taken up by the reins. Did they take you in too? A forget-me-not amulet. Oh, whoever invented that trinket was a real trickster. There was a great demand for them during the war, probably second only to vodka. And what girl's name is inside it? Let's take a gander. Lucienne. Yara blushed like a beetroot and felt as though the blood would gush from his cheeks at any moment. I, I must ask you not to open it. Forgive me, but it's personal. I, I don't want to offend you, but... The wagon bounced. Lucienne cuddled up to him and Yara shut up. Cyrilla. The wagoner spelled it out with difficulty, but it surprised Yara who hadn't suspected the peasant girl of such far-reaching talents. She won't forget you. She slammed the medallion shut, let go of the chain and looked at the boy. That's Cyrilla, I mean, if she really loved you. Foolish spells and amulets. If she really loved you, she won't forget. She'll be faithful. She'll wait. What for? Yara lifted his stump. The girl squinted her cornflower blue eyes slightly. If she really loved you, she repeated firmly. She's waiting, and the rest's codswallop. I know it. Do you have such great experience in this regard? None of your business. Now it was Lucienne's turn to blush slightly. What I've had and with whom? And don't think I'm one of those what you only have to nod at, and she's ready to have some experience in the hay. But I know what I know. If you love a fellow, you will have all of him, and not just bits. Then it's a hill of beans even if he's lost one of those bits. The wagon jumped. You're simplifying it a bit, Yara said through clenched teeth, greedily sniffing up the girl's fragrance. You're simplifying it a lot, and you're idealising it a lot, Lucienne. You deign not to notice even a detail so slight that a man's ability to support a wife and family depends on whether he's in one piece. A cripple isn't capable. Hey, hey, hey! She bluntly interrupted him. Don't be blubbering on me, frock. The black cloaks didn't tear your head off, and you're a brain box. You toil with your noggin. What are you staring at? I'm from the country, but I have ears and eyes. Quick enough to notice a detail so slight as someone's manner of speech that's truly lordly and learned. And what's more? She bent her head and coughed. Yara also coughed. The wagon jumped. And what's more? The girl finished. 
I've heard what the others said, that you're a scribe and the priest at a temple. Then see for yourself that that hand's a trifle, and that's that. The wagon hadn't bounced for some time, but Yara and Lucien seemed not to notice it at all, and it didn't bother them at all. I seem to attract scholars, the girl said after a longer pause. There was one, once, made advances towards me. He was book learned and schooled in academies. You could tell it from his name alone. And what was it? Semester. Hi there, miss. Gifreita Corncrake called from behind their backs. He was a nasty, gloomy man, wounded during the fighting for Maena. Crack the whip above the gelding's rumps, miss. Your cart's crawling along like snot down a wall. I swear, added another cripple, scratching himself on a stump covered in shiny scar tissue, visible under a rolled-up trouser leg. This wilderness is getting me down. I'm really missing a tavern since, I tell you, I'd verily love a beer. Can't we go any brisker? We can. Lucienne turned around on the box. But if the shaft or a hub breaks on a clod, then for a Sunday or two you'll not be drinking beer but rainwater or birch juice, waiting for a lift. You can't walk, and I'm not going to take you on my back, am I? That's a great pity, Corncrake grinned, for I dream at night of you taking me. On your back, I mean from behind. I like it like that. And you, miss? You are soul of a cripple, Lucienne yelled. You stinking old goat, you... She broke off seeing the faces of all the invalids sitting on the wagon, suddenly covered in a death-like pallor. Damn, sobbed one of them. And we were so close to home. We're done for, said Corncrake quietly, and utterly without emotion, simply stating the fact. And they said, the thought flashed through Yara's head, that there weren't any more squirrels, that they'd all been killed that the elven question, as they said, had been solved. There were six horsemen, but after a closer look it turned out there were six horses but eight riders. Two of the steeds were carrying a pair of riders. All the horses were treading stiffly and out of rhythm, their heads drooping. They looked miserable. Lucienne gasped loudly. The elves came closer. They looked even worse than the horses. Nothing remained of their pride, of their hard-earned, supercilious, charismatic otherness. Their clothing, usually even on gorillas from the commando units, smart and beautiful, was dirty, torn and stained. Their hair, their pride and joy, was dishevelled, matted with sticky filth and clotted blood. Their large eyes, usually vain and lacking in any expression, were now abysses of panic and despair. Nothing remained of their otherness. Death, terror, hunger and homelessness had made them become ordinary. Very ordinary. They had even stopped being frightening. For a moment, Yara thought they would pass them, would simply cross the road and disappear into the forest on the other side, not gracing the wagon or its passengers with even a glance that all that would remain of them would be that utterly non-elven, unpleasant, foul smell. A smell that Yara knew only too well from the field hospitals. The smell of misery, urine, dirt and festering wounds. They passed them without looking. But not all of them. An elf woman, with long dark hair, caked together with congealed blood, stopped her horse right beside the wagon. She sat in the saddle, leaning over awkwardly, protecting an arm in a blood-soaked sling around which flies buzzed and swarmed. Toruvia, said one of the elves, turning around. Inca digne, Lunath. Lucienne instantly realized, understood what it was about. She understood what the elf woman was looking at. The peasant girl had been familiar from childhood with the blue-grey swollen spectre, the apparition of famine, lurking around the corner of her cottage. So she reacted instinctively and unerringly. She held out the bread towards the elf woman. Enca digna, Teruviel, repeated the elf. 
He was the only one of the entire commando unit to have the silver lightning bolts of the Vrieth Brigade on the torn sleeve of his dust-covered jacket. The invalids on the wagon, until then petrified and frozen in their tracks, suddenly twitched, as though animated by a magic spell. Quarter loaves of bread, rounds of cheese, pieces of fatback and sausage appeared, as if by magic, in the hands that they held out towards the elves. And for the first time in a thousand years, elves were holding their hands out towards humans. And Lucien and Yara were the first people to see elves crying. To see them choking on their sobs, not even trying to wipe away the tears flowing down their dirty faces, giving the lie to the claim that elves supposedly had no lacrimal glands at all. And repeated the elf with the lightning bolts on his sleeve in a faltering voice. And then he held out a hand and took the bread from Corncrake. Thank you, he said hoarsely, struggling to adapt his lips and tongue to the foreign language. Thank you, human. After some time, noticing that it had all gone, Lucienne clicked her tongue at the horses and flicked the reins. The wagon creaked and rattled. No one spoke. It was well on towards evening when the highway began to teem with armoured horsemen. They were commanded by a woman with completely white, close-cropped hair, with an evil, fierce face disfigured by scars, one of which crossed her cheek from her temple to the corner of her mouth, and another of which, describing a horseshoe, encircled her eye socket. The woman also lacked a large part of her right ear, and her left arm below the elbow ended in a leather sleeve and a brass hook to which her reins were attached. The woman staring malevolently at them with a glare full of vindictiveness, asked about the elves, about the Skoyatayl, about terrorists, about fugitives, survivors of a commando unit destroyed two days back. Yara, Lucienne and the invalids, avoiding the gaze of the white-haired, one-armed woman, spoke, mumbling indistinctly that, no, they hadn't encountered anyone or seen anyone. You're lying, thought White Railer, once Black Railer. You're lying. I know you are. You're lying out of pity. But it doesn't matter anyway, for I, White Railer, have no pity. Hurrah! Up with the dwarves! Long live Barkley Elves! Long live the dwarves! The Novigrad streets thudded beneath the heavy iron-shod boots of the old campaigners of the volunteer regiment. The dwarves marched in a formation typical for them, in fives, and the hammers on their standard fluttered over the column. Long live Mahakam! Vive on the dwarves! Glory to them and fame! Suddenly, someone in the crowd laughed. Several others joined in, and a moment later, everybody was roaring with laughter. It's an insult! Hierarch Hemelfart gasped for air. It's a scandal. It's unpardonable. Vile people, hissed Priest Villima. Pretend you can't see it, Voltest advised calmly. We shouldn't have economized on their pay, Maeve said sourly, or refused them rations. The dwarven officers kept their countenance and form, standing erect and saluting in front of the review stand whereas the non-commissioned officers and soldiers of the volunteer regiment expressed their disapproval of the budget cuts applied by the kings and the hierarch. Some crooked their elbows as they passed the stand, while others demonstrated their other favourite gesture, a fist with the middle finger stuck stiffly upwards. In academic circles, that gesture bore the name Digitus Infamis. The plebs had a cruder name for it. The blushes on the faces of the kings and the hierarch demonstrated that they knew both names. We ought not to have insulted them by our miserliness, Maeve repeated. They're an ambitious nation. The howler in Elskadeg howled. The howling turned into a horrifying wailing call. None of the men sitting by the campfire turned his head around. Boreas Munn was the first to speak after a long silence. The world has changed. Justice has been done. Well, you might be exaggerating with that justice, 
The pilgrim smiled slightly. I would agree, though, that the world has in some way adapted itself to the basic law of physics. I wonder if we have the same law in mind, the elf said in a slow, drawling voice. Every action causes a reaction, said the pilgrim. The elf snorted, but it was quite a friendly snort. That's a point for you, human. Stefan Skelen, son of Bertram Skelen, you, who were imperial coroner, be upstanding. The High Tribunal of the Eternal Empire by grace of the Great Son has found you guilty of the crimes and illegitimate acts of which you have been charged, namely, treason and participation in a conspiracy intended to bring about a murderous assault on the statutory order of the Empire and also on the person of the Imperial Majesty. Your guilt, Stefan Skelen, has been confirmed and proven, and the Tribunal has not found extenuating circumstances. His Royal Imperial Majesty has thus not granted you an Imperial pardon. Stefan Skelen, son of Bertram Skelen. You will be taken from the courtroom to the citadel, from where, when the apposite time comes, you will be led out. As a traitor, unworthy of treading the soil of the Empire, you will be placed on a wooden cart, and horses will pull you to Millennium Square on that cart. As a traitor, unworthy of breathing the air of the Empire, you will be hanged by the neck on a gallows, by the hand of an executioner, between heaven and earth, and you will hang until you are dead. Your corse will be cremated, and the ashes tossed to the four winds. O oh, Stefan Skelen, son of Bertram, traitor, I, the head of the highest tribunal of the Empire, sentencing you, utter your name for the last time. May it henceforth be forgotten. It works! It works! shouted Professor Oppenhauser, rushing into the Dean's office. It works, gentlemen! Finally! Finally! It functions! It rotates! It works! It works! Really? Jean Lavoisier, Professor of Chemistry, called rotten eggs by his students, asked bluntly and quite sceptically. It can't be. And what, out of interest, works? My perpetual motion machine! A perpetuum mobile? Edmund Bumbler, venerable zoology lecturer, asked curiously. Indeed. You aren't exaggerating, my dear colleague. Not in the slightest, yelled Oppenhauser and leapt like a goat. Not a bit. It works. The machine works. I set it in motion, and it works. It runs continuously, without stopping, permanently, forever and ever. It can't be described, colleagues. You must see it. Come to my lab, quickly. I'm having my breakfast, protested Rotten Eggs. But his protest was lost in the hubbub and general excited commotion. Professors, magisters and bachelors threw coats and fur coats over their gowns and ran for the exit, led by Oppenhauser, still shouting and gesticulating. Rotten Eggs pointed his digitus infamous at them and returned to his roll and forcemeat. The small group of scholars, constantly being joined by more scholars, greedy to see the fruits of Oppenhauser's thirty years of labours, briskly covered the distance separating them from the laboratory of the famous physicist. They were just about to open the door when the ground suddenly shook, perceptibly, powerfully, actually, very powerfully, actually. It was a seismic wave, one of the series of earthquakes caused by the destruction of Stigger Castle, Vilgefortz's hideout, by the sorceresses. The seismic wave had come all the way to Oxenfurt from distant ebbing. Dozens of pieces of glass exploded with a crash from the stained glass window on the frontage of the Department of Fine Arts. The bust of Nicodemus de Boot, the Academy's first rector, scrawled over with rude words, fell from its plinth. The cup of herb tea with which Rotten Eggs was washing down his roll and forcemeat fell from the table. A first-year physics student, Albert Solpietra, fell from a plantain tree in the academy grounds that he had climbed to impress some female medical students. And Professor Oppenhauser's Perpetuum Mobile, his legendary perpetual motion engine, turned over once more and stopped. Forever. And it was never possible to start it again.
Long live the dwarves! Long live Mahakam! What kind of mixed bunch is this? What gang of ruffians? thought Hierarch Hemelfart, blessing the parade with a trembling hand. Who's being cheered here? Venal condottieri? Obscene dwarfs? What a bizarre bunch! Who won this war, after all? Them or us? By the gods, I must draw the king's attention to this. When historians and writers get down to their work, their scribblings ought to be censored. Mercenaries, witches, hired brigands, non-humans, and all other suspicious elements are to vanish from the chronicles of humanity, are to be deleted, expunged, not a word about them, not a word. And not a word about him either, he thought, pursing his lips and looking at Dykstra, who was observing the parade with a distinctly bored expression. It will be necessary, thought the Hierarch, to issue the kings with instructions regarding Dykstra. His presence is an insult to decent people. He's a heathen and a scoundrel. May he disappear without trace, and may he be forgotten. Over my dead body, you sanctimonious purple hog, thought Philippa Eilhart, effortlessly reading the Hierarch's feverish thoughts. You'd like to rule. You'd like to dictate and influence. You'd like to decide things. Over my dead body. All you can make judgments about are your piles, which don't count for much beyond your own arse. And Dykstra will remain. As long as I need him. You'll make a mistake one day, thought Priest Willemer, looking at Philippa's shining crimson lips. One day one of you will make a mistake. Your vain glory, arrogance and hubris will be your undoing, and your scheming, your immorality, the baseness and perversion which you give yourselves unto in which you live. It will come to light. The stench of your sins will spread when you make a mistake. Such a moment has to come. And even if you don't make a mistake, an opportunity will arise to blame you for something. Some misfortune, some disaster, some pestilence, perhaps a plague or an epidemic will fall on humanity. Then your guilt will descend on you. You will not be blamed for having been unable to prevent the plague, but for being unable to remove its effects. You shall be to blame for everything. And then... Fires will be lit under stakes. The stripy old tomcat, called Ginger because of its colouring, was dying. Dying hideously. He was rolling around, writhing, scratching the ground, vomiting blood and mucus, racked by convulsions. On top of that, he had bloody diarrhoea. He was meowing, although it was beneath his dignity. Meowing mournfully, softly. He was weakening fast. Ginger knew why he was dying, or at least guessed what was killing him. Several days before, a strange freighter, an old and very dirty hulk, a neglected tub, almost a wreck, had called at the port of Sintra. Katrina announced the barely visible letters on the hulk's prow. Ginger naturally couldn't read the letters. A rat climbed down the mooring line to alight on the quay from the strange old tub. A single rat. The rat was hairless, lousy and sluggish, and only had one ear. Ginger killed the rat. He was hungry, but instinct prevented him from eating the hideous creature. However, several fleas, big, shiny fleas, teeming in the rodent's fur, managed to crawl onto Ginger and settle in his coat. What's up with that sodding cat? Someone probably poisoned it or put a spell on it. Ugh, abomination. It doesn't half stink, the scoundrel. Get him off those steps, woman. Ginger stiffened and silently opened his bloody maw. He no longer felt the kicks or pokes of the broom with which the housewife was now thanking him for eleven years of catching mice. Kicked out of the yard, he was dying in a gutter, frothing with soap suds and urine. He died, wishing that those ungrateful people would also fall ill and suffer like him. His wishes were about to come true, 
and on a great scale. A great scale indeed. The woman who had kicked and swept Ginger from the yard stopped, lifted her frock and scratched her calf below the knee. It was itchy. A flea had bitten her. The stars over Elskadeg twinkled intensively. They formed the backdrop against which the sparks from the campfire were dying out. Neither can the piece of Sintra, said the elf, nor yet the bombastic Novigradian parade be considered a watershed or a milestone. What kind of notions are they? Political authority cannot create history with the help of acts or decrees. Neither can political authority assess history, give grades or characterize it, although in its pride no authority would ever acknowledge that truth. One of the more extreme signs of your human arrogance is so-called historiography, the attempts to give opinions and pass sentences about what you call ancient history. It's typical for you people and results from the fact that nature gave you an ephemeral, insectile, ant-like life and an average lifespan of less than a hundred years. You, however, try to adapt the world to that insectile existence. And meanwhile, history is a process that occurs ceaselessly and never ends. It's impossible to separate history into episodes from here to there, from here to there, from date to date. You can't define history nor change it with a royal address, even if you've won a war. I won't enter into a philosophical dispute, said the pilgrim. As it's been said before, I'm a simple and not very eloquent fellow, but I dare observe two things. Firstly, a lifespan as short as insects protects us, people, from decadence, and inclines us to respect life, live intensively and creatively, in order to make the most of every moment of life and enjoy it. I speak and think like a man, but after all, the long-lived elves thought likewise— going to fight and die in the Scoia'tael commando units. If I'm wrong, please correct me. The pilgrim waited a suitable length of time, but no one corrected him. Secondly, he continued, it seems to me that political authority, although unable to change history, may by its actions produce quite a fair illusion and appearance of such an ability. Political power has methods and instruments to do so. Oh, yes, replied the elf, turning his face away. Here yeah, you've hit the nail on the head, Master Pilgrim. Power has methods and instruments which are in no way open to discussion. The galley's side struck the seaweed and shell-covered piles. Mooring ropes were thrown. Shouts, curses and commands resounded. Seagulls shrieked as they scavenged for the refuse floating in the port's dirty green water. The quayside was teeming with people, mainly uniformed. End of the voyage, gentlemen elves, said the Nilfgaardian commander of the convoy. We're in Dillingen. Everybody off, you're being waited for here. It was a fact. They were being waited for. None of the elves, and certainly not Foltiana, had any faith in the assurances of fair trials or amnesties. The Scoia'tael and the officers of the Vrihed Brigade had no illusory hopes about the fate awaiting them on the far side of the Yaruga. In the majority of cases, they had become accustomed to it, accepted it stoically, with resignation even. Nothing, they thought, could astonish them now. They were mistaken. They were chased from the galley, jingling and clanking their manacles, driven onto the jetty and then onto the quay between a double line of armed mercenaries. There were also civilians there, whose sharp eyes flashed quickly, flitting from face to face, from figure to figure. Selectors, thought Foltiana. He wasn't mistaken. He couldn't expect, naturally, his disfigured face to be overlooked. And he wasn't. Mr. Isengrim Foltiana? The Iron Wolf? What a pleasant surprise! Come this way, come this way! The mercenaries dragged him out of the ranks. Fafel! Konachda Reo shouted to him. 
He had been recognized and holed out by other soldiers wearing gorgets with the Redanian eagle. Seved, Sekir Madia. You'll be seeing each other, hissed the civilian who had selected Foyltiana, but probably in hell. They're already waiting for him in Drakenborg. Hello, stop. Isn't that by chance Mr. Reardon? Seize him. In all, they pulled out three of them. Just three. Foltiana understood and suddenly, to his surprise, began to be afraid. A fail, Angus Bricree shouted to his comrades as he was pulled out of the rank, manacles jingling. A fail, Freren. A mercenary shoved him roughly. They weren't taken far. They only got to one of the sheds close to the harbour, right next to the dock of which a forest of masts swayed. The civilian gave a sign. Foiltiana was pushed against a post under a beam over which a rope was slung. An iron hook was attached to the rope. Reardon and Angus were sat down on two stools on the dirt floor. Mr. Reardon, Mr. Bree Cree, said the civilian coldly. You have been given an amnesty. The court decided to show mercy. But justice must be done, he added, not waiting for a reaction. And the families of those whom you murdered have paid for it to happen, gentlemen. The verdict has been reached. Reardon and Angus didn't even manage to cry out. Nooses were thrown over their necks. They were throttled, knocked down along with the stools and dragged across the floor. As they vainly tried with their manacled hands to tear off the nooses, biting into their necks, the executioners kneeled on their chests. Knives flashed and fell, blood spurted. Now even the nooses were unable to stifle their screams, their hair-raising shrieks. It lasted a long time, as always. Your sentence, Mr. Foyltiana, was equipped with an additional clause, said the civilian, turning his head slowly. Something extra. Foyltiana had no intention of waiting for that something extra. The manacle's clasp, which the elf had been working on for two days and nights, now fell from his wrist as though tapped by a magic wand. With a terrible blow of the heavy chain, he knocked down both mercenaries guarding him. Foil Tiana, in full flight, kicked the next one in the face, lashed the civilian with the manacles, hurled himself straight at the cobweb-covered window of the shed and flew through it, taking the frame and casing with him, leaving blood and shreds of clothing on the nails. He landed on the planks of the jetty with a thud. He turned tumbled forward, rolled over and dived into the water between the fishing boats and launches. The heavy chain, still attached to his right wrist, was dragging him down to the bottom. Foiltiana fought. He fought with all his strength for his life, which not so long before he hadn't thought he cared about. Catch him! yelled the mercenaries, rushing from the shed. Catch him! Kill him! Over there! yelled others, running up along the jetty. There! He came up there! To the bolts! Shoot! roared the civilian, trying with both hands to stop the blood gushing from his eye socket. Kill him! The strings of crossbows twanged. Seagulls flew up shrieking. The dirty green water between the launches seethed with crossbow bolts. Thievant! The parade stretched out and the crowd of Novigradians were now displaying signs of fatigue and hoarseness. Thievant! Long live the army! Hurrah! Glory to the king's glory! Philippa Eilhart looked around to see that no one was listening, then leaned over towards Dykstra. What do you want to talk to me about? The spy also looked around. About the assassination of King Vizimir, carried out last July. I beg your pardon. The half-elf who committed that murder. Dykstra lowered his voice even more was by no means a madman, Phil, and wasn't acting alone. What are you saying? Hush! Dykstra smiled. Hush, Phil. Don't call me Phil. Do you have any proof? What kind? Where did you get it? You'd be surprised, Phil, if I told you where. When can I expect an audience, honourable lady? Philippa Eilhart's eyes were like two black bottomless legs. Soon, Dykstra. The bells tolled. The crowd cheered hoarsely. The army paraded. 
Petals cover the Novigradian cobbles like snow. Are you still writing? Ori Ruvin started and made a blot. He had served Dykstra for nineteen years, but was still not accustomed to the noiseless movements of his boss, appearing from God knows where and God knows how. Uh, good evening, <coughs> you're on Men from the Shadows. Dykstra read the title page of the manuscript, which he had picked up unceremoniously from the table. The History of the Royal Secret Services, written by Oribasius Gianfranco Paolo Reuven, Magister. <laughs> ori, ori. An old fellow and such foolishness. <clears throat> I came to say goodbye, Ori. Reuven looked at him in surprise. You see, my loyal comrade, continued the spy, without waiting for his secretary to cough anything up, I'm also old, and it turns out I'm also foolish. I said one word to one person, just one person, and just one word. It was one word too many, and one person too many. Listen carefully, Ori. Can you hear them? Ori Reuven shook his head, his eyes wide open in amazement. Dykstra said nothing for a time. You can't hear, he said after a moment. But I can hear them. In all the corridors. Rats are running through the city of Tretagor. They're coming here. They're coming on soft little rat's paws. They came out of the shadows, out of the darkness, dressed in black, masked as nimble as rats. The sentries and bodyguards from the antechambers dropped without moaning under the quick thrusts of daggers with narrow angular blades. Blood flowed over the floors of Traitorgor Castle, spilled over the tiles, stained the woodblocks, soaked into the Vengerbergian carpets. They approached along all the corridors and left corpses behind them. He's there said one of them, pointing. The scarf showing his face up to his eyes muffled his voice. He went in there, through the chancery, where Reuven, that coffin old coot, works. There's no way out of there. The eyes of the other one, the commander, shone in the slits of his black velvet mask. The chamber behind the chancery is windowless. There's no way out. All of the other corridors are covered. All the doors and windows. He can't escape. He's trapped. Forward. The door gave away to kicks. Daggers flashed. Death! Death to the bloody killer! Him? Him? Ori Reuven raised his myopic, watery eyes above the papers. Yes? How can I him, him, help you, gentlemen? The murderers smashed open the door to Dykstra's private chambers, scurried around them like rats, searching through all the nooks and crannies. Tapestries, paintings and panels were tall from the walls, fell onto the floor. Daggers slashed curtains and upholsteries. He's not here, yelled one of them, rushing into the chancery. He's not here. Where is he? rasped the gang leader, leaning over Ori, staring at him through the slits in his black mask. Where is that bloodthirsty dog? He's not here, Ori Reuven replied calmly. You can see for yourself. Where is he? Talk. Where's Dykstra? Am I? coughed Ori. Him, him, my brother's keeper. Die, old man. I'm old, sick, and very weary. <coughs> I fear neither you nor your knives. The murderers ran from the chamber. They vanished as quickly as they had appeared. They didn't kill Ori Reuven. They were paid killers, and there hadn't been the slightest mention of Ori Reuven in their orders. Oribasius Gianfranco Paolo Reuven, master at law, spent six years in various prisons, constantly interrogated by various investigators, asked about all sorts of apparently senseless things and matters. He was released after six years. He was very ill by then. Scurvy had taken away all his teeth, anemia his hair, glaucoma his eyesight, and asthma his breath. The fingers of both hands had been broken during the interrogations. He lived for less than a year after being freed. He died in a temple poorhouse, in misery, forgotten. The manuscript of the book Men from the Shadows, the History of the Royal Secret Services, vanished without trace. The sky in the east brightened. 
a pale glow appeared above the hills, the harbinger of the dawn. Silence had reigned by the campfire for a long time. The pilgrim, the elf, and the tracker looked into the dying fire in silence. Silence reigned in Elskadeg. The howling phantom had gone away, bored by its vain howling. The phantom must have finally understood that the three men sitting by the campfire had seen too many atrocities lately to worry about any old spectre. If we are to travel together, we must abandon mistrust, Boreas Munn said suddenly, looking into the campfire's ruby glow. Let's leave behind us what was. The world has changed. There's a new life in front of us. Something has ended. Something is beginning. Ahead of us. He broke off and coughed. He was not accustomed to speeches like that, was afraid of looking ridiculous. But his accidental companions weren't laughing. Why, Boreas positively sensed friendliness emanating from them. The pass of Elskadeg is ahead of us, he ended in a more confident voice. And beyond the pass, Serikania and Hackland. There's a long and dangerous road ahead of us. If we are to travel together, let's abandon mistrust. I am Boreas Munn. The pilgrim in the wide-brimmed hat stood up, straightening his great frame, and shook the hand being held out towards him. The elf also stood up, his horrifyingly disfigured face contorted strangely. After shaking the tracker's hand, the pilgrim and the elf held out their right hands towards each other. The world has changed, said the pilgrim. Something has ended. I am... Sigi Ruven. Something is beginning. The elf twisted his ravaged face into something that, according to all evidence, was a smile. I am... Wolf Isengrim. They shook hands, quickly, firmly, downright violently. For a moment, it looked more like the preliminaries to a fight than a gesture of reconciliation. But only for a moment. The log in the campfire shot out sparks, celebrating the event with a joyful firework. God strike me down, Boreas Munn smiled broadly. If this isn't the start of a beautiful friendship. Along with the other martyr sisters, St. Philippa was also calumniated for betraying the kingdom, for fomenting tumults and sedition, for inciting the people and plotting an insurrection. Vilmerius, a heretic and cultist and self-appointed high priest, ordered the saint to be seized, thrown into a dark and foul prison beset with cold and stench, calling on her to confess her sins and declare those that she had committed. And Vilmerius showed St. Philippa divers instruments of torture and menaced her greatly. But the saint merely spat in his countenance and accused him of sodomy. The heretic ordered her stripped of her raiment and thrashed mercilessly with leather straps and for splinters to be driven under her fingernails. And then he asked and called on her to disavow her faith and the goddess. But the saint merely laughed and advised him to distance himself. Then he ordered her dragged to the torture chamber and her whole body to be harrowed with iron gaffs and hooks and her sides scorched with candles. And although thus tormented, the saint in her mortal corpse showed immortal forbearance, until the torturers were enfeebled and withdrew in great horror. But Vilmerius fiercely admonished them and ordered them further to torture her and soundly belabor her. They then began to scorch St. Philippa with red-hot irons, dislocate her members from the joints and rend the woman's breast with pincers. And in this suffering, she, having confessed nothing, expired. And the godless, shameless Vilmerius, about whom you may read in the works of the Holy Fathers, met such a punishment that lice and worms spread over him and overcame him until he was decayed all over and expired. And he reeked like a cur such that he needs must be cast into a river without burial. For which praise and a martyr's crown are due to St. Philippa and glory forever to the great mother goddess and to us a lesson and a warning. Amen. The life of St. Philippa the Martyr of Mons Calvus, copied from the martyr scribes in the Tertorian Breviary, summarized, drawn from many holy fathers who praise her in their writings.
Chapter 11 They rushed like the wind, like mad things, at breakneck speed. They rode through the days, now burgeoning with spring. The horses carried them in a light-footed gallop, and the people, straightening their necks and backs from toiling on the soil, watched them as they went, uncertain of what they had seen, riders or apparitions. They rode through the nights, dark and wet from the warm rain, and the people, woken and sitting up on their pallets, looked around terrified, fighting the choking pain that rose in their throats and chests. People sprang up, listening to the thud of shutters, to the crying of those rested from sleep, to the howling of dogs. They pressed their faces to the parchment in their windows, uncertain of what they had seen, riders or apparitions. After ebbing, Tales of the three demons began to circulate. The three riders appeared from God knows where and God knows how, completely astonishing Pegleg and giving him no chance to flee. Neither was there any help to call for. A good five hundred paces separated the cripple from the outermost buildings of the small town, and even if it had been closer, there was a slender chance that any of Jealousy's inhabitants would bother about someone calling for help. It was siesta time, which, in jealousy, usually lasted from late morning until early evening. Aristoteles Bobek, nicknamed Pegleg, the local beggar and philosopher, knew only too well that jealousy residents didn't react to anything during siesta time. There were three riders, two women and a man. The man had white hair and wore a sword slung across his back. One of the women more mature and dressed in black and white, had raven-black hair curled in locks. The younger one, whose straight hair was the colour of ash, had a hideous scar on her left cheek. She was sitting on a splendid black mare. Pegleg felt he'd seen a mare like that before. It was the younger one that spoke first. Are you from round here? It wasn't me, Pegleg said, teeth chattering. I'm not but gathering mushrooms. Forgive me, don't harm a cripple. Are you from round here? She repeated, and her green eyes flashed menacingly. Pegleg cowered. Aye, noble lady, he mumbled. I'm a local, right enough. I was born here in Birka, I mean in jealousy, and I shall no doubt die here. Last year, in the summer and autumn, were you here? Where should I have been? Answer when I ask you. I was, good lady. The black mare shook its head and pricked up its ears. Pegleg felt the eyes of the other two, the black-haired woman and the white-haired man, pricking him like hedgehog spines. The white-haired man scared him the most. A year ago, continued the girl with a scar, in the month of September, the ninth of September to be precise, in the first quarter of the moon, six young people were murdered here. Four lads and two girls. Do you recall? Pegleg swallowed. For some time he had suspected, and now he knew, now he was certain. The girl had changed, and it wasn't just that scar on her face. She was completely different to how she had been when she was screaming, tied to a hitching post, watching as Bonnard cut off the heads of the murdered rats. Quite different to how she had been in the chimera's head when Bonnard undressed and beat her. Only the eyes. The eyes hadn't changed. Talk! The other black-haired woman urged him. You were asked a question. I remember, my lord and ladies, confirmed Pegleg. How could I not remember? Six youngsters were killed. By truth, it was last year. In September. The girl said nothing for a long time, looking not at him, but somewhere in the distance over his shoulder. So, you must know, she finally said with effort, you must know where those boys and those girls were buried. By which fence, on what rubbish tip or muck heap, or if their bodies were cremated, if they were taken to the forest and left for the foxes and wolves. You'll show me that place. You'll take me there. Understand? I understand, noble lady. Come with me, for it's not far at all. He hobbled, feeling on his neck the hot breath of their horses. 
He didn't look back. Something told him he shouldn't. Here it is, he finally pointed. This is our jealousy boneyard here in this grove. And the ones you was talking about, Miss Falker, they lie over there. The girl gasped audibly. Pegleg glanced furtively and saw her face changing. The white-haired man and the black-haired woman were silent and their faces inscrutable. The girl looked long at the small barrow. It was orderly, level, tidy, edged by blocks of sandstone and slabs of spar and slate. The fir branches that the burial mound had been decorated with had turned brown. The flowers that had once been laid there were dry and yellowed. The girl dismounted. Who? she asked dully, still looking, not turning her head away. Well, many jealousy people helped. Pegleg cleared his throat. But chiefly, the widow Gulu and young Niklar. The widow was always a good and sincere dame, and Niklar, his dreams tormented him terribly. I wouldn't give him rest until he'd given the murdered ones a decent burial. Where shall I find them? The widow and Niklar. Pegleg said nothing for a long time. The widow is buried there, beyond that crooked little birch, he said at last, looking without fear into the girl's green eyes. She died of pneumonia in the winter of the year, and Niklar joined the army somewhere in foreign parts. Folks say he fell in the war. I forgot, she whispered. I forgot that destiny tied both of them to me. She approached the small burial mound and knelt down, or rather fell onto one knee. She bent over low, very low, her forehead almost touching the stones around the base. Pegleg saw the white-haired man make a movement as though meaning to dismount, but the black-haired woman caught him by the arm, stopping him with a gesture and a look. The horses snorted, shook their heads, the rings of their bits jingling. The girl knelt for a long, long time at the foot of the burial mound, bent over, and her mouth moved in some silent litany. She staggered as she stood up. Pegleg held her up instinctively. She flinched hard, jerked her elbow away, and looked at him malevolently through her tears. But she didn't say a word. She even thanked him with a nod when he held her stirrup for her. Yes, noble Miss Falker he dared to say. Fate ran a strange course. You were in grievous strife then and bitter times. Few of us here in jealousy thought you'd get out of it alive. And finally, you're healthy today, my lady, and Gulu and Nickler are in the beyond. There's not even anyone to thank, eh? To repay for the burial mound. My name's not Falka, she said harshly. My name's Siri. And as far as thanks are concerned, feel honoured by her. The black-haired woman interjected coldly. And there was something in her voice that made Pegleg tremble. Grace, gratitude and reward have befallen you. You and your entire settlement. You know not even how great, said the black-haired woman, slowly enunciating her words. For the burial mound. For your humanity. And for your human dignity and decency. On the 9th of April, soon after midnight, the first residents of Clermont were awoken by a flickering brightness, a red blaze that struck and flooded into the windows of their homesteads. The rest of the town's residents were roused from their beds by screams, commotion, and the insistent sounds of the bell tolling the alarm. Only one building was burning. It was huge and wooden, formerly a temple, once consecrated to a deity whose name even the oldest grandmothers couldn't remember a temple now converted into an amphitheatre where animal baiting, fights and other entertainment was held, capable of hauling the small town of Clermont out of its boredom, depression and drowsy torpor. It was the amphitheatre that was now burning in a sea of roaring fire, shaking from explosions. Ragged tongues of flame, several yards long, shot from all the windows. Fire! 
roared the merchant Huvenagel, the owner of the amphitheatre, running and waving his arms around, his great paunch wobbling. He was wearing a nightcap and a heavy caracal coat he had thrown over his nightshirt. He was kneading the dung and mud of the street with his bare feet. Fire! Help! Water! It's a divine punishment, pronounced one of the oldest grandmothers authoritatively, for those rumpuses they held in the house of worship. Yes, yes, madam, no doubt about it. A glow emanated from the roaring theatre. Horse urine steamed and stank, and sparks hissed in puddles. A wind had got up from God knows where. Put out the fire! Hoovenagel howled desperately, seeing it spreading to the brewery and granary. Help! Fetch buckets! Fetch buckets! There was no shortage of volunteers. Why, Clermont even had its own fire brigade, equipped and maintained by Hoovenagel. They tried to put the fire out doggedly and with dedication, but in vain. We can't cope, groaned the chief of the fire brigade, wiping his blistered face. That's no ordinary fire. It's the devil's work. Black magic, another fireman choked on the smoke. From inside the amphitheatre could be heard the terrible cracking of rafters, ridges and posts breaking. There was a roar, a bang and a crash. A great column of fire and sparks exploded into the sky and the roof caved in and fell onto the arena. Meanwhile, the whole building listed over. You could say it was bowing to the audience, which was entertaining and diverting for the last time, pleasing it with a stunning, truly fiery spectacle. And then the walls collapsed. The efforts of the firefighters and rescuers meant half of the granary and about a quarter of the brewery were saved. A foul-smelling dawn arose. Hoovenagel sat in the mud and ash in his soot-covered nightcap and caracal coat. He sat and wept woefully, whimpering like a child. The theatre, brewery and granary he owned were insured, naturally. The problem was that the insurance company was also owned by Hoovenagel. Nothing, not even a tax swindle, could have made good even a fraction of the losses. Where to now? asked Geralt, looking at the column of smoke, a smudged streak discoloring the sky glowing pink in the dawn. Who do you still have to pay back, Siri? She glanced at him, and he immediately regretted his question. He suddenly desired to hug her, dreamed of embracing her, cuddling her, stroking her hair, protecting her, never allowing her to be alone again, to encounter evil, to encounter anything that would make her desire revenge. Yennefer remained silent. Yennefer had spent a lot of time silent lately. No, Ciri said calmly. We're going to ride to a settlement called Unicorn. The name comes from a straw unicorn. The poor, ridiculous, miserable effigy that looks after the village. I want the residents to have, as a souvenir of what happened, a, well, if not a more valuable, then at least a more tasteful totem. I'm counting on your help, Yennefer, for without magic, I know, Siri. And after that? The swamps of Periplut. I hope I can find my way. To a cottage amidst the swamps. We'll find the remains of a man in a cottage. I want those remains to be buried in a decent grave. Geralt still said nothing and didn't lower his gaze. After that, Siri continued, holding his stare without the slightest difficulty. We'll stop by the settlement of Dundara. The inn there was probably burned down and the innkeeper may have been murdered. Because of me. Hatred and vengeance blinded me. I shall try somehow to make it up to his family. There's no way of doing that, he said, still looking. I know, she replied at once, hard, almost angrily. But I shall stand before them in humility. I shall remember the expression in their eyes. I hope the memory of those eyes will stop me making a similar mistake. Do you understand that, Geralt? He understands, Siri, said Yennefer. Both of us, believe us, understand you very well, daughter. Let's go. The horses bore them like the wind, like a magical gale. 
Alarmed by the three riders flashing by, a traveller on the road raised his head. A merchant on a cart with his wares, a villain fleeing from the law, and a wandering settler driven by politicians from the land he had settled, having believed other politicians, all raised their heads. A vagabond, a deserter, and a pilgrim with a staff raised their heads. They raised their heads, amazed, alarmed, uncertain of what they had seen. Tales began to circulate around Ebbing and Jesu about the wild hunt, about the three spectral riders. Stories were made up and spun in the evenings in rooms smelling of melting lard and fried onions, village halls, smoky taverns, roadhouses, crofts, tar kilns, forest homesteads and border watchtowers. Tales were spun and told. About war, about heroism and chivalry, about friendship and hatred, about wickedness and betrayal, about faithful and genuine love, about the love that always triumphs, about the crimes and punishments that always befall criminals, about justice that is always just, about truth which always rises to the surface like oil. Tales were told. People rejoiced in them, enjoyed the fairy tale fictions, because, indeed, all around in real life, things happened entirely back to front. The legend grew. The listeners, in a veritable trance, drank in the carefully measured words of the storyteller telling of the witcher and the sorceress, of the Tower of the Swallow, of Ciri, the witcher girl with the scar on her face, of Kelpie, the enchanted black mare, of the Lady of the Lake. That came later, years later, many, many years later. But right now, like a seed swollen after warm rain, the legend was sprouting and growing inside people. May came suddenly, first at night, which flared up and sparkled with the distant fires of Viltana. When Ciri, strangely excited, leapt onto Kelpie and galloped towards the campfires, Geralt and Yennefer took advantage of the opportunity for a moment of intimacy. Undressing only as much as was absolutely necessary, they made love on a sheepskin coat flung onto the ground. They made love hurriedly and with abandon, in silence, without a word. They made love quickly and haphazardly, just to have more of it. And when they had both calmed down, trembling and kissing away each other's tears, they were greatly surprised how much happiness such hurried lovemaking had brought them. Geralt? Yes, Yen. When I... When we weren't together, did you go with any other women? No. Not once. Not once. Your voice didn't even waver. So I don't know why I don't believe you. I only ever thought about you, Yen. Now I believe you. May came unexpectedly during the daytime too. Dandelions spattered and dotted the meadows yellow, and the trees in the orchards became fluffy and heavy with blossom. The oak woods, too distinguished to hurry, remained dark and bare, but were already being covered in a green haze, and at the edges grew bright with green splashes of birch. One night, when they were camping in a valley covered in willows, the witcher was woken by a dream. A nightmare where he was paralyzed and defenseless, and a huge grey owl raked his face with its talons and searched for his eyes with its curved beak. He awoke and wasn't sure if he hadn't been transported from one nightmare into another. There was a brightness billowing over their camp that the snorting horses took fright at. There was something inside the brightness, something like a dark interior, something shaped like a castle hall with a black colonnade. Geralt could see a large table, around which sat ten shapes, ten women. He could hear words, snatches of words, Bring her to us, Yennefer. We order you. You may not order me. You may not order her. You have no power over her. I'm not afraid of them, Mama. They can't do anything to me. If they want, I'll stand before them. Is meeting in the first of June at the new moon. We order you both to appear. We warn you that we shall punish disobedience. I shall come right away, Philippa. Let her stay with him a little longer. Let him not be alone. 
just a few days. I shall come immediately as a hostage of goodwill. Comply with my request, Philippa. Please. The brightness pulsated. The horses snorted wildly, banging their hooves. The witcher awoke. This time for real. The following day, Yennefer confirmed his fears after a long conversation conducted with Ciri in private. I'm going away, she said dryly, without any preliminaries. I must. Ciri's staying with you, for some time at least. Then I'll summon her and she'll also go away, and then we'll all meet again. He nodded, reluctantly. He'd had enough of silent assent, of agreeing to everything she communicated to him with everything she decided. But he nodded. He loved her when all was said and done. It's an imperative that cannot be opposed, she said more gently. Neither can it be postponed. It simply has to be taken care of. I'm doing it for you in any case, for your good, and especially for Ciri's good. He nodded. When we meet again, she said even more gently, I'll make up for everything, Geralt. The silence, too. There's been too much silence. Too much silence between us. And now, instead of nodding, hug me and kiss me. He did as he was asked. He loved her when all was said and done. Where to now? Siri asked dryly, a short while after Yennefer had vanished in the flash of the oval teleporter. The river. Geralt cleared his throat, fighting the pain behind his breastbone that was taking his breath away. The river we're riding up is the Sans Retour. It leads to a country, I must show you, for it's a fairy tale country. Siri turned gloomy. He saw her clench her fists. Every fairy tale ends badly, she drawled, and there aren't any fairy tale lands. Yes, there are. You'll see. It was the day after the full moon when they saw Toussaint bathed in greenery and sunshine, when they saw the hills, the slopes and the vineyards, the roofs of the castle's towers glistening after a morning shower. The view didn't disappoint. It was stunning. It always was. How beautiful it is, said Ciri enraptured. Oh my, those castles are like children's toys, like icing decorations on a birthday cake. It makes me want to lick them. Architecture by Faramon himself, Geralt informed her knowledgeably. Wait till you see the palace and grounds of Beauclair close up. Palace? We're going to a palace? Do you know the king here? Duchess. Does the Duchess, she asked sourly, observing him intently under her fringe, have green eyes perhaps and short black hair? No. He cut her off looking away. She looked completely different. I don't know where you got that from. Leave it, Geralt, will you? What is it about this Duchess, then? As I said, I know her. A little. Not too well and not too close, if you want to know. But I do know the Duchess's consort, or rather a candidate for the Duchess's consort. You do too, Siri. Siri jabbed Kelpie with a spur, making her dance around the highway. Don't torment me any longer. Dandelion. Dandelion? And the Duchess? How come? It's a long story. We left him here at the side of his beloved. We promised to visit him returning after... He fell silent and turned gloomy. You can't do anything about it, Siri said softly. Don't torment yourself, Geralt. It's not your fault. Yes, it is, he thought. It's mine. Dandelion's going to ask, and I'll have to answer. Milva, Kair, Rages, Angulem. A sword is a double-edged weapon. Oh, by the gods, I've had enough of this. Enough. Time I was done with this. Let's go, Siri. In these clothes? She croaked. To a palace. I don't see anything wrong with our clothes. He cut her off. We aren't going there to present our credentials or to a ball. We can even meet Dandelion in the stables. 
Anyhow, he added, seeing her looking sulky. I'm going to the bank in the town first. I'll take a little cash out, and there are countless tailors and milliners in the cloth holes in the town square. You can buy what you want and dress as you wish. Have you got so much cash? She tilted her head mischievously. You can buy what you want, he repeated. Even ermine and basilisk leather slippers. I know a shoemaker who ought to have some of it left in stock. How did you make so much money? By killing. Let's ride, Siri, and not waste time. Geralt made a transfer and prepared a letter of credit, received a cheque and some cash in the branch of the Canfinelli's bank. He wrote some letters that were to be taken by the express courier service heading over the Yaruga. He politely excused himself from the luncheon the attentive and hospitable banker wanted to entertain him with. Siri was waiting in the street, watching the horses. The street, empty a moment earlier, now teemed with people. We must have happened on some feast or other. Siri gestured with her head towards a crowd heading for the town square. A fair, perhaps? Geralt looked keenly ahead. It's not a fair. Ah. She also looked, standing up in the stirrups. It's not another execution, he confirmed. The most popular amusement since the war. What have we seen so far, Siri? Desertion, treason, cowardice in the face of the enemy, she quickly recited. And financial cases for supplying mouldy hardtack to the army. The witcher nodded. The life of an enterprising merchant is tough in wartime. They aren't going to execute a tradesman here. Siri reined back Kelpie, who was already submerged in the crowd as though in a rippling field of corn. Just look. The scaffold's covered in a cloth, and the executioner has a fresh new hood on. They'll be executing somebody important, at least a baron. So it probably is cowardice in the face of the enemy. Toussaint didn't have an army in the face of any foe. Geralt shook his head. No, Siri. I think it's economics again. They're executing somebody for swindles in the trade of their famous wine, the basis of the economy here. Let's ride on, Siri. We won't watch. Ride on? How exactly? Indeed, riding on was impossible. In no time at all, they had become stuck in the crowd gathered in the square and were mired in the throng. There was no chance of their getting to the other side of the square. Geralt swore foully and looked back. Unfortunately, retreat was also impossible, for the wave of people pouring into the square totally clogged up the street behind them. For a moment, the crowd carried them like a river, but the movement stopped when the common folk came up against the serried wall of halberdiers surrounding the scaffold. They're coming, somebody shouted, and the crowd buzzed, swayed, and took up the cry. They're coming! The clatter of hooves and the rattle of a wagon faded and was lost amidst the throng's bee-like humming. So they were astonished when a rack wagon pulled by two horses trundled out of a side street, and on it, having difficulty keeping his balance, stood... Dandelion, groaned Siri. Geralt suddenly felt bad. Very bad. That's Dandelion, Siri repeated in an unfamiliar voice. Yes, it's him. It's unfair, thought the witcher. It's one big bloody injustice. It can't be like this. It shouldn't be like this. I know it was stupid and naive to think that anything ever depended on me, that I somehow influenced the fate of this world, or that this world owes me something. I know it was a naive, arrogant opinion. But I know it. There's no need to convince me about it. It doesn't have to be proved to me. Particularly like this. It's unfair. It can't be Dandelion, he said hollowly, looking down at Roach's mane. It is Dandelion, Siri said again. Geralt, we have to do something. What? he asked bitterly. Tell me what? Some soldiers pulled Dandelion from the wagon, treating him, however, with astonishing courtesy, without brutality, with positive reverence, the most they were capable of. They untied his hands before the steps leading to the scaffold. Then he, nonchalantly, scratched his behind and climbed the steps without being urged. One of the steps suddenly creaked, and the railing, made of a rough pole, cracked. Dandelion almost lost his balance. That needs fixing, damn it, he yelled. You'll see, one day somebody will kill themselves on these steps, and that wouldn't be funny. Dandelion was intercepted on the scaffolding by two hangman's assistants in sleeveless leather jerkins. 
The executioner, as broad in the shoulders as a castle keep, looked at the condemned man through slits in his hood. Beside him stood a character in a sumptuous, though funereally black, outfit. He also wore a funereal expression. Good gentlemen and burghers of Beauclair and the surroundings, he read thunderously and funereally from an unrolled parchment. It is known that Julian Alfred Pankratz, Viscount de Lettenhove, alias Dandelion, Pankratz what? Siri whispered a question. By sentence of the Ducal High Court, has been found guilty of all the crimes, misdeeds, and offences of which he is accused, namely, Les Majeste, treason, and furthermore, sullying the dignity of the noble estate through perjury, lampooning, calumny, and slander, also roistering and indecency, as well as debauchery, in other words, harlotry. Thus, the tribunal has adjudged to punish Viscount Julian, etc., primo, by defacing his coat of arms, by painting diagonal black lines on his escutcheon, secundo, by the confiscation of his property, lands, estates, copses, forests, and castles. Castles, groaned the witcher. What castles? Dandelion snorted insolently. The expression on his face demonstrated emphatically that he was heartily amused by the confiscation announced by the tribunal. Tertio, the chief penalty. Anna Henrietta, reigning over us as her enlightenment, the Duchess of Toussaint and Lady of Beauclair, has deigned to commute the punishment provided for the above-mentioned crimes of being dragged behind horses, broken on the wheel and quartered, to beheading by axe. May justice be done. The crowd raised several incoherent shouts. The women standing in the front row began to hypocritically wail and falsely lament. Children were lifted up or carried on shoulders so as not to miss any of the spectacle. The executioner's assistants rolled a stump into the centre of the scaffold and covered it with a napkin. There was something of a commotion, since it turned out someone had swiped the wicker basket for the severed head, but another one was quickly found. Four ragged street urchins had spread out a kerchief beneath the scaffold to catch blood on it. There was great demand for that kind of souvenir. You could earn good money from them. Geralt! Siri didn't raise her lowered head. We have to do something. He didn't answer. I wish to address the townspeople, Dandelion proudly declared. Make it short, Viscount. The poet stood on the edge of the scaffold and raised his hands. The crowd murmured and fell silent. Hey, people, called Dandelion. What cheer? How go you? Uh, muddling along, muttered someone, after a long silence, in a row towards the back. That's good, the poet nodded. I'm greatly content. Well now, we may begin. Master Executioner, the funereal one said with artificial emphasis. Do your duty. The executioner went closer, kneeled down before the condemned man in keeping with the ancient custom, and lowered his hooded head. Forgive me, good fellow, he requested gravely. Me? asked Dandelion in astonishment. Forgive you? Uh-huh. Not a chance. I? I'll never forgive you. Why should I? Have you heard him, the prankster? He's about to cut my head off, and I'm supposed to forgive him. Are you mocking me or what, at a time like this? How can you, sir? asked the executioner, saddened. For there's a law, uh, and a custom. The condemned man must forgive the executioner in advance. Good sir, expunge my guilt, absolve my sin. No. No? No! I won't be at him, the executioner declared gloomily, getting up from his knees. He must forgive me, otherwise there's nothing doing. Lord Viscount, the funereal clerk caught Dandelion by the elbow. Don't make things difficult. People have gathered. They're waiting. Forgive him. He's asking politely, isn't he? I won't forgive him, and that's that. Master Executioner, the funereal man approached the executioner. Chop off his head without being forgiven. Eh? I'll see you right. Without a word, 
the executioner held out a hand as large as a frying pan. The funereal man sighed, reached into a pouch, and tipped some coins out into his hand. The executioner looked at them for a while, then clenched his fist. The eyes in the slits of his hood flashed malevolently. Very well, he said, putting the money away and turning towards the poet. Kneel down then, Mr. Stubborn. Put your head on the block, Mr. Spiteful. I can also be spiteful if I want to. I'll take two blows to behead you. Three, if I'm lucky. I, I absolve you, howled Dandelion. I, I forgive you. Thank you. Since he's forgiven you, said the funereal clerk gloomily, give me back my money. The executioner turned around and raised the axe. Step aside, noble sir, he said forebodingly in a dull voice. Don't get in the way of the tool, for where heads are being chopped off, if you get too close, you might lose an ear. The clerk stepped back suddenly and almost fell off the scaffold. Like this? Dandelion kneeled down and stretched his neck on the block. Master? Uh, hey, master? What? You were joking, weren't you? You behead me with one blow, with one swing? Well? The executioner's eyes flashed. Let it be a surprise, he snapped portentously. The crowd suddenly swayed, yielding before a rider bursting into the square on a foaming horse. Stop! yelled the rider, waving a large roll of parchment hung with red seals. Stop the execution! By ducal order! Out of my way! Stop the execution! I bear a pardon for the condemned man! No again! The executioner snarled, lowering the already raised axe. Another reprieve! It started to get boring. Mercy! Mercy! bellowed the crowd. The matrons in the front row began to lament even louder. A lot of people, mainly youngsters, whistled and moaned in disapproval. Quiet and down, good gentlemen and burghers, yelled the funereal man, unrolling the parchment. This is the will of Her Grace Anna Henrietta. In her boundless goodness, in celebration of the peace treaty which, as rumour has it, was signed in the city of Sintra, Her Grace pardons Viscount Julian Alfred Pankratz de Lettenhove, alias Dandelion, and his misdeeds, and waves his execution. Darling little weasel, said Dandelion, smiling broadly, ordering at the same time that the above-mentioned Viscount Julian Pankratz, etc., without delay, doth leave the capital and borders of the Duchy of Toussaint, and never return, since he offends Her Grace, and Her Grace can no longer countenance him. You are free to go, Viscount. And my property? yelled Dandelion. Eh? You can keep my chattels, copses, forests and castles, but give me back, sod the lot of you, my loot, my horse Pegasus, a hundred and forty tailors and eighty hailers, my raccoon-lined cloak, my ring. Shut up! shouted Geralt, jostling the fulminating and reluctantly parting crowd with his horse. Shut up and get down and come here, you blockhead! Siri, clear the way. Dandelion, do you hear me? Geralt? Is that you? Don't ask, just get down. Over here, leap onto my horse. They forced their way through the throng and galloped down the narrow street. Siri first, and Geralt and Dandelion on roach behind her. Why the hurry? said the bard behind the witch's back. No one's following us. For now, your duchess likes to change her mind and suddenly cancel what she's already decided. Come clean. Did you know about the pardon? No, no, I didn't, murmured Dandelion. But I confess, I was counting on it. Little Weasel is a darling and has a very kind heart. Enough of that bloody little weasel, damn it. You've only just wriggled out of less majesty. Do you want to fall back into recidivism? The troubadour fell silent. Siri reined back Kelpie and waited for them. When they caught up, she looked at Dandelion and wiped away a tear. Oh, you, she said. You... Pankrats. Let's go, urged the witcher. Let's leave this town and the borders of this enchanting duchy while we still can. A ducal messenger caught up with them almost at the very border of Toussaint, from where one could already see Gorgon Mountain. 
He was pulling behind him a saddled Pegasus and was carrying Dandelion's loot, cloak, and ring. He ignored the question about the 140 talars and 80 halos. He listened, stony-faced, to the bard's request to give the Duchess a kiss. They rode up the Sans Retour, which was now a tiny, fast-flowing stream. They bypassed Belhaven and camped in the Newey Valley, in a place the Witcher and the Bard remembered. Dandelion held out for a very long time. He didn't ask any questions, but he finally had to be told everything and be accompanied in his silence, in the dreadful, pregnant silence that fell after the telling and festered like a sore. At noon the next day, they were at the slopes outside Riedbrunner. Peace and order reigned all around. The people were sanguine and helpful. It felt safe. Gibbets, heavy with hanging corpses, stood everywhere. They steered clear of the town, heading towards Dolangra. Dandelion. Geralt had only just noticed what he should have noticed much earlier. Your priceless tube. Your centuries of poetry. The messenger didn't have them. They were left in Tucson. They were. The bard nodded indifferently. In little weasel's wardrobe, under a pile of dresses, knickers and corsets, and may lie there forever. Would you like to explain? What's there to explain? I had enough time in Tucson to read closely what I'd written. And? I'm going to write it again, anew. I understand. Geralt nodded. In short, you turned out to be as poor a writer as you were a favourite. Or, to put it more bluntly, you'll make a fucking mess of whatever you touch. Well, but even if you have the chance to improve and rewrite your half a century, you haven't got a fucking prayer with Duchess Anarietta. Ugh, the lover driven away in disgrace. Yes, yes, no point making faces. You weren't meant to be ducal consort in Tucson, Dandelion. We shall see about that. Don't count on me. I don't mean to be there to see it. And no one's asking you to. I tell you, though, little Weasel has a good and understanding little heart. In truth, she got somewhat carried away when she caught me with young Nike, the Baron's daughter. But now she's sure to have cooled off, understood that a man isn't created for monogamy. She's forgiven me and is no doubt waiting. You're hopelessly stupid, stated Geralt. And Siri confirmed she thought the same with an energetic nod of her head. I'm not going to discuss it with you, Dandelion sulked, particularly since it's an intimate matter. I tell you one more time, Little Weasel will forgive me. I'll write a suitable ballad or sonnet, send it to her, and she'll have mercy, Dandelion. Oh, there's really no point talking to you. Let's ride on. Gallop, Pegasus. Gallop, you white-legged flyer. They rode on. It was May. Because of you, the witcher said reproachfully. Because of you, oh my banished lover, I also had to flee from Tucson like some outlaw or exile. I didn't even manage to meet up with Fringilla Vigo. You wouldn't have seen her. She left soon after you set off in January. She simply vanished. I wasn't thinking about her. Geralt cleared his throat, seeing Ciri prick up her ears in interest. I wanted to meet Reynard and introduce him to Ciri. Dandelion fixed his gaze on Pegasus's mane. Reynard de Boisfren, he mumbled, fell in a skirmish with marauders on the Cervantes Pass sometime at the end of February, in the vicinity of the Vedette Watchtower. Anarietta honoured him with a posthumous medal. Shut up, Dandelion. Dandelion shut up, admirably obedient. May marched on and matured. The vivid yellow of dandelions disappeared from the meadows, replaced by the downy, grubby, fleeting white of their parachutes. It was green and very warm. The air, if it wasn't freshened by brief storms, was thick, hot, and as sticky as mead. They crossed the Yaruga on the 26th of May, over a very new, very white bridge smelling of resin. The remains of the old bridge, black, scorched, charred timbers, could be seen in the water and on the bank. Siri became anxious. Geralt knew. He knew her intentions, knew about her plans, about the agreement with Yennefer. He was ready. But in spite of that, 
the thought of parting stung him painfully, as though a nasty little scorpion had been sleeping in his chest, within him, behind his ribcage, and had now suddenly come awake. A spreading oak tree stood, as it had for at least a hundred years, actually, at the crossroads outside the village of Koprozhvanitsa, beyond the ruins of the burnt-down inn. Now, in the spring, it was laden with tiny buds of blossom. People from the whole region, even the remote Spala, were accustomed to using the huge and quite low boughs of the oak to hang up slats and boards bearing all sorts of information. For that reason, the oak tree that served for communication between people was called the Tree of Tidings of Good and Evil. Siri, start on that side, ordered Geralt, dismounting. Dandelion, have a look on this side. The planks on the boughs swayed in the wind, clattering against each other. Searches for missing and separated families usually dominated after a war. There were plenty of declarations of the following kind. Come back, I forgive you. Plenty of offers of erotic massage and similar services in the neighbouring towns and villages, and plenty of announcements and advertisements. There were love letters. There were denunciations signed by well-meaning people, and poison pen letters. There were also boards expressing the philosophical views of their authors, the vast majority of them moronically nonsensical or repulsively obscene. Ha! called Dandelion. A witcher is urgently sought in Rustburg Castle. They write that good pay, luxurious accommodation, and extraordinarily tasty board are guaranteed. Will you avail yourself of it, Geralt? Absolutely not. Siri found the information they were looking for and then announced to the witcher what he had been expecting for a long time. I'm going to Wengerberg, Geralt, she repeated. Don't make faces like that. You know I have to, don't you? Yennefer summoned me. She's waiting for me there. I know. You're going to Rivia, to that rendezvous you're still keeping a secret. A surprise, he interrupted. It's a surprise, not a secret. Very well, a surprise. I, meanwhile, will sort out what I need to in Wengerberg, pick up Yennefer, and we'll both be in Rivia in six days. Don't make faces, please. And let's not part like it was forever. It's just six days. Goodbye. Goodbye, Siri. Rivia, in six days? She repeated once more, raining Kelpie around. She galloped away at once. She was out of sight very quickly, and Geralt felt as though a cold, awful, clawed hand was squeezing his stomach. Six days, Dandelion repeated pensively. From here to Wengerberg and back to Rivia. Altogether it'll be close to 250 miles. It's impossible, Geralt. Indeed, on that devilish mare on which the girl can travel at the speed of a courier three times quicker than us, theoretically, very theoretically, she could cover such a distance in six days, but even the devilish mare has to rest. And that mysterious matter that Siri has to take care of will also take some time. And thus, it's impossible. Nothing is impossible. The witcher pursed his lips. For Siri. Can it be? She's not the girl you knew. Geralt interrupted him harshly. Not any longer. Dandelion was silent for a long time. I have a strange feeling. Be quiet. Don't say anything, I beg you. May was over. The new moon was coming. The old moon was waning. It was very thin. They rode towards the mountains, barely visible on the horizon. It was a typical landscape after a war. All of a sudden, graves and burial mounds had sprung up among the fields. Skulls and skeletons lay white amidst the lush spring grass. Corpses hung on roadside trees, and wolves sat beside the roads, waiting for the miserable travellers to weaken. Grass no longer grew on the black patches of land where fires had passed through. The villages and settlements of which only charred chimneys remained resounded with the banging of hammers and the rasping of saws. Near the ruins, Peasant women dug holes in the scorched earth with hoes. Some of them, stumbling, were pulling harrows and ploughs and the webbing harnesses bit into their gaunt shoulders. Children hunted for grubs and worms in the newly ploughed furrows. 
I have a vague feeling that something's not as it should be here, said Dandelion. Something's missing. Do you have that impression, Geralt? Eh? Something's not normal here. Nothing's normal here, Dandelion. Nothing. During the warm, black and windless night, lit up by distant flashes of lightning and restless growls of thunder, Geralt and Dandelion saw from their camp the horizon in the west blooming with the red glow of fire. It wasn't far, and the wind that blew up brought the smell of smoke. The wind also brought snatches of sound. They heard, like it or not, the howling of people being murdered, the wailing of women and the brash and triumphant yelling of bandits. Dandelion said nothing, glancing fearfully at the Witcher every now and then. But the Witcher didn't even twitch, didn't even turn his head around, and his face seemed to be cast in bronze. They continued on their journey the next morning. They didn't even look at the thin trail of smoke rising above some trees. And later, they chanced upon a column of settlers. They were walking in a long line, slowly, carrying small bundles. They walked in complete silence. Men, boys, women and children. They walked without grumbling, without tears, without a word of complaint. Without screams, without any desperate wailing. But there were screams and despair in their eyes in the empty eyes of people who had been damaged, robbed, beaten, driven away. Who are they? Dandelion ignored the hostility visible in the eyes of the officer supervising the march. Who are you driving like this? The Nilfgaardians, snapped a sub-lieutenant from the height of his saddle. He was a ruddy-faced stripling of no more than eighteen summers. Nilfgaardian settlers, they appeared in our lands like cockroaches, and we'll sweep them away like cockroaches. So it was decided in Sintra, and so it was written in the peace treaty. He leaned over and spat, and if it was up to me, he continued looking defiantly at Dandelion and the Witcher. I wouldn't let them get out of here alive, the rats. And if it depended on me, said a non-commissioned officer with a grey moustache, in a slow, drawling voice, looking at his commander with a gaze strangely devoid of respect, I'd leave them in peace on their farms. I wouldn't drive good farmers from the land. I'll be glad that agriculture was prospering, that there's something to eat. You're as thick as pig shit, Sergeant, snapped the sub-lieutenant. It's Nilfgaard. It's not our language, not our culture, not our blood. We'd be glad of the agriculture and nursing a viper in our bosom. Traitors, ready to stab us in the back. Perhaps you think there'll be harmony with the black cloaks forever. No, they can go back where they came from. Hey, soldiers, that one has a cart. Get it off him, at the double. The order was carried out extremely zealously, with the use not only of heels and fists, but truncheons too. Dandelion gave a slight cough. What? Something not to your liking, perhaps? The youthful sub-lieutenant glared at him. Perhaps you're a Nilfgaard lover. Heaven forbid. Dandelion swallowed. Many of the empty-eyed women and girls, walking like automatons, had torn garments, swollen and bruised faces, and thighs and calves marked by trickles of dried blood. Many of them had to be supported as they walked. Dandelion looked at Geralt's face and began to be afraid. Time we were going, he mumbled. Uh, farewell, gentlemen. The sub-lieutenant didn't even turn his head around, preoccupied with checking that none of the settlers were carrying luggage larger than the peace of Sintra had determined. The column of settlers walked on, they heard the high-pitched, desperate screams of a woman in great pain. Geralt, no, groaned Dandelion. Don't do anything. I beg you, don't get involved. The Witcher turned his face towards him, and Dandelion didn't recognize it. Get involved, he repeated. Intervene. Rescue somebody. Risk my neck for some noble principles or ideas. Oh no, Dandelion, not any longer. One night, a restless night lit up by distant flashes of lightning, a dream woke the Witcher again. He wasn't certain this time either, 
if he hadn't gone straight from one nightmare to another. Once again, a pulsating brightness that frightened the horses rose above the remains of the campfire. Once again, there was a great castle, black colonnades, and a table with women sitting around it in the brightness. Two of the women weren't sitting but standing, one in black and white and the other in black and grey. It was Yennefer and Ciri. The witcher groaned in his sleep. Yennefer was right to quite categorically advise Ciri against wearing male clothing. Dressed like a boy, Ciri would have felt foolish here, now, in the hall among these elegant women sparkling with jewellery. She was pleased she'd agreed to dress in a combination of black and grey. It flattered her when she felt approving looks on her puffed, paned sleeves and high waist, on the velvet ribbon bearing the small, rose-shaped diamond brooch. Please, come closer. Siri shuddered a little, not just at the sound of that voice. Yennefer, it turned out, had been right in one more thing. She had advised against a plunging neckline. Siri, however, had insisted, and now had the impression the draught was literally raging over her chest, and her whole front, almost to her navel, was covered in goose flesh. Come closer, repeated the dark-haired, dark-eyed woman, whom Siri knew and remembered from the Isle of Thaneth. And although Yennefer had told her whom she would meet in Monte Calvo, had described them all and taught her all of their names, Siri at once began to entitle her Madam Owl in her thoughts. Welcome to the Monte Calvo Lodge, said Madam Owl, Miss Siri. Siri bowed as Yennefer had instructed, politely but more in the male fashion, without a ladylike curtsy, without a modest and submissive lowering of her eyes. She responded with a smile to Triss Merigold's sincere and pleasant smile, and with a somewhat lower nod of the head to Margarita Lozantila's friendly look. She endured the remaining eight pairs of eyes, although they pierced like gimlets, stabbed like spear blades. Please be seated, beckoned Madame Owl with a truly regal gesture. No, not you, Yennefer, just her. You, Yennefer, are not an invited guest, but a felon. Summoned to be judged and punished, you will stand until the lodge decides on your fate. Protocol was over for Siri in a flash. In that case, I shall also stand, she said, not at all quietly. I'm no guest either. I was also summoned to be informed about my fate. That's the first thing. And the second is that Yennefer's fate is my fate. What applies to her applies to me. We cannot be rent asunder with all due respect. Margarita Lozantila smiled, looking her in the eyes. The modest, elegant woman with a slightly aquiline nose, who could only be the Nilfgaardian, Azirava Anahid, nodded and tapped her fingers lightly on the table. Philippa, said a woman with her neck wrapped in a silver fox fur boa, we don't have time to be so uncompromising, it seems to me. At least not today, not right now. This is the lodge's round table. We sit at it as equals even if we are to be judged. I think we can all agree about what we should. She didn't finish, but swept her eyes over the remaining sorceresses. They, meanwhile, expressed their agreement by nodding. Margarita, Azira, Triss, Sabrina Glevisig, Kira Metz, and the two beautiful elf women. Only the other elf guardian, the raven-haired Fringilla Vigo, sat motionless, very pale, not resting her eyes from Yennefer. Let it be so. Philippa Eilhart waved a ringed hand. Sit down, both of you, despite my opposition. But the lodge's unity comes before everything. The lodge's interests before everything and above everything. The lodge is everything, the rest nothing. I hope you understand, Siri. Very well. Siri had no intention of lowering her gaze, particularly since I am that nothing. Francesca Finderbeer, the stunning elf woman gave a peal of resonant laughter. Congratulations, Yennefer, she said in her hypnotically melodic voice. I recognize an outstanding hallmark, the purity of the gold. I recognize the school. It isn't difficult to recognize. Yennefer swept a passionate look around her. For it's the school of Tessia de Vries. Tessia de Vries is dead, Madame Owl said calmly. She's not present at this table. 
Tissaire de Vries died, and the matter has been grieved and mourned. It was simultaneously a landmark and a turning point. For a new time has dawned, a new era has come, and great changes are coming. And fate has assigned you an important role in these transformations, Siri. You, who once were Cyrilla of Sintra, you probably already know what role. I know, she snapped, not reacting to Yennefer's restraining hiss. Velgefort's explained it to me, while preparing to stick a glass syringe between my legs. If that's supposed to be my destiny, then I, respectfully, decline. Philippa's dark eyes flashed with a cold anger, but it was Sherla de Tankerville who spoke. You still have much to learn, child, she said, wrapping the silver fox fur boa around her neck. You will have to unlearn many things I see and hear by your own efforts or with someone's help. You have lately come into possession, it can be gathered, of much evil knowledge. You have also certainly endured evil, experienced evil. Now, in your childish rage, you refuse to notice the good. You deny the good and good intentions. You bristle like a hedgehog, unable to recognize precisely those who are concerned with your good. You snort and bear your claws like a wild kitten without leaving us a choice. You need to be grabbed by the scruff of the neck. And we shall do that, child, without a second thought. For we are older than you. We are wiser. We know everything about what has been and what is. And we know much about what will be. We shall take you by the scruff of the neck, Kitty. So you may one day soon sit here among us at this table as an experienced and wise she-cat, as one of us. No! Not a word! Don't you dare open your mouth when Sherla de Tankerville is speaking! The voice of the Kaviran sorceress, sharp and piercing like a knife scraping against iron, suddenly hung in mid-air over the table. Not only Siri cowered. The other witches of the lodge shuddered slightly and drew their heads into their shoulders. Well, perhaps with the exception of Philippa, Francesca and Azira, and Yennefer. You were right, continued Sherla wrapping the boa around her neck, in thinking that you are summoned to Monte Calvo to be informed about your fate. You weren't right to think you are nothing. For you are everything. You are the future of the world. At this moment, naturally, you don't know that, can't know that. At this moment, you're a puffed-up and spitting kitten, a traumatized child, who sees in everybody Emir Vi Emris or Vilgefortz holding his inseminator. And there's no point now, at this moment, explaining to you that you are mistaken, that it concerns your good and the good of the world. The time will come for such explanations, one day. Now, hot under the collar, you don't want to listen to the voice of reason. Now, for every argument, you will have a riposte in the form of childish stubbornness and noisy indignation. Now, you will simply be grabbed by the scruff of the neck. I have finished. Inform the girl of her fate, Philippa. Siri sat stiff, stroking the heads of the sphinxes carved into the armrests of the chair. You will go to Covia with Sherla and I. Madam Owl broke the heavy and dead silence. To Poinvanis, the royal summer capital, because you are no longer Cyrilla of Sintra, you will be presented at the audience as a novice in magic, our pupil. At the audience, you will meet a very wise king, Esterad Tyson, of genuine royal blood. You will meet his wife, Queen Zuleika, a person of extraordinary nobility and goodness. You will also meet the royal couple's son, Prince Tancred. Siri, beginning to understand, opened her eyes widely. Madam Owl noticed it. Yes, she confirmed. You must make an impression on Prince Tancred above all for you will become his lover and bear his child. Were you still Cyrilla of Sintra? Philippa took the conversation up after a long pause. Were you still the daughter of Pavetta and the granddaughter of Calanthe? We would make you Tancred's wedded wife, princess, and later queen of Covia and Povis. Sadly, and I say this with real sorrow, fate has deprived you of everything, including the future. You will only be a lover, a favourite, by name and formally, interjected Shayla, 
for in practice we shall try hard for you to gain the status of princess by Tancred's side, and afterwards even of queen. Your help will be necessary, naturally. Tancred must desire you to be at his side, day and night. We'll teach you how to fuel such a desire, but whether the lesson is learned will depend on you. Those titles are essentially trifles, said Madame Owl. It's important that Tancred impregnates you as quickly as possible. Well, that's obvious, Siri muttered. The Lodge will provide for the future and position of your child. Philippa didn't take her eyes off Siri. You deserve to know we're thinking here about matters of great note. You will be participating in it in any case, since right after the birth of the child, you will begin to take part in our gatherings. You will learn. Since you are, although it may be incomprehensible to you today, one of us. You called me a monster on the Isle of Thaneth, Madame Owl. Siri overcame the constriction in her throat. And today, you tell me I'm one of you. There's no contradiction in that, resounded the voice of Enid and Gleana, the daisy of the valleys, as melodic as the burbling of a stream. We, Melunet, are all monsters, each in our own way. Isn't that right, Madame Owl? Philippa shrugged. We shall disguise that hideous scar on your face with an illusion. Shayla spoke again, tugging at her boa, apparently indifferently. You will be beautiful and mysterious, and Tancred Tyson, I assure you, will lose his head for you. We'll have to invent some personal details for you. Cyrilla is a nice name and is by no means so rare that you would have to give it up to remain incognito. But we have to give you a surname. I wouldn't protest if you chose mine. Or mine, said Madame Owl, smiling with the corners of her mouth. Cyrilla Eilhart also sounds nice. That name, the silver bells of the Daisy of the Valleys, jingled in the hall again, sounds nice in every combination, and each of us sitting here would like to have a daughter like you, Zirael, or Swallow with the eyes of a falcon, you who bear the blood and the bones of Lara Doran's blood and bones. Each of us would give up everything, even the lodge, even the fate of the kingdoms and the whole world, to have a daughter like you. But it's impossible. We know that it's impossible, which is why we envy Yennefer. Thank you, Madame Philippa, Siri said a moment later, clenching her hands on the Sphinx's heads. I'm also honoured at the offer of bearing the name Tankerville. However, because a surname is the only thing in this whole matter that depends on me and my choice, the only thing that isn't being imposed on me, I have to gratefully decline and choose for myself. I want to be called Siri of Wengerberg daughter of Yennefer. Ha! A black-haired sorceress, whom Ciri guessed was Sabrina Glevisig of Kaidwin, flashed her teeth. Tancred Tyson will prove to be an ass if he doesn't wed her morganatically. If instead of her, he lets some drippy princess be foisted upon him. He'll turn out to be an ass and a blind man, unable to recognize a diamond among pieces of glass. Congratulations, Yenna. I envy you, and you know how sincerely I can envy. Yennefer thanked her with a nod of her head, without even the ghost of a smile. And thus, said Philippa, everything is settled. No, said Siri. Francesca Finderbear snorted softly. Sheila de Tankerville raised her head and her facial features hardened unpleasantly. I have to think the matter over, Siri declared. Ponder it. Sort everything out in my mind, calmly. Once I've done that, I'll return here to Monte Calvo. I'll appear before you, ladies. I'll tell you what I've decided. Shayla moved her lips as though she'd found something in her mouth she ought to spit out at once, but she didn't speak. I have arranged to meet the witch Geralt in the city of Rivia. Siri lifted her head up. I promised him I'd meet him there, that I'd ride there with Yennefer. I'll keep that promise, with your permission or without it. Madame Rita, who is here, knows that I always find a crack in the wall if I'm going to Geralt. Margarita Lozantila nodded with a smile. I must talk to Geralt, say goodbye to him, and admit he's right. Because you ought to know one thing, ladies. 
when we were riding away from Stigger Castle, leaving corpses in our wake. I asked Geralt if it was the end, if we were victorious, if evil had been overcome and if good had triumphed. And he just smiled, somehow strangely and sadly. I thought it was from tiredness, because we had buried all of his friends at the foot of Stigger. But now I know what that smile meant. It was a smile of pity, at the naivety of a child who thought that the slit throats of Vilgefortz and Bonhart meant the triumph of good over evil. I really must tell him I've grown wiser, that I've understood. I really must tell him. I must also try to convince him that what you want to do with me fundamentally differs from what Vilgefortz wanted to do to me with a glass syringe. I have to explain to him that there is a difference between Monte Calvo Castle and Stigger Castle, even though Vilgefortz was concerned with the good of the world, and you are also concerned with the good of the world. I know it won't be easy to convince an old wolf like Geralt. Geralt will say I'm a chit, that it's easy to beguile me with appearances of nobility, that all this bloody destiny and good of the world are stupid platitudes. But I must try. It's important that he understands and accepts it. It's very important. For you two ladies. You haven't understood anything, said Sherla to Tankerville harshly. You're still a child, passing from the stage of callow howling and foot-stamping to callow arrogance. The only thing that raises hope is your sharpness of mind. You'll learn quickly. Soon, believe me, you'll laugh, recalling the nonsense you talked here. As regards your trip to Rivia, I pray you, let the Lodge express its opinion. I'm expressing my firm opposition, for fundamental reasons, to prove to you that I, Sherla de Tankerville, never waste words and I'm capable of making you bend your proud neck. You need to be taught discipline for your own good. Let's settle this matter then. Philippa Eilhart placed her palms on the table. Ladies, please express your opinions. Are we to permit the haughty maid Siri to ride to Rivia for a meeting with some witcher for whom there soon won't be a place in her life? Are we to let sentimentalism grow in her? Sentimentality that she will soon have to utterly get rid of. Sheila is opposed. And the rest of you ladies? I'm against, declared Sabrina Gleversig. Also for fundamental reasons. I like the girl. I like what she says. Her insolence and hot-tempered impudence. I prefer it to spineless acquiescence. I wouldn't have anything against her request, particularly since she would certainly return. People such as she don't break their word. But the little madam has threatened us. She must know we disregard such threats. I'm opposed, said Kira Metz, for practical reasons. I like the girl too, and Geralt carried me in his arms on Thanith. There isn't a scrap of sentimentality in me, but it was awfully pleasant. It would be a way of repaying him, but no. For you are mistaken, Sabrina. The girl is a witcher and is trying to outwit us. In short, make a run for it. Does anyone hear? Yennefer drawled malevolently. Dare to doubt the words of my daughter. You, Yennefer, be quiet, hissed Philippa. Don't speak or I'll lose my patience. There are three votes against. Let's hear the rest. I vote to allow her to go, said Triss Marigold. I know her and vouch for her. I'd also like to accompany her on her journey, if she agrees. Help her in her deliberations and reflections, if she agrees. And in her conversation with Geralt, if she agrees. I'm also in favour, smiled Margarita Lozantila. What I will say will astonish you ladies, but I'm doing it for Tessire de Vries. Were Tessire here, she would be outraged at the suggestion that compulsion and the restriction of personal freedom are necessary to maintain the unity of the Lodge. I vote in favour, said Francesca Finderbear, straightening the lace on her neckline. There are many reasons but I don't have to reveal them, nor do I intend to. I vote in favour, said Ida Emane Epsifni, just as laconically, because my heart compels me thus. And I am opposed, declared Azirva Anahid dryly. I am not driven by any sympathy, antipathy or fundamental issues. I fear for Siri's life. She is safe in the lodge's care, but an easy target on the roads leading to Rivia. And I worry that there are people who, 
even having taken away her name and identity, will still think that's not enough. It remains for us to learn the position of Madame Fringilla Vigo, said Sabrina Glevisig, quite scathingly. Although it should be obvious, for I take the liberty of reminding you all of Rhys Run Castle. Although I am grateful for the reminder, Fringilla Vigo lifted her head proudly, I vote for Siri, to show the respect and affection I have for the girl. And more than anything, I'm doing it for Geralt of Rivia, the witcher without whom that girl wouldn't be here today, who, in order to rescue Siri, went to the end of the world, fighting everything that stood in his way, even himself. It would be wickedness to deny him a meeting with her. Yet there was too little wickedness, Sabrina said cynically, and too much naive sentimentality, the same sentimentality we mean to eradicate from this maiden. Why, there was even talk about hearts, and the result is that the scales are in the balance, in deadlock. We haven't decided anything. We'll have to vote again, I suggest, by secret ballot. What for? They all looked at the person who had spoken. Yennefer. I am still a member of this lodge, said Yennefer. No one has taken my membership away from me. No one has taken my place. I have the formal right to vote. I think it's clear who I'm voting for. The votes in favour prevail, so the matter is settled. Your insolence, said Sabrina, locking her fingers, armed with onyx rings. Borders on bad taste, Yennefer. In your place, madam, I would sit in humble silence, added Shayla grimly bearing in mind the voting of which you soon will be the subject. I backed Siri, said Francesca, but I must take you to task, Yennefer. You left the lodge, fleeing from it and refusing to cooperate. You don't have any rights. You do, though, have obligations, debts to pay, a sentence to hear. Were it not for that, you wouldn't have been allowed to cross Monte Calvo's threshold. Yennefer restrained Siri, who was itching to stand up and shout. Without resisting and in silence, Siri sank into the chair with the armrests carved into sphinxes, watching Madame Owl, Philippa Eilhart, getting up from her chair and suddenly towering over the table. Yennefer doesn't have the right to vote, that is clear, she announced in a ringing tone. But I do. I've listened to the votes of all the women present here, so I can finally vote myself. I believe. What do you mean by that, Philippa? Sabrina frowned. Philippa Eilhart looked across the table. She met Ciri's eyes and looked into them. The bottom of the pool is made of a many-coloured mosaic, the tiles shimmering and seeming to move. The entire surface trembles, glimmering with light and shade. Carp and Orf flash by under lily leaves as large as plates amidst green pondweed. The young girl's large dark eyes reflect in the water. Her long hair reaches down to the surface, floating on it. The girl, forgetting about the whole world, runs her little hands among the stems of water lilies and hangs over the edge of the pool surrounding the fountain. She would love to touch one of the small golden red fishes. The fish swim up to the girl's hands. They circle around her curiously but they don't let themselves be seized. They're as elusive as apparitions, like the water itself. The dark-eyed girl's fingers close on nothingness. Philippa! It's her most favourite voice. In spite of that, the little girl doesn't react right away. She continues to look at the water, at the little fish, at the water lilies and at her own reflection. Philippa! Philippa! Shayla de Tankerville's harsh voice shook her out of her reverie. We are waiting. A cold spring wind blew in through the open window. Philippa Eilhart shuddered. Death, she thought. Death passed beside me. This lodge, she finally said confidently, loudly and emphatically, will decide the fates of the world because this lodge is like the world, is its mirror. Good sense, which doesn't always mean cold wickedness and calculation, is balancing out sentimentality, which is not always naive. Responsibility, iron discipline, even if imposed by force, and aversion to violence, gentleness and trust, 
the matter-of-fact coolness of omnipotence, and heart. I, casting my vote last, take one more thing into consideration, she continued into the silence that had descended on the colonnaded hall in Monte Calvo. One that, though it doesn't balance out anything, counterbalances everything. Following her gaze, all the women looked at the wall, at the mosaic constructed from tiny coloured tiles depicting the snake Aroboros grasping its tail in its teeth. That thing is destiny, she continued, fixing her dark eyes on Siri, which I, Philippa Eilhart, have only recently begun to believe in. Which I, Philippa Eilhart, have only recently begun to understand. Destiny isn't the judgments of providence, isn't scrolls written by the hand of a demiurge, isn't fatalism. Destiny is hope. Being full of hope, believing that what is meant to happen will happen, I cast my vote. I vote for Siri, the child of destiny, the child of hope. The silence in the colonnaded hall of Monte Calvo Castle, plunged in subtle chiaroscuro, lasted a long time. The cry of an osprey circling over the lake reached them from outside the window. Madame Yennefer, Siri whispered. Does that mean, let's go, daughter, answered Yennefer in a soft voice. Geralt's waiting for us and there's a long road ahead. Geralt awoke and leapt to his feet with a cry of a night bird in his ears. Then the sorceress and the witcher were married and held a grand wedding party. I too was there. I drank mead and wine, and then they lived happily ever after, but for a very short time. He died ordinarily of a heart attack. She died soon after him, but of what the tale does not say, they say of sorrow and longing. But who would lend credence to fairy tales? Florence Delanois, Fairy Tales and Stories Chapter 12 It was the sixth day after the June new moon when they arrived in Rivia. They rode out of the forests onto the hillsides, and then, beneath them, down below, suddenly and without warning, twinkled and glittered the surface of Loch Escalot, which filled the valley in the shape of the rune from which it took its name. The hillsides of Crea Gros, the protruding end of the Mahakam Massif, covered in fur and large, gazed at their own reflections in the lake's surface, as did the red tiles of the towers of the stout Rivia Castle, the winter seat of the kings of Lyria, standing on a headland extending into the lake and by a bay at the southern end of Loch Escalot lay the town of Rivia, with the bright thatch of the cottages around the castle and dark houses growing by the lakeshore like mushrooms. Well, we seem to have arrived, Dandelion stated, shielding his eyes with his hand. Now we've come full circle. We're in Rivia. Strange how strange are the twists of fate. I don't see blue and white pennants on any of the castle towers, and thus Queen Maeve is not residing at the castle. I don't suppose in any case that she still remembers our desertion. Believe me, Dandelion, Geralt interrupted, steering his horse down the hillside. I don't give a damn who remembers what. A colourful tent resembling a cake stood outside the city not far from the turnpike. A white shield with a red chevron hung on a pole in front of it. A knight in full armour and a white surcoat decorated with the same arms as the shield was standing under the raised flap of the tent. The knight was scrutinizing women in headscarves, tar and pitchmakers with kegs containing their wares, herdsmen, peddlers and beggars. His eyes lit up in hope at the sight of Geralt and Dandelion riding slowly along. The lady of your heart. Geralt dispelled the knight's hope in an icy voice. Whoever she is, is the most beautiful and most virtuous virgin from the Yaruga to the Boina. By my truth, the knight snapped back. You speak the truth, sir. A fair-haired girl in a densely studded leather jacket vomited in the middle of the street, bent in two, holding onto the stirrup of a flea-bitten grey mare. 
The girl's two male companions, identically attired, carrying swords on their backs and wearing bands on their foreheads, cursed the passers-by filthily in somewhat incoherent voices. Both were more than tipsy, unsteady on their feet, bumping into horses' sides and the bar of the hitching post situated outside the inn. Must we really go in there? asked Dandelion. There may be more nice lads like that inside. I'm meeting someone here. Have you forgotten? This is the rooster and mother hen mentioned in a notice on the oak tree. The fair-haired girl bent over again, puked spasmodically and extremely profusely. The mare snorted loudly and jerked, knocking the girl over and dragging her through the vomit. What are you gawking at, you fool? mumbled one of the youngsters. You grey-haired old bum. Get out, muttered Dandelion dismounting. Don't do anything foolish, please. Fear not, I won't. They tied their horses to the hitching post on the other side of the steps. The young men stopped paying attention to them and began insulting and spitting at a townswoman crossing the street with a child. Dandelion glanced at the witch's face. He didn't like what he saw. The first thing that stuck out after entering the inn was a sign. Wanted. Cook. The next was a large picture on a signboard made of planks of wood, portraying a bearded monster holding a battle axe dripping blood. The caption announced, The Dwarf, a wretched, treacherous runt. Dandelion was right to be worried. In practice, the only guests in the inn, apart from a few seriously drunk drunks and two skinny prostitutes with dark circles around their eyes, were more lads dressed up in leather sparkling with studs with swords on their backs. There were eight of them of both sexes, but they were making enough of a commotion for eighteen, shouting over each other and swearing. I recognize you and know who you are, gentlemen. The innkeeper surprised them as soon as he saw them, and I have news for you. You're to go to a tavern called Veersings in Elm. Oh, Dandelion cheered up. That's good. I wouldn't know about that. The innkeeper went back to drying a mug on his apron. If you just stay in my establishment, that's your choice. But I'll tell you that Elm's a dwarven district where non-humans reside. And what of it? Geralt squinted his eyes. Aye, I'm sure it doesn't bother you. The innkeeper shrugged. Why, the one who left the news was a dwarf. Since you associate with such as he, that's your affair. It's your affair whose company you find more agreeable. We aren't particularly fussy as regards company, announced Dandelion, nodding towards the youths in black jackets with bands around their pimply foreheads, yelling and wrestling at a table. But I swear we aren't fond of that kind. The innkeeper put down the dry mug and glared at them unpleasantly. You should be more understanding, he instructed with emphasis. Youngsters have to let off steam. There's a certain saying, youngsters have to let off steam. The war damaged them. Their fathers perished. And their mothers screwed around, finished Geralt, with a voice as icy as a mountain lake. I understand, and I'm full of understanding. At least I'm trying hard to be. Let's go, Dandelion. Be off with you, with respect, said the innkeeper, without respect. But don't be a complaining about what I warned you of. These days it's easy to get a sore head in the dwarven district, if anything were to happen. If what were to happen? How would I know? Is it any business of mine? Let's go, Geralt, urged Dandelion, seeing out of the corner of one eye that the war-damaged youngsters, those who were still reasonably conscious, were observing them with eyes shining with fish tech. Goodbye, Master Innkeeper. Who knows? Perhaps we'll visit your establishment one day, in a while, once those signs have gone from the entrance. And which one don't your gentlemen like? The innkeeper frowned and stood with legs aggressively apart. Eh? The one about the dwarf, perhaps? Uh, no, uh, the one about the cook. Three youngsters got up from the table, slightly unsteady on their feet, clearly intending to bar their way. A girl and two boys in black jackets, with swords on their backs. Geralt didn't slow his stride. He walked on, and his face and eyes were cold and totally indifferent. Almost at the last moment, the striplings parted, stepping back. Dandelion smelled the beer on their breath and sweat, and fear. You have to get used to it, said the witcher when they were outside. You have to adapt. It's hard sometimes. That's no argument. 
That's no argument, Dandelion. The air was hot, dense and sticky, like soup. Outside, in front of the inn, the two boys in black jackets were helping the fair-haired girl wash in a horse trough. The girl snorted incoherently, indicating that she was feeling better and announced that she needed a drink. And of course she'd go to the bazaar to overturn some stalls for a lark, but first she needed a drink. The girl's name was Nadia Esposito. That name became etched into the annals. It passed into history. But Geralt and Dandelion couldn't have known that then. Neither could the girl. The narrow streets of the city of Rivia bustled with life and what seemed to wholly occupy the residents and visitors was trade. It seemed as though everybody was trading in everything there and trying to exchange anything for something more. A cacophony of shouts resounded from all sides. Goods were being advertised. People were bargaining heatedly, insulting each other, thunderously accusing each other of cheating, thievery and swindles, as well as other peccadilloes absolutely unconnected to commerce. Before Geralt and Dandelion had reached Elm, they were presented with a great deal of attractive offers. They were offered, among other things, an astrolabe, a brass trumpet, a set of cutlery decorated with the coat of arms of the Frangipani family, stocks in a copper mine, a large jar of leeches, a tattered book entitled An Alleged Miracle or the Medusa's Head, a pair of ferrets, an elixir to increase potency, and, as part of a package deal, a none-too-young, none-too-slim, and none-too-fresh woman. A black-bearded dwarf tried to convince them extremely aggressively to buy a shoddy little mirror in a pinchbeck frame, attempting to prove it was the magical looking-glass of Cambuscan, when soon after somebody threw a stone and knocked the wear out of his hand. Lousy kobold, bellowed a barefoot and dirty street urchin. Unhuman, bearded old goat! And may your guts rot, you human shithead! roared the dwarf. May they rot and leak out of your ass! People looked on in gloomy silence. The district of Elm lay right beside the lake, in a bay among alders, weeping willows, and, naturally, elms. It was much more quiet and peaceful. No one bought anything or wanted to sell anything here. A light breeze was blowing from the lake, especially pleasant after getting out of the stuffy, fly-blown stink of the city. They didn't have to search long to find Versing's tavern. The first passerby they encountered pointed it out to them without hesitation. Two bearded dwarves, sipping beer from mugs hugged against their bellies, were sitting beneath a roof covered in bright green moss and swallow's nests on the steps of a porch enveloped in climbing peas and wild roses. Geralt and Dandelion! said one of the dwarves and belched daintily. What took you so long, you rogues? Geralt dismounted. Greetings, Yarp and Zegrin. Glad to see you, Zoltan Chive. They were the only guests of the tavern, which smelled strongly of roast meat, garlic, herbs and something else, something elusive but very pleasant. They sat at a heavy table with a view of the lake, which looked mysterious charming and romantic through tinted panes in lead frames. Where's Siri? Yap and Zegrin asked bluntly. She can't be... No, Geralt quickly interrupted. She's coming here. She'll be here any moment. Well, beardies, tell us how things are going. Didn't I say? Yapin said with a sneer. Didn't I say, Zoltan? Comes back from the end of the world, where if rumours can be believed he waded in blood, killed dragons, and overthrew empires, and he asks us how things are going. That's the witcher all over. What smells so appetising here? Dandelion interjected. Dinner, said Yapin Zigrin. Meat. Dandelion, ask me where we got the meat. I won't, because I know that joke. Don't be a swine. Where did you get the meat? Crawled here itself. <laughs> and now, more seriously, Yarpin wiped away tears, although the joke, to tell the truth, was pretty hoary. The situation with Vittles is quite critical, as usual, after a war. You won't find meat, not even poultry. It's also hard to get fish. Things are bad with flour and spuds, peas and beans. Farms have been burned down, stores plundered, fish ponds emptied, and fields lie fallow. There's no turnover, added Zoltan. There's no transport. Only usury and batter are functioning. 
Did you see the bazaar? Profiteers are making fortunes beside beggars selling and exchanging the remains of their possessions. If the crops fail on top of that, people will begin to die of hunger in the winter. Is it really that bad? Riding from the south, you must have passed villages and settlements. Think back to how often you heard dogs barking. Bloody hell! Dandelion slapped himself on the forehead. I knew it! I told you, Geralt, that it wasn't normal, that something was missing. Ha! Now I get it. We didn't hear any dogs. There weren't any around. He suddenly broke off and glanced towards the kitchen and the smell of garlic and herbs with terror in his eyes. Fear not, snorted Yarpin. Our meat doesn't come from anything that barks, meows or calls out mercy. Our meat is totally different. It's fit for kings. Let us in on it, dwarf. When we received your letter and it was clear we'd meet in Rivia, Zoltan and I pondered over what to serve you. We racked our brains till all that racking made us want to piss and then we went down to a little lakeside alder. We looked and there were positively tons of snares. So we took a sack and caught a load of the dear mollusks, as many as we could stuff in it. A lot of them escaped, Sultan Chive nodded. We were a tad drunk and the devilish fast. Again, both dwarves wept with laughter at another old chestnut. This thing, Yarpin pointed at the innkeeper bustling around by the stove, knows how to cook snails, and that, you ought to know, demands considerable arcane knowledge. He nonetheless is a born chef de cuisine. Before he became a widower, he and his wife ran the roadhouse in Maribor, with such a table that the king himself entertained guests there. We'll soon be tucking in, I tell you. And before that, nodded Zoltan, we'll have a starter of freshly smoked whitefish, caught on a gaff in the bottomless depths of this lake, and we'll wash it down with hooch from the depths of the cellar. Man the story, gentlemen, reminded Yarpin, pouring. The story... The whitefish was still hot, oily, and smelled of smoke from alder chips. The vodka was so cold it stung the teeth. Dandelion spoke first, elaborately, fluently, colourfully, and volubly, embellishing his tale with ornaments so beautiful and fanciful they almost obscured the fibs and confabulations. Then the witcher spoke. He spoke the same truth, and spoke so dryly, boringly and flatly, that Dandelion couldn't bear it and kept butting in, for which the dwarves reprimanded him. And then the story was over, and a lengthy silence fell. To the archer Milva. Zoltan Chive cleared his throat, saluting with his cup. To the Nilfgaardian. To Regis the herbalist, who entertained the travellers in his cottage with moonshine and mandrake. And to Angulem, whom I never knew. May the earth fly lightly on them all. May they have in the beyond plenty of whatever they were short of on earth, and may their names live forever in songs and tales. Let's drink to them. There sing, a grey-haired fellow, pale and thin as a rake, the sheer opposite of the stereotype of an innkeeper and master of culinary secrets, brought to the table a basket of snow-white aromatic bread, and after that a huge wooden dish of snails on a bed of horseradish leaves, sizzling and spitting garlic butter. Dandelion, Geralt and the dwarves set about eating with a will. The meal was exquisitely tasty and at the same time extremely comical considering the need to fiddle with bizarre tongs and little forks. They ate, smacked their lips and caught the dripping butter on bread. They swore cheerfully as one snail after another slipped from the tongs. Two young kittens had great fun rolling and chasing the empty shells across the floor. The smell coming from the kitchen indicated that Veersing was cooking another batch. Yarp and Zegrin reluctantly waved a hand, but realised that the witcher wouldn't give up. Nothing new with me by and large, he said, sucking out a shell. A bit of soldiering, a bit of politicking because I was elected vice starosta. I'm going to make a career in politics. There's great competition in every other trade. And there are no end of fools, bribe-takers and thieves in politics. It's easy to make a name for yourself. Well, I don't have a flair for politics, said Zoltan Chile, gesticulating with a snail held in his tongs, and setting up a steam and water hammer works in partnership with Figs Maruzzo and Munro Brois. Remember them, Witcher? Figs and Brois? Not just them. Yezen Varda fell at the Battle of the Yoruga, 
Zoltan informed them dryly. Pretty stupidly, in one of the last skirmishes. Shame. And Percival Schuttenbach? The gnome? Oh, he's doing well. The crafty thing. He got out of the draft using some ancient gnomish laws as an excuse, claiming his religion forbade him from soldiering. And he managed it, even though everybody knows he'd give the whole pantheon of gods and goddesses for a marinated herring. He has a jeweler's workshop in Novigrad. Do you know, he bought that parrot Field Marshal Duda and turned the bird into a living advertisement after teaching it called Diamonds, Diamonds. And just imagine, it works. The gnome has lots of custom, hands full of work and a well-stuffed safe. Yes, yes, that's Novigrad. When he lies in the streets there, that's also why we want to start our hammer works in Novigrad. People will be smearing shit on your door, said Yarpin, and throwing stones at the windows and calling you a filthy short ass. It won't help you at all that you're a war veteran, that you fought for them. You'll be a pariah in that Novigrad of yours. You're right, said Zoltan cheerfully. There's too much competition in Mahakam and too many politicians. Let's drink a toast, lads, to Caleb Stratton and Jason Vada. To Regan Dahlberg, added Yarpen, growing gloomy. Geralt shook his head. Regan, too? Aye, at Mayena. Old Mrs. Dahlberg was left a widow. Ah, by the devil. Enough. Enough of that. Let's drink. And hurry with those snails. I see Veersing's bringing another bowl. The dwarves, belts loosened, listened to Geralt's story about how Dandelion's ducal romance finished up on the scaffold. The poet pretended to be piqued and didn't comment. Yarpin and Zoltan roared with laughter. Yes, yes said Yapin Zigrin at the end, grinning. As the old song goes, though man can bend rods of steel, women will always bring him to heel. Several wonderful examples of the aptness of that adage are gathered around one table today. Zoltan Chive springs to mind. When I told you what's new with him, I forgot to add he's taken a wife. And soon, in September, the lucky girl is called Eudora Brekakex. Brekanrigs, Zoltan corrected emphatically, frowning. I'm beginning to have enough of correcting your pronunciation, Zigrin. Take heed, for I'm liable to start cracking heads when I've had enough of something. Where's the wedding? And when exactly? Dandelion interrupted in mid-sentence placatingly. I'm asking because we might look in, if you invite us, naturally. It hasn't been decided what, where or how, or even if it's happening. Zoltan mumbled, clearly disconcerted. Yarpin's getting ahead of himself. Eudora and I are engaged right enough, but who knows what might happen in these fuck-awful times. The second example of women's omnipotence, continued Yarpin Zigrin, is Geralt of Rivia, the Witcher. Geralt pretended to be occupied with a snail. Yarpin snorted. Having miraculously regained Siri, he continued, he lets her ride off, agreeing to another farewell. He leaves her on her own again, although as somebody here rightly observed, the times are not too peaceful for fuck's sake. And said Witcher does all that because that's what a certain woman wants. The Witcher always does everything that that woman, known to society as Yennefer of Wingerberg, wants. And if only said Witcher got any benefit from it. But he doesn't. Indeed. As King Desmond used to say when looking into his chamber pot after completing a motion, the mind is unable to grasp it. I suggest. Geralt raised his cup with a charming smile. We drink up and change the subject. Well said, said Dandelion and Zoltan in unison. Versing brought to the table a third and then a fourth great bowl of snails. Neither did he forget, naturally, about the bread and vodka. The diners had now eaten their fill, so it was no surprise that toasts were being drunk somewhat more frequently. Neither was it a surprise that philosophy crept into the discourse more and more often. The evil I fought against, repeated the Witcher, was a sign of the activities of chaos, activities calculated to disturb order. Since wherever evil is at large, order may not reign, and everything order builds collapses, cannot endure. The light of wisdom and the flame of hope, the glow of warmth, instead of flaring up, go out. 
It'll be dark, and in the darkness will be fangs, claws, and blood. Yop and Zigrin stroked his beard, greasy from the herb and garlic butter that had dripped from the snails. Very pretty sad, witcher, he admitted. But, as the young Sero said to King Vridenek during their first tryst, it's not a bad-looking thing, but does it have any practical use? The reason for existence, the witcher didn't smile, and the raison d'etre of witches has been undermined since the fight between good and evil is now being waged on a different battlefield and is being fought completely differently. Evil has stopped being chaotic. It has stopped being a blind and impetuous force against which a witcher, a mutant as murderous and chaotic as evil itself had to act. Today, evil acts according to rights because it is entitled to. It acts according to peace treaties because it was taken into consideration when the treaties were being written. He's seen the settlers being driven south, guessed Zoltan Chive. Not only that, Dandelion added grimly. Not only that. So what? Yarpin Zigrin sat more comfortably, locking his hands on his belly. Everyone's seen things. Everybody's been pissed off. Everybody's lost his appetite for a shorter or a longer time. Or lost sleep. That's how it is. That's how it was. And how it's going to be. Like these shells here. I swear you won't squeeze any more philosophy out of it, because there isn't any more. What's not to your liking, Witcher? What doesn't suit you? The changes the world's undergoing? Development? Progress? Perhaps. Yarpen said nothing for a long time, looking at the Witcher from under his bushy eyebrows. Progress, he said finally, is like a herd of pigs. That's how you should look at progress. That's how you should judge it. Like a herd of pigs trotting around a farmyard. Numerous benefits derive from the fact of that herd's existence. There's pork knuckle, there's sausage, there's fat back. There are trotters in aspic. In a word, there are benefits. There's no point turning your nose up at the shit everywhere. They were all silent for some time, weighing up in their minds and consciences the various important issues and matters. Let's have a drink, said Dandelion finally. No one protested. Progress, said Yapin Zigrin amidst the silence, will eventually light up the darkness. The darkness will yield before the light, but not right away, and definitely not without a fight. Geralt, staring at the window, smiled at his own thoughts and dreams. The darkness you're talking about, he said, is a state of mind, not matter. Quite different witches will have to be trained to fight something like that. It's high time to start. Start retraining? Is that what you had in mind? Not entirely. Being a witcher doesn't interest me any longer. I'm retiring. Like hell. I'm totally serious. I'm done with being a witcher. A long silence fell, broken only by the furious meowing of the kittens, which were scratching and biting one another under the table, faithful to the custom of that species for whom there's no sport without pain. He's done with being a witcher, Yarp and Zigrin finally repeated in a drawling voice. Ha! I don't know what to think about it, as King Desmond said when he was caught cheating at cards. But one may suspect the worse. Dandelion, you travel with him, spend a lot of time with him. Is he showing any other signs of paranoia? Yes, yes. Geralt was stony-faced. Joking aside as King Desmond said when the guests at the banquet suddenly began to go blue and die. I've said what I intended to say. And now to action. He picked up his sword from the back of the chair. This is your sire, Zoltan Chive. I return it to you with thanks and a low bow. It has served. It has helped. Saved lives and taken lives. Witcher. The dwarf raised his hands in a defensive gesture. The sword is yours. I didn't lend it to you. I gave it. Gifts, quiet, Chive. I'm returning your sword. I don't need it any longer. Like hell, repeated Yarpin. Pour him some vodka, Dandelion, because he sounds like old Schrader when a pickaxe fell on his head down a mineshaft. Geralt, 
I know you have a profound nature and a lofty soul, but don't talk such crap, please. Because, as it's easy to see, neither Yennefer nor any other of your magical concubines are in the audience, just us old buggers. You can't tell old buggers like us that your sword's not needed, that witches aren't needed, that the world's rotten, that this, that and the other. You're a witcher, and always will be. No, I won't. Geralt responded mildly. It may surprise you, old buggers, but I've come to the conclusion that pissing into the wind is stupid, that risking your neck for anybody is stupid, even if they're paying, and existential philosophy has nothing to do with it. You won't believe it, but my own skin has suddenly become extremely dear to me. I've come to the conclusion it will be foolish to risk it in someone else's defence. I've noticed, Dandelion nodded. On one hand, that's wise. On the other... There is no other. Do Yennefer and Siri, Yarpin asked after a short pause, have anything to do with your decision? A great deal. Then everything's clear, sighed the dwarf. Admittedly, I don't exactly know how you, a professional swordsman, intend to sustain yourself and intend to organise your worldly existence, even though, however you slice it, I can't see you in the role of, let's say, a cabbage planter, Nonetheless, one must respect your choice. Innkeeper, if you be so kind, this is a Mahakam Sail sword from the very forge of Rundurin. It was a gift. The receiver doesn't want it. The giver may not take it back. So you take it. Fasten it above the fireplace. Change the name of the tavern to the witch's sword. Me tales of treasure and monsters, of bloody wars and fierce battles, of death be told here on winter evenings, of great love and unfailing friendship of courage and honour. May this sword cheer up the listeners and inspire the storytellers. And now, pour me vodka, gentlemen, for I shall continue talking, shall present profound truths and diverse philosophies, including existential ones. The cups were filled with vodka silently and solemnly. They looked into each other's eyes and drank, no less solemnly. Yarpen Zigrin cleared his throat, swept his eyes over his audience and made certain they were sufficiently rapt and solemn. Progress, he said with reverence, will lighten up the gloom, for that is what progress is, for as, if you'll pardon me, the asshole is for shitting. It will be brighter and brighter, and we shall fear less and less the darkness and the evil hidden in it. And a day will come, perhaps, when we shall stop believing at all that something is lurking in the darkness, We shall laugh at such fears, call them childish, be ashamed of them. But darkness will always, always exist, and there will always be evil in the darkness, always be fangs and claws, death and blood in the darkness, and witches will always be needed. They sat in reflection and silence, so deeply plunged in their thoughts that the suddenly increasing murmur and noise of the town, angry, Baleful, intensifying like the buzzing of annoyed wasps, escaped their attention. They barely noticed as a first, a second, and a third shape stole along the silent and empty lakeside boulevard. Just as a roar exploded over the town, the door to Versing's inn slammed wide open, and a small dwarf rushed in, red from effort and panting heavily. What is it? Yuppin Zigrin lifted his head. The dwarf, still unable to catch his breath, pointed towards the town centre. His eyes were frantic. Take a deep breath, advised Zoltan Chive, and tell us what's going on. It was said later that the tragic events in Rivia were an absolutely chance occurrence, that it was a spontaneous reaction, a sudden and unpredictable explosion of justified anger, springing from the mutual hostility and dislike between humans, dwarves and elves, It was said that it wasn't the humans but the dwarves who attacked first, that the aggression came from them, that a dwarven market trader had insulted a young noblewoman, Nadia Esposito, a war orphan that he had used violence against her. When then her friends came to her defence, the dwarf mustered his fellows. A scuffle broke out, and then a fight which took over the whole bazaar in an instant. The fight turned into a massacre, into a massed attack by humans on the part of the suburbs occupied by non-humans and the district of Elm. 
in less than an hour from the time of the incident at the bazaar to the intervention by sorcerers, 184 individuals had been killed, and almost half of the victims were women and children. Professor Emmerich Gostchalk of Oxenfurt gives the same version of events in his dissertation. But there were also those who said something different. How could it have been spontaneous? How could it have been a sudden and unforeseeable explosion, they asked, if in the course of a few minutes from the altercation at the bazaar, wagons had appeared in the streets from which people began to hand out weapons? How could it have been sudden and justified anger if the ringleaders of the mob, who were the most visible and active during the massacre, were people no one knew and who had arrived in Rivia several days before the riots from God knows where and afterwards vanished without trace? Why did the army intervene so late and so tentatively at first? Still, other scholars tried to identify Nilfgaardian provocation in the Rivian riots and there were those who claimed it was all concocted by the dwarves and elves together that they had killed each other to blacken the name of the humans. Utterly lost among the serious academic voices was the extremely bold theory of a certain young and eccentric graduate who, until he was silenced, claimed that it was not conspiracies or secret plots that had manifested themselves in Rivia, but the simple and indeed universal traits of the local people. Ignorance, xenophobia, callous boorishness, and thorough brutishness. And then everybody lost interest in the matter and stopped talking about it at all. Into the cellar, repeated the witcher, anxiously listening to the quickly growing roar and yelling of the mob. Dwarves into the cellar without any stupid heroics. Witcher, Sultan grunted, clenching the haft of his battle axe. I can't. My brothers are dying out there. Into the cellar. Think about Eudora Brekakex. Do you want her to be a widow before her wedding? The argument worked. The dwarves went down into the cellar. Geralt and Dandelion covered the entrance with straw mats. Veersing, who was usually pale, was now white as cottage cheese. I saw a pogrom in Maribor, he stammered out, looking at the entrance to the cellar. If they find them there, go to the kitchen. Dandelion was also pale. Geralt wasn't especially surprised. Individual accents were sounding in the hitherto indistinct and monotonous roar that reached their ears. Notes that made their hair stand up on their heads. Geralt, groaned the poet, I'm... Somewhat similar to an elf. Don't be stupid. Clouds of smoke billowed above the rooftops, and fugitives dashed out of a narrow street. Dwarves of both sexes. Two dwarves dived into the lake without thinking and began to swim, churning up the water, straight ahead towards the middle. The others dispersed. Some of them turned towards the tavern. The mob rushed out of the narrow street. They were quicker than the dwarves. Lust for slaughter was winning out in this race. The screaming of people being killed pierced the ears and made the coloured glass in the tavern's windows jingle. Geralt felt his hands begin to shake. One dwarf was literally torn apart, rent into pieces. Another, thrown onto the ground, was turned into a shapeless bloody mass in a few moments. A woman was stabbed with pitchforks and pikes, and the child she had defended until the end was trampled, crushed under the blows of boot heels. Three of them, a dwarf and two dwarf women, fled straight towards the tavern. The crowd raced after them, yelling. Geralt took a deep breath. He stood up, feeling on him the terrified eyes of Dandelion and Versing. He took the sile, the sword wrought in Mahakam, in the very forge of Rundurin, down from the shelf over the fireplace. Geralt, the poet groaned pathetically. Very well, said the witcher walking towards the exit. But this is the last time. Damn it, it really is the last time. He went out onto the porch and jumped straight down from it, filleting, with a rapid slash, a roughneck in bricklayer's overalls who was aiming a blow with a trowel at a woman. He cut off the hand of the next one who was grasping the hair of another woman. He hacked down two men kicking a dwarf on the ground with two swift diagonal slashes and he entered the crowd quickly, spinning around in half-turns. He cut with wide blows, apparently chaotically, knowing that such strokes are bloodier and more spectacular. He didn't mean to kill them, he just wanted to wound them. He's an elf! He's an elf! yelled someone in the mob savagely. Kill the elf! 
That's going too far, he thought. Dandelion, perhaps, but I don't resemble an elf in any way. He spotted the one who had shouted, probably a soldier, because he was wearing a brigantine and high boots. The witcher wormed his way into the crowd like an eel. The soldier shielded himself with a javelin held in both hands. Geralt cut along the shaft, chopping off the soldier's fingers. The witcher whirled, bringing forth shrieks of pain and fountains of blood with the next broad stroke. Mercy! An unkempt young man with crazy eyes fell on his knees in front of him. Spare me! Geralt spared him, stopped the movement of his arm and sword, using the momentum intended for the blow to spin away. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the unkempt youth spring to his feet and saw what he was holding. Geralt interrupted the turn to spin back the other way. But he was stuck in the crowd. He was stuck in the crowd for a split second. All he could do was watch as the three-fanged fork flew towards him. The fire in the grate of the huge hearth went out, and it grew dark in the hall. The strong wind, gusting from the mountains, whistled in the cracks in the walls, wailed, blowing in through the drafty shutters of Caer Morin, the seat of the witches. Damn it! Eskil blurted out, stood up and opened the sideboard. Seagull? Or vodka? Vodka, said Cohen and Geralt as one. Of course, said Vesemir, hidden in the shadows. Of course, naturally. Drown your stupidity in booze, sodding fools. It was an accident, muttered Lambert. She was managing well, Macomb. Shut your trap, you ass. I don't want to hear your voice. I tell you, if anything's the matter with the girl... She's good now, Cohen interrupted gently. She's sleeping peacefully, deeply and soundly. She'll wake up a bit sore and that's all. She won't remember at all about the trance or what happened. As long as you remember, panted Vesemir. Blockheads! Pour me one too, Eskel. They were silent for a long time, engrossed in the howling of the wind. We'll have to summon someone, said Eskel finally. We'll have to get some witch to come. It's not normal what's happening to that girl. That's the third trance already, but it's the first time she's used articulated speech. Tell me again what she said, ordered Vesemir, emptying the goblet in one draft, word for word. I can't tell you word for word, said Geralt, staring into the embers. And the meaning, if there's any point looking for meaning in it, was me and Coin are going to die. Teeth will be our undoing. We'll both be killed by teeth, in his case two, in mine three. It's quite likely we'll be bitten to death, snorted Lambert. Teeth could be the downfall of any of us at any moment. Although if that prediction is a real prophecy, you two will be finished off by some extremely gap-toothed monsters. Or by purulent gangrene from rotten teeth, Eskel nodded, apparently serious. Except our teeth aren't rotting. I wouldn't make fun of the matter, said Vesemir. The witchers said nothing. The wind howled and whistled in the walls of Gair Morin. The unkempt young man, as though horrified by what he'd done, dropped the shaft. The witcher cried out in pain in spite of himself and bent over. The trident sticking into his stomach overbalanced him, and when he fell onto his knees, it slid out of his body and fell onto the cobbles. Blood poured out with a swoosh and a splash worthy of a waterfall. Geralt tried to rise from his knees. Instead, he fell over on his side. The sounds around him resonated and echoed. He heard them as though his head was underwater. His vision was also blurred with distorted perspective and totally false geometry. But he saw the crowd take flight, saw them run from the relief, from Zoltan and Yarpin holding battle axes, Versing holding a meat cleaver, and Dandelion armed with a broom. Stop, he wanted to cry. Where are you going? It's enough that I always piss into the wind. But he couldn't cry out. His voice was choked by a gush of blood. It was getting towards noon when the sorceresses reached Rivia. Down below, viewed from the perspective of the highway, 
The surface of Loch Escalot glittered with the sparkling reflections of the castle's red tiles and the town's roofs. Well, we've arrived, stated Yennefer. Rivia! <laughs> How strange are the twists of fate. Ciri, who had been excited for a long time, made Kelpie dance and take short steps. Triss Merigold sighed imperceptibly. At least she thought it was imperceptible. Well, well. Yennefer glared at her. What strange sounds are lifting your virgin breast, Triss? Siri, ride on ahead and see if you're already there. Triss turned her face away, determined not to provoke or give any pretext. She wasn't counting on a result. For a long time, she had sensed the anger and aggression in Yennefer, getting stronger the closer they got to Rivia. You, Triss, Yennefer repeated scathingly. Don't blush, don't sigh, don't slaver, and don't wiggle your bum in the saddle. Do you think that's why I yielded to your request, agreed to you coming with us? For a languorously blissful meeting with your erstwhile sweetheart? Siri, I asked you to ride on ahead a little. Let us have a talk. It's a monologue, not a talk, said Siri impertinently. But she yielded at once, under the menacing violet glare, whistled at Kelpie, and galloped down the highway. You aren't riding to a rendezvous with your lover, Triss, Yennefer continued. I'm neither so noble nor so stupid as to give you the chance and him the temptation. Just this once, today, and then I'll make sure that neither of you has any temptations or opportunities. But today, I won't deny myself that sweet and perverted pleasure. He knows about the role you played and will thank you for it with his eyes and I shall look at your trembling lips and shaking hands, listen to your lame apologies and excuses. And do you know what, Triss? I'll be swooning with delight. I knew you wouldn't forget what I did, that you would take your revenge, muttered Triss. I accept that, because I was indeed to blame. But I have to tell you one thing, Yennefer. Don't count too much on my swooning. He knows how to forgive. For what was done to him, indeed. Yennefer squinted her eyes but he'll never forgive you for what was done to Siri, and to me. Maybe, Triss swallowed. Maybe he won't, particularly if you do your utmost to stop him. But he definitely won't bully me, he won't stoop to that. Yennefer swiped her horse with her whip. The horse whinnied, jumped, and cavorted so suddenly that the sorceress swayed in the saddle. That's enough of this discussion, she snapped. A little more humility, you arrogant slut. He's my man, mine, and only mine. Do you understand? You're to stop talking about him. You're to stop thinking about him. You're to stop delighting in his noble character. Right away, at once. <sighs> I feel like grabbing you by that ginger mop of hair. Just you try, yelled Triss. Just try, you bitch, and I'll scratch your eyes out. I... They fell silent, seeing Siri hurtling towards them in a cloud of dust. They knew right away that something was afoot, and saw at once what it was before Ciri even reached them. Tongues of flame suddenly shot up over the thatched roofs of the now nearby suburbs and over the tiles and chimneys of the city, and smoke belched in billows. Screaming, like the distant buzzing of annoying flies, like the droning of angry bumblebees, reached the sorceress's ears. The screaming grew. It increased, counterpointed by single, high-pitched cries. What the bloody hell is going on there? Yennefer stood up in the stirrups. A raid? A fire? Geralt! Ciri suddenly groaned, becoming as white as vellum. Geralt! Ciri? What's the matter with you? Ciri raised her hand, and the sorceresses saw blood dribbling over it, along the lifeline. The circle has closed, said the girl, closing her eyes. A thorn from Sherawaith pricked me and the snake, Aroboros, has sunk its teeth into its own tail. I'm coming, Geralt. I'm coming to you. I won't leave you alone. Before either of the sorceresses had time to protest, the girl had turned Kelpie around and galloped off at once. They had enough presence of mind to immediately urge their own horses into a gallop, but their steeds were no match for Kelpie. What is it? screamed Yennefer, gulping the wind. What's happening? But you know sobbed Triss, galloping beside her. Fly, Yennefer! 
before they had dashed among the shacks of the suburbs, before they were passed by the first fugitives fleeing the town, Yennefer already had a clear enough picture of the situation to know that what was happening in Rivia wasn't a fire or a raid by enemy troops, but a pogrom. She also knew what Ciri had felt, where and to whom she was rushing so quickly. She also knew she couldn't catch up with her. There was no chance. Kelpie had simply jumped over the panicked people, crushed together into a crowd, knocking off several hats and caps with their hooves. She and Triss had had to rein in their steeds so abruptly they almost tumbled over their horses' heads. Siri, stop! They suddenly found themselves amidst narrow streets full of the running and wailing mob. As she passed, Yennefer noticed bodies lying in the gutters, saw corpses hanging by their legs from posts and beams. She saw a dwarf lying on the ground being kicked and beaten with sticks, saw another being battered with the necks of broken bottles. She heard the shouts of the assailants, the screaming and howling of the beaten. She saw a throng clustering around a woman who had been thrown from a window and the glint of metal bars rising and falling. The crowd closed in, the roar intensified. It seemed to the sorceresses that the distance between them and Ciri had shortened. The next obstacle in Kelpie's way was a small group of disorientated halberdiers, whom the black mare treated like a fence and jumped over, knocking a flat kettle hat off one of them. The others simply squatted down in fear. They burst into a square at full gallop. It was black with people and smoke. Yennefer realized that Ciri, unerringly led by her prophetic vision, was heading for the very heart, the very center of events, to the very core of the conflagrations where murder was rampaging. For a battle was raging in the street she had turned towards. Dwarves and elves were fiercely defending a makeshift barricade, defending a lost position, falling and dying under the pressure of the howling rabble attacking them. Ciri screamed and pressed herself to her horse's neck. Kelpie took off and flew over the barricade, not like a horse, but like a huge black bird. Yennefer rode into the crowd and reined her horse in sharply, knocking a few people over. She was dragged from the saddle before she managed to yell. She was hit on the shoulders, on the back, and on the back of her head. She fell onto her knees and saw an unshaven character in a shoemaker's apron preparing to kick her. Yennefer had had enough of people kicking her. From her spread fingers shot pale blue hissing fire, cutting like a horsewhip the faces, torsos, and arms of the people surrounding her. There was a stench of burning flesh, and for a moment, howling and squealing rose above the general commotion and hullabaloo. Witch! Elven witch! Enchantress! The next character leapt at her with a raised axe. Yennefer shot fire straight in his face. His eyeballs burst, seethed, and spilled out onto his cheeks with a hiss. The crowd thinned out. Someone grabbed her by the arm, and she recoiled, ready to fire. But it was Triss. Let's flee from here, Yenna. Flee from here. I've heard her talking in a voice like that before, flashed a thought through Yennefer's head. With lips like wood that not even a droplet of saliva can moisten. Lips that fear paralyzes, that panic makes tremble. I heard her talking in a voice like that, on Sodden Hill, when she was dying of fear. Now she's dying of fear too. She's going to die of fear her whole life. For whoever doesn't overcome the cowardice inside themselves will die of fear to the end of their days. The fingers that Triss dug into her arm seemed to be made of steel, and Yennefer only freed herself from their grasp with the greatest of effort. Flee if you want to, she cried. Hide behind the skirts of your lodge. I have something to defend. I shan't leave Ciri alone or Geralt. Get away, you rabble. Out of the way if you value your lives. The crowd separating her from her horse retreated before the lightning bolts shooting from the sorceress's eyes and hands. Yennefer tossed her head, ruffling up her black locks. She looked like fury incarnate, like an angel of destruction, a punishing angel of destruction with a flaming sword. Be gone! Get you home, you swine! She yelled, lashing the rabble with a flaming whip. Be gone, or I'll brand you with fire like cattle! It's only one witch, people, a resonant and metallic voice sounded from the crowd. A single bloody elven spellcaster. She's alone, the other bolted. Hey, children, take up stones. Death to the non-humans, war betide the witch. To her confusion. 
The first stone whistled past her ear. The second thudded into her arm, making her stagger. The third hit her directly in the face. First, the pain exploded intensely in her eyes, then wrapped everything in black velvet. She came to, groaning in pain. Pain shot through both her forearms and wrists. She groped involuntarily, felt the thick layers of bandage. She groaned again, dully, despairingly, sorry that it wasn't a dream, and sorry that she'd failed. You didn't succeed, said Desire de Vries, sitting beside the bed. Yennefer was thirsty. She wanted somebody to at least moisten her lips, which were covered in a sticky coating. But she didn't ask. Her pride wouldn't let her. You didn't succeed, repeated Desire de Vries, but not because you didn't try hard. You cut well and deep. That's why I am here with you. Had it only been silly games, had it been a foolish, irresponsible demonstration, I would have nothing but contempt for you. But you cut deeply, purposefully. Yennefer looked at the ceiling vacantly. I shall take care of you, girl, because I believe it's worth it. And it'll require a good deal of work. Oh, but it will. I'll not only have to straighten your spine and shoulder blade, but also heal your hands. When you slit your wrists, you severed the tendons, and a sorceress's hands are important instruments, Yennefer. Moisture on her mouth. Water. You shall live. Desire's voice was matter-of-fact, grave, stern even. Your time has not yet come. When it does, you will recall this day. Yennefer greedily sucked the moisture from a stick wrapped in a wet bandage. I shall take care of you, Desire de Vries repeated, gently touching her hair. And now we are alone here, without witnesses. No one will see, and I shan't tell anyone. Weep, girl. Have a good cry. Weep your heart out for the last time. For later you won't be able to. There isn't a more hideous sight than a sorceress weeping. She came to, hawked and coughed up blood. Someone was dragging her across the ground. It was Triss. She recognized her by the scent of her perfume. Not far from them, iron-shod hooves rang on the cobbles and yelling resounded. Yennefer saw a rider in full armor, in a white surcoat with a red chevron, pummeling the crowd with a bullwhip from a high lancer's saddle. The stones being hurled by the mob bounced harmlessly off his armor and visor. The horse neighed, thrashed around and kicked. Yennefer felt she had a great potato instead of her upper lip. At least one front tooth had been broken or knocked out and was cutting her tongue painfully. Triss, she gibbered. Teleport us out of here. No, Yennefer. Triss's voice was very calm and very cold. They'll kill us. No, Yennefer. I shan't run away. I shan't hide behind the lodger's skirts. And don't worry. I shan't faint from fear like I did at Sodden. I shall vanquish it inside me. I've already vanquished it. A great pile of compost, dung and waste, in a recess of moss-covered walls, rose up near the exit of the narrow street. It was a magnificent pile. A hill, one could say. The crowd had finally succeeded in seizing and immobilizing the knight and his horse. He was knocked to the ground with a terrible thud, and the mob crawled over him like lice, covering him in a moving layer. After hauling Yennefer up, Triss stood on the top of the pile of garbage and raised her arms in the air. She screamed out a spell, screamed it out with true fury, so piercingly that the crowd fell silent for a split second. They'll kill us, Yennefer spat blood, as sure as anything. Help me! Triss interrupted the incantation for a moment. Help me, Yennefer. We'll cast Altsua's thunder at them. And we'll kill about five of them, thought Yennefer. Then the rest will tear us to pieces. But very well, Triss, as you wish. 
If you don't run away, you won't see me running away. She joined in the incantation. The two of them screamed. The crowd stared at them for a second, but quickly came to their senses. Stones whistled around the sorceresses again. A javelin flew just beside Triss's temple. Triss didn't even flinch. It isn't working at all, thought Yennefer. Our spell isn't working at all. We don't have a chance of casting anything as complicated as Altsor's thunder. Altsor, it is claimed, had a voice like a bell and the diction of an orator. And we're squeaking and mumbling, mixing up the words and the intonation pattern. She was ready to interrupt the chant and concentrate the rest of her strength on some other spell, capable either of teleporting them both away or treating the charging rabble, for a split second at least, to something unpleasant. But it turned out there was no need. The sky suddenly darkened and clouds teemed above the town. It became devilishly somber and there was a cold wind. Oh my, Yennefer groaned. I think we stirred something up. Marigold's destructive hailstorm, repeated Nimu. Actually, that name is used illegally. The spell was never registered because no one ever managed to repeat it after Triss Marigold, for mundane reasons. Triss's mouth was cut and she was speaking indistinctly. Malicious people claim, furthermore, that her tongue was faltering from fear. It's hard to believe that. Condwyrimur's pouted her lips. There's no shortage of examples of the venerable Triss's valour and courage. Some chronicles even call her the fearless. But I want to ask about something else. One of the legend's versions says that Triss wasn't alone on the Rivian Hill, that Yennefer was there with her. Nemu looked at the watercolour, portraying the steep black razor-sharp hill against a background of deep blue clouds lit from below. The slender figure of a woman with arms outstretched and hair streaming around was visible on the hill's summit. The rhythmic rattle of the Fisher King's oars reached them from the fog covering the surface of the water. If anyone was there with Triss, they didn't endure in the artist's vision, said the Lady of the Lake. Oh, what a mess, Yennefer repeated. Look out, Triss. In a moment, hailstones, angular balls of ice the size of hen's eggs, plummeted onto the town from the black cloud billowing above Rivia. They fell so heavily that the entire square was immediately covered in a thick layer. There was a sudden surge in the throng. People fell, covering their heads. They crawled one under the other, ran away, falling over, crowding into doorways and under arcades, and cowering by walls. Not all of them were successful. Some remained, lying like fish on the ice which was copiously stained with blood. The hailstones pelted down so hard that the magical shield Yennefer had managed to conjure up over their heads almost at the last moment trembled and threatened to break. She didn't even try any other spells. She knew that what they had triggered could not be halted, that they had unleashed by accident an element that had to run riot, that they had freed a force that had to reach a climax, and would soon reach that climax. At least so she hoped. Lightning flashed. There was a sudden peal of thunder which rumbled on and then gave a crack, making the ground tremble. The hail lashed the roofs and cobblestones. Fragments of shattering hailstones flew all around. The sky brightened up a little. The sun shone. A ray breaking through the clouds lashed the town like a horsewhip. Something escaped Triss's lips, neither a groan nor a sob. The hail was still falling, hammering down, covering the square in a thick layer of icy balls gleaming like diamonds. But now the hail was lighter and more patchy. Yennefer could tell from the change in the thudding on the magical shield, and then it stopped, all at once. All of a sudden, armed men rushed into the square, iron-shod hooves crunched on the ice. The mob roared and fled, whipped by knouts, struck by spear shafts and the flats of swords. Bravo, Triss, Yennefer croaked. I don't know what that was, but you did a nice job. There was something worth defending, croaked Triss Merigold, the heroine of the hill. There always is. Let's run, Triss, because it probably isn't over yet. It was over. 
The hail that the sorceresses had unleashed on the town cooled down hot heads, enough for the army to dare to strike and bring order. The soldiers had been afraid before. They knew what they were risking with an attack on the enraged mob, on a rabble drunk on blood and killing, that feared nothing and would retreat before nothing. But the explosion of the elements had brought the cruel, many-headed beast under control, and a charge by the army accomplished the rest. The hailstones had caused awful havoc in the town, and a man who a moment earlier had beaten a dwarf woman to death with a swingle tree and shattered her child's head against a wall was now sobbing, was now weeping, was now swallowing back tears and snot, looking at what was left of the roof of his house. Peace reigned in Rivia. Were it not for the almost two hundred mutilated corpses and a dozen burned-down homesteads, one might think nothing had happened. In the district of Elm, on Loch Escalot, over which the gorgeous arc of a rainbow was shining, weeping willows were reflected beautifully in the smooth, mirror-like water. Birds had resumed their singing, and it smelt of wet foliage. Everything looked pastoral. Even the witcher, lying in a pool of blood, with Ciri kneeling over him. Geralt was unconscious and as white as a sheet. He lay motionless, but when they stood over him, he began to cough, wheeze, and spit blood. He began to shake and tremble so hard, Siri couldn't stop him. Yennefer kneeled down beside her. Triss saw that her hands were shaking. She herself suddenly felt as weak as a kitten, and everything went black. Someone held her up, stopped her from falling. She recognized Dandelion. It's not working at all. She heard Ciri's voice emanating despair. Your magic isn't healing him at all, Yennefer. We arrived. Yennefer had difficulty moving her lips. We arrived too late. Your magic's not working, Ciri repeated, as though she hadn't heard her. What's it worth then, your confounded magic? You're right, Ciri thought Triss, feeling a lump in her throat. We know how to cause a hailstorm, but we can't drive death away, although the latter would seem to be easier. We've sent for a physician, said the dwarf, standing beside Dandelion hoarsely. But he's taking his time. It's too late for a physician, said Triss, surprising herself by the calm in her voice. He's dying. Geralt trembled once more, coughed up blood, tensed, and went still. Dandelion supporting Triss sighed in despair, and the dwarf swore. Yennefer groaned. Her face suddenly changed, contorted and grew ugly. There's nothing more pathetic, Ciri said sharply, than a weeping sorceress. You taught me that yourself, but now you're pathetic. Really pathetic, Yennefer. You and your magic, which isn't fit for anything. Yennefer didn't respond. She was holding Geralt's limp, paralyzed head in both hands and repeating spells, her voice quavering. Pale blue sparks and crackling glimmers danced over her hands and the witch's cheeks and forehead. Triss knew how much energy spells like that used up. She also knew the spells wouldn't help in any way. She was more than certain that even the spells of expert healers would have been powerless. It was too late. Yennefer's spells were only exhausting her. Triss was amazed that the black-haired sorceress was holding out so long. She stopped being amazed when Yennefer fell silent halfway through the next magical formula and slumped down onto the cobbles beside the witcher. One of the dwarves swore again. The other stood with head lowered. Dandelion, still holding Triss up, sniffed. It suddenly became very cold. The surface of the lake, filled with fog like a sorceress's cauldron, became enveloped in mist. The fog rose swiftly, billowed over the water and rolled onto the land in waves, enveloping everything in a thick white milk in which sounds grew quieter and died away, in which shapes vanished and forms blurred. And I once renounced my power, said Ciri slowly, still kneeling on the blood-soaked cobbles. Had I not renounced it, 
I would have saved him now. I would have healed him. I know it. But it's too late. I renounced it, and now I can't do anything. It's as though I've killed him. The silence was first interrupted by Kelpie's loud neighing, then by Dandelion's muffled cry. Then they were all struck dumb. A white unicorn emerged from the fog, running very lightly, ethereally and noiselessly, gracefully raising its shapely head. There actually wasn't anything unusual in that. Everybody knew the legends, and they were unanimous about unicorns running very lightly, ethereally and noiselessly, and raising their heads with characteristic grace. If anything was strange, it was that the unicorn was running over the surface of the water, and the water wasn't even rippling. Dandelion groaned, but this time in awe. Triss felt herself being seized by a thrill, by euphoria. The unicorn clattered its hooves on the stone boulevard. It shook its mane and neighed lengthily and melodically. Ehwarachwax, said Siri. I'd hoped you'd come. The unicorn came closer, neighed again, tapped with a hoof and then struck the cobbles hard. He bent his head. The horn sticking out of his domed forehead suddenly lit up with a bright glare, a brilliance that dispersed the fog for a moment. Siri touched the horn. Triss cried out softly, seeing the girl's eyes suddenly lighting up with a milky glow, saw her surrounded by a fiery halo. Siri couldn't hear her, couldn't hear anyone. She was still holding the unicorn's horn in one hand and pointed the other towards the motionless witcher. A ribbon of flickering brightness that glowed like lava flowed from her fingers. No one could tell how long it lasted, because it was unreal, like a dream. The unicorn, almost blurring in the thickening fog, neighed, struck its hoof and shook its head and horn as though pointing at something. Triss looked. She saw a dark shape on the water under the canopy of willow branches hanging over the lake. It was a boat. The unicorn pointed again with its horn and quickly began to vanish into the mist. Kelpie, said Siri. Follow him. Kelpie snorted and tossed her head. She followed the unicorn obediently. Her horseshoes rang on the cobbles for a while. Then the sound suddenly broke off, as though the mare had taken wing, disappeared dematerialized. The boat was beside the very bank, and in the moments when the fog dispersed, Triss could see it clearly. It was a primitively constructed barge, as clumsy and angular as a large pig trough. Help me, said Siri. Her voice was confident and determined. No one knew at the beginning what the girl meant, what help she was expecting. Dandelion was the first to understand, perhaps because he knew the legend had once read one of its poeticized versions. He picked up the still unconscious Yennefer. He was astonished at how dainty and light she was. He could have sworn somebody was helping him carry her. He could have sworn he could feel Kaya's shoulder beside his arm. Out of the corner of one eye, he caught sight of a flash of Milver's flaxen plait. When he placed the sorceress in the boat, he could have sworn he saw Angulem's hands steadying the side. The dwarves carried the witcher, helped by Triss, who was supporting his head. Yarp and Zygrin positively blinked on seeing both Dalberg brothers for a second. Zoltan Chive could have sworn that Caleb Stratton had helped him lay the witcher in the boat. Triss Merigold was absolutely certain she could smell the perfume of Litanade, also called Coral. And for a moment, she saw amidst the haze the bright yellow-green eyes of Cohen from Ger Morin. That was the kind of tricks played on the senses by the fog, the thick fog over Loch Escalot. It's ready, Siri, the sorceress said dully. Your boat is waiting. Siri brushed her hair back from her forehead and sniffed. Apologize to the ladies of Monte Calvo, Triss, she said, but it can't be otherwise. I cannot stay when Geralt and Yennefer are departing. I simply cannot. They ought to understand. They ought to. 
Farewell then, Triss Marigold. Farewell, Dandelion. Farewell, all of you. Siri, whispered Triss. Little sister, let me sail away with you. You don't know what you're asking, Triss. Will you ever? For certain, she interrupted firmly. She boarded the boat, which rocked and immediately began to sail away, to fade into the fog. Those that were standing on the bank didn't hear even the merest splash, didn't see any ripples or movements of the water, as though it wasn't a boat, but an apparition. For a very short time, they could still see Ciri's slight and ethereal silhouette, saw her push off from the bottom with a long pole, saw her urge on the already quickly gliding barge. And then there was only the fog. She liked me, thought Driss. I'll never see her again. I'll never see her because... I said to the earth if again. Something ends. Something has ended, said Dandelion in an altered voice. Something is beginning. Yaf and Zegrin chimed in. A rooster crowed loudly somewhere in the direction of the town. The fog quickly began to rise. Geralt opened his eyes, irritated by the play of light and shadow through his eyelids. He saw leaves above him, a kaleidoscope of leaves flickering in the sun. He saw branches heavy with apples. He felt the soft touch of fingers on his temple and cheek. Fingers he knew. Fingers he loved so much it hurt. His belly and chest hurt. His ribs hurt. And the tight corset of bandages left him in no doubt that the town of Rivia and the three fanged trident hadn't been a nightmare. Lie still, my darling, Yennefer said gently. Lie still. Don't move. Where are we, Yen? Is it important? We're together. You and me. Birds, either greenfinches or thrushes, were singing. It smelled of grass, herbs and flowers, and apples. Were Siri. She's gone away. She changed her position, gently freeing her arm from under his head, and lay down beside him on the grass so that she could look in his eyes. She looked at him voraciously as though she wanted to feast her eyes on the sight, as though she wanted to eat him up with her eyes to store it away for the whole of eternity. He looked at her too, and longing choked him. We were with Siri in a boat, he recalled. On a lake. Then on a river. On a river with a strong current. In the fog. Her fingers found his hand and squeezed it strongly. Lie still, my darling. Lie still. I'm beside you. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter where we were. Now I'm beside you. And I'll never leave you. Never. I love you, Yen. I know. All the same, he sighed. I'd like to know where we are. Me too, said Yennefer, quietly and not right away. And is that the end of the story? Galahad asked a moment later. Not at all, protested Ciri, rubbing one foot against the other, wiping off the dried sand that had stuck to her toes and the sole of her foot. Would you like the story to end like that? Like hell, I wouldn't. So what happened then? Nothing special. She snorted. They got married. Tell me. Ah, what is there to tell? There was a great big wedding. They all came. Dandelion, Mother Nenica, Yoller and Yurnaid, Yap and Zegrin, Vesemir, Eskel, Cohen, Melver, Angulem, and my missile. And I was there. I drank mead and wine. And they... I mean, Geralt and Yennefer had their own house afterwards and were happy. Very, very happy. 
like in a fairy tale. Do you understand? Why are you weeping like that, O Lady of the Lake? I'm not weeping at all. My eyes are watering from the wind and that's that. They were silent for a long time and looked as the red-hot glowing ball of the sun touched the mountain peaks. Indeed, Galahad finally interrupted the silence. It was a very strange story. Oh, very strange. Truly, Miss Siri, the world you came from is incredible. Siri sniffed loudly. Yes, continued Galahad, clearing his throat several times, feeling a little uncomfortable by her silence. But astounding adventures also occur here in our world. Let's take, for instance, what happened to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, or to my uncle, Sir Bors and Sir Tristan. Just consider, Lady Siri, Sir Bors and Sir Tristan set off one day for the west, towards Tintagel. The road led them through forests, untamed and perilous. They rode and rode and looked, and there stood a white hind, and beside it a lady dressed in black. Truly, a blacker black you couldn't even see in nightmares. And that comely lady, so comely you couldn't see a comelier one in the whole world, well, apart from Queen Guinevere, that lady, standing by the hind, saw the knights, beckoned, and spake thus to them. Galahad. Yes? Be quiet. He coughed, cleared his throat, and fell silent. They were both silent, looking at the sun. They were silent for a long time. Lady of the Lake, I've asked you not to call me that. Lady Siri. Yes. Ride with me to Camelot, O Lady Siri. King Arthur, you'll see, will show you honour and respect, while I... I shall always love you and revere you. Get up from your knees at once. Or maybe not. If you're there, rub my feet. They're really frozen. Oh, thank you. You're sweet. I said my feet. My feet finish at the ankles. Lady Siri, I haven't gone anywhere. The day is drawing to a close. Indeed. Siri fastened her boot buckles and stood up. Let's saddle up, Galahad. Is there somewhere around here we can spend the night? <laughs> I can see from your expression that you know this place as well as I do. But never mind, let's set off. Even if we have to sleep under an open sky, let's go a bit further into a forest. There's a breeze coming off the lake. Why are you looking like that? Ah, she guessed, seeing him blush. Are you imagining a night under a filbert bush on a carpet of moss in the arms of a fairy? Listen, young man, I don't have the slightest desire. She broke off, looking at his blushing cheeks and shining eyes, at his actually not bad-looking face. Something squeezed her belly, and it wasn't hunger. What's happening to me? she thought. What's happening to me? Don't dilly-dally, she almost shouted. Saddle your stallion. When they mounted, she looked at him and laughed out loud. He glanced at her, and his gaze was one of amazement and questioning. Nothing, nothing, she said freely. I just thought of something. On we go, Galahad. A carpet of moss, she thought, suppressing a giggle under a filbert bush, with me playing the fairy. Well, well. Uh, Lady Siri? Yes? Will you ride with me to Camelot? She held out her hand, and he held out his. They joined hands, riding side by side. By the devil, she thought. Why not? I'd bet any money that in this world a job could be found for a witcher girl because there isn't a world where there wouldn't be work for a witcher. Lady Siri, let's not talk about it now. Let's go. They rode straight into the setting sun, leaving behind them the darkening valley. Behind them was the lake, the enchanted lake, the blue lake as smooth as a polished sapphire. They left behind them the boulders on the lakeside, the pines on the hillsides. That was all behind them.
and before them was everything. You have been listening to an Orion audiobook. The Lady of the Lake, written by Andrzej Sapkowski, translated from the Polish by David French, and read by Peter Kenny. The executive producer was Pandora White. This is a Strathmore Publishing production, directed and engineered by Mary Price and edited by Wolfgang Dienst. The text is copyright 1999 by Andrzej Sapkowski. The English translation is copyright 2017 by David French. And the recording is copyright 2017 by the Orion Publishing Group, an Achette UK company. For information about other Orion audiobooks, visit the website at www.orionbooks.co.uk. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.